Linux has dominated the operating system space for as long as anybody can remember. Despite its beginning as an open source operating system, Linux has evolved to rule the whole world. Developers now rely on Linux to ensure that they are on the right track. Hello everyone and welcome to this session. You are currently watching an Edureka Linux full course video. By the end of this video, you will have a thorough understanding of Linux all the way from theory to the practical applications. But before we go ahead, if you love watching videos like these, then subscribe to Edureka's YouTube channel and click the bell button to never miss out any updates from us. Also, if you want to learn more about Linux after watching this session and wish to obtain Edureka's Linux certification course, then please see the link in the description below. Now, let's begin with our agenda where we'll have a brief overview of what we'll cover in this Linux full course video. We'll start with the fundamentals of Linux where we'll learn what Linux is and how do we use it. After which, we will see different shells in Linux. Next, we will see how to install Linux using a virtual box. Now, once this is done, we will see Linux commands on Ubuntu. After which, we will also see some Linux commands for DevOps, followed by a detailed explanation on Linux file system. Now, it's time to deep dive into the technical aspects of Linux. We'll start with the package management in Linux. Now, once this is done, we will then understand Linux administration and learn how to configure a DNS server. After all this, we will see what is shell scripting. We can then see some shell scripting interview questions with answers. We will then compare Linux to Windows and Linux to Unix. We truly hope that this session assists you in getting jobs in the industry. In order to accomplish so, we will look at some essential Linux interview questions. So stick till the end. Now let's begin with the fundamentals of Linux. Why did Linux become popular? Well, uh, before I talk about uh, you know why they became popular, let's look at the birth of Linux, how things started off. Okay. So back in 1969, there was this person called uh, you know in fact there were two people, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson, right? So they were working in the AT&T Bell Labs and what they did was they created this C programming, right? So we're all aware of uh, programming, right? So we're all aware of these basic programming languages, right? So C is one of the most basic and one of the most uh, effective and the root of all the other programming languages. So that was C and it was them that uh, developed C and the Unix operating system. So that was what happened in 1969, okay? And then in the decade that followed, okay? So basically in the 1970s, people started developing or contributing to the development of these two things, okay? So they started uh, contributing to the development of the C programming language and the Unix operating system. So in our session, we'll uh, discuss more on Unix operating system. And uh, since it's about Linux, right? So Unix is basically the mother of uh, Linux because uh, Linux is based on the Unix operating system. Okay, I'll tell you uh, how that's the case uh, in some more time, but that's why we are starting off with Unix operating system. Okay, so I'm now going to cover about uh, C and getting back to our slides. So it says growth of Unix because of open source collaboration and there was commercial sale of Unix. Now what this meant is that, you know, the product that Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson created, right? That those were, uh, you know, something really attractive. They were some amazing software and operating systems that would, uh, you know, power machines and computers. Now what this meant was, uh, you know, they had to be developed to become even better, right? So they made it open source. Uh, it was, uh, when we say open source, it means that it was freely available to use uh, by anyone. So anybody, any person, any scientist or uh, any engineer or anybody could just get access to the source code and start improving that uh, source code. And if they feel that they have improved the software in any way, then they can just, uh, you know, give that code back to uh, the developers. So basically it was all about uh, collaborated uh, development. So that's what happened with Unix operating systems. In the 70s, many uh, hippies, uh, scientists, they all collaborated together, uh, wrote their own code, their own version of uh, Unix operating system and contributed to the development of uh, Unix operating system. And uh, since AT&T, they were the uh, ones who built Unix or the ones they were responsible for founding Unix, they were the ones that uh, gained a lot of benefit. They got help from other people for, uh, you know, developing the operating system. And what they did in turn was they made it a business, right? So they made money out of that by, you know, starting commercial sale of Unix. And uh, this was something that did not go down well with uh, many people. And this did not go down well with the other developers and scientists because uh, it was their effort which uh, contributed to the growth of uh, Unix. But however, they are not getting any benefits of, you know, Unix because AT&T that was making money out of somebody else's work. So that's what happened in the 1970s. 
okay and then came the 1980s which uh, was a little more different so instead of uh, you know buying uh, you know unix from at and uh, and you know having uh, two different versions of unix one was a free bsd and the other one was the paid at and version of unix so instead of going to go for them companies started developing their own unix so ibm came up with uh, their own uh, unix version called the aix solaris came up with their own version called the sun operating system and hp came up with their own version of unix called hp ux so there are other versions also like posix and all these things now since there were many versions right many flavors and many dialects of the same unix operating system it was becoming a little problematic because each of the dialects would be a little different so the uh, ibm's unix would be different from hp's unix and solaris's unix or it would be different from posix okay so each of them would be different but however they're all based on the same thing so it was unnecessary uh, you know confusion there uh, with so many versions of unix so that is when this person called richard stallman came up with something called as the gnu project okay so i told you earlier that uh, linux is just a kernel and not an operating system on its own so what this person did was you know he came up with something called as a free software movement so he wanted something like you know back in the 70s when everyone could collaborate and work on the same one single operating system like that he tried to bring back that era and this uh, free software movement of his this idea led to the gnu project so the gnu project was all about people being able to access an operating system for free and uh, you know developing that operating system so that's what uh, this led to and uh, that's what we call even today right so gnu is uh, basically the operating system and the uh, linux is the kernel that powers the operating system so a combination of these two is what results in one of the distributions of linux so we have multiple distributions like ubuntu uh, centos uh, red hat debian fedora all these things so all these things are uh, flavors a combination of one of the operating systems and the uh, you know linux kernel okay so that's what uh, they are so this is what happened in the 1980s and then you know mid to late 1980s was when richard stallman came into the picture and he came up with the gnu project where people could develop uh, you know and use free operating system so that's what happened here and the event that happened after this is what is a result of uh, today's world okay so after that then in the 1990s so probably 1991 or 1992 that was when this person called linus torvalds who was uh, still back in college at that time he put the linux kernel source code online so he was uh, trying to use the posix version with one hardware called 386 and he thought that it's compatible only with that hardware and uh, so he put the source code online for anyone to use and later they found out that it could be used with the gnu and that's when the whole uh, thing gained popularity so that's when we uh, you know came up with something called as the linux plus uh, gnu this whole term of having a kernel plus this operating system and getting them to work together so that's what happened here all right so guys uh, that's how linux was born okay now uh, without wasting any more time let me go to the next slide and uh, talk about the various distributions of linux so i told you that there are many versions like ubuntu centos and also let's uh, talk about those and uh, when we talk about distributions the most important and the most famous ones are uh, those of uh, red hat enterprise linux fedora and debian okay so these three are uh, primarily different companies and enterprises well debian is basically not one company it's kind of you know let's say a group of developers developing this uh, version of linux okay this version of linux and the ubuntu version so that is what debian is and the red hat is basically an enterprise it's a company that is uh, commercially selling the linux distribution okay and it's probably the most used and the most popular of uh, them all uh, why because they are very stable they are very reliable and as it's written here servers and workstations right so it's the preferred uh, linux distribution for servers and workstations the red hat uh, enterprise linux so they have a free version so that's called the uh, centos and uh, today's demonstration i'll be showing it to you on centos only okay so they have that and they have uh, various other uh, distributions in fact even fedora right that which we are going to talk about next even fedora is a company that's funded by red hat itself so it's again one of the variations of uh, red hat and fedora has its own set of you know distributions under it and uh, that's about the fedora distribution then comes the debian so this again i spoke about uh, debian so debian is you know the linux distribution that is uh, developed with the help of many developers so this is not developed for commercial purpose it's basically free and open source software and anybody with the skills can start uh, contributing to this software and you have many other distributions okay so these are among the uh, important and the commercial ones and if you're uh, talking about some of the free distributions which people can use then they are ubuntu linux mint centos uh, open source uh, gen2 and many more okay so there are almost 100 uh, linux distributions today and you can use any of them 
you know, if you're getting started with Linux, then I would uh, suggest you to either start off with Ubuntu or CentOS. Because uh, CentOS is, you know, something that's really reliable and that's really fast, okay? And Ubuntu is the most popular Linux distribution out there, okay? And so I read somewhere that Ubuntu is the third most used operating system, okay? So that's what uh, Ubuntu is all about. Of course, it's not uh, as fast as CentOS, but still Ubuntu is, you know, a very popular and uh, very handy tool. And Linux Mint is uh, the other uh, distribution which can be used for uh, playing movies and uh, listening to music because uh, this gives you more of a Windows-like interface. So that's what Linux Mint is. So we have various distributions like this. You can start off with one of these distributions mentioned here. You can either go for uh, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux or the Fedora or the Debian or the other uh, operating systems which are uh, based on them. Okay, so the CentOS here, it is based on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Okay, so uh, the RHEL, right, we call them RHEL. So they have the free version that, you know, they provide for uh, enterprise users are, is that of uh, CentOS. And uh, Fedora, again, for that matter of fact, you know, uh, they have uh, multiple distributions under them, under their name. And Debian are the people who are the founders of uh, Ubuntu, okay. So Ubuntu is a distribution that is based on Debian. And since Ubuntu is so popular, there are different versions of Ubuntu itself, right. There are other distributions like XUbuntu or Edubuntu all these things and uh, they are the other you know versions of ubuntu so that's about the uh, different uh, linux distributions and uh, you guys can probably you know if you're newcomers then i would suggest you to go for either ubuntu or centos like i said earlier all right great so let me go to the next slide then okay so now we are in this slide and uh, let's talk about the features of linux here so the linux features you know when we say features it's basically those compared to the other operating systems compared to uh, windows and compared to mac Okay, so compared to them, how does Linux perform and you know, what are the benefits with Linux? And uh, first of all, we have uh, this feature of, uh, you know, the updates being very easy to be performed. If you have any software in your uh, operating system or if it's the operating system itself, which you want to update, then it's really easy with Linux. It's uh, just going to be one command that you need to run and, you know, you can run that command from the terminal. Okay, for those guys who don't know what a terminal is, so let me just open my uh, Linux version and show you what a terminal is, okay? So this is my uh, CentOS version of Linux, all right? And then you have different options here, right? So the terminal that you see here, this is what I was talking about. So when you open the terminal, this is another window that opens. Okay, now this is the command line interface. So when I say command line interface, uh, this is where I can uh, put in my commands and I can get my uh, you know software or my kernel to listen to those commands and perform actions by creating a process for uh, those commands. So the whole benefit of uh, Linux is this CLI because the CLI is really helpful. If you're uh, going for Windows or something, you have a very good GUI, all right? So even in Linux, you have a GUI. So let me show you the GUI aspect. So similar to Windows, you can just uh, go to the computer and you can go to file system. You can open various other uh, folders and directories. So you have multiple directories and uh, folders here, right? So I mean, directories are basically folders. Folders is what you call in Windows and here you call them directories. So I can go into any of these, uh, you know directories and I can close them like this I can access any of these directories I can access any software or anything that's installed anywhere so Linux basically provides a GUI too okay but the thing with Linux is that you also have a terminal right this terminal is basically a command and interface where you can you know put in your uh, commands and you can get the software to behave the way you want to you can run certain commands you can install software you can run uh, programs, you can uh, run codes. So that's what the advantage with the uh, CLI is. And this is basically the reason why uh, it's very popular among all these software developers. Okay, so I told you earlier that software developers is a favorite tool, right, Linux. So that's because uh, Linux is uh, the free version of Unix and it's also you know possible to develop and create so many programs. So that's the thing with uh, Linux. So that's why it's so popular. So back in the slides, I told you that it was very easy to perform updates, right? So those updates can be, uh, you know, easily performed by just running a few commands here. You know, by uh, writing one single command, I can update a particular software. Supposing I have Java installed in my uh, system, then I can just write a command for updating that. I can just say sudo yum update and the uh, package name. If it's Java, I can just put the Java version. If it's uh, any other uh, language or if it's any other software, then I can put that software name over here and update the uh, application. So that's how simple and that's how easy, uh, you know, it is to update softwares over here. So I was uh, talking about uh, this aspect. So let me go back to the slides and talk about the other features. Okay, so that was how updates can be easily performed. And then another feature is that the software is free. You don't have to pay for uh, Linux. 
So because Windows, of course, you all know that Windows is paid. You can't, you know, have a pirated version. If you're caught having a pirated version, you will be uh, fined. Of course, uh, home, uh, you know, desktop users and home users don't really have that problem because there are no routine checks. But companies cannot use uh, the pirated version of Windows because if there are audits, they can come and seize the computers and put a heavy fine on the company. So that's what we say when the free software licensing is there in uh, Linux. Because you don't have to have any license, you can just uh, you know get all the folks in your company to work on Linux for free. So that's the free software licensing aspect. And then you have the access to source code, right? So when we say access to source code, I told you that back in the 70s, people could just collaborate together and develop the operating system. So that is what I'm talking about here. So the entire the source code for uh, running this OS, the basically the Ubuntu or the CentOS source code is available to you, and you can customize it. And you can uh, you know change it the way you want. You can make it behave the way you want to. And uh, if it's a really good feature that you've added, then you can also share your uh, discoveries and your uh, you know features with other people, with other uh, fellow developers. You can do all these things. So you have complete uh, you know access to the source code, and you have complete freedom with what your OS can do and how it behaves. But the same thing cannot be said for uh, Windows, right? So Windows, you cannot change it completely. You don't get access to the source code at all, and you can't change all the features the way you want to. Because that's a proprietary tool and uh, it's uh, programmed to behave in one way. And if you try changing too many things, then your uh, you know Windows will uh, report. So that's what is going to happen. So that's about the uh, access to source code feature. And then we have another feature that is uh, multiple distributions. So I spoke about uh, the different distributions in the previous slide. So the basic distributions are those of Red Hat, Debian, or Fedora. Right, so uh, you have various versions of them itself. You have uh, different uh, flavors in the Red Hat, and you have different uh, ones in the Debian. And again, Fedora has a lot of other distributions. Further, many distributions are based on uh, them. So you have uh, so many options, and if you don't like one of the distributions, then you can work on another distribution. Right. So if you don't like CentOS because uh, you know you don't get support for everything, then you can use Ubuntu. Okay, it is the most popular operating system, and it has support for almost every application and uh, every software. So you can use that. But if you're unhappy with the speed of Ubuntu, then you can probably switch to CentOS. So you have all that uh, flexibility, and all this flexibility without any cost. Okay, uh, no cost with respect to uh, energy or having to learn something new because all these are Linux. At the end of the day, the commands will be the same. Almost 98% of commands will be the same. There are just going to be minor uh, differences in the commands that will be executed in uh, the different uh, distributions. But yeah, 98% of them would be the same. You won't have a tough uh, transition time also. You'll have, uh, you know, you can gain so many benefits by using Linux. And the last, but not the least, right? So this feature is probably the highlight of uh, Linux. So it says better malware protection. So when we say better malware protection, we say that it's the ultimate. Okay. Uh, in Windows, if uh, you people uh, would have noticed that you need an antivirus because uh, it's prone to viruses and uh, attacks and bugs and all these things. So people can easily hack into your system, right? So the same thing cannot, uh, you know, happen with Linux. You don't need an antivirus at all. Linux is completely antivirus free. Okay, 100%. You don't need an antivirus. And in fact, you don't even have an antivirus. But of course, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's completely secure also. Uh, security is something that's really good, but it's still developing in Linux. But it's definitely better than Windows. Right? So you can be sure that no one's going to hack your system so easily. So that's what uh, Linux is all about. So, guys, that brings us to the uh, end of this slide of Linux features. Okay. And if you guys have uh, you know any doubts even now about Linux and how good Linux is, then uh, that should have been clarified and put to rest by now. Okay, so moving on. So uh, enough with the theory. Now let's straight away get started with our hands-on. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how to run commands and how to do various other things with the CentOS operating system. Okay, so first of all, the first part of this hands-on session is going to be about you know an introduction to the terminal and the various commands and the basic commands and how to browse through the uh, different uh, directories. Okay, so we use commands like pwd, clear, ls, and cd commands. Okay, now uh, let me go to my CentOS. Okay, in case I uh, forgot to mention it earlier, then guys, I'm using a VM here. Okay, so I'm running my Windows operating system on my uh, laptop and I have a virtual box installed. And in the virtual box, I've instantiated my uh, Linux virtual machine. Okay, so my Linux distribution here is uh, CentOS. Let me just show you another thing. Okay, so this is the virtual box that I was talking about. This is what I'm running in my Windows and uh, I have uh, you know multiple options. So I can choose any VM that I want to. So this is the virtual box and all these are uh, the different VMs that we have in my virtual box. 
so currently i'm running this vm called master okay and later on i'll be running on even this vm called slave now I'll be doing these two for uh, showing you how SSH works. So I told you in the agenda slide that I'll uh, you know uh, get two remote machines to access each other, right? So for that purpose, I need uh, these two VMs, and of course both are CentOS. And uh, yeah, as you can see, the information it says that a 32-bit CentOS system. I've called it uh, or named it Master, and this one is named it as uh, Slave. So similarly, I have the uh, Ubuntu uh, also. So the Ubuntu 64-bit is uh, this. So let me just uh, turn on the Ubuntu and show you how Ubuntu looks like. Okay, so let's just wait for some time. Okay, so let me just enter the password for the user. And uh, here we are. This is my Ubuntu uh, OS, right? So even this is being hosted on the same virtual box. So I uh, am kind of running two different virtual machines at the same time. Okay, so we have options uh, to browse the internet and uh, again open the terminal here. The terminal option is uh, right here in my Ubuntu operating system. Okay, so I just wanted to show you the uh, Ubuntu operating system. So let me just quickly turn it off and uh, go back to my uh, CentOS and start running a couple of uh, commands. Okay, so I was uh, showing you the uh, CentOS, right? So login. Okay. So this is my uh, terminal and uh, first of all the main difference that you people need to understand between Windows and Linux is that in Windows it was you know the storing uh, files or folders it was all in drives okay so we had a C drive we had a D drive we had uh, many more drives like that and we could store our uh, documents all in those folders okay but in Linux it's a little different from how uh, Windows works in Linux we have something called as the root directory okay so we have file system here, right? So basically whatever folders or documents or directories you have, everything can be accessed from the file system. When I clicked on uh, file system, then you would have noticed that I got a forward slash here, okay? So this forward slash basically means root, okay? This means I'm in the root directory, and in the root directory, every document and every uh, folder is present in this root directory, okay? Now, whether it is uh, me storing some kind of, uh, you know, important uh, files or uh, MP3s or videos, then everything can be accessed from the root. So, you can uh, think of this something like a tree hierarchical structure, okay? So, you have one root and all the other branches and all the uh, leaves and all those things. You can consider them to be the different directories and the files inside. So, they can all be accessed from the root. And if you want me to show you where, uh, one minute. Okay, so now this is your desktop, right? So you have the different icons here and each of these icons are for different operation. So you have uh, Edureka's home and then you have a terminal and you have an LMS. So this is a folder and this is a document. Okay, so readme is a document. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to browse to the desktop folder. So from uh, root directory, if you go to this uh, folder called uh, home, right? So under home directory, you have other option. You have Edureka and Uzi. Okay, so now if I go to the Edureka directory, then you have other options of uh, desktop documents downloads uh, music and all these things so if i go to desktop then in this directory you have the files and the different things that are present on my desktop so lms was a folder that was present readme this is a file that was present the terminal was present on my desktop so that is available here so eclipse ide is present here so all this was present on my desktop so i get the same thing accessed uh, from here and similarly if you're downloading something from the internet then that will get downloaded to uh, this folder the downloads folder right so you have a documents folder similarly you have a videos folder music folder so all these uh, files or folders will be stored in some place right so they will be stored in your uh, slash home slash edureka okay if you're downloading them and uh, if not if it's going to be softwares which you're going to install then you can install them in any other uh, directory here in fact most of the softwares that you install they'll be by default they'll get installed in this directory in the bin directory right so you have the bin directory you have the uh, lib directory which will have a list of all the different libraries that the uh, os would uh, use and then you have the sbin you have all these things right so they can all be accessed from here and uh, that's about accessing them from the GUI aspect. Okay, and the same thing can be done through the uh, terminal. Okay, now uh, let me go to my terminal and show you how that is done. So this is my uh, terminal. Okay, this is the command line interface where I can uh, put in my commands. And when those commands uh, are executed by the uh, kernel or by the shell, then uh, program will get uh, activated and some kind of uh, features will run. All right. Okay, guys. Uh, so. Before I get started, let me go back to my slides and show you what are the different basic commands that I want to run first of all, okay? So as you can see, it says Linux provides a CLI 
to communicate with the operating system right so that was a terminal that i showed you the cli is called the terminal and the cli is basically it's better for tasks which cannot be performed with the gui you know uh, i showed you the concept of uh, going to different directories and different folders right so it was a little tough i had to go to go through multiple directories so through the gui that's one kind of uh, you know drawback you'll have to spend a lot of time uh, navigating but uh, with the uh, cli it's easier it's just one command and you can access the directory that you want to and that's the advantage with uh, the cli okay and this is just one basic uh, example that i'm giving you there are many more advanced concepts and topics which uh, is not very easy to perform with the help of a gui so in those places you can just use the cli to perform those uh, tasks and the cli is also much faster in quite a few ways okay so that's the advantage with the cli and running the commands basically the first and foremost you have the pwd okay now this stands for print working directory okay and what it does is it displays the current working directory of the terminal okay and then there's this forward slash and i told you that the forward slash represents the root directory okay now let me go to the terminal and show you these two things so uh, right now we are in the home directory okay now uh, let me just uh, type it down let me just put pwd and when i put pwd it prints the current working directory okay the presently working directory so that is home slash edureka now uh, if i go to the uh, computer and uh, file system and home and inside this edureka then what you see here right so this is the folder that i'm accessing through my terminal because the present working directory is set to this folder okay now if i want to you know say i want to change the directory it means i want to change from this particular folder to a different folder so there are other options like desktop folder and documents folder right if i want to move to one of these folders then how will i do it using the terminal so i'm just going to show you how that is done i just want to minimize this a little bit yeah the command for that is cd space the name of the folder supposing i want to go to the desktop folder then i can just put d s k t o p all right and when i put enter then i'm inside this folder so earlier you had you saw this option right so this represents the directory i'm in okay i was in fact in the home directory and right now i'm in the desktop directory so desktop is uh, the directory inside home and if i want to you know list down the contents in the uh, desktop then i can run the ls command okay so when i put ls it basically lists down the different folders and the different files that are present in that directory okay so we have the eclipse we have lms which is a folder we have readme which is another uh, file we have all these things okay so let me just uh, go to the uh, desktop folder and show you the same okay we have the uh, terminal we have the lms which is a folder and similarly going back to the terminal if i want to enter this linux folder then i can again uh, you know just say cd and uh, space lms okay when i do this i'm inside this folder okay now if i put ls then i have the list of the folders or documents that are present in this L uh, lms folder okay so uh, ls is basically the command to list down the folders or files in that directory and yeah cd space the file name or the directory name would move you to that particular directory now that is the same thing that i have discussed in uh, this slide here also okay so i spoke about the uh, present working directory which displays the current uh, directory that your terminal is uh, in and then you have the root directory from where all your directories or folders are marked right so everything can be accessed from the root directory so that is this and then you have something called as the echo command you have the uh, su and the sudo commands okay uh, these are something a little advanced so before i show this let me show you the uh, clear command let me explain the clear command okay now getting back to my uh, terminal when i type clear the whole uh, cli is cleared right my terminal is cleared so whatever commands i ran previously those are not present anymore but what happens is those commands they don't get deleted or something they are just scrolled down so as you can see they are still present here so when i scroll down uh, what happens is uh, you know it just make sure that the other documents or the other uh, commands that are specified earlier those are all uh, hidden and i'm uh, showed something new so that's what uh, happens here okay so that is this now i told you that you know by giving cd you can go to the directory or the folder that's in the present working directory right but uh, how about uh, going back to the previous directory so basically from edureka folder to go to desktop we clicked on this and then we entered this folder right so from this directory by clicking on lms you go to a different directory right so you go in here but using the gui you can just click on the uh, cross mark here and you can exit that directory but how about you doing that with the help of the terminal how will you do it here so to do that we have the option called cd space two period marks period marks or full stop so that's what we call it right dot so if you have uh, two dots after cd this means you want to navigate to the previous directory 
So we are currently in the LMS and when I give enter I'm back to the desktop folder right the desktop directory now again if I uh, give the same command again then from a desktop I need to go back to this Edureka directory correct so there we go tilde symbol here it represents that we are in the uh, home directory okay so the uh, home directory is basically uh, I can also access the home directory by just giving uh, CD and enter okay that I can do it from any other directory so let's say I am just uh, doing an LS and I'm changing directory to uh, downloads okay D O W N L O A D S okay so just you gotta remember to give the exact name of the uh, folder or the directory that you want to travel to so only then it will work otherwise if you just give DOW it won't really work okay so after this uh, if you give enter then you go to the downloads uh, folder and uh, do we have anything inside downloads no we don't have any other folder or directory under downloads. so now let's try going to the uh, home directory from here straight away okay so I initially told you that by having two period uh, marks after uh, you know CD you go to the previous directory in that path right so instead of that if I uh, just give a CD okay and if I give enter then I'll straight away go to the home directory and this is with respect to uh, any directory no matter in uh, which directory I am in so if I just give CD then it will go to the home directory okay so that's what the benefit with the CD command is you can give CD to move to any directory okay so I have a question here from uh, Shashikant and Shashikant is asking me uh, should we have to do it CD and LS every time it seems a little complicated so Shashikant you don't need to really do that because uh, I was just about to get to that point okay if you want to go to a different uh, directory or a different folder you don't need to give CD and uh, LS every time okay so LS is basically only for you to uh, figure out or understand what are the different directories inside a particular directory okay so if I know the path then I can just feed it right away in one command and enter that directory now uh, let's say I am currently in the CD directory so this is uh, CD so this is my home directory okay now if I click on desktop and if I click on LMS and then you have another folder here okay you have HBase okay now supposing I want to go to any of these uh, directories from my terminal then I don't have to you know put CD three different times and uh, followed by LS and then go to those directories I can just uh, specify this thing in just one command so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say CD space or uh, since right now we are in the uh, home directory I need to give uh, desktop okay now one more thing which I want to uh, show you people is there is this option of a tab on your keyboard right when you give tab then the command here will be auto filled right the option will be auto filled so uh, let me explain that again so I'm just going to go back so in the uh, home directory right so you have uh, different options you have desktop and documents so what I'm going to show you is by clicking on uh, CD and space and then if I just type three or four characters of desk okay I want to go to this directory but I've just typed DSK okay now if I click on tab then the remaining uh, characters of that particular option is already uh, filled okay it gets auto filled so that is what the tab would do by clicking on tab it will get auto filled so similarly under desktop you have the option of LMS right so I'll just put L and if I press tab the remaining will get auto filled correct and inside the LMS you have different directories we saw that we have uh, HBase, we have Hive and all these things so let me go there and show you what are the different uh, directories that are there so we have HBase, Hive, MapReduce and Uzi okay now uh, let's go to the terminal again supposing I want to go to uh, Uzi directory okay now when I just click on capital O and if I click on tab then uh, it kind of auto fills the directory okay but in case let's take the example of Hive or HBase over here okay now since both start with H I'm gonna type H and if I click on tab that doesn't work okay it gives me further options of uh, HBase and Hive so that is because there are uh, more than one options for uh, you know starting with H right there are more than one folders or directories that start with H so that's why you're getting further options that's why it's not auto filling but if you see the second character here is uh, B and the second character here is I so if you either give B and now if you press tab then HBase is what is going to be picked up okay because uh, after uh, H and B there's only the only option is uh, of uh, HBase there's no other folder that has uh, HB as the first letters of the name so similarly if I just type IV and if I do tab then Hive gets out of it so things like that so uh, since our mission was to go to the HBase uh, directory I'm just gonna say HBase okay now inside uh, HBase I wanted to go to one of the directories in here so let's say we go to advanced HBase practicals okay now for that if you want to go there then you just got to give this okay so this is your complete path to access that particular folder 
and when I give enter, then I am in uh, the advanced headbase practicals module 9. Okay, so I'm in this uh, particular folder or this particular directory. So that is what you can do with the help of feeding a path after CD. So now if I want to go back to my home directory, I'm just going to click on CD and put enter. Okay, so uh, that is this. Now let me go back to my slides. I'm just going to close all these uh, folders. Okay, now going back to my slides, I showed you the print working directory command and I showed you the root directory and uh, I showed you the clear. Okay, so the echo and uh, the sudo commands are something that I did not show you, but I also spoke about the ls and the cd commands, right? So, what I'm going to do is uh, before I go into details of cd and ls, right, I'm going to just show you the echo command and the uh, sudo user, okay? Now, going back to my terminal, the echo command, right? So, what is uh, the echo command? So, uh, what is the echo command? Echo command is something that uh, writes its arguments to standard output. So, when we say arguments, it uh, means whatever we type after uh, echo, we'll type echo space and followed by that whatever we write. So, that will be specified to standard output. And when we say standard output, uh, it is the output that will be displayed by the uh, CLI. So, in your terminal, whatever output you get, so you'll get specified to that particular standard output. Okay, now let me show you a practical example. Only then you'll be able to understand that. So uh, let's just clear the screen. So another uh, shortcut to clear the screen is Control L. Okay. If not, you can just give the clear command like this. Okay. This will clear your screen. Otherwise, you can just uh, give Control plus L, which will again, uh, you know, just clear the screen. It's a keyboard shortcut. Okay. So I told you that uh, I was talking about the echo command. So when I say echo, and if I give enter, then there is nothing that is displayed. But if I uh, say echo and say hi, see what the output uh, came. So when we executed this command, this was the output that came back. It says hi, and uh, if I say echo hi, my name is uh, Vardhan. When I say this, then whatever uh, was specified as arguments, right? So this was basically specified as arguments to this command. So the argument is specified as uh, the output. This is the takeaway from the definition. So the definition was basically that whatever the argument is, that is uh, specified to standard output. So that's what it happens. So that's what uh, comes here. So this is one thing. And in fact, there's another uh, functionality also. Now, uh, we were all aware of the concept of uh, variables, right? So we can assign uh, some kind of value to a variable and we can also print that with the help of the echo command. Now, uh, let's say that we have a variable uh, x, okay? And uh, let's give it a value 100, okay? So now if I uh, just say echo dollar x, then the value that is stored in this variable, right? That be printed. Uh, because uh, echo is something that's just gonna print the uh, argument to standard output, okay? It will display the value that is present over here. So if it's just a string then that will be printed and if it's a variable that I'm specifying, then even that will be printed. So the difference between uh, the variable and uh, string is this dollar, okay? Now if I just give uh, echo dollar x, then I've uh, set the 100 value to x, right? So that 100 will be printed here. So like I told you, 100 is printed. But uh, the same thing, if I give echo x without the dollar, then see what's printed. It is x which is printed. So that is the difference between the string and a variable, okay? So you can, you know, have again a variable uh, called name or you can have a variable called uh, Vardhan and you can store the value of 10, okay? But if you want the value to be displayed, then you gotta append dollar before the variable name, okay? So that is about the echo command. And uh, in fact, there are a lot of advantages with uh, this command and I will uh, talk about the other features and the other places where this is used later during the session. But uh, till then, this kind of an introduction is uh, enough for now, okay? So going back to the uh, slides, what else do I have? Uh, okay, so we have the SU command, correct? So as it says, SU it is used to switch to the root user, okay? Uh, so that use super user permissions can be used to execute commands, all right? And then you have uh, su username uh, used to switch to a different user. And then you have uh, sudo command, which executes only that particular command with the root or super user privileges. Now these three, what they essentially mean is that you get more permissions. So if I go back to my terminal, so if you guys remember, then I logged into uh, CentOS with the Edureka user, right? So that is uh, displayed here also. So uh, it says uh, Edureka at localhost, right? So uh, this is the username of this account. And uh, similarly, you have something called as the root user, okay? This is my user and then you have the root user and what the root user uh, is, is the root user gives you a lot of uh, permission. So that's like the ultimate uh, super user of uh, this particular system, 
so basically if there is any folder that cannot be accessed uh, by my user okay my user name is uh, edureka and if i do not have the permissions to access that particular uh, directory or uh, that particular folder then we can use the root user because root has the ultimate privileges so any command that is executed with the root user then that will be executed okay so because root has all the privileges it has all the permissions so that's what uh, the root user is and uh, you know there are certain uh, functionalities which need the su user or the root users uh, permission and i will show you all those things later but for now what you need to understand is by just uh, giving su then uh, you can switch to the root user okay and uh, it asks for the password of course you got to know what is the password for your root user and when you give the password you will be logged in as a root user so you are not uh, edureka anymore okay and as you can see here you are root at the rate local host so this is the host name and this is my uh, username okay root so earlier you might have noticed that there was a dollar symbol okay but now it is a hash so this uh, basically this hashtag uh, represents that we are inside the root user and we are accessing the uh, you know executing commands as a root user so that's what it means and if you want to get out or exit the root user then you can just type exit and give enter so now you are back as yourself now you are going to be executing commands as a dreka user okay and uh, another thing that you can do is if you have multiple users okay and if you want to switch to one of the other users then you can also give the uh, su command and uh, go to switch to the user uh, supposing the username is uh, let's say abc is the username then i can just give su space abc okay now since i don't have any uh, user uh, uh, you know a user account called abc it will probably throw me an error or tell me that it does not exist okay but the point that you need to notice that if you have any user then you can uh, just switch to that user from the terminal by using the su command okay su space the name of the user account so again uh, later during the session there is a topic about uh, creating and uh, deleting user so at that time i will show you how you can switch to another user uh, from the terminal okay so let's park it for for later because uh, it's a little complicated if i uh, tell you that right now so uh, i think uh, i've covered pretty much uh, everything about uh, su and there's one other command called sudo okay so sudo basically lets you execute a particular command as a root user so when i give uh, sudo and ls then what happens is uh, this particular command ls command which will list down all the other directories or folders in the current working directory right so this will be executed as a root user okay so uh, similarly so earlier i executed the su command and i gave a password for that the difference between the two is that with the help of uh, sudo then only that particular command will be executed as a root user but uh, whereas with su then the entire set of commands after that will be executed as the root user as you will be logged in as a root user itself so let me just show it to you again so this was the ls command which i executed as a sudo user okay as a sudo user or as a root user but if i just uh, give su and if i give the password then i enter and i can uh, enter the same details okay i can put the same command ls as a root user so basically the kind of results i get will be the same okay but it's just the difference is that the uh, user that will be executing that particular command so i hope uh, this clears your doubt okay so i'm just going to say exit and uh, clear the screen and if i go back to my slides i'll just read out the definition so sudo basically executes only that particular command with the root or the super user privileges okay and uh, when you give sudo username you can switch to a different user and when you give uh, su you can switch to the root user so that's what uh, i showed you the differences between the three you first give su and then it'll ask you for the password you specify the password and then you'll be logged in as a root user and then you can execute your uh, commands you can execute any number of commands you want to and then you can exit that particular root access and then come come out of it and if you want to execute another command with the uh, root permission okay and if it's just one command which you want to execute then you can just uh, give uh, sudo and then you can put your command there right so i will uh, you know talk about these things later but uh, for now what you need to understand is the basics and these are the basics okay the pwd the echo the su commands because all these things come in handy when you uh, go to the advanced uh, concepts so going on to the next slide we have the ls uh, commands here okay i showed you one command that is what happens when you just put the ls command so now there are uh, different options that you can uh, use along with the ls right so basically ls uh, stands for uh, listing all the contents in the current working directory okay and uh, if i go back to my slides right now we are in the uh, home directory and if i give ls here it will list down all the directories that are uh, present in my home directory okay so let me just clear the screen and execute that again ls 
So uh, right now we have desktop, downloads and music. So these three are some folders. We have documents which is another folder. All these things are folders and these are documents. Okay, documents and files. So these are the uh, directories or folders. These are the documents or files. So this is what you get when you execute the ls command. Now if you go to the slides, then you will notice that you have certain options that you can type along with the ls. So when you say ls path, then you can uh, you know probably list down the list of contents that is there in that particular path. Okay, uh, let me go back to the uh, terminal. If I say ls and if I say the path where I want to uh, list down the contents. Okay, right now I might be in the home directory. Okay, but what if I want to list down the contents that are present in the uh, desktop directory? Then at that time I can use ls uh, path. So what I'll do is uh, I can just put desktop. Okay, and inside desktop, there are many other folders. If you remember, there was one folder called LMS. So if I put LMS, okay, this is the path, right? So I have given LS followed by the path desktop slash LMS. Now, if I give enter, then the uh, folders or the directories that will be present in this uh, particular directory or this folder will be displayed to me. That is the uh, HBase, Hive, MapReduce, Uzi, and Ping. So that is what LS and path does. Now, if you go to the slides, there are other options, right? So these options they can be also referred to as flags. So uh, there is a hyphen followed by one letter character. Okay, there's one character here that is L. There is a character called A. There's another set of characters here, author. So all these are called options or they're also called as flag. We refer to them as L flag or A flag or author flag, all these things. Okay, now if you give the L flag, what happens is it lists down all the contents similar to uh, just giving LS, but along with its owner settings, its uh, permissions and the timestamp. So when we say owner settings, permissions and timestamp, it is with respect to uh, the particular folder inside that directory. So let me show you an example of that. So by uh, giving ls, you have all the different folders that are present in this root directory. Okay, now if I give ls hyphen l, so the same directories or same documents are listed down here, but we have additional uh, options here, right? So we have additional information. So these are the set of permissions that a particular user has. We have uh, different, we have username and we have the host name, we have the memory size, we have the date, the timestamp and all these things followed by the name of the file. So if you see desktop, desktop is something uh, it was created on this day and this is the size of it and all these things. Okay, so this is called the long format. I will explain each of uh, these permissions and uh, what each of these stands for, what one stands for. What is uh, Edureka here and what is Edureka here? I'll explain the uh, all these things in some more time because uh, before I explain those things, there are other commands which I want to show with respect to LS, right? So in LS, other than uh, LS minus L, you have uh, LS minus A, you have LS author, okay? So uh, let's see what happens when we give the A flag. It should ideally show you the list of all the hidden contents in the specified directory, okay? And then if it's uh, if you're using the author flag, then it will list down all the contents in that directory along with its owner, correct? So let's try executing ls uh, hyphen a first. So when we give a, all the hidden directories also should be displayed. So as you can see, these were the other uh, folders which were not visible when I gave just ls because ls just shows the list of contents that are available in the GUI, right? So in the GUI, if you go to uh, and if you go to desktop, from the GUI aspect, you only get to see these, okay? So these are the regular files which are not hidden. But of course, there are going to be many hidden and those can be accessed by uh, the terminal by giving the ls minus a command. Okay, so that is what this uh, helped in doing. Now if I give ls and if I use the author flag now, see what happens. You have the author also. So instead of uh, having the username and the host name, here you have the author of that particular uh, document. So if this is the particular uh, folder or uh, file or a document, then who is the author for that? it is edureka because i am the user right so the author name will be present over here followed by the size and the timestamp it was uh, created and all these things and we get the list of contents for all the directories or folders which are present in uh, that particular uh, directory so that's what ls does okay so guys uh, that was about uh, the author flag and uh, in case we want to use a combination of uh, these flags then even that is possible so I showed you earlier that there is uh, this ls minus uh, l flag and then there is ls minus a flag, right? So minus a uh, displays all the hidden contents in that uh, directory. So let me use a combination of them. So let me say ls hyphen l and a. Since there are uh, two flags which I want to use, then I'm just going to use one hyphen symbol for uh, two different flags. 
So when I do this, then all the hidden uh, contents will also be displayed along with their extended long format. Okay, so uh, those are the different folders or directories which are present in uh, this uh, home directory of mine. Okay, so that is the combination of uh, ls minus l and ls uh, hyphen a. So we saw a combination. And uh, again, so similarly, if I instead of those flags, if I use the hyphen s flag, then it will sort that entire list by the size. Okay, and let me show you an example of that. So we use the ls minus l, right? Now, if I use s over here, it will sort this entire list of uh, directories with the size. The high, the the folder with the largest size will be on top, and the one with the smallest size will be at the bottom. So as you can see here, it was all jumbled. It was uh, th this is basically the size block, right? So this is basically for the size block. Here, if you see the previous time when I just uh, ran ls uh, hyphen la, then it was in a different order. But uh, since I ran ls uh, hyphen la and capital S, this has sorted the result in uh, as per the uh, size of the blocks of the folders. The folder with the highest size is displayed first, and the one with the lowest is displayed last. So that is about the ls uh, hyphen s. So there is one more command that I want to uh, show you, which can be executed with the help of the ls command. Okay. We executed the ls hyphen l a and uh, s flags, right? So we executed this one previously. Now, what if you want to uh, store these details? So whatever the output here was, if you want to store it into another file, how will you do that? We have uh, an option for that, okay? And that is uh, this symbol, greater than symbol, okay? It's called the direction flag, input output direction flag. And uh, by using this flag, whatever the result or the output of the command that comes, right? prior to this symbol those will be stored in the file that uh, precedes this symbol so let's say that you know i want to create a new file i'm going to create that okay i'm currently in the home directory right so let's not execute it here what i'm going to say is uh, let me first change directory to documents okay now in here of course uh, i don't think there are any uh, hidden documents either so there are no folders here so what i'm going to do is uh, ls minus l a s okay and i'm going to run the uh, this command at the home slash edureka directory okay i'm going to uh, basically run the same las so basically the same results i will run them by uh, specifying this uh, directory and i will be storing this file inside my new file okay now let me name that file uh, file1.txt okay now uh, the reason i moved to uh, this directory is because i can store the file in this directory okay uh, had i not uh, moved to this directory and had i just executed this uh, ls minus las followed by uh, this direction then what would have happened is it would have just created this new file in my uh, the home directory itself okay so if i give an enter here there's a new file that would have been created under my uh, documents directory okay now uh, when, when i ran ls inside documents there was no folder but now let's uh, run ls so now you can see that there's a new file that's created and that is called file1.txt now that is because i uh, used this uh, direction symbol nothing but the greater than uh, symbol and when i do this whatever result that gets generated from uh, this command right from these options on these flags those will be stored in a new file and uh, the file name needs to be specified over here Okay, so that was a wrong command that I used. It's not ls. So uh, what I need to do is let me just view that file. Okay, so to view this particular file or any file, we have to use the vi editor or we have to use a g edit editor or we can use the cat command. Okay, now the most common one is the vi editor. So let's uh, just execute the vi and open this file from here. Okay, and the reason that this ls dot file did not execute was because uh, it lists down the files, right? And this is a wrong usage. I did uh, a mistake by specifying ls and uh, by not giving a directory so i should have used vi instead so that's why that did not come but anyways uh, if i give vi and file name then that file opens right so the file which i created and this file has uh, the output that was displayed earlier okay so basically whatever was generated by the ls and uh, a flags of ls so that result instead of coming in the terminal it got stored in a different file okay now uh, let's just exit this vi file and explain the same thing so what you saw inside this file file1.txt the content is the same as uh, this one okay so we ran the same command ls uh, hyphen las but just that instead of getting the output in the terminal we gave a direction command over here to uh, save it in a different uh, file and we stored this file 
in the home slash edureka directory okay now supposing if i uh, want to store this uh, file in the same directory then even that can be done okay it's not a big deal so this is the command right so if i remove the path over here then what happens is whatever the output gets that gets generated from uh, this option and this command that will be stored in the file1.txt inside my uh, home directory okay if I'm inside the documents directory, right? So let me just go back one path. So right now I am inside the uh, home directory, right? So here if I execute that uh, command, okay, then a new file will be created with uh, the name file1.txt and it will have uh, the same details. So um, I've done that and uh, let's see what are the contents of that file, okay? So it's nice, right? So you can, uh, in this way, whatever uh, output that you have, that you can directly store it into another file so it's a very handy uh, command and a very handy option and I'll uh, talk about more such advantages like this later okay so for now I just wanted to show you how the direction uh, works so uh, getting back to my slides I think I've shown you how to work with uh, the ls uh, command and in the previous slide I showed you the basic commands with respect to uh, present working directory and uh, clear directory and the sudo and the echo commands so I've done with uh, ls also and uh, now I'm going to show you how to work with the CD directory. So some of the CD directories I showed you earlier also. I showed you how to switch to a new directory. So uh, when you type CD, it will just change the directory to the home directory. Okay. So the slash home slash edureka. Okay. Now that is my home directory. My home directory is uh, set to that path. So if I give CD, it will uh, go to that particular home directory. And uh, similarly, if I uh, you know give even CD and uh, space tilde symbol as you can see here then even this command will uh, change the directory to the home directory okay but however if you give uh, cd space uh, just slash this will change it to the root directory so it changes the current directory to the root directory that is because uh, the forward slash here it represents the root i uh, told you this a number of times earlier okay and if there's any other path or any other folder which you want to move to then you start from the root so you specify the absolute address right you start from the root, you say slash, and then you put the folder name. You again uh, say slash, and then you put the next folder name. So uh, it is similar to that. The first uh, forward slash represents the uh, root directory, and uh, the subsequent slashes are to differentiate between the different uh, parent and the uh, subdirectories. So that's what they are. So this will change you to the root directory, and then you have the uh, cd hyphen double period mark. Okay, two period symbols. And when you give uh, cd space uh, dot right if you give two dots cd space dot dot then it will change to parent directory so supposing i'm inside the uh, desktop directory so desktop's parent is uh, home directory right so it will change me to uh, the home directory but supposing if i was uh, inside let's say the uh, if i'm inside a directory called uh, directory c and if uh, c's parent was b then by running cd space dot dot from the c directory then it will switch me to the parent directory which is b so that's what uh, this does and then we have one more command here that is uh, cd within single quotation marks we have some kind of path now this is uh, useful at times when uh, your folder name or your uh, directory name has uh, two words okay so if you have two words then if you have a space in between then the space will be considered as an argument okay so terminal will consider that as an argument so if you want to switch to a document in that kind of a situation you know or if you want to switch to a directory which has a space or a document which has a space in the middle so in that kind of situation, you can use a single quotation mark or double quotation mark. Okay, so it's uh, you know you also have the comfort to uh, switch to double quotation marks. So I'll execute all these things and show you. Okay, so first I'll show you the uh, the CD tilde, then with the forward slash, then with the dot mark. This of course I showed you earlier also, and then I'll show you how to switch to another folder with you know which is having two different names with a space in the middle. So going back to my uh, root. So uh, right now we are inside the uh, home directory itself so if I give a CD hyphen desktop okay now in here we have my other directories and if I do CD and LMS I'm inside the LMS uh, directory okay now from here if I give CD and if I give use the tilde option right then it will switch me to the uh, root directory uh, so see this was the tilde symbol earlier okay so this tilde symbol represents a root and since i uh, said change directory to tilde symbol this which implies a root it uh, basically uh, decodes it as a change directory to the root directory so when i did that i have automatically switched to root directory while earlier it was lms so uh, similarly if you are in the uh, 
LMS directory and if you also just press CD right if you just give this command even this will switch you to the root directory so basically uh, CD and uh, CD space till day they are uh, both the same but uh, however if you give CD with forward slash then it will uh, switch you to the root directory so when I give enter as you can see I'm in the root directory so if I give LS over here I have a list of other directories which I showed you earlier. So in in your file system, right? So yeah. And so inside your file system, if you open this folder, then you have the root directory. So inside this directory, you have home and Eureka, and this is where desktop and documents are all present as a subdirectory of uh, this parent directory. Okay. So this is the root directory where everything is stored. So any document or any folder in your Linux operating system, they can be referred or they can be accessed from this root directory. Okay. Now uh, going back to the terminal, let me show you an example of that. I've already moved to the uh, root directory. Now let me say cd bin and uh, okay we have this. So now when I uh, gave cd space bin then it moved me to the bin folder inside my root directory. So uh, I ran the root directory, I did an ls which listed down the list of uh, folders inside my root directory. These were the options, uh, bin, boot, dev, these are all the different folders. And when I said change directory to bin, it uh, shifted me or it moved me to this particular folder, okay, inside the uh, root directory. So right now I am in the bin directory, and inside the bin directory, I ran the ls command, which basically uh, means listing down all the uh, contents, whether it's documents or whether it's uh, folders or directories, all those will be listed down, okay. So these are the list of all those uh, contents in the uh, bin directory, okay. Now that we are in bin, let me go back to my root directory by giving double dot. Okay, so from bin, it again I go back to my uh, uh, root directory. Okay, so this uh, forward slash represents root directory, like I told you earlier. And if I do ls, then I am back to this directory where uh, we have bin, boot, dev, and uh, etc, home, and all these things. So now what I'm going to do is, uh, so now that I'm in the root directory, now let me say change directory to home. And inside home, there is uh, Edureka. I want to go to Edureka. Inside Edureka, let's go to desktop. And then there is uh, LMS. Okay. And uh, in here, if I do LS, then these are the list of uh, folders here. Okay. Now I'm going to change directory to HBase. And if I do an LS over here, then you can see that there is one particular folder called Advanced HBase Practicals Module 9. Okay. If I now just say CD and if I put ADV space HBase then I will not be able to autofill the option okay that's because uh, the terminal or the CLI is not able to recognize this particular uh, command because there's a space over here okay so it treats ADV as a separate folder but since it's not able to find any folder here as ADV that is the uh, problem okay let me show you via the GUI what it looks like so we are in the desktop and inside LMS we have HBase inside HBase we have advanced HBase practical so this was what I was talking about this particular folder correct so let me minimize this for you okay now this is a classic situation of when you need to use the double quotation mark or single quotation mark okay now if I just uh, put the same name uh, like say ADV and uh, HBase then it kind of auto fills automatically right so even the quotation mark ends over here so that uh, indicates that this is another folder that's present so if I uh, you know just put enter then it will change my directory to this particular folder so that is what the uh, quotation mark does so when I do enter then I'm inside this folder when I do ls I have the list of uh, folders and directories inside this advanced headbase practicals folder all right guys so I'm just going to do a cd to my home directory and I'm here and that was about the different uh, cd commands that are available which I wanted to show you okay so let me just go back to my slides now and go to the next slide. I showed you all the uh, different commands here. Okay. So the next set of commands that I'm going to talk about are those of uh, cat, grep, sort, and pipe commands. Okay. So uh, let's first go to the next slide and start off with cat command. Okay. So when would we use the cat command? Guys, so it's pretty obvious, right, from uh, what it's written here. It says when you're working with files, that time you can use the cat command. So uh, the cat command, it is basically used to display the uh, content of the text files and uh, concatenate several files into one. So uh, what this means is if I have a particular, uh, 
you know, I have a text file. So earlier we created one text file having all the file permissions, right? So if I have that kind of a text file and if I want to uh, display the content of that text file, then I can use the cat command. I can say cat and if I give the file name, then that content will be displayed. So when I use only the cat command with uh, one file name, it's very similar to how the VI uh, command works or how the nano command works, right? So it will display the content in the terminal itself, correct? But the difference with cat command is that with cat, I can uh, list down the contents of multiple files. So it's not just one. Okay, I can uh, have, I can even display, I can specify uh, three different file names. And if I put enter, then the content of uh, all the three files will be displayed in my terminal. The same thing won't happen with VI. So if I say VI, then only that particular file's content will be displayed. So same thing with uh, nano, right? So uh, let me just go to the terminal and show you an example of uh, the cat command. So right now we are in the CD directory. Let me just maximize this. Okay, I'm gonna clear the screen. Present working directory is uh, the home slash Hedrega directory. This is the uh, home directory. And from here, let me go to uh, documents. Okay, if I do an ls, there is this file1.txt which I created earlier. Correct? So this was uh, where the different file permissions were present. Right? So if I do cat hyphen file name and if I give enter, then I get the list of uh, the contents of that particular file. So in that file, there are only uh, these three rows because this was the latest updated uh, permissions that I uh, specified in the file1.txt. Okay, so guys, I uh, earlier told you that you can enter uh, details to a file by uh, using the uh, direction command, right? So that was the greater than uh, symbol. So I'm gonna use that kind of a symbol over here and I'll uh, create a new file by adding details by using that command, okay? So initially it was, I uh, used the ls minus l, but this time I'll use the cat command itself and uh, say I'm gonna give the direction symbol here and when I've done with that let me give the name of the new file let's say file2.txt now when I hit enter the command is not executed completely okay so I'm inside this place where I can enter the text so it's basically gonna create a new uh, file okay now whatever text I enter here that will be stored inside this file so uh, let's say hi my name is uh, Vardhan and if I give enter, I can go to the next line and uh, here let's say welcome to Linux tutorial by Edureka. Okay. Now, if I want to, uh, you know, just add these two lines to this particular uh, file called file2.txt, then I can press control D now. Okay. By pressing control D, I come back to my uh, command line so what this command basically does is this cat command would have uh, created a new file file to txt and the uh, text that we entered below it right uh, this will be entered inside this text so if i do cat file to txt then whatever i typed earlier that got saved in this file now similarly if you see the uh, file one dot txt the contents are these okay so this is the contents of uh, this one and this is the content of uh, this file now uh, i told you that with the help of cat command you can uh, display the content of two different files so let me show you that option okay i'm going to say file1.txt and then i'm going to say file2.txt so in this way i'm going to basically display two files cat i'm going to display file1 and file2 when i go enter First, the file two contents will be displayed, and then the file two contents uh, or the lines in file two dot txt will be displayed, right? So first, these were the permissions that were there in the first file, and then uh, this was what was there in the second file. All right, guys. Now uh, this brings us to another important concept of how to append files. So CAT basically stands for concatenate, right? So that's the most important option. So if you want to uh, concatenate a particular file with you know some kind of lines, then I showed you how that is done by creating a new file. What I did was I, I created a new file, file2.txt, and I concatenated these lines into this particular file. file. So if I just give cat, and uh, if I give file1.txt, and if I give uh, double marks, okay, so double direction marks, which is uh, nothing but the greater than symbol, okay? We also call it direction marks. So if you uh, give file1.txt, and followed by this, if you give file2.txt, then what's gonna happen is, whatever contents are there in file one, those will get uh, appended or concatenated to this file2.txt, okay? So in my file2.txt, we have uh, these two lines, okay? Hi, my name is Vardhan and 
welcome to Linux tutorial by Edureka. And file one has uh, these three lines. So basically, when I uh, enter now, there will be uh, a file two in which there will be extra lines. Okay, so let me uh, do a cat file two dot txt. So as you can see, initially when I ran my uh, cat file two dot txt over here, I had only these two lines, right? But now after uh, using the bidirectional uh, symbol, okay, the direction uh, symbol, what has happened is I have three extra lines. So it says, uh, hi, my name is Vardhan. Welcome to Linux tutorial by Reka. After that, I have the permissions, which was present in the previous uh, file. Okay, so uh, that's what happens here. Okay, in fact, it's actually four other lines. Thanks for pointing that out, uh, Heyman. So Heyman, you know, who's another person in our section, he said that there are four lines in the file one .txt. Actually, he's correct. So total eight. So this is the uh, first line, and uh, these are the other three lines. Uh, so you can also see that from uh, here. Okay. So the first time when I ran cat file one dot txt, right? I first got total eight. This was the first line, and after that I got the permissions. Okay. So this is the first line, and then you have the uh, list of the other contents. So when we ran the ls minus l, the uh, total number of uh, entries were eight. So that was what uh, the total eight stands for. So these are the four lines that got appended to my uh, file two dot txt. Okay, but however, there wouldn't be any changes to my file one dot txt because I didn't make any changes there. So let me anyway show you that also. Uh, if you see here again, the contents here are the same. It's only that the file two has got these four lines extra. So that is what the direction symbol does. So these are the uh, advantages with the uh, cat command. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, let me go back to my slides and show you some more options. Okay. So we have uh, flags like we have the B flag, the N flag. S flag and E flag. Let's see what each of those stand for. Okay. So uh, when we use the B flag, it's going to add line numbers to the non-blank lines. Okay. So whichever line there is some text, so those lines are going to be numbered. Okay. And uh, when you say minus n, then it is used to add uh, line numbers to all lines. It doesn't matter if it's blank lines or non-blank lines. It's just going to add numbers everywhere. Line numbers. Okay. And when you give the S flag, it is uh, basically to squeeze all the blank lines. Supposing you have Three blank lines one after the other, then it will squeeze all those blank lines and it will reduce it. Okay, so that's what the S does. And then the E flag is uh, going to uh, show you a dollar at the end of uh, each line. So let me go back to my terminal and show you this uh, option. So, first of all, let's see the cat file 2.txt and uh, let me use the uh, flag minus n. So, this will list the number of lines, right? So there are basically four lines from file one and these were the uh, two lines that are earlier present. So these are the uh, six lines in total we have in this file two dot txt. Okay, let me just clear the screen because uh, it's a little uh, tough to see everything right. So yeah, so when I ran the minus n command the file two dot txt the lines in there were numbered. Okay, one to six uh, and then we have another uh, flag called minus b flag right M minus b flag will add numbers to also the uh, non blank lines. So, but for that we need to first uh, have blank lines over here. So what we'll do is uh, I'm going to do a cat and uh, do this and file 2.txt. So when I do this, I'll be adding uh, lines to this file 2.txt. Okay, I'll be appending lines over here. So let me just give one blank line, enter some random text, and then enter you know blank line and then random text. Okay. So this is what I'm going to just enter. Or append to my file to dot txt. Okay, you press Control D to exit this, and now these would have been saved to my file to dot txt. So let me just run the same command again. Oh, sorry, I should have ran this cat file to dot txt. Okay, when I do this, as you can see, uh, it starts from here, and these were the other lines that were appended. Okay, and now if I use the cat hyphen b flag, okay, see what happens. Only the non blank lines are uh, numbered, right? So these lines are not numbered. But if I use the minus n, which I used earlier, what it would do is it will number each and every line. So that's the difference between minus b and uh, the minus n flag. Okay, so n numbers all the lines irrespective of it being empty or not. But whereas uh, minus b numbers only lines which are uh, non blank. Okay, so that is uh, this one. And there is uh, another flag which is the uh, hyphen s flag okay so it's not capital s it is a uh, small s right so when i say minus s then you get the list of the documents so as you can see here all the uh, spaces are squeezed into one uh, seems like there were no multiple spaces right no multiple blank lines so what we'll do is let's edit the file 2.txt again okay 
or in fact, let me open it via the uh, editor, VI editor. Okay. So when I do this, these are the uh, existing ones. So when you uh, press insert or when you press I button or insert button, you can start entering text details inside uh, this file. Okay. Now, uh, right now I'm here. Let me add multiple blank lines here. Okay. So as you can see, there are around uh, three blank lines here. One, two, three, four. There are four blank lines, and here there are three blank lines. Okay. Now uh, let me press escape. Okay. Now if I give escape. Okay. So now we are in insert mode. So what I do is uh, I'm going to press escape, and then followed by that, if you give colon and uh, WQ, this would uh, save this file. Okay. So I've made changes, right? I've added lines here, so it would uh, save that uh, changes, and it would quit the VI editor mode. So if I give enter, so I'm outside that file. So now if you see the uh, cat file uh, 2.txt, then it has additional lines, right? So uh, now I'm going to run the command that I ran earlier, cat hyphen uh, flag s and then file name. So when I do this, all the uh, multiple blank lines are squeezed into one. So as you can see here, there, there have been multiple lines here when I ran the file 2.txt. But here when I ran the cat hyphen uh, with the s flag, then there are all these multiple uh, blank lines are squeezed into one. Okay, so that is uh, the uh, option with the cat command. Okay, so I think with that I think I've covered all the different option. Okay, there is one left. There is uh, the minus e option, right? So okay, now let me show you what that does. So when we use the capital E flag, okay, there is a dollar sign that is appended after every line. So uh, the first line is total eight, uh, or let's say the first line is this one. So there's a dollar sign here. And after this line, there's a dollar sign. After this, there's a dollar sign. And uh, since these are blank lines, you'll only find the dollar sign here. And uh, again, after this one, you have a dollar sign. And uh, you know, blank lines have dollar signs. And yeah, so that's how the uh, E flag works. Okay, so every uh, at the end of the line is uh, appended with the dollar symbol. Okay, so with this, I'm done with all the uh, cat commands. So going back to my slides now, let's go to the uh, next command that is grep. Okay. So uh, grep command working with grep command. So what does the grep command do? You guys have any idea? Okay, well I don't expect you people to, but uh, yeah. So if people, uh, if any of you know, if you have an introduction to Linux, then you can answer it. But it's fine if you don't, because I'm going to explain that it's my duty. And the grep command is basically used to search for a particular string or a word in a text file, right? We have a file document like the one which we created now. Like we we have two documents like file one dot txt and file two dot txt. And what if you want to search for a particular string, right, or a particular uh, word? So in this case, it's pretty simple because you, you can easily find them. But what if you want to do it to, uh, you know, a very big file document uh, which has like millions of lines, right? So supposing you have any document, then you'll have multiple lines, right? And if you want to find one particular word or if you want to go to one particular string, then how will you do it? So in Windows, you have the Control F option, right? But via a CLI, you can't use it, right? So via a CLI, you use the uh, grep command. Okay, and the format for executing the command is this. So you specify grep, and then you specify the string that you want to search for. So options is the string that I've searched in this command, and then the file name. Okay, and this will return the result of the matching string options. So similarly, if you use the i flag, then it will uh, return the results for even case insensitive strings. So basically, if you do not use the i flag, then it is uh, it's case sensitive, right? So it will only search for options with uh, these letters. But if uh, there is a word called options with a capital O where the first letter is capitalized, then uh, in that case, only when you use I will even that uh, particular result be uh, shown. Okay, so that is the advantage with the I flag. And then you have the N flag, which is the grep uh, hyphen N, which will again uh, return the matching strings along with that line number in which line was that string or that word found. So that's what N does. And when you give minus V flag, then what happens is uh, you will not be shown the list of lines where the results were present, but instead you will be shown the list of uh, lines where the results uh, were not found, where there was no matching string, right? So those lines will be printed with the help of V flag. And then with the C flag, it returns the number of lines in which the uh, results matched the search string. So supposing you have like four words, okay? You have a big document and uh, your word, your uh, string matched four times. Then, uh, if you use the minus C flag, then it will uh, display the number four instead of uh, displaying the search string. Okay, so let me go to the uh, VM. Let me go to my uh, CentOS and uh, show you how to execute these commands. 
okay so right now we are in the documents folder if I want to execute uh, that then we need to edit this in a different way okay we need to have a different text and this directory has uh, these documents right so let me just uh, quickly go to the uh, documents folder and here if I do an ls we have the two files which we created we have file 2.txt and file 1.txt so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to see what's there in file 1.txt okay so let me edit this file okay or let's say let's just create a new file what do you say we can create a new file by uh, doing this right by uh, giving the direction symbol followed by the uh, name of the file let's say automobiles automobiles this is the name of my uh, file automobiles.txt and I can start listing down the automobiles that I want so let's say car or let's say motorbikes okay we can say train well train is technically not an automobile but uh, still or let's uh, go into uh, details of the companies okay let's say Maruti let's say Ferrari Lamborghini these are some of the most famous uh, companies right so when it comes to bikes you have Yamaha then you have uh, Honda right you have uh, Suzuki you have Aprilia and uh, to name a few more we can add some more uh, companies like BMW we can add Audi we can add Volkswagen to this list okay now if I do a control D then uh, this will be the list of content in my uh, automobiles.txt okay uh, let me I'm gonna clear the screen now and if I do cat command here then it displays the list of uh, contents here right okay now let's use the grep command to search the content that is uh, present in this uh, text so uh, I'm gonna do a grep and uh, the string that I want to search for is uh, let's say am because in Lamborghini we have the search string am and even in Yamaha we have uh, the am right we are supposed to get two results for this so in this case so if I uh, just say grep am and if I specify the file name automobiles.txt and if I give enter then I get the two different words right the two uh, names where this was present where am was present okay now if I use the same thing with the uh, I flag then it will uh, display the list of uh, files in a case insensitive fashion but in my file there's no uppercase file I'm gonna say see automobiles.txt I'm gonna append I'm gonna append this word called amber okay so amber is another uh, automobile company and when I do this and if I run the cat command now okay you will see that along with uh, these names to there initially there is amber has been appended okay and this time when I search for am right so it should not uh, show me this because even though there is am here uh, the A is capital here but I'm searching for uh, small a so it should not show me this result okay I should get the same result that I got previously so if I uh, do a grip am like earlier I got the uh, Lamborghini and Yamaha as the only options okay but now if I uh, append this with minus I or the I flag so what happens is I'll get the option of even amber along with this because it would search for the string in a case insensitive fashion okay so this time as you can see amber is uh, added to this list because uh, it did not consider case insensitive uh, words letters okay so that is about the I flag and uh, there is another n flag right so let's see what the n flag does so every time you use the uh, minus n flag then it will list down the line in which the word was uh, present so that's what uh, I mentioned earlier so over here in line number six and line number seven we have Lamborghini and Yamaha right so the line number is mentioned okay now uh, so that's what the n flag does okay so we have the v flag and the c flag left so let's execute them and uh, see what happens so when I remove n and when I execute v as you can see all the uh, results except for Yamaha and for Lamborghini would be present here okay but if I give minus IV 
okay which indicates iv flag then even amber would not be present in the output i will get now okay when i give enter as you can see amber is not present because uh, amber is part of uh, the case insensitive option right when we included i this would be chosen as a search result and since it's considered as a search result we will display only the result uh, the set of results which were not found so the other lines in which text was not found were these and that's why we got these options okay now we have one more uh, flag which we need to see and that is the c flag and when you enter the uh, c flag then it displays the list of uh, the number of times that a string was found so am was uh, found two times in once in lamborghini and once in yamaha so that's why we got the answer as two now if i use c with the combination of i all right i'm going to get three that's because even amber will be considered in this case okay guys so uh, this is uh, what is uh, there with respect to the grep command i spoke about the uh, grep command okay and now in the next slide let me talk about the sort command okay and so we use the sort command to sort the results of a search either alphabetically or numerically all right and uh, we can sort either files or uh, file contents or directories so what this means is uh, whatever results you get right or uh, i mean not just results or even if uh, it's the list of uh, items that is present in a particular directory even when you run an ls command right you will have a list of uh, files and the list of folders that are there in that particular directory so we can sort even those things okay now that result can be sorted and uh, also we can sort anything else we can sort the contents of a file right we can sort the contents of the file or uh, you know all these things so that's what this means so uh, without wasting much time let me just uh, show you how that is done so you can give sort and the file that you want to uh, search alternatively you can also uh, search two files at the same time by giving uh, file1.txt and file2.txt okay so and the and the syntax for that is uh, sort and the file name okay when you say sort on the file name then the contents of this file will be uh, returned in the alphabetical order okay if you want to sort two files at the same time then you can uh, in arguments you can just give both the file names and it will uh, sort the contents for both file1.txt and file2.txt okay and again if you want to uh, display them in the reverse order then you can specify the r flag and uh, for case insensitive uh, sorting you can do the hyphen f flag and then if you want to sort the results based on the number in a numerical order then you can uh, use the n flag okay guys so uh, let me first of all go to my terminal and start executing them okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to clear my screen and currently let me just list on the contents of this directory so we have automobiles uh, file we have file 1 and we have file 2 when i just give a sort and press enter then i enter the interactive mode okay so here i can uh, type all this i can type random words okay i can say uh, a b c d or i can say b c d a or i can say e f e d f g all these things okay and then when i press control d it gets me out of the interactive mode and when i exit the interactive mode the text that i typed in right the input that has been sorted so this uh, up till this line was what i entered as input if you remember and uh, up till e d f g right so basically this uh, text has been ordered as per alphabetical order and since a uh, comes first in alphabetical uh, chronology this, this is first the b c d a is second and then you have the other lines okay uh, these have been sorted in an alphabetical uh, order now if i give sort with the file name okay that is uh, automobiles.txt and if i give enter then this particular uh, file will be ordered in the alphabetical order okay the contents will be uh, listed down in an alphabetical order uh, let me clear the screen and show that again so let me first just do a cat and show you how the order is okay now let me run the sort with the file name okay so now if you see it was in this order initially right so car was the first option motorbike was the second train was the next maruti and then came ferrari and lamborghini but uh, if you look at the sorted uh, result then it's, it's in the sorted manner right so first comes amber then comes aprilia then comes audi and then the others so that's what sorting does okay and the same thing can be done for two different files at the same time so this was the automobiles.txt supposing i want to list down even my uh, file 2 contents then i can just type file 
2.txt here and uh, the results of both the files will be in my uh, terminal okay but before that let me just uh, clear the screen so that will be easier for you to view the results okay so now that i've cleared the screen let me uh, sort these two files okay so let's the command is sort and this is what i had previously and let me add file 2 to it okay file 2.txt now what this would do is the results of both these files right automobiles and uh, file 2 the results of those would be sorted in the alphabetical manner okay now if i give an enter as you can see here first initially you have blank space okay now uh, that is because blanks are ahead of the capital a right this is the alphabetical order correct so first comes blank space then comes uh, white space and then comes the characters so once we are done with those things then we have uh, amber aprilia audi this was the order in which uh, the files were listed in the automobiles and uh, right after c d comes okay now this line is part of the file one well, these are part of uh, automobiles. This was part of file 2.txt. So yeah, these results were uh, a part of the automobiles.txt file. The blank lines here, these were part of the file 2.txt. And uh, again, uh, these two lines, right? These were part of file 2.txt. Okay, so this is what happens when you give two files as uh, arguments. Now, uh, there are other options that I want to show you though. So uh, there were flags like R flag, right? So R flag lists the uh, results in the reverse order. Okay, I'm just gonna clear the screen. And yeah, for clearing the screen, the, the shortcut is Control L. All right, guys. So uh, let's say sort automobiles dot txt. Okay, it's cat, right? I don't want to do cat. I want to do sort automobiles dot txt, and I want to use the flag minus R. So when you use minus R, it will display the result in the reverse order so we have the reverse order in which Yamaha comes first and uh, amber comes last so that is the uh, reverse order and we have another flag here the other flag is uh, the F flag which will return the results in uh, the case insensitive uh, fashion okay so that is the uh, minus F and then if you go back to the slides there is uh, N option right so N will return the results in the numerical order now let me go to my uh, terminal and let me use the n flag now but of course i don't think it will uh, sort anything because there are no numericals here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, use the file 2.txt here okay file 2.txt okay so there are no numericals here either what i can do is i can edit these details so let me go vi and uh, say file 2.txt and I'm going to enter the insert mode. I'm going to remove all these uh, unwanted lines. Okay, so I've removed all the blank lines. Now I'm going to put one here. I'm going to put two here. I'm going to add three to this line. I'm going to add four to this line. Okay, all right, guys. Or right, let's say let's give the order seven here. Okay, you have two here. Okay, so there are some kind of uh, numericals ahead of, uh, you know, in before every line starts, right? So when we run the minus n command now, the sort command with the n flag now, then it would sort these lines with respect to the lines with the numerical order. Okay, so first this line would be uh, shown the blank line. Okay, then you would be shown the, uh, uh, you know, the total line. Then you would be shown the third line and like that. So let me just uh, escape colon and save and quit. Okay, now let me uh, run that same sort command sort hyphen n file 2.txt. So, as you can see, the uh, alphabets are first sorted. Okay, so the lines where there are uh, text characters or alphabetical letters, so those are displayed, and after that, the lines that are formatted after that are in numerological uh, fashion. Okay, so uh, if I don't give the n, it would be a different uh, fashion altogether. So earlier uh, the file was just uh, displayed in the regular numerological order okay so where one two three four five the numbers came first and then came the text but since we ran the hyphen and the uh, alphabetical uh, letters or the characters came first okay after that it was sorted by uh, numerical letters so that's what the n flag does and, and that brings us to the end of the sort commands okay so uh, after the sort command the next one that we have in line is that of pipe command okay so this is uh, referred to as the pipe so you will find this in your uh, 
in your keyboards right above the enter button okay uh, where you have the backward slash so in that button if you press uh, shift and if you press that button you will get this pipe command and what the pipe command helps you does is it uh, lets you perform two operations in the same command like it will uh, let me search let's take the example that's specified here okay we are using the grep to search for a particular string from a file and uh, we are using that and then we are sorting that result okay so since there are two operations involved okay one is the sort and one is the uh, search since there are two operations involved in the same command we separate the two operations with the help of the pipe command so that's what uh, this is and uh, as the definition says the pipe command is used to output the result of one command as input to another command okay the same thing can be said over here also so we'll first search the file for a particular string and whatever result you get that will be given as input to the sort command over here right so this uh, saves us time in uh, not having to mention the uh, file name after sort again so uh, we'll just be performing one grep search and then we'll just uh, whatever result comes that result will go to the operation that's performed over here right so uh, let me just go to the terminal and show you an example of this i'm going to clear the screen and uh, let's run the grep command to search for am from the automobiles.txt okay i'm going to use the pipe command and uh, sort this so these were the two results right so when you do a cat command or when you do when you just run the grep command uh, with am right so what would happen is you'll get these two results because these two lines or these two words have the am characters inside right now when you give the sort it would sort it alphabetically right and if i if i want to sort it in the other way then i can just run the same command with the r flag so when i uh, do r then this result will be sorted in the reverse fashion so yamaha comes first and lamborghini comes first so that's how the uh, pipe command can be used to get the output from uh, one operation and feed that output as the input to the uh, next operation right so uh, this is relatively a smaller topic okay and we quite often we'd be using uh, the pipe command when you want to use multiple uh, operations in the same command so that's about the pipe command okay so let me just clear the screen and get back to my presentation and see what's my next slide all about okay so now that i've uh, shown you how to sort the contents of the file let's go to the next uh, slide right so the next section of uh, this linux tutorial is going to be about the copy move make directory remove remove directory and the user permissions all right so let's get started with this section okay uh, cp stands for copy and that will be the first slide uh, that we're going to talk about okay so as you know uh, copy is basically used to copy files or directories okay and the point note is files and directories so in windows you have the option of uh, right clicking on any uh, file or any folder and uh, you know saying copy or copy paste or cut paste right that's in windows and uh, you can do that even through the gui in linux but how will you do it through the cli right through the terminal you specify this command you specify cp and if you have any flag you enter the flag and then you specify the source and the destination okay so the source is uh, basically this will be the path of the, the folder that you want to copy and this is the place where you want to copy it to all right so uh, let's uh, get back to executing and showing you a demonstration of this so i'm going to go back to my terminal so uh, first of all uh, we are in the documents directory and let's see what is there in this directory okay there are the three files that we created right there is automobiles.txt there is uh, file1.txt and file2.txt now uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy the automobiles.txt and uh, paste it in my uh, desktop okay so let me just minimize this so this is my desktop right so right now i don't have the automobiles.txt but through the terminal i want to run a command which will copy the uh, automobiles.txt to this folder okay so i'm just going to minimize the terminal now uh, to show you that it happens okay in real time so what i'm going to do is uh, ls and i'm going to say copy automobiles.txt this is the source and the destination is uh, root home Edureka and uh, in Edureka it's the desktop folder right when I hit enter there will be a new automobiles.txt file that will be created over here so as you can see the new file got created over here and uh, yeah so it's, it's a very simple command that you can uh, execute so you can do the same thing to even uh, directories and uh, files all right uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'll uh, go to the home directory and from the home directory I'm going to go to the desktop directory and copy the LMS folder, 
right? So the LMS folder is again, uh, you know, it's it's a folder this time. It's not a file. So last time we copied a file. This time I want to show you how to copy the folder itself. Okay, I'm going to copy this folder and paste it somewhere else. So let me go to the terminal, CD, and I'm going to go to the desktop here. All right. So we have uh, LMS here. So I'm going to say copy LMS. All right. So uh, I'm going to remove the slash from here because I'm going to copy this uh, folder now. And uh, this would make it the source. That would make LMS the source. And the destination is, uh, we have to put the absolute path here, right? So we got to start from the root directory and go to home, add Reka. And uh, let's say I want to put it in the uh, documents directory. Okay. So something that is present uh, in the desktop directory that is uh, being copied and pasted inside the documents directory. Okay, so when we give enter. So uh, guys, uh, we are getting an error here, right? So it says uh, copy CP omitting directory LMS. Can you all guess why that is the case? Can you all like understand the meaning of this error omitting directory? Don't break your sweat too much because uh, the meaning is simple here. It just it has just omitted the directory. Okay, now the reason is so that is because uh, the CP command it by default it copies only files. Okay, if you want to copy directories also, then you got to uh, add another flag called R flag. So let me just quickly go to the slides and show you uh, the functionality there. Okay, as you can see here, uh, we have the R flag, right? So CP minus R, it is for recursive copy, and that is for copying directories also. Okay, and it copies also hidden files. If there are any hidden files or if you have directories which you want to copy inside that directory then it will uh, it will copy that that itself so that is the thing because you cannot copy uh, directories without the r flag you can only copy files so that is the uh, meaning here and uh, we have another flag here called the v flag and that is verbose well what verbose means is it prints informative messages supposing you are uh, executing a command okay and supposing the command is going to take time like it's going to take a good 5 10 seconds then during that time it would uh, print the status of the system like supposing it has completed like step 1 to step 3 okay and it's uh, stuck at step 4 then it would print that message and as and when step 4 is completed you will get a message uh, saying that's completed and yeah similarly it's like progress wise it uh, tells you what is the progress and what are the uh, action that the system is taking and what step it's performing so it just prints such informative messages minus v okay okay let's uh, first start off with the i flag okay so we have something called as the cp flag i okay so when you give the i flag it enters the interactive mode so when you say interactive mode it is because uh, at times you might have uh, files which will all be already be present in in a particular directory okay uh, you saw me copy automobiles.txt once from documents to desktop okay now if i do the same operation again if i run the same command again at that time it will uh, automatically overwrite the file right because uh, the file name is the same the automobiles.txt was the one that is there in my documents folder and again, even over here on my desktop, it is documents. Uh, sorry, it's automobiles. When I copy them, what would happen is that file would be replaced. Okay, now uh, in that kind of a situation, uh, when you're copying multiple files, you might want to be notified before something happens, right? So if you specify something like the I flag, then you will get an interactive mode. So the system will not take a decision on its own, but instead it will not use any defaults. Okay, that's what we mean uh, by uh, on its own. Okay, so it would uh, you know ask you, it would prompt you for an answer it will tell you that okay this file already exists in this directory and uh, do you want to replace it and then it will give you an option y or n y stands for s n stands for no so that's what the cp and i flag does and uh, when you give the n flag it will not overwrite the file okay because by default it overrides the file and uh, if you specify the n flag it will not overwrite the file but the whole concept here is it is based on the file name what if the file name is the same and the file contents are different okay at that situation you might want something like the flag u okay now what the flag u does is it will update the destination file only when the source file is different from the destination file so by using the n flag you will make sure that the file is not overwritten okay but then if you use the u flag you will have another benefit okay what will happen when you use the u flag is so first it would check the file name if the file names are different then it would create a new file if in case uh, there is uh, another file by the same name then it would check the contents of that file if the contents of uh, that file and the file that's being copied if they are the same then it would, it would not get copied and it would only get copied when the content is different so at that time you'll have uh, two different files with the same name so that's the advantage with the uh, cp and u flag okay so let's try executing uh, these options 
all right so i'm just going to go back to my terminal here so first and foremost let's execute the uh, r flag okay it's capital r so do note that and uh, when you say enter so the item is copied so if you go back to your uh, documents folder you can see that there's a new folder called elements that's been created so this was initially not present and it's uh, present now okay now uh, what we'll do is i'll delete this okay i'm going to minimize this execute the same command along with the verbose flag all right so as you can see the uh, status of the system was also displayed in the meanwhile even though i entered my uh, text somewhere here yep it's right here correct so this was the earlier uh, command that i executed without the verbose okay here it just straight away copied the file okay the lms uh, uh, sorry the lms uh, folder to my uh, documents folder but when i gave v the informative message also came right so it uh, the step by step process of what all is being copied came so first uh, this was the first folder being copied this was the first sub folder being copied and after that all the other files that are being copied each and every document step by step it is all listed down and uh, you'll get all those details here if you give minus v in your command so that's what the minus v does okay so i'm left to show you the uh, i n and uh, u flags right so what i'm going to do is uh, let's say i just want to clear the screen now okay i'm going to remove this command here and go back to the documents folder and show you that the lms has been copied okay with the verbos when i created this folder okay now uh, what i wanted to show you is i wanted to show you copy with the interactive mode so earlier if you see the uh, desktop there is already an automobiles.txt right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy automobiles.txt i'm going to copy this one again to the desktop at this time it should uh, you know i'm going to use an i flag and it will not overwrite the existing flag so now i'm going to say cp automobiles.txt to destination is uh, home slash edureka slash all right uh, i think i'm in the wrong directory right now okay so i need to go one uh, path back switch to documents all right now here i need to copy the automobiles from here right and uh, put it in the desktop so home slash edureka slash desktop okay so i'm gonna copy the automobiles or txt over here so when i give enter the automobiles or txt has been copied here again so let me just go back to my desktop and see that even though i've run run this command two times one now one uh, one earlier and one uh, now just a couple of seconds back there has been no duplicate that's been created that's because this file has been overwritten okay with the one with the name automobiles has been overwritten with the latest command so what i'm going to show you now is i'm going to use an i flag here like i told you i flag is uh, what gets you into interactive mode so you will start interacting with the uh, linux uh, kernel or the linux shell over here so as it says the uh, home edureka desktop automobile.txt it says overwrite do you want to overwrite this particular uh, file because it's already present if you want to overwrite if you say why and if you enter then the file would be overwritten okay but if you uh, give n and enter then that file would not be overwritten so if i say no and if i enter then uh, that copy would have failed okay but if i do the same thing again and if i press y it would have uh, overwritten the file would have been overwritten so that is uh, what the i flag is and then you have another option okay of uh, the n flag so the n flag what it does is it does not overwrite the file by default so for that option i told you that uh, by default it overwrites right so i also showed you earlier that uh, no duplicate was created and the existing file was overwritten supposing you don't want to do that then you can just use the n flag which would uh, automatically indicate and tell the uh, linux uh, runtime engine that uh, not to overwrite this particular file okay so you can have any number of files there so even if uh, the contents are different here okay so even in case uh, the new file that's being copied has a different content okay but it has the same name then even in that case by specifying the n file it will not be overwritten because there's a good chance that you might have made changes to the latest file and by copying another file with the same name to that same directory then there's a good chance that you'll be losing out on the changes that you made right so at uh, that time you can uh, use the n flag so in fact let me show you that with an example uh, what i'm going to do is uh, right now we are in the documents directory so i'm going to do a cat and uh, automobiles okay so these are the contents here and uh, let me update this okay 
what I'm going to add is I'm going to add another uh, company of another uh, bike. Okay. Uh, let's say we are adding KTM to that list. Okay. So when I do control D and exit the interactive mode and if I do cat automobiles txt then KTM would be added over here. Okay. Now this uh, automobiles file in the documents right now this is the updated one. Okay. But in the desktop the updated file is not present. Okay. In the desktop the file with only uh, this much of content is there. Now I'm going to execute the command with the end flag. Okay. So with the end flag it's basically indicating that you're not supposed to overwrite the file. Okay. So when it says that when it finds out that automobiles.txt is present over there also in the desktop also it would uh, not copy the file at all. Okay. So when I give enter and uh, of course so there's nothing here. Now if I go to the uh, desktop okay if I click on automobiles.txt here you can see that I'm, uh, KTM is not present. All right. But however when I close it and if I uh, remove the end flag right if I remove this flag and execute it and if I go back to the automobiles or TXT, you'll find that KTM is updated. Awesome, right? So that's the power of this end flag. Okay. So that is uh, the end of uh, all the different flags that I was about to show you from my PPT. Okay. So additionally, there is one other uh, thing that I want to show you. Okay. Now I showed you how to copy from source to destination. Okay. And now, you know, what if you know the path of something and you want to copy it to your present directory? To where you are currently. So this is basically I'm just teaching you this uh, option to you know save some time. Uh, you know at times you might want some uh, shortcuts or some hacks, right? You don't want to provide the complete path everywhere. So at that situations, at that scenarios, you can uh, use this uh, hack. And let me explain that before I uh, execute it in my uh, terminal. So what I'm saying is, uh, right now I'm in my desktop and uh, I have only my automobiles and my README text files. Okay. Now, but in my documents folder. I have uh, three other texts. I have file one dot txt and file two dot txt. Okay. Uh, let's say I just want to copy the file two dot txt. What will I do if I want to copy my file two dot txt into my uh, desktop? I'll have to go to my uh, documents folder, then put the cp command, and then enter the file name, and then copy it to this folder, right? I have to specify the path of this desktop. So instead of that, there is another hack over there. Okay. Now instead of doing that, what I can do is I can just go to my terminal. I need to first go to the desktop folder button. Okay. So I'm going to go one step back. I'm going to say change to desktop. And here, yes, there is only automobiles.txt and there is uh, readme.txt. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the cp command such that I copy file from this particular directory to the current directory. Okay. So the file 2.txt, if you remember, that is present in my documents directory, right? So I'm going to specify the path to the documents directory. And the path to the documents directory is slash uh, home edureka and documents okay and the file name is uh, file 2.txt okay i'm going to copy this file which is under this path to my current directory okay instead of uh, having to specify my complete current directory i can just give one dot so this uh, one dot represents the current working directory okay i'm currently in my desktop and uh, what this command would do is it would copy this file into this uh, current directory. Okay. Now, when I give enter, and if I go back to my uh, desktop, you'll see that the file 2.txt has been created. Okay. That's because it, it went to this path, picked up this file, and pasted it in my uh, current directory. Okay. So that's what this is about. All right. So this is what I wanted to show you guys. This was something additional uh, which was not there on the slides. So I'm uh, done with that. So moving on to the next slide. Okay. So uh, next up we have uh, is the move command. Okay. So the MV like CP stands for copy the MV here stands for move. Okay. And this is uh, used at times when you want to cut paste something. Okay. Uh, this would when we used copy then the original copy of that file was also present in the existing directory and it was created in another directory. Right. But if you use the uh, MV command then it's uh, going to basically work like cut paste where it will remove the content from the uh, source directory and the only copy would be present in the destination directory. All right. So uh, let me straight away get started. It's not too much of an explanation needed over here because uh, it's self explanatory. If you use the I flag, it basically enters into interactive mode again, like before. So the U flag is again the same as uh, what it was in the copy command. It updates the destination file only when the source file is uh, different from the destination file. And uh, the MV minus V, again, it would, uh, you know, uh, move, it would print the system state. Okay. Prints the source and the destination files. Uh, gets into the interactive mode where the okay not interactive mode it basically means uh, 
the system status will be displayed over here. Okay, that's what the verbo is, is all about. Uh, so let me go back to my terminal and uh, show you how this copy is done. All right. So let me clear the screen. And currently, I'm in my uh, desktop folder. Okay. And here I have uh, these files. I have automobiles or txt and readme and file two. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to use the move command to move file two dot txt to another uh, destination. I'm going to move it to the LMS, right? So when I give uh, LMS, okay, this means that this move command will work such that this file will be moved to LMS folder. Okay, let me give enter and go back to my desktop and find that it's not it's missing. That's because I ran a command over there. If I go to LMS, however, I'll find the file to txt over here. All right, awesome, right? So that's what uh, the MV file does. And uh, supposing I want to uh, you know similar to copy uh, you can move multiple uh, files at the same time all right so i can uh, move you know supposing uh, i go back to my desktop okay and i'll find that there is automobiles and readme suppose i want to move both of these to the uh, elements directory then i can do that also i can just uh, simply give move i can give uh, automobiles or txt and readme.txt and specify the destination I can move to any other folder or I can move to LMS folder. If I'm moving it to LMS folder, then I just need to give LMS. Okay. But however, if I'm moving uh, to another uh, folder, then I got to start from the root, say home, uh, Ed Raker, and from your, let's say I want to go to downloads. Okay. So downloads, if I want to go, I'll give this path, I'll give enter. And if you notice, both are missing from my uh, desktop. And if I go to my Ed Raker, and if I go to downloads, I can find the two files over here. So that's how simple it is guys. So that's the uh, move command and if you want to see the uh, system status then you can use the V flag like we use for CP. So a similar log will be generated and shown. If you want to enter interactive mode then you can use the I flag. Right. If you're moving like two files right at that time you might need the interactive uh, interactive file. So similar to a copy where if you are uh, moving to the destinations folder where there's an already another file with the same name then at that time you might want to uh, use the i flag it would ask you whether you want to override it or not if you don't want to override it at all then you can just give the n flag but there again if you don't want to use the uh, n flag either then you can uh, use the minus u flag which would update the destination file only when the source and the destination files are different okay so these are the uh, different flags that can be used with mb so the basically the flags that can be used here are the same as the flags that can be used with the copy command so guys uh, that's it with the uh, move command and we can go to the next slide okay we can go to the next topic but before that there is uh, one more functionality that i want to show you with respect to both copy and move i uh, actually forgot to show you this aspect okay now uh, for this let me first show you the gui aspect okay all right i go to my editor and if you go to my documents you'll find all these uh, three text files and also my lms folder right now whether be it copy or whether be it uh, move Commands I've showed you how to copy like one file or two files or three files, okay? But what if we have like 25 files, right? So what you have like, I mean, just think about this. What if you're a proper uh, Linux user and you and you want to just transfer all your uh, files of some particular format, right? You want to just transfer it to another folder. You want to take a backup or something like that. What would you do? Instead of you know, you can do a Control A over here and choose all the files, okay? Or you can choose one after the other like this. But to the CLI, how will you do it? Correct. So you have such problems, right? So for that, you know, we have uh, options also for CLI and uh, those work with both CP and the move commands. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how that is done. Uh, so for that purpose, I'm going to first go to my documents directory. I want to make that my uh, PWD. So I'll just go on back and here I am. Go to documents. Okay. Now I'm here. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to clear the screen. So of course for clearing the screen the shortcut is uh, control L okay if you guys have forgotten that and uh, I also mentioned that earlier so control L is the shortcut for that uh, so yeah we have automobiles.txt file 1 and file 2 and LMS so we have these four files and uh, one folder there okay now if I want to move this one of the directory then there's another option so what I can do is I can use something called as regular expressions okay uh, regular expressions is one topic which I'm going to cover in detail later during the session but just because we're in the CP or in the move commands uh, stage of this uh, demonstration I want to continue and I want to show you this also okay I want to just get finished with this part 
So you will get an idea of uh, what I'm saying when you see me do this. Uh, so here we have these four uh, files. So first let's use the copy command. So if I want to copy all the files which are in the form of a file, okay? So they are all in the .txt format, right? So what I can do is I can uh, just do a cb. I can uh, click on dot or rather asterisk dot txt. Okay. Now what this essentially does is instead of uh, searching for the text file by its name, when you specify an asterisk, it searches for all the files with the dot uh, txt. Okay, which is ending with a dot txt. So that's what this would do. And when we say cp followed by uh, asterisk dot txt, it means copy all the files that are ending with dot txt. So in our case, we have automobiles dot txt file one dot txt and uh, file two dot txt right so what this command would do is it would copy these things and put it in the path where i suggest here so let's say i want to put it in another folder okay let me start off from the root home edureka then here i think we have you know we have these options right okay this is the documents so in the edureka we have okay we have the music folder we have downloads pictures okay downloads of course i've already copied something in there so what i'll do is i'll move that to the music folder Okay, so the music directory. So I'm going to say this and give enter. So your copying has been uh, successful. So if you go back to the uh, music directory, you'll see that there are three new files. One is automobiles, the other one is file one, and the other one is file two. Okay, now uh, the same thing can be done for even move, right? Uh, the same way we executed a copy, we can also execute the move command. Move is going to completely move it, it's more like cut pasting. Okay, similar to how uh, you remember from Windows. Let's move it to pictures. Okay, so currently in pictures is nothing and in uh, music we have these three. So when I execute the move command, this folder should become empty and they should uh, all go to the pictures uh, folder. All right, so move. Okay, but we have a problem for that. What we need to do is we got to move to our uh, music folder, right? So it would this would probably show an error. So I'm going to first uh, go back or rather go to music folder. Okay, we are in documents, right? So what we're going to do is uh, CD music, right? And I have my commands here, right? So here I'll execute that move command. So it was this one. I'm just going to replace CP with MV. Okay. So from my uh, music directory, it's going to move all the folders or files which will have the .txt format. Okay, all the files, not folders. It will move all the files with the .txt format. And it will move it to home slash edureka slash let's move it to pictures what do you say okay so when i give enter that would have moved so let's go back to our folders music there's nothing here this has been cut pasted to the pictures directory all right so this is what i wanted to show you okay this is what i missed showing you earlier while executing the cp command but yeah here we are i've done this and uh, similarly, if you want to go also, uh, you know, if you're from the music directory and if you want to move something to the uh, present working directory, even that is possible. Okay. So another possibility which I would like to show you is that uh, of going back, going to pictures, and then we have all this here. Right? I'm going to clear the screen. LS again. We have automobiles, file1.txt and file2.txt. Right. So uh, we can do a move command and uh, So right now uh, we are in the uh, so let me clear the screen again. So I'm going to do a CD. I'm going to clear the screen and uh, currently I'm going to do an LS. So some of our items are present in pictures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, move back to music. If I do an LS, there's nothing over here. So what I'll do is I'll say move slash home slash edureka slash pictures dot okay asterisk first dot txt and i want to move it to the current directory so when i do this again from the pictures everything would have moved back to music all right so that is the other uh, thing that i want to show you okay so similarly it works for even the copy command i'm pretty sure you'll understand uh, how it works so i'm not going to waste uh, too much time on that Okay, I've uh, cleared my screen and now let's uh, start with the next topic. Okay, I'm going to go back to my slides and yeah, the next topic is uh, make directory commands. Okay, so the next topic is uh, make directory. Okay, that's what MKDIR stands for. Make directory. All right, so it's simple. 
again if uh, it's all about creating a new directory or creating a new folder okay so uh, to create a new directory you just uh, specify mkdir and uh, the path okay the directory path okay that would create a new subdirectory in that path okay guys so currently we are in the uh, documents right so i'm going to do an ls i have these many uh, things so i'm going to do a mkdir and create a new folder over here so that folder name is going to be uh, let's say folder one okay when i do this a new folder is created so when i do the ls command again so you can see that the folder one is uh, extra okay it was not there the previous time that we executed the ls command okay so that's how you create a, a new folder so it's pretty simple now comes the other question okay i can go into uh, the folder one okay of course there'll be nothing inside now what if i want to create multiple folders okay and uh, parent directories let's say something like i want to create folder one inside which i want to create a folder two and create a folder three is that possible okay so i'm going to try doing that and show you if it's possible or not okay so i'm going to say make directory folder one slash folder two okay this would be folder two because i'm already inside folder one this would be folder three and folder four okay so this basically will run the make directory command inside folder one and it will make a directory two three and four now when i give enter these folders should be created ideally they should be created okay ideally speaking so let me just verify everything once and show it to you so it was documents this was the new folder i created folder one there is nothing inside okay now uh, from the terminal if i click enter it says make directory cannot create directory folder two three and four okay because there's no such file or directory okay do you all know why that is i asked you specifically can we do it that is because when we try to enter one directory it's possible okay when like in this case we specify just one one directory right just folder one so it created the directory once but in this case there are too many directories that we need to create okay it's like two three and four how can make directory create so many folders because this is going to be in the form of a parent child or a sub directory right we are creating folder 2 inside which there's a folder 3 inside which there's a folder 4 so in this case mkdir is not enough so this is when we need to use another flag called the hyphen p flag that stands for parent okay let me go to my slides and just cover that aspect once so as you can see here there's a flag called hyphen p okay and what it does is it creates both a new parent directory and a sub directory and it's essentially used only when you're creating like two three directories and i mean you're creating one directory and a couple of sub directories under that directory okay so that's when you use this uh, alternatively you can also use this uh, hyphen hyphen parents all right and uh, if you want to create one parent directory and multiple sub directories inside that directory then you can use these flower brackets okay inside the flower brackets you can uh, have the different uh, folder names okay so let me just quickly go to the terminal and show you that aspect so make directory these were there and now i'm going to give minus p and when i execute this everything would have been created so let me do a cd folder 2 now do an ls there's a folder 3 now let me do this and enter and let me do an ls again there's a folder 4 of course here there would be nothing right so let me uh, enter this folder 4 and here there would be nothing folder 4 so that's what i was talking about okay uh, let me also verify that once from the terminal folder 1 we created a folder 2 inside which there's a folder 3 and there's a folder 4 okay guys so this is what we just created so what i'm going to do is uh, i'm going to just go back to my folder 1 here okay in fact yeah okay folder 1 should be good now i want to show you executing the same command with the flower bracket right i told you that creating a flower bracket will let you create multiple directories inside that directory so if i'm going to say make directory folder uh, because it's inside folder one i can create one here folder two i can say comma folder three comma folder four okay and if i close this flower bracket then these three sub directories or folders would be created inside my folder one all right so given enter here if i go back to my gui so i go inside folder one so initially there was one folder two okay that was the folder 2 which I created earlier. Okay, and now I created folder 2 all in small. Small f, small f, and small f here. So folder 2, folder 3, folder 4 was created now. Folder this one was created earlier. Okay, guys. 
So that's how uh, you know you make directories. In fact, you can even append this with a parent. Say you are supposing you are now in folder uh, one, right? You can say make directory. You can say f2, put a slash, and then inside this f2 folder, these subdirectories will be created. Okay. Now if I give enter, I know what the problem here is. Uh, it says because f2 is not created right now. Correct. This is the time when you got to use the uh, hyphen p command, parents command, right? So which I showed you earlier. So now that I've used the minus p, so the parent is created and the uh, children are also created. So if I go back to folder one, this was f2 was what I created recently. All right. So inside f2, there should be folder two, folder three, folder four. All right. So this is uh, what we can do with respect to make directory commands. All right. So let me close this and go back to my slides. Okay, and uh, go to the next topic. Okay, so uh, next up is the uh, rmdir and the rm commands. Okay, so this is the remove and this stands for remove directory. Now there's a subtle difference between the two. Okay, now uh, when you say okay, the basic difference between the two is that when you say remove directory, it will only remove that particular directory. But when you say remove, it can also remove the subdirectories or the child directories inside that one. So let me just go to my terminal and show you how these are executed. Okay, I'm going to go to my terminal. So currently, I am in my folder one, right? So let's go to folder two, and then do an ls cd folder three, ls cd folder folder four. Okay, of course, there's nothing here. So what I can do is I'm in folder three now. Okay. LS again. Yes, I'm in folder three, and I, if I want to remove this folder, then I can do a remove directory folder four. All right. So when I do this, this particular uh, folder would have been deleted. Now from folder two, I can uh, again remove folder three. Okay, similar to how I uh, removed folder four. But how about I go one more path back? Okay, so right now I'm in LS. Okay. So if I do a PWD, you'll find that I'm in folder one. Okay. And when I do an ls, I have f2 folder 2, I have a capital folder 2. This is where my folder 3 and folder uh, 4 is present. Okay, so I have that, and then I have uh, folder 3 and I have uh, 4 and 4. Now, however, if I try doing a remove directory, and if I try to remove folder 2, right, it will not work. It failed because the folder 2 which we are trying to delete, right, from inside folder 1, we are trying to delete the folder 2. This is that folder 2 and inside this folder 2 there's another folder that is folder 3. Let me just uh, show it to you once so that I can remove your confusion. So inside this uh, folder 2 I have folder 3. Okay. And because I'm trying to delete this uh, folder 2 it's not able to delete because there is already a folder 3 inside this folder. That is a problem with remove directory. So guys I just cleared the screen and uh, let me just do an ls again. So now I'm going to show you how to remove these folders. I showed you removing folder four. Okay. So inside this folder three, I went and I uh, removed folder four. Okay. Now I'm going to show you how to remove multiple folders. Okay. At the same time. Now let's say I'm running the same remove directory again. So I'm going to say remove folder two. And uh, when I give enter, it says failed to remove uh, folder two because the directory is not empty. Okay. Uh, do you know what the problem is? It's uh, telling right because the directory is not empty. It's not able to delete. So because folder 3 is contained inside folder 2. It's not able to delete this folder. So if I want to delete folder 2 also, then what I got to do is you know, I got to first delete the folder 3 and then delete the folder 4. So I have to provide the absolute path of the uh, child directory. Okay, so I'm going to say remove directory. Okay, same like before. I'm going to say folder 2 slash folder 3. When I run this command, then my folder three will get deleted. Okay, the child will get deleted, but the parent will still be uh, active. Folder two will be active. Okay, because uh, when I uh, use the rmdir with folder two and folder three, only folder three will get deleted. Let me show you uh, why that's the case. When I give enter, when I do an ls, folder two should be available. See, folder two is available, but when I do a folder uh, two, there's nothing in here. Okay, there's nothing in here. So. If you want to do that, if you want to delete both the parent and the child at the same time, you got to use a minus p flag. So let me show you to uh, use a minus p flag. Okay. So I'm just going to make the folder three now. 
and I'm going to show you how to use a P flag. So similar to how we use while creating a folder, we got to use the same remove directory. Okay, uh, rmdir with the uh, hyphen P and folder two and folder three. Folder two slash folder three. So in this case, both the folder two and the parent and the child will get deleted. Okay, enter. When I do an ls, I don't have a folder two here. Okay, this one is also deleted. So that's what a minus p flag does. Now let me just create, make a new directory, and uh, what I want to show you is the verbos. Okay, so I'm gonna make directory. So again, the the ones which I deleted have come back again. Would have been created again. So I want to show you the usage of the verbos directory. When I add a v here, as per the slides it said, right? Verbos. So when I add a V here and when I hit enter, okay, I've uh, done the make directory again. So I have to actually remove the directory now. Okay, now when I say remove directory and when I uh, try to print the uh, verbos hyphen PV, so it says first it's deleted the folder three, okay, which is answered inside folder two. After deleting that, it has come and deleted folder two. Okay, so that's what this is all about. This is what uh, you know you need to know about the remove directory commands. Now uh, let me just clear the screen. So guys, uh, now let's uh, see how the rm command works. Okay, now uh, the rm command here, as it says from the slides, it can be used to remove uh, even non-empty directories. Okay, if we use the rm with the r flag, and if we use uh, the r and p flags together, then it removes the non-empty uh, directories, including the parent and the uh, sub-directories. Okay, so the one limitation that we had with rm dir command was that. We could not remove uh, non-empty directories. We had to first empty them and then only delete them. Okay. Otherwise, we had to specify the entire path and then uh, you know use the p flag to remove all the parents and all the uh, child subdirectories in that path. Right. That was the limitation that we uh, had with remove directory. But in RM, we don't have that problem because uh, let's see. Okay. In LS, we have so many folders. Okay. So if I try going to F2, okay, and I do an LS here, then I have three different folders: folder two, folder three, folder four. Okay. Now, if it's an RM DIR command, it cannot technically delete this folder called F2. F2 is basically a non-empty directory. Inside F2, there are other directories like uh, folder two, three, and four. So let me just uh, show to you once. So inside F2, we have three folders: folder two, folder three, and folder four. So with the uh, RM DIR command, we cannot definitely remove. But with F2, we have a chance of removing it. Okay. That's because uh, we can make use of the R flag here. Okay. But however, this will also it will delete F2 and its subfolders. Okay, so let me do an LS. And uh, if you can see here, initially under folder one, we had F2 and uh, these three. Okay, but now we don't uh, have that under uh, F2 because that whole F2 folder is missing. If I go back to my folder one here, you will see that the F2 is uh, missing over here too. That's because the remove right it uh, removed the whole uh, f2 folder in spite of it containing some uh, folders okay and that's what the r flag does that's the advantage of uh, using the r flag okay so if the same thing if we uh, use the r flag with the v flag then it will print the uh, status also it's like the verbos right it will print it will uh, tell you what all has been deleted and how it has been deleted so that's the advantage with using rm over uh, rm dir okay at times uh, this is more beneficial so I'm just going to clear the screen and uh, getting back to my presentation. I'm uh, done with all the concepts in this slide. So let me go on to the next topic. Okay. So the next topic is going to be that of uh, working with user permissions. Okay. It's very important for a Linux administrator to know what these uh, user permissions are. Okay. Because uh, the different files will be there, different directories will be there, and he has to determine what kind of access will be available for which user. Right. So that's what is uh, controlled here. So uh, the different permissions are basically read, write, and uh, execute. Okay, R stands for read, W stands for uh, write, and uh, execute is X. Okay. So uh, initially, you'll get this kind of uh, an output. Okay. You know what? Let me go to my terminal and show you what happens when you run an ls ns ls minus l command because user permissions is something which will appear and which you can control via the ls hyphen l command, right? Because when you do that. All the different file contents, whether it's a directory or whether it's uh, another file, all those things along with their uh, permissions will be visible in long format, right? So let me go to my uh, terminal first and uh, go to CD. All right. Now, when I do an ls, I have a list of all these uh, documents. Okay. But however, when I do an ls hyphen l, I get it in long format. Okay. 
So I get it something like this. So for each folder, I have the permission set. So for desktop, I have the permission sets and then I have the other components. Okay, I'm going to explain what this entire component, what the entire row means. So to not let you get too complicated, first I'm going to explain only this part. Okay, the first uh, 10 characters. If you see here, the first 10 characters are these and I will explain this part first and then I'll explain this set, these three blocks and then I'll explain the remaining blocks. Okay, so getting back to this uh, first block in my slides, you can see that the first block, it determines what is the file type. Okay, it's either the file or directory type in fact. If that uh, is a directory, then it would be represented by D. Okay, if you have a D as the first character over here, then that's a directory. Okay, as it says, but it can also be any other thing. If it's a hyphen like this, then it means that it's a normal file. Okay, but uh, in the first uh, letter, if it's a C, then it means that it's a character special file. And uh, if there is B over here in the spot of the first letter, then it's a binary special file. So basically, there can be four different uh, letters over here. It can be either a hyphen or a D, B or C, representing four different uh, aspects. Okay, so uh, that is the first uh, information that you have about that particular file. And then you have three different blocks. Okay, so the next nine letters are going to determine the user permissions. Okay, and those nine are divided into three, three, three. Okay, so the first three represent the user permissions. Okay, and the second block having three uh, RWX representatives uh, are those of group permissions, and the final block represents other permissions. Okay, this means other users. Now, this user is the actual user who is logged into the system. Okay, that particular user. So this is the user permissions. This is the group permissions which the user belong to and what the other group can view and this is with respect to the other users. Okay, that's what is meant by this others. So if we have uh, and the order always goes by RWX and RWX and here also it will be RW and X. Okay, so that is the order read write and execute. So if the first three blocks are all RW and X then it means that the user has all the three permissions or the owner of the file or the user has uh, the read write and the execute permissions okay and in this place if there are uh, three characters right r w and x in this order it means that the owner or the user has uh, the permissions to read write and execute that particular file okay and if there is r w and x in the next block then it means that the group has the read write and execute permissions on that particular uh, file so every file that's created right it will have a user and it will also have a default uh, group that it will be uh, assigned to so all the users a part of uh, that group will have the read write and execute permissions okay but whereas the last three here it stands for other users permission so there can be multiple users right the same system can have multiple users one of course will be the root user the other will be the owner or you and besides you there can be any number of users it can be your friends your colleagues or uh, you know other people so this others represents that and uh, if you have a blank in any place okay so in this case there's a blank over here in place of w there's a blank it means that this others they don't have the right access they only have the read access and the execute access all right and uh, similarly if you go back to the terminal okay and if you see here uh, take the example of uh, this particular file desktop okay desktop folder is where we were executing a lot of commands right it is under the Edureka folder. So yeah, this was the folder that we are talking about. The desktop right now, it's a directory basically, okay, that you all agree with. Then these three characters represent that the person who's using it, okay, right now the person who's uh, using it, uh, because I'm logged in right now and I've logged in with uh, this username, right? Sorry for that guys. Yeah, and I've uh, logged in with this username, right, Edureka. So uh, me being the owner and me being the user, I have the read, write and execute permissions okay but the group that I belong to okay that group does not have the read write and execute uh, permissions and the group that uh, this file belongs to now because uh, this file is either owned or used by me okay now because I'm the user I have this access and then this file will also belong to a group right so whenever you create this file it will be assigned to that particular user creating it and it will be assigned to a default group so we are talking about that group here Okay, and that particular group does not have uh, all three rights. It has only the read permission and the execute permission. It doesn't have the write permission. Okay, and the same thing can be said for uh, even the other users. So the other users in that system who will be using that system, they will only have the read and execute access on the uh, desktop. Okay, but whereas if you take the example of uh, this file1.txt, right, which I created some time back uh, during this session, 
this one, if you see the permissions are such that the first one is a hyphen. Okay, uh, what hyphen technically means is uh, it's a normal file. Okay, I explained that uh, hyphen is normal. B stands for binary special file, and C stands for character special file. So of course we don't have uh, those options here. We don't have the B and C options. But what you got to understand this uh, is that this is a normal file and this is a directory. Okay, wherever there is D. So since this is a file, the access for the user is uh, such that I have the read and write access. Okay, but I can't execute it. The user can't execute it. And when it comes to the group, even the group has the read and write access, but you cannot execute it. The other users, however, they have only the read access and they cannot execute this particular file, right? So they cannot execute or they cannot write this particular file. So that's what these uh, group permissions mean. And if you go forward from group permissions, there are more other blocks, right? So let's go back to the slides and see what they stand for. So in this slide, let's talk about the next three blocks. Okay, so the next block is uh, that of a number. Okay, you have a number over here and that represents the symbolic links. All right, the block after that is uh, the one that represents the uh, owner name and the one followed by that represents the group name. Okay, so that is with respect to these three blocks. All right, and then after that comes the file size of the particular file and then you have the timestamp the time when the file was created the file or the folder was created this is the actual file size of the block okay now that's what the user permissions here represent so if i quickly go back to the uh, terminal and show you this is basically the symbolic link this is the uh, owner name this is the group name of the file this is the uh, block size okay and this is all in uh, kilobytes okay and uh, this is the timestamp and this is of course the name of the file right so we have the name of the file and that file will have first be the file type then user permissions then symbolic links then the owner name then group name then the file size then comes the timestamp at the end so that's what the different file permissions are uh, the read write and execute and if you want to modify any of uh, these file permissions then it's also possible okay now let me go to my slides and show you how that's possible let me show you some theory first Okay, so first of all, if you want to change the permissions, then you can use the chmod command. Okay, you can use the chmod command as shown over here, and uh, you can use it to change the access permission of both the files and the directories. If you want to change the owner of the particular file, okay, change the owner of that particular file or directory, then you can use the chown command. And then if you want to change the group ownership of that file, then you can use the chgrp. Okay. So when you use the chmod command, you got to specify whom are you referring to? Are you referring to the uh, the user? Are you referring to the group or are you referring to the other people? Okay, the other users. You got to say that and then you got to use either a plus symbol or a minus symbol. Okay, when you use plus, it means that you're adding these two rights. Uh, so in this case, when you're saying G plus WX, so G stands for group, right? So as you can see from uh, this particular slide, G stands for group, U stands for users and uh, others stands for O. Okay, and all stands for A. Okay, so as per this, if you're using G over here, then it means that you're uh, talking about the group and you're adding the W that is a right and the execute permissions. You know, that means you're giving them the W and uh, the right and the execute permissions. Okay, and after that, you got to specify the file name. So this means it will modify the permissions to this for this particular file. And similarly, you can use the equal to symbol and also the minus symbol. So when you use the equal to symbol, then whatever rights you have initially, that will be overwritten. So when you say chmod, u is equal to rwx, and then uh, it doesn't matter what the previous set of permissions were. Then the the previous set of permissions will be replaced by whatever you specify here. So you'll be setting that particular user to have the read, write, and execute access for that file. Okay, and then uh, you can in fact specify if, uh, you know. Uh, you can set access control for multiple people. You can set it for uh, groups, users, all at the same time. So in this place, this command, we've uh, set it for the users here. We are setting it read, write, and execute for users. And then after that, we are uh, setting it for the other people. Okay, for the other users, we are removing the write and the execute access. Okay, the execute permissions. So let me just uh, quickly go to my uh, terminal and show you that. So currently, uh, let's take the example of this pictures. Okay. Let's take an example of this particular folder. The user that is me, I have the read, write, and execute permissions. The group has read and execute only. Okay. And uh, they, of course, the other users, they also have only the read and execute. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say chmod. Uh, I don't want to change my permissions. Okay. So I would rather uh, change the permissions that my group has. So I would say g is equal to read and w. Okay. So if you see here, Right now, the group has read and execute. Okay, 
I don't want to give them execute. So if I want to remove execute, I have to do uh, G minus R and then I have to uh, give comma G plus W. Okay. But uh, those are two different arguments, right? So instead of using two different arguments, I can just give an equal to which would replace this entire list with the uh, current arguments. So instead of uh, having R and X, I will replace that with R and W, read and write. Okay. I'll give a command. And then now uh, we have others here, the other users, they have read and execute again. So what I'll do is I'll uh, say O minus execute because I want to give others only the read access. Okay. So in this case, when I do this, the X over here, that will uh, become hyphen and uh, the hyphen here will become W. Okay. I'll be enabling the W for them and uh, removing the execute. And for these people, I'll be removing the execute. And now that I've uh, specified what are the permissions and who are the uh, recipients, I'm going to give the file name. So let's say pictures. Okay. So I'm going to give the LS minus L command again. And now you can see that if you go to pictures, it's been reset. So the others have only the read access. The others are blank. Okay. And the uh, group have the read and write access and uh, this execute has been taken away from them. So that is with respect to the read, write and execute permissions that users can have. All right. So I'm just going to clear the screen and go back to my slides. So similarly, you can change even the uh, ownership of uh, certain files and uh, certain groups. Okay. So uh, if you use a ch own, okay, ch uh, change ownership with that's what it stands for. And when I follow that with the username and the file name, then this particular file will have a new user or will have a new owner and uh, this will be the username. Okay. And similarly, even the group command works in the same fashion. So uh, this is something that you can always uh, work on and you can figure it out. All right, guys. So working with Linux repositories. Okay. And it says that stable versions of most softwares will already be available in Linux repositories and the command to install them is this. So you would have uh, heard me say earlier that it's very easy to update software and the operating system itself by just uh, running one simple command, right? You can update the software. So uh, this is what I'm talking about. So you can just run one command. So this is the only command that you need to run. Okay. If you just give uh, sudo yum install and uh, if you give the package name, then that particular package will get updated. Okay. The sudo is something that you would uh, recognize from what I told you earlier. The sudo is to, uh, we give it to to execute this uh, command as a root user. Okay. And uh, if you see that there are two other lines and the only difference between these three lines is the letter that the word we are using here. Okay. So in the first case, in case of any Red Hat enterprise uh, Linux system or uh, even CentOS, right, which falls under Red Hat, we use yum. Okay. But if it's uh, a Debian based system like Ubuntu or Ubuntu, X Ubuntu or any, any other uh, Debian Linux system, then you would have to use apt hyphen get. Okay. And then if uh, you're using a Fedora based system, then you got to use the DNF. Okay. So these are the three different commands. Uh, and these are the, that's because uh, the repository name for rel, it's called as uh, yum repository and the repository name for Debian is called as the apt repository. Okay. And for Fedora, it's called DNF repository. So that's why we say we are first, we will have to first give the sudo, uh, sudo uh, command, which would make sure that we execute this command as a root user. And from the command perspective, the first part would be calling or referring to the repository. Okay. So from the CentOS, it would refer to the yum repository or from the Ubuntu if it is, if I give apt get, it would uh, refer to the uh, apt repository. And then we have something called as install. And when we say install and then follow that by package name, then that particular package will get installed. So for example, over here it is Java, right? I'm trying to show how to install Java on your system. So in this case, if you first give a yum update, then it will uh, first of all update your links to your repositories. Okay. It would update the yum command and uh, the links that you have between the repository and yourself. So it's uh, not something related to installation of Java. Okay. This is just another uh, command that you specify if any of your installation fails. Okay. So this is not a compulsory uh, command that you need to run. But besides that, what you have is uh, yum install Java 1.8.0 hyphen open JDK. Now uh, the packaging that you see here, right? That is Java. So if I want to install Java, then I would just give this uh, particular package name and I would say install. Okay. Because uh, the package name of Java that's present in the Linux repository that is called as Java 1.8.0 open JDK. And similarly, if you want to install any other uh, software, right? If you want to uh, install any other technology like uh, Hadoop, then you can just uh, give one such uh, package name. You just got to find out what is the name of the package that they have in the repository. You can just uh, simply Google it and uh, it will give you the package name and you can 
just say yum install or sudo yum install followed by package name followed by hadoop uh, hyphen 2.0 or 2.3.0 or very soon hadoop 3.0 is coming so you can say hadoop uh, hyphen 3.0 something like that and yeah if it's uh, if you want to install docker then again you can say sudo yum install docker and uh, probably the version name i don't think docker uh, needs a version though and uh, for installing docker you can uh, do it also through ubuntu okay so when i install docker in my uh, other ubuntu vm right which i showed you earlier so that vm has uh, docker installed and uh, the uh, command that i ran that time was uh, sudo apt-get install docker and uh, that downloaded and installed the latest version of uh, docker that was available in the uh, repository okay yeah so that is it and once you're done with the installation it would take quite some time to install and once when everything is done then you will have to just you know update your environment variables okay you have to set the environment variables over here in your dot bash rc file and once you set the environment path over there then you can just do source and then your software is uh, ready it's installed okay now this was another step which i skipped out because this is not really necessary for you to uh, execute this okay i'll uh, tell you why because uh, this command which is update hyphen alternatives hyphen hyphen config java it is only to select a particular version of java now let's say that you're new to linux okay and uh, you're uh, downloading java for the first time then you just need to run this command so after running this command you can straight away just uh, you know probably when you're done with this java is installed basically okay but it's just that you need to go to your uh, sudo you should do sudo g edit go to your bash rc file and update the path where java is installed okay you got to specify it your uh, environment variables to your runtime engine that uh, java has been installed in this path so you have to just copy the path of your java and paste it in uh, the environment variables over here and then you have to uh, source that particular bash rc so when you're done with these two things uh, your java is installed okay but if you already have a java package installed okay so in my case when i'll be showing you this now i already have a java 1.7 package okay so now if i do a sudo yum install java 1.8.0 open jdk then i'll have multiple versions of java okay and my environment variables would be currently set to java 1.7 because that's what i already have but uh, since you have you know multiple versions of java and since there are different packages you can have multiple packages of java installed but you can only run one of them okay so you set which one you want to run right that one you set over here whether i want to choose to execute 7 or whether i want to choose to execute 8 that i can choose by uh, updating over here so i'll show you this command also okay so uh, that is what i want to show you with respect to linux repositories so similarly you can even uh, uh, you know uh, you can do a sudo yum install php if you want to install a php server you can just say php mysql server if you want to install any other software like wget you can do that also so this is what we are saying you know it's very simple to install software so if you're doing it with the gui then you'll have a lot of steps that you need to do you need to go to the website download the appropriate package then extract them then install them all those things so instead this is just simpler and it's uh, much faster okay now let me go back to my terminal and show you how that is done okay so i'm going to go to my uh, cd and the command is sudo yum install and uh, now would come the java package so the package i'm going to install is java 1.8.0 okay uh, that's because java 8 is uh, placed with this name okay so the package name of java 8 in uh, the linux repositories is uh, java hyphen 1.8.0 hyphen open jdk now when i hit enter it asks for the password because uh, this particular uh, oh, sorry for that guys when i use sudo to execute this particular command then it asks for a password because i'm executing this as a root user so that's why if i try executing this as a local user as my own user then it wouldn't be possible to execute this command okay i have to execute this as a root user and uh, root user is the one that has the ultimate privileges the ultimate access he has access to everything so you just enter the password and put enter and then automatically your uh, packages will get downloaded and uh, it'll get installed so uh, now it says uh, you know total download size is 33 mb and uh, it asks is it okay to download it y stands for yes and uh, n stands for no now if it's uh, you when you're trying to download java when you give this command you got to say y and hit enter because uh, that would download the 33 uh, mb package and insert in your uh, linux machine okay but uh, however i have already downloaded java and since i've done it already so i don't need to okay i don't want to waste my time here uh, because uh, this is a session right i don't want to waste your precious time so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to click on n and give enter is it fine uh, uh, siddharth hemant 
all you guys who are in the session, is it fine? Because I want to save some time here by hitting N, okay? Because otherwise it would take some time to uh, set up the installation process. So, okay, fine, yeah. I'm getting a yes from uh, you both, all right? So uh, I'm just going to click on no, okay? So it says uh, exiting on the user command. Great. Uh, yeah, so the, the only thing you got to notice that instead of N, if you put Y and if you hit enter, it will download for you and it would complete the installation, all right? And uh, there's one more thing that I would actually like to add to this. Supposing while uh, installing the same package, right? While uh, doing the sudo yum install java, this package when you're trying to run this command, if you want this uh, Y option to be chosen automatically, okay? Because right now it entered into the interactive mode, okay? Interactive mode is when the kernel was asking you, should you download this and do you want to download this and execute it later? And I had to press N and uh, get out of it. Okay, but however, you might not want to. Okay, so, at, so there may be times when you might uh, want to by default just click on yes. So what you can do at that time is you can just uh, go back here. So do yum, you, you have a flag here. You can just put hyphen y and if you uh, then install it, then it will not ask you, it will not get into this interactive mode. So it will take this uh, y, y flag, y option automatically and it will, uh, you know, install the Java package. So that is what I wanted to show you. That's what I want to tell you. So that's how you install uh, Java, okay? So now I've just cleared the screen, guys, okay? So the when you execute this command in your uh, Linux machine and uh, when you, you finished downloading an installation of your uh, Java, what you got to do is you got to set your environment variables, okay? So as it was uh, written in the slide, you got to give the sudo g edit dot bash rc to enter into the bash rc file and set the environment variables here, the path to where your Java is installed, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do is... Uh, I'm going to do the same to and your dot bash rc is something that will be present only in your home directory. Okay, so you got to remember to uh, go to CD and from CD you got to access that. You got to say sudo gedit space dot bash rc. When you do this, it'll ask you for the password, but of course I've entered the password previously, so it didn't ask me. But yeah, when you do that, you will open this uh, bash rc file. Okay, so right now my Java path is uh, set to this. Okay, so this means when during runtime when any application is uh, using or requesting for Java, then it will uh, look for Java in uh, this path. So you just need to find out uh, where your Java has been installed in your system. So it would most probably be in your uh, user slash lib slash JVM folder. Okay, so let me uh, go to the same. So it will be there under your root directory. So uh, if you uh, go to your my computer from your file system under the lib folder, we have various uh, packages that will all be installed over here. Okay, so in my system, it's all installed over here. So this is the JVM folder. And inside here, I have all the different uh, Java packages which I have uh, downloaded over a period of time. So guys, uh, in this case, uh, supposing, see, I have Java 1.7.0 OpenJDK installed, okay? Now in your case, you will have a Java 1.8.0 OpenJDK installed. So what you gotta do is you gotta just right click on that folder, okay, similar to what I'm doing now. Okay, I'm gonna right click and uh, just click on copy and go here and paste the path over here, okay? If anything is existing already, then remove that and uh, paste the new path. So the path is nothing but where your JVM is located from your root. So it's in root USR library folder and then inside library it's in JVM and here it's this is the folder it's present in, okay? And then you gotta also additionally give the path to your bin directory, okay? So you have, this is your bin directory. So what do you do is you right click on bin, again copy, go to your dot bash rc, Okay, you got to uh, paste it over here. All right, so this is how, uh, this is what you do. This is how simple it is. So when you do it, you just got to save it and you got to, you know, close this dot uh, bash rc file. And when you're done with uh, saving and closing it, just go back to your terminal and you got to run this command. Source dot bash rc, okay. So when you do this, then your uh, terminal will get synced with the updated environment variables. Otherwise, even if you don't run it, it's fine. You can just start executing your commands from a new terminal. Then it would all be fine. But yeah, the source.bashrc is only to sync your environment variables with uh, this particular uh, terminal that is uh, opened. Okay. So that's how uh, you install Java in your uh, system. Okay, guys. So uh, I'm just going to clear the screen now. Okay. And I'm going to go back to my slides. Okay. So I'm done with uh, showing you how to work with Linux repositories. And uh, the next topic that I'm going to talk about is that of uh, tar files. So what are tar files? Okay, so all of you Windows users might be aware of uh, this software called WinZip or WinRAR. Okay, what are they? What do they do? They are basically to uh, extract your files, right? So they'll be in compressed form and you'll have to extract them. So 
uh, in Linux we have an equivalent format. So in Linux it is uh, either the tar file or the gzip and the gunzip files. Okay. So tar is the preferred option. So I'm going to show you how to compress and decompress a file with dot tar format. But however, even gzip and gunzip is uh, something that can be used. If you want to compress a file with the gz format, okay, then you got to uh, use this command. But however, if you are going to decompress it, then you got to give gunzip, okay. And the syntax is here, okay. But however, with the tar you, for both compressing and decompressing, you will use the same tar command itself. So you'll just have tar, and in the arguments, there will be a minor change. So when you're compressing the file, you will have to specify hyphen c, okay. And when you're uh, decompressing the file, you will have to give the uh, flag minus x. Otherwise, it's all fine. Uh, the V here stands for verbose, and uh, the F here indicates that you want to compress the file that is uh, mentioned followed by uh, the command here. Okay, so this F just basically indicates that you got to compress this particular file. Otherwise, the uh, kernel will be wondering for which file to compress, and it will throw an error to you later. Okay, so that is what uh, the XVF here stands for. These are the different flags that are available with the star command. Okay. Okay, before I go and show you how to do the start, let me show you a place where tar files will be uh, present. So in Linux, right? So no matter what kind of software you're downloading, whether it's a Java package or if it's a Hadoop package, if you're uh, downloading them manually from the internet, okay, then you would get them in the dot tar format, okay? Or you might find them in uh, TGZ format, okay? So tar is uh, something the most, I mean, I would prefer a few people download tar because that's the easiest. Uh, it's easiest to extract and uh, uh, you know also compress them. So uh, you can just download the tar file. It's very common, and you can just uh, by just running this one command, you can compress the file. So the Hadoop packages that are available on Apache's website, right? That would almost be around uh, two to three GB, but you the compressed format will only be around uh, 100 or 200 MB. Okay. So same thing can be said for uh, something like Tomcat if you're uh, you know downloading the Tomcat package or uh, Nagios. So anything like that. So those packages would have a lot of MB and uh, to download them, you'll need to compress them, right? So because the lesser you download, the more uh, you save on bandwidth. So it's also easier to transfer them in a compressed format. So for transferring, especially you use these tar files. Okay, you compress them into tar format, and then later when you're uh, done downloading, you can extract them and bring them to regular file format. So I'll show you how that is done. So uh, first of all, let me go to my terminal, and uh, let's go to the documents folder. Okay, um, here I'm doing an ls. We have this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say ls hyphen l. Okay. When I run this, you can see the uh, different uh, files and the size. Okay. You can see that the uh, LMS folder, right? The LMS folder here, it has uh, it's the highest. Okay. It's uh, it's showing it's four four zero nine six MB. So what we can do is I'm going to show you how to compress this and convert it into a tar file. So to convert it into a tar file, you got to say tar hyphen cvf okay x is when you're trying to decompress it but uh, cvf is when you're trying to compress it so you're going to say tar hyphen cvf and then here comes the uh, tar file name so uh, what do you want to be the name of the tar file okay so i just want to have it as uh, lms dot tar okay so this is the name of the file i want to keep so i will put that here and then you got to specify the file which you want to compress whether it's lms or whether it's any other folder so i want to do it for lms so i can just say lms okay and when I run this command, then this particular document would have uh, been compressed and it's present. Okay, so if I do an ls now, you can see that there's an LMS folder and an LMS tar file. Okay, so this is the compressed version of this folder. Now, when I do an ls minus l command, you'll see that there's a new tar file that's created. Okay, LMS dot tar, and then you have this folder whose the tar file this one is. So that's how uh, simple it is, guys. And uh, what you can uh, do now is if you uh, you can just transfer this file over uh, FTP or uh, via SSH or you know just upload this to your internet and let people download this because this is a smaller file compared to this proper folder right now uh, in case you want to uh, extract a file so in case you have downloaded this kind of a tar file okay from the internet how will you untar it what is the package to uh, you know decompress it so uh, to answer that question I can we can give the command tar hyphen xvf and the package name so in my case, it's lms.tar. So when I just do this and when I hit enter, then that package would get extracted. So now if I do an ls command, you can see that uh, this particular tar file has been uh, extracted, but you can't see two different folders because uh, the existing lms folder has been uh, rewritten. Okay. So it has been, uh, well, let's just say it has been overwritten and that's why you can't see two different files. But yeah, 
as you can see this was the process uh, which was uh, taken to untar the lms package okay so that's it with uh, respect to the uh, compressing and decompressing of files so uh, let me quickly go to the next topic in my slide okay so the next topic is that of environment variables so what are environment variables i told you that we had to set the environment variables in the dot bash rc file right while installing java so what are they as the definition says here environment variables control the behavior of the software packages installed in linux okay the path where the packages have been installed will be specified in the environment variables so if you are uh, installing java okay and if there is some other application which needs java let's take the example of hadoop okay so hadoop is basically a java framework okay so the map reduce concepts it's all java related and uh, you need java to run hadoop otherwise it will not run hadoop so by just uh, downloading uh, the hadoop tar file from the internet and extracting that tar file is not enough okay what you got to do is you got to download java also and uh, set the environment variables for both java and for uh, hadoop so in our case when hadoop is running because it's based on the java framework it would need java to work right so at times it lacks the runtime engine where is java installed so that i need uh, some commands to be run on java so at that time when the runtime engine is asked that kind of a question it will go to the environment variables and it will look for the path over there okay so that was the environment variables i was talking about earlier okay you go and set your environment variables in your dot bash rc file and your dot bash rc file can be uh, accessed by going to your uh, home directory from your home directory just run gedit dot bash rc okay and here you can set your path so if you've uh, installed hadoop recently then you can just set the path of hadoop over here and if you've installed java then you can set the path of java over here so basically whenever any other application wants access to uh, some program right so it can uh, get access by looking at its path from here so that's what the uh, bash rc file is all about okay that's what the environment variables are all about so uh, that was about uh, the environment variables and we have some of the most common environment variables are these okay print env so this will basically list uh, or prints the list of all the environment variables okay all or almost all the environment variables that's what this will do and then when you say echo you know dollar home this will print the path of the home directory of the user so this uh, home that you see here this is a variable okay and uh, the path of your home directory has been specified over here so whenever you press cd on your terminal right so it goes to the home directory correct so that is the home directory i'm talking about over here and uh, the path of that is what is set over here so when you say echo dollar home like i told you earlier i showed you that echo will basically print whatever arguments you give it will print it to standard output right so when you say echo dollar home it will print the path of your home whatever stored in this variable and similarly when you give uh, echo dollar path then it will print the list of all the directories in which the shell looks for commands okay and all those directories will be separated by uh, colon okay so you'll have multiple directories which uh, you will get as a result and they will all be separated by a colon okay and similarly for host name uh, what was the name of your uh, host of your system right that will be printed when you give this because this again is a variable and this uh, is all set as environment variables okay and then you have uh, username your uh, username will be printed so and uh, when we say language it's basically the uh, the language right in which the whole uh, system works it can be either chinese or it can be english so in our case it will all be english right so because we are all uh, working on english so it will all print either us english or uh, uk english something like that and when you say echo bash version this will print the version of uh, this instance of bash so let's just go ahead and uh, execute some of these uh, environment variables okay i'm just going to clear the screen and go to cd clear the screen and uh, first of all let's uh, put dollar or let's say echo when you give echo you have nothing okay i showed you earlier that when you just put an echo and uh, when you say hi you will get uh, hi as a return the output will be hi so similarly when you say echo dollar x right i set the path of x to uh, 200 earlier so when when i say this right x i will get the value of 100 now and similarly the path of uh, home will already be set so if i just give uh, echo and uh, dollar path then all the directories where the shell will look for to execute commands those paths will be present here so scoop is uh, located over here in this uh, bin path and separated by a colon we have the next thing so i have installed pig in my system so pig is installed here uzi is installed here hive is installed here okay and similarly uh, if you see java java is installed here okay and uh, hadoop 2.2.0 that's uh, installed over here right 
and uh, similarly there are all the directories where your uh, shell will look for right they will all be specified in uh, this path so similarly you have another command that is for uh, home this will print the home directory and my home directory is uh, home slash adreka you can also uh, alternatively print your host name right so my host name is localhost dot local admin okay so this is my uh, host name right so my uh, basically my host name is localhost so that's what's being printed here and when I say echo and uh, follow that with language okay with a dollar then it would print the language so this is uh, using English US English okay UTF hyphen 8 so that's what this means and in case if you want to print the list of uh, all the uh, environment variables then you can just run this command print env okay so all the environment variables uh, that are uh, there in your system they will all be displayed here okay so uh, that's it with respect to environment variables let me get back to my slides now and continue with my session so going on to the next slide now I'm going to talk about regular expressions okay so regular expressions or regex they are used to search through data it can be piped along with the grep command to find patterns of text in the file okay now uh, what this means is that uh, you will have multiple different uh, files or uh, you know multiple a lot of data in probably even one file okay uh, with the help of uh, regular expression what you can do is you can search for patterns of that data so you can use the grep to search through data and you can uh, use the regular expressions to search through patterns of data that kind of a pattern supposing you have a spelling mistake in the middle okay supposing the spelling of apple is a-p-p-l-e okay and uh, you know you might have made a mistake in one of the files you have saved it as uh, apple okay and you're not able to find when and when you're using uh, apple apple you're not able to find that actual string okay then it's uh, you'll be wondering why you're not able to find it okay then you'll realize that okay it may be because the spelling that I would have entered in the file it's uh, that might be wrong by mistake I would have entered apple so in that kind of a situation you can use regular expressions to find patterns of text in the file so you're all aware of uh, the pipe I spoke about earlier right you can uh, use uh, the pipe to uh, use one operations output as the input to another operation right so you can use that and uh, you can use the regular expressions with the combination of grep okay with the combination of grep command so you have uh, a lot of regular expressions and uh, the most common of them are these okay so the dot here it basically means it can replace any character okay it can mean any character the dot so and then you have uh, the caret symbol here so the caret symbol here it basically uh, matches the start of the string okay now what that means is uh, let me give you an example supposing you're doing a cat file1.txt you're looking for uh, some kind of data inside this file1.txt and you're using the grep command to search this data cat will basically list down all the uh, file contents grep will uh, search that data and how will it search when you give a it will just display you know all the lines or all the words where a is present but when you give a caret a it means that the starting of the string starts with a supposing I have uh, three different lines or three different strings in my uh, document in my file one dot txt okay supposing I have uh, abc uh, afg and uh, adf okay and if I uh, give caret a then the result that will be out would be uh, given given back to me is those three lines because those three lines are starting with the character a so that's what this uh, character means it matches the start of the string okay so that's about caret and similarly if uh, you want to match something with the end of the string you can use the dollar symbol and supposing you know that this particular word or string that you're searching for it ends with xt okay in that case you can uh, put xt and then you can uh, suffix that with a dollar then all the strings in that particular file uh, you know which are uh, all the all the strings in that file which are ending with xt they will be displayed okay so that's uh, how you can search for data and uh, similarly if you give asterisk uh, asterisk basically means that the character that is uh, you know preceding the preceding character is um, it matches zero or more times so let's take an example of uh, this okay now in this case we have uh, a in front of the asterisk okay so the asterisk basically means preceding character matches zero or more times supposing I have uh, two different strings in my file okay uh, one string is ABC and the second uh, string is uh, DEF so then comes the asterisk okay so when you give uh, asterisk it basically means that the uh, preceding character it occurs zero or more times but uh, however if you give a question mark it means that the character that that comes up uh, proceeding before the question mark that appears exactly one or uh, it can appear more times okay and then you have uh, you know these brackets here which can be used 
to group these regular expressions. Supposing you have uh, you know more than one or two ex regular expressions, you can use them to group them. And uh, again, the uh, backslash here it represents special characters. Okay, so let me uh, just run a couple of examples of uh, this for you. Okay, let me go to my terminal and uh, go to my home directory. I'm gonna clear the screen. I'll go to documents. Okay, so in here I have my three different text documents: automobiles, file one, and uh, file two. So if I uh, do cat and automobiles or txt, then I have a list of uh, all these uh, strings, right? I have the list of all the cars and bikes and the different uh, automobile companies. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to say cat automobiles or txt, and I'm going to use a pipe. I'm going to use a grep command to search for uh, strings starting with the letter A. Okay. So if I give A, then all the strings where there is uh, A present that will appear. Okay. Now first let me show you without the regular expression. So when I give A, then these are the strings where A is present. Okay. Uh, however, if I uh, give grep hyphen v, then it will list down those strings where uh, a is not present. Okay, so you might uh, see a present in these two things, but the truth is it's looking for a small a. Okay, if you want case insensitive searching, then you can just use uh, i also. All right. So uh, you can see, as you can see from here, in these four uh, strings, a is not present. Right. So that kind of uh, searching is what we need to do. So I can use a regular expression to search for those strings starting with a particular character. Okay, by using the caret command. So in uh, if you take this example, so these are the list of strings in which A is present, right? So in here, where is A starting? Okay, so A is uh, probably starting only in uh, this one particular uh, string. Okay, but maybe also over here, but because I haven't included the in case insensitive, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this V once. I'm going to print it. Okay, I'll just do a control L and execute it again. So now, if you see uh, all the strings where A is present, whether it's a capital A or small a, those will be listed here. Okay, and now I can use a regular expression to uh, basically filter out those letters or those strings which are starting with A. Okay, by uh, specifying this command. Okay, so I have to ideally get the answer I should get is Aprilia, Audi, and Amber. Okay, so when I hit enter. Okay, so uh, there's a space here, so that's the problem. And as you can see, uh, it says that there is no string that's matching with this A. Okay, now that's because I removed the uh, hyphen I. Okay, I removed the hyphen I, which stands for uh, case insensitive searching. So it basically returns that uh, it's not returning any result here. So that basically means the, there was no search. But however, if I add a, a hyphen I, okay, hyphen I, and enter, then I will get these three as my results because I've added the case insensitive searching here. So did you all guys uh, get this concept here of using a regular expression of uh, you know this is caret. Okay, this matches the starting of the string. Now I can uh, do something similar. I can search for the end of the string. Okay. Now let's see again if I use a itself and if I give dollar then it will look for all the strings which are ending with a. Okay, so uh, that's happening because of uh, this problem. The whole dollar a should come inside brackets. Okay, I should be in uh, quotation marks so that is the thing so when i do this i'm not getting any result so uh, similarly i can uh, execute another uh, command okay so another uh, one involving regular expressions of uh, asterisk so what i'll do is i'll uh, say grep hyphen n let's say i want to search for the character a itself okay so uh, when i say a in asterisk so it uh, when when i use this asterisk it basically means zero or more occurrence of a Correct. So I'm going to search for uh, that from uh, here, and then I have to specify the file name over here. So I'm not using any cat command, and I'm not using a pipe to get data in over here. Okay. So I'm just going to display the number of times that happens by uh, specifying the file name here. I'm going to say automobiles.txt. When I hit an enter, I get all the uh, occurrences where zero or more times a is uh, occurring. Okay. So uh, that is uh, one aspect, and uh, the other command that I can uh, show you is that of uh, with respect to echo itself. So I can run an echo inside flower brackets. I can say a to z. Now when I uh, print this, okay, sorry, there should be just uh, two dot symbols. So when we say two dot symbols, it basically fills the characters, the sequence of uh, a b c a, a b c d e f g h, uh, you know, the entire alphabetical sequence. That will happen, as you can see. So that's because there were just uh, two dots specified. But had there been three, this wouldn't happen. Okay, it would just uh, display this uh, whole uh, thing again. So 
the thing you got to notice that the regular expression that we are uh, using here is uh, this one two dots okay so similarly you can uh, replace it with even uh, numbers so we can have 89 and you can say 33 so from 33 to 89 all the numbers will be uh, you know the sequence of the numbers will be present here and you can also have combinations like you know I can have uh, say P over here and I can have a A over here yeah when I do this the combination of A with uh, all of these uh, numbers would be visible so as you can see so A 33 B a 34p so things like that right so patterns are also being generated so that is the advantage with uh, some of these uh, regular expressions okay so I'm just gonna clear the screen now and uh, go on to the next topic okay so we are done with regular expressions now and uh, this takes us to the final part of uh, this uh, Linux demonstration okay this Linux webinar and uh, here we are going to talk about processes adding users and SSH all right so let's get started Okay, so uh, guys, processes is uh, something that's really important from the administration uh, perspective of Linux. Okay, well, it's I mean it's basically something that's a necessity, not more than you know uh, an important thing. It's most basically a necessity. I mean uh, you should know what this is. And when I say processes, I'm pretty sure that you know that we are talking about uh, the programs or instances of programs, right? So uh, anything that you start on your uh, system, so whether you're starting a web browser or whether you're uh, how you're using a media player so everything every software there it will have a process involved okay there can be multiple instances of that particular project uh, supposing I'm viewing a presentation on my uh, computer okay supposing I'm uh, seeing five different presentations at the same time I mean I'm, I can see only one at a time but I can have the remaining open and I can put them in the background right so uh, that's what we mean so the different instances of that particular system can also be considered as a process so at any point of time only one application or only one process will be in the foreground okay but many such uh, instances of many softwares or also of that particular software or program can be present in the background okay so the example of that is uh, me opening uh, two chrome browsers so i can have two different uh, chrome windows and uh, you know one can be in the background one can be in the foreground okay so similarly ppts or uh, whether it's uh, a media player anything like that so that's what a process is okay now going with definition an instance of a program is called a process all right any command given to the Linux kernel starts a new process and there can be multiple processes of the same program there can be multiple processes when we say processes it basically means instances so we can have any number of uh, instances of uh, any of your application right of Chrome or of uh, VLC media player of all those things you can have multiple such uh, instances at the same time and all these instances are referred to as processes okay official term is uh, processes and each of those processes have some process ID okay so uh, yeah like I told you they'll be divided into two different processes one is the foreground processes and the other one is the background processes okay so uh, how will you determine what are the different processes that are running in your uh, system in Windows you can just do control alt delete and then you'll uh, get the list of uh, programs right and you can even terminate them you can end the programs from there right so you have different tabs so let me show you an example of that okay so this is my Windows system okay and when I do control alt delete it starts my task manager and it asks me for applications or processes and all these things so this is the process that I'm talking about okay you can have any number of processes and running in your system okay you might not be aware of all of those things so yeah anyways uh, some may be started by you and some may not be started by uh, you right some may be started uh, at system boot and some of those uh, processes might be started by you when you're uh, running some command so that's what this is so every time you specify uh, you know a command in the uh, terminal or the kernel that will uh, boot a program or a software and that will uh, also alternatively start a process okay and every time you start it you will have a new process defined and if you want to see the list of all the uh, processes running in your system then you can use this top command okay and what you get followed by that will be the list of uh, processes and their uh, PID their user username their uh, priority all these things so I will talk about all these aspects in some time so let me first show you the different things and how they look in the uh, Linux in my VM okay so I'm gonna run here I'm gonna run the top command and when you do that you can see that you have something called as PID we have user you have uh, PR you have a whole taskbar and we have with respect to which software is running which program is running what is the application name and all these things okay so right here uh, you can't probably see anything that I have created on my own okay except for this uh, virtual box client and uh, maybe the terminal okay 
but uh, if you want me to create one then I can also create one so what I'll do is I can just uh, end this here by pressing uh, control C I can get out of this uh, top and what I'll do is I'll create a Firefox instance okay so Mozilla Firefox is installed in my system and through my uh, terminal I will start Firefox okay when I hit enter my Firefox uh, has been initiated okay see now I did not make any change okay I did not uh, touch the uh, Firefox icon but instead of that on its own Mozilla Firefox opened that is because I hit Firefox and I put enter the terminal so when I did that the uh, Firefox opened okay now I can just minimize this and if you go back to the terminal you'll see that I'm still inside uh, you know the terminals assuming that I'm still working on Firefox okay I've still not ended Firefox or that so when I uh, when I close Firefox that's when I'll come out of the terminal over here but instead of doing all that I can uh, simply do control Z or control W okay when I do control Z it means that I'm stopping my Firefox instance okay so uh, whatever Firefox uh, browser that was open that is stopped the process however would not be stopped the process would be running in the background okay now supposing I want to push it uh, if I want to bring it to the foreground I can just say uh, FG and I can give uh, Firefox okay this will again uh, initiate uh, Firefox for me but otherwise I can just uh, you know close it and I can push it also to the background I can say BG and I can say Firefox and if I give enter then my Firefox has been pushed to the background so now uh, what I'll do is let me run that top command again and if you see over here the Firefox was not visible okay but since I started and uh, pushed my Firefox to the background and all since I've done all these things my Firefox will be visible in this uh, list of uh, processes okay now uh, seems like I've sent it to the background right so that's why it's not coming so let me uh, hit Firefox again and it's opened uh, the uh, terminal now and what I'm gonna do is uh, of course it's in the background so I'm gonna run the top command again and show you that Firefox is here huh. so we have the Firefox here right as you can see there's a Firefox process that of course keeps uh, moving up and down and uh, it's all sorted by the priority that each process has okay so uh, yeah so every single uh, instance or every single program or uh, application that you start right so they will be started in this way and they will have a process ID associated with them they will have the time uh, for how long they've been uh, instantiated they'll have the CPU memory they're using the virtual memory they're using uh, and all these things okay so let me explain each of uh, these things by going to my slide first so if I go back to my slides okay as you can see here these are the different uh, blocks that you saw earlier okay on the uh, terminal so the first PID stands for the process ID so each process that is initiated which will have a unique process ID okay and the user here is uh, the name of the user who started that process and uh, PR is uh, refers to the priority of that process because uh, every process that is running in your uh, Linux it will have a priority associated with that okay and the greatest priority process is what will be executed first and that will be executed at the top and then so along with the priority of that process you have the niceness value so niceness value is uh, again you know the value ranges from minus 20 to uh, plus 20 and even the priority value uh, it varies from minus 20 to plus 20 okay so basically the uh, niceness value is uh, somewhere it's opposite to priority okay so the lesser the nice value the greater will be the priority of your uh, process you can also manually set the niceness value of your uh, process to increase the priority if you want to give a particular uh, program or a particular uh, process more priority then you can probably decrease the niceness value and uh, that will lead to the increase in priority on its own so that's what this is and then after that we have uh, this VRT block okay so VRT stands for virtual memory RES stands for the physical memory SHR stands for the shared memory S is the status of the uh, process so that's what uh, S is so S speaks about the status of that particular process okay and then percentage CPU is it is about the percentage uh, of the CPU time okay and percentage of the memory of the physical memory that's being used okay and then you have the time block which uh, refers to the total CPU time that uh, this process has been running for and then finally you have the command okay and then and then after the command you will have the process that is uh, actually running okay so uh, let me just quickly go back to my thing here so the command is basically the uh, application that's running okay so yeah that's about the different process I'm just gonna end this uh, top by giving uh, control Z when I give control Z uh, this stops and I can just clear my screen so that's about my processes okay now uh, I showed you how the top command works okay now along with that if you want to see the list of all the uh, processes that are running okay then you can see that by running this command PS uh, hyphen uh, space UX 
or uh, you can do this or you can even run ps hyphen pid so when you do that you will only get the list of processes that are uh, you know being started by you okay so you're the user i'm the user and uh, my name is edreka right so all the uh, processes which i have started right so all my processes will be visible of course uh, uh, the other users process will not be visible to me it will be only visible uh, for him okay so i can also give uh, pid otherwise ps pid okay the ps ux it uh, basically displays the process that uh, you have started okay so you any any program or anything that you have started that you can uh, see it here you can see you know what is the percentage of the memory that's being used because of that process what is the process id for that particular process and uh, all these things okay so uh, similarly if you have uh, you know anything else so that's what uh, this command does okay the next thing that i want to tell you is uh, that of finding the pid of a particular uh, process so you know that we've started uh, a particular process okay we started the firefox process that time and what i can do is i can find out the uh, pid of that particular process by giving this command pid of and uh, what is the name of the process uh, so in my case it's firefox so i'm just going to give pid of and firefox that will give me the pid of that particular uh, process 5836 okay now i'm going to clear screen okay now i'm going to run the process again okay i'm going to start firefox again and when i do this there is a new instance of firefox that starts okay so a new process would have uh, started by now and uh, when i just give control z i'm kind of stopping my process and uh, now if i give ps hyphen ux then you can see here that there's a new firefox process that starts that's running okay the id is 6060 okay you can verify that by also giving uh, by seeing what is the answer that i get if i uh, pid of firefox when i do this i get 6060 so that is uh, what this is all about okay and if you see the status it's uh, also showing as a tl okay this means that i've uh, terminated that process okay so process of firefox has uh, been instantiated it has a pid of 6060 okay and uh, you know if i want to kill this process then i can give the command kill 6060 all right great so that's about the different process that i want to talk to you about okay so uh, what's next is uh, let me go back to the slides and talk about the next topic all right so i spoke about uh, processes here and uh, the next topic is uh, pro this is the penultimate topic actually and i'm going to tell you how to create your own users so you can uh, create users by this command simply uh, saying uh, sudo user add and uh, the username okay if you want to set password to that person then you got to say password and uh, the username of that password and then it will prompt you to set a password for that person and similarly if you want to delete that particular user you can say user delete and then uh, the name of that username whichever you want to delete okay uh, but one thing is that you got to always use sudo before that because uh, these commands cannot be executed by users like us okay we need a root access for that we need uh, only root users who have uh, super user permissions can uh, do this so that's why we use uh, sudo and we enter the password for it okay now uh, one thing you need to notice that when a user is created then by default he is uh, also added to a particular group okay there'll be sometimes there'll be a default group to which uh, that person will be added and if uh, you want to add a user to a particular group then you can uh, just do that by using the user mod command okay you can say user mod uh, hyphen g uh, g represents uh, the group and then you can say the group name and the username so the group name that you want to set and followed by the username of uh, that particular person suppose you want to add your own groups then you can do that by group add and group name and then if you want to delete them it's again the same thing okay after this process then again you can uh, assign them a different group okay so let me just show it to you on my terminal okay so the first command is uh, adding a user right so before anything let me just go to system go to administration and uh, user and groups it asks for a password okay i'm giving okay when you go there you see that there are two users currently so edureka and uzi so these are the two users and in groups again there are uh, edureka and uzi so there are two groups here also now uh, if i want to add users i can add it from here okay i can just i can click on add user and i can give the username i can give the full name password and all these things from the gui but uh, you know the cli is a more simpler version where i can just uh, supply a command okay so i'm going to say uh, user add space uh, i can give the name of the user so if i want to create a user for myself okay i can uh, give this name user user add vardhan okay but of course it's not going to work because it would say we need uh, sudo access permission denied right so what i'll do is i'll uh, give sudo access it asks for the root password 
and when you give the password you don't have any argument so that means your user has been uh, created successfully so if you go back to system and administration and if you go to uh, user and groups you'll find that there's a new user that's added and uh, the user id is 502 okay now let me just minimize this for now uh, similarly if you want to set a password for this user because right now it might not have a password and if you want to set a password then you got to run this command sudo password and the username username is uh, vardhan so i'm going to do this hit and enter it will say changing the new password for the user okay and uh, let's say the new password is uh, this and it will say retype the new password i can give it here and then the tokens are updated successfully okay password is updated successfully so that's what uh, this is all about so if i go back to this uh, user window and if i click on vardhan then you'll know that uh, there's a password that's been added over here okay this is what i added from here and you'll also notice that there's a new home directory that's created for that person so all these things right uh, so that's about creating a user supposing you want to create a new group then uh, how will you do it uh, similarly just say group add so i'm going to say uh, sudo and then enter this so the group has been added successfully and if i go back to the system under administration under users and groups if i go to groups now even inst is something that's created so this vardhan is something that got created uh, now because uh, as and when you create a new user right when you create a user without uh, you know by specifying any any group then automatically is added to uh, a group so a group is created automatically when a user is created and it is the same as the username so that's how this got created but anyways this is the new group so i'm just going to do uh, control l and uh, same way if you want to delete any users uh, it's again a very simple process you can just do a sudo and uh, user delete and the name of that user okay if I want to delete Vardhan, then I can uh, do this. Yeah, so I'm not able to delete it right now because Vardhan is currently logged in. So if I just uh, log off from this VM and if I uh, uh, log in as Vardhan and log out from there, and then as a root, if I execute this command, then I would be able to uh, delete this uh, user. And the command is, is uh, very simple. This is the command, and uh, you can all try it at home. All right. And similarly, if you want to delete any group, uh, again, the uh, command is uh, simple it's uh, group delete. And then the name of the group that is uh, INST, okay, which I created. So if you do this, the group has been deleted now, okay? Yeah, as you can see, now INST is not visible, okay? So that was uh, the previous window. I hadn't refreshed it. So now if you see, INST is deleted. So that's how you delete the group and that's how you uh, delete a user. All right, so that's uh, that brings us to an end uh, to this topic. So I'm just going to clear the screen. And uh, what I can do is I can just uh, go back to my slides and get started with this final uh, slide of mine so guys uh, this is the last topic for today that is the the secure uh, shell okay it's also called the ssh and this is for uh, gaining remote access of uh, a system okay so uh, you can get access to a system which is remotely located so without you physically accessing that system you can get access through this uh, ssh server okay so that's what the ssh does okay it's called secure shell the connection is called uh, secure shell connection so uh, all the other uh, topics in this uh, session, right, today's session, they were all basic uh, stuff which any user could uh, learn. But uh, this one, this uh, SSH is something a little, it's a little advanced. And this is, and this is with uh, respect to networking, okay? You know, it's a thing that people would look forward to, okay? So if it's, uh, you know, if you guys are waiting for a long time and if you're uh, feeling bored in the session, then uh, this is something that's going to be a little more fun. You're going to do something real time and you're going to see something uh, incredible happen here. Okay. By pinging and accessing some other machine. So first of all, how does secure shell work? So we have two different uh, systems, right? But in my case, it'll be two different VMs. And uh, in general, it'll be two different uh, systems which are remotely located. And you can get access to them by the help of this SSH. And uh, how is that possible? By setting the IP address and uh, all those things, right? You set the IP address and in two different places. You set one system as the master and you set the other system as the slave. And uh, you basically what you do is you have something called as the uh, ATC hosts. Okay. So you go to this uh, file and you set the master and the slave IPs over here. Okay. You'll have to set up this IP for uh, the master and this uh, IP for the slave machine. And then you can do the if config or the IP adder show to list down the uh, IP address of that particular machine. So if it's uh, something other than what you want to set, then you can just uh, do that by deleting the existing IP table, running this command in both the uh, machines, and then to add an IP address to that uh, machine, you can uh, run this command. So do IP adder, add, and the IP address you want to add. Okay. So remember to uh, set the mask for that, and when you enter this command, 
this particular IP address will be set for that particular node. Okay, so that will be the master's node and set this IP address for the slave node. Okay, the command will be the same, but before that you got to delete the IP address, the existing one by this command and then add the new IP address uh, at the slave end with this command and then uh, simply just type SSH master or SSH slave. Okay. So when you do that uh, your secure connection would be established and you if you see the username then you will realize that okay you're logged in into the different uh, system okay uh, that's what I want to show you now and that's what I'm going to uh, do it but before that you might have uh, some problems like firewalls and stuff like that okay if you have a firewall you can still set up an SSH connection okay but the problem is you will have to generate RSA key and all and I don't want to do that because it's a little more complicated and since you people are beginners I just want to show you by turning the firewall off okay and to turn the firewall off what you got to do is you got to drop the IP table okay it will just stop your IP table and this command will permanently disable your IP table so this is with respect to Linux so when you do these two things then you can get started all right so uh, let me go to my uh, VM and show you what are the two different machines that I will be pinging to okay as you can see so this is uh, the VM which I was working on right so let's say cancel and I'm just going to minimize this terminal okay and let me just uh, close every other uh, file and folder all right this is my terminal that's uh, minimized so if you can see here you have uh, something called as master written right so this is the uh, master machine and if I go back to my virtual box you can see that this is the machine that's already running okay now this is the slave machine which I will ping so I need to instantiate this slave machine also and even when uh, you are pinging two different machines two remote machines or two machines in the same VM then what you got to do is uh, you know you got to turn on both and you got to set the IP address in both the places and then you got to ping them from there so let's just wait until the slave opens all right when it's launched we can uh, start with our commands but in the meanwhile I can just go to my master terminal and uh, I can go to the terminal and start executing my IP tables okay so uh, let me check if my connections are all running let me click on this okay now that both my uh, network connections are on so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say if config okay so when you do an if config you will get this kind of an output okay so your at zero is uh, is your NAT address is your network ad uh, address translation okay and your at one in my case it's at one but uh, generally you people will not get an at one because this comes when you're running a VM okay so I have uh, set up a bridged adapter okay host only adapter actually where between my two VMs so I have a master VM and a slave VM right yeah since there are two VMs in the same machine I need to set different IP addresses for both the VMs right so that's when at one comes into the picture otherwise in your case if you're running running Linux and if you run this if config tab then you will not get at one you'll only get at zero or you'll just get one option you'll get L naught and you'll get at zero okay and uh, this L naught basically uh, represents the uh, NAT address okay so this 10.0.2.15 point point this basically is your IP address which you need to use to connect to the internet so if you don't get an address over here then it means you're not connected to the internet okay so that's what uh, this means and right now my uh, at1 address is 192.160.56.2 okay and similarly if I go to my slave VM let me just log in here first as you can see from here it's a slave VM and if I launch my terminal what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the command if config again, right? So right now it says that my uh, okay I don't have a 9net address. Okay, my uh, network is not connected. Okay, I have at one connection and that is 192.168.56.2. Okay, but my NAT address is not set. So I think I'm disconnected from the internet. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on system at zero, and when I do this, I'll be connected to the internet now, and I'm going to run this command again. And uh, now if you see I have the uh, NAT address okay so this is my network address 10.0.2.15 and in, in case of my master VM 10.0.2.15 was again the uh, NAT address okay it's the same but however the at one would have to be different okay I mean whether it's different or not I need to change my uh, at one but now what matters is I need to ping my uh, slave from my master right so I need to uh, drop whatever uh, IP address is there right now so uh, if this is the IP then I have to drop this IP so even in your case uh, by default there will be one uh, random IP address you can drop that IP address by uh, running one of the commands which I showed you in my slides I'll uh, show you that again similarly you got to do the same thing at even your master's end you got to drop the IP uh, with the at one IP address and when you when you've done that you can set your new IP address so you will be setting two different IP addresses one for your master and one for your uh, slave okay this you'll be setting one over here in this VM 
and you'll be setting one over here and uh, that address will be over here okay so i'll make my uh, slave as uh, 192.168.56.3 okay so i'll drop this one and i'll update it as uh, .3 and in fact master can be the same 192.168.56.2 can be the you know the ip address of my uh, master slave okay so i'll use these two things and once i add these two uh, ip addresses to the uh, etc slash hosts file then i can start pinging them okay i can start pinging them and i can get uh, remote access to them all right so what i'll do is i'll first uh, clear the screen and i'll go to my slave and again i'll do the same thing i'll i'm going to clear the screen now so going back to my uh, VM, the first command that uh, we got to run is we got to drop this particular IP address. So to delete the IP address, we have this command uh, sudo IP adder delete and then whatever the IP address is. Okay, so here uh, this was the IP address, right? I'm going to drop the th1 address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this here. I'm going to say dev th1. Now when I hit enter, this particular IP address will be dropped okay okay this is the password okay now if i again run if config you can see that uh, i don't have an f1 address that's because i dropped it over here correct let me just show it to you that's because i dropped this particular address okay now similarly let me run the same command in my uh, slave also the command is ip adder delete the ip address over here is uh, 192.168.56.2 okay so this is the same here also so I'm going to just uh, paste it here and say dev at one when I give enter. Okay, I need to give uh, sudo. So that is a problem. So I'm going to give sudo IP adder. It asks for the password. There you go. And uh, yeah, my IP address has been uh, discarded. Okay, now if I again run the if config, you can see that at one again does not have any IP address. Now, what I need to do is I need to set my own IP address over here. So let me first set the IP address over here itself in my uh, this uh, slave VM. So to uh, add the IP address, the command is almost the same except that instead of delete, you will have to put add. Okay, and uh, you will have to specify the IP address you want to set. So I want to set 192.168.56.102. Okay, I'm going to say that 102, and then I need to give a mask. So if you remember, I told you that we need to give a mask. So it'll be slash 24 or let me give 103 because this is the slave, right? I can give 103 here, 103 slash 24. When I give enter, the IP address would have been added. So if I do the if config, now you can see that th1 has this address 192.168.56.103. This is what I added some time back, right? This is what I added here. Now, similarly, I need to go back to my uh, master VM and uh, I've uh, deleted the uh, IP address from here. I need to add the IP address here, the new one. Okay. So the command is uh, add 192.168.56.102 slash the mask. That's 24. Give enter. Okay. Now let me check the if config. As you can see, the uh, IP address for my th1 is there. It's uh, up and running now. It's 192.168.56.102 over here in this case. Okay. Now, I've, uh, now that I've done this, uh, there's one more important thing that I need to do. I need to add my IP addresses to the etc slash hosts file, which indicates to both the VMs where the master is and uh, what is the IP address of the master and what is the IP address of the slave. Okay. Now that I've uh, added this one, so let me just uh, copy this address. I'm going to copy this and I need to set this address of the master and similarly the address of the uh, slave in the etc slash hosts file. Okay. How will you access the etc slash uh, hosts file? You need to first go to your uh, home directory and from here, okay, let me clear the screen, home directory. So here you got to give sudo gedit slash etc slash hosts, okay. When you hit enter, you'll open this file, okay. This file is called uh, hosts slash etc file. So in here, you know, I've already set my IP addresses, okay. Now I can just uh, delete it for namesake. And I can just copy or uh, paste what I uh, had copied. So it was 192.168.56.102. This is the IP address of the master, which I wanted to set. Correct. If you see here, this is the IP address that I added now. And I'm adding this IP address dot one or two to the host. I'm going to add that as master. And similarly, if I go to the uh, slave, the IP address is 192.168.56 and 103. Okay. Now I need to go to the etc file and uh, since that is a slave, I got to set the IP address for the slave and of course, even the slave IP is already set, but 
but I'll just uh, update it and save it anyways. I'm gonna save this and I'm gonna close this. Okay. Now, uh, similarly, I need to go to the uh, slave VM and set these two IP addresses. Okay. Now, uh, again, the command is go to cd and uh, go write sudo gedit slash edc slash hosts. Okay. So here also the IP address is set to 102 and uh, 103. Okay. Now this is the slave VM and uh, the IP address of this machine is 103 and the master is uh, 102. Okay. That's the other VM. So uh, I mean it's the same. So I don't need to make any changes here. I'm just going to close this. Yeah. I can just uh, close it without saving. Now, uh, now that I've done this, I can straight away start pinging or uh, get SSH connection. Okay. I can just say since this is the slave, I can say SSH space master. Now, since I've added the IP address of the master in the uh, host table, I don't need to specify the IP address of that particular system. I can just say SSH master and if I put enter, then it will ask me for the master's password and the other VM's password is what I'm going to put here. And when I put enter, as you can see, I'm uh, logged in now. So the password has been entered and uh, you can see the last login here. Okay. So the last time I logged in was on uh, this date and I had logged in from this slave itself. Okay. From this particular VM itself. So uh, to prove that this is the actual master, what I can do is I can uh, just go to CD and I can do an LS command. Okay. I can go into any of these uh, desktop or the downloads or the pictures uh, folders, right? Because I made quite a few changes in my master slave and from the master slave is where I showed you the earlier uh, files, right? I created the automobile.txt, the file1.txt, the file2.txt. Okay. If you can remember, then my documents has uh, these contents. Okay. It has folder one, it has uh, automobiles.txt and all these things. So I can just uh, add the same to my slave. So I can just navigate to desktop. And if I do an LS, I get the list of all these things. Okay. So as you can see, there is uh, the automobiles.txt and the readme file in my downloads folder. Okay. Now let me go to my uh, master. So in my master, if I go to downloads, I have these two files. Okay. So this is what I mean when I say remote access. So these two VMs are communicating with each other such that the slave is uh, accessing and it's running commands inside the master and whatever is visible over there, I get access to here. Supposing you want me to, uh, you know, open another file. Okay. So the music folder has these three uh, files, right? So I can access these also. I can just uh, say CD and uh, go back one path and say I want a smooth change to music. So when I go here and I do an LS, I have automobiles.txt, file1.txt and file2.txt. So basically these three text files are present in the other VM in the other machine. Okay. They are present over here. However, they are not present in this machine. If you want me to prove that they are not there in this machine, then I can just minimize this, go to uh, in the file directory go to music. Okay, it's empty. So this basically means that I'm accessing the master VM from this slave VM. Okay, alternatively, you can also check the downloads folder. There's nothing here either. So yeah, that's how we log into the remote machine. And in my case, I've logged into slave from my machine and I've accessed these folders. Okay, I can also view these uh, contents in these folder by going to cat automobiles.txt and when I hit enter, whatever uh, data set that I created earlier in the session, right? couple of hours back. So those are visible over here. Okay. So that's it. So another thing is that if you want to exit from your master's machine, right? If you want to exit your SSH uh, shell, then you can just hit exit. Okay. When you hit exit, it says uh, log out. Okay. Connection to master is closed. So this shows that you now we are back to your own VM. And now if you uh, try going to CD and uh, if you go to music or something, you'll not find any documents or any folders in that particular directory. That's because this is your VM. This is the slave VM. And similarly, I can just, uh, you know, from my uh, master's VM also, I can get access to the slave VM by just uh, typing in SSH and slave. The password is uh, this and this is the last time that was logged in and uh, I'm here. If I go to CD music and if I do an LS, there's nothing available here. Okay. That's because uh, the slaves VM does not have anything in the music folder or anything in the uh, documents folder. So that is the reason. Okay. And similarly, I can exit from here by giving this command exit. It says uh, it's logged out and connection to slave is closed. Okay, guys. So this is uh, about the SSH and uh, this is about the secure uh, shell connection. There is something called as the uh, RSA key. Okay. Now that is something that will get generated if there is a firewall. So in my case, I have uh, blocked my firewall by dropping the IP tables. Okay. So the uh, command to drop the IP tables are this one. 
they are service IP tables and stop okay this will uh, drop the IP table temporarily and if you want to permanently disable the IP table then you can just uh, run the command sudo uh, check config and IP tables off so by doing this your uh, firewall will be turned off and you can use the SSH connection in the way I showed you okay now this is a very simpler way but in case of a real scenario okay where the machine is located remotely where you cannot actually disable your firewall okay because firewall is important to uh, block any unauthorized access right so firewall is important to be enabled so in that case if you want uh, an SSH connection to be present in spite of a firewall then there's another uh, procedure where you have to generate an SSH uh, key right an RSA key from the master's end and set that uh, key at the slave end so you have that kind of a process and uh, that is something that's a little more complicated than this and of course that I can't show you now but uh, I promise to show you that in my uh, next Linux webinar okay so if you guys promise to come back and visit me in that webinar then I can uh, promise you to uh, show it to you there alright guys so uh, I'm uh, hoping that it's all fine I'm hoping that you people understood the concepts here and uh, it's been a good session it's been pretty long but it's been worth it right uh, basically uh, Hemant who's uh, new to computer science he says that you know he's uh, got a lot of you know and he's understood Linux well and uh, yeah he also says that he's going to install CentOS. Okay, Leonard Hemant, that's good because even uh, this was CentOS. Maybe this is why you want to install CentOS. But don't just keep yourself uh, restricted to this CentOS, Hemant. You can also install Ubuntu and find out which one you like. So, see, I like CentOS and uh, this is my preferred uh, Linux distribution. Okay, so I recommend everything Ubuntu and CentOS to you. You can install them and uh, you work on them and you will only figure out uh, which is better for you. So let's talk a little bit about the kernel and the shell. So what is a kernel? Now the computer programs that allocate the system resources and coordinate all the details of the computer's internals is basically known as the kernel. Now the kernel is the heart of any operating system. It interacts with the hardware and most of the tasks like memory management, task scheduling and file management. Now users communicate with the kernel through a program called the shell. The shell is that utility that processes your requests. When you type in a command, basically at your terminal, the shell interprets the command and calls the program that you want. The shell uses standard syntax for all commands. It is basically a command line interpreter which translates commands entered by the user and converts them into a language that is understood by the kernel. And obviously the next logical question is what is a shell script? Since I spoke about the shell, it is only obvious that I'm going to mention the shell script. The basic concept of a shell script is a list of commands which are listed in order of execution. With that, let's move on to our next topic which is evolution of the shell. So let's begin with a short history of the modern shells and then explore some of the useful and exotic shells that are available in Linux today. All right. So the shell or the command line interpreter have a long history, but this discussion begins with the first ever Unix shell. Ken Thompson of Bell Labs discovered the first shell for the Unix called the V6 in 1971. Now similar to its predecessor, this shell was an independent user program that could be executed outside the kernel. Now I'm not going to talk about the Thompson shell. We are going to begin our journey with a look at the modern shell since 1977 when the Bourne shell was introduced. Now the Bourne shell created by Stephen Bourne at the AT&T Bell Labs remains useful even today. The author developed the Bourne shell after working on an Algol 68 compiler so you'll find its grammar more similar to the algorithmic language than other shells. Now the source code itself although developed in C even made use of macros to give it the Algol 68 flavor. Now the Bourne shell had two primary goals to serve as a command line interpreter to interactively execute commands for the operating system and for scripting. In addition to replacing the Thompson shell, the Bourne shell offered several advantages over its predecessors. Now the Bourne introduced control flows, loops and variables into scripts providing a more functional language to interact with the operating system. Now the shell also permitted you to use shell scripts as filters providing integrated support for handling signals but lacked the ability to define functions. Finally, it incorporated a number of features that we use today, including command substitution 
and hear documents to embed preserved string literals within a script. Now, the bone shell was not only an important step forward, but also an anchor for numerous derivatives, many of which are used today in typical Linux systems. Next, we have the seashell, which came in 1978. It was created by Bill Joy while he was still a graduate student. It has been widely distributed beginning with the two BSD release of Berkeley software distribution. The C shell is a command processor typically run in a text window, allowing the user to type commands. Now, the C shell can also read commands from a file called a script. Like all Linux shells, it supports file name, wildcarding, piping, here documents, command substitution, variables, and control structures for condition testing. What differentiated the C shell from others, especially in the 1980s, were its interactive features and overall style. Its new features made it easier and faster to use. The overall style of the language looked more like C programming language and was seen as more readable. Now, another improvement that we saw on the bone shell was the corn shell in 1983. It was developed by David Korn of Bell Labs again as a comprehensive combined version of other major shells that were present at that time. The initial development was based on the bone shell source code. Now, the corn shell is backward compatible with the bone shell and includes many features of the C shell as well. Now, the corn shell compiles with POSIX 2 shell and utilities major differences between the corn shell and the traditional bond shell include job control command aliasing and command history that is designed after the corresponding c shell features after the corn shell we have the 10x c shell which was a derivative of your basic c shell now this shell in 1983 was essentially the c shell but with programmable command line completion command line editing and a few other features then we have bash which still remains one of the most popular shells even in today's time now this was written by brian fox for the gnu project as a free software replacement for the bond shell it had been distributed widely as default login shell for most linux distributions and apple's mac os now the bash can also read and execute commands from a file like all Linux and Unix shells, it supports file name globbing, piping, here documents, and command substitution. The keywords, syntax, and other basic features of the language are all from the basic shell. The shell's name is an acronym for Born Again Shell, a pun on the name of the Born Shell that it replaces. The bash command syntax is a superset of the Born Shell command syntax. It supports brace expansion, command line completion, basic debugging, and exception handling using trap. Now it can execute the vast majority of shell scripts without modification, with the exception of the bond shell scripts tumbling into fringe syntax behavior. The bash command syntax includes ideas drawn from the corn shell and the C shell as well. After that, the world came across various other shells such as the public domain corn shell, which was basically a public domain or a free version of the corn shell. You had the alchemist shell, then you had the extensible shell or the plan 9 shell. Today we have many other shells, namely your Z shell, your Debian Armquist shell or the Dash shell, and the Mir BSD corn shell. In this segment, I am going to majorly focus on four shells, which will give you an idea of all the other derivative shells as well i'm going to be talking about first the basic shell the bone shell i'm going to talk about the born again shell the corn shell the 10x c shell and an exotic shell called the scheme shell moving on let's talk a little bit about shell versus bash now most people use these two terms synonymously but they are not the same thing now, the shell command language is a programming language which is described by the POSIX standard. It has many implementations, including the bash. Now, because shell is a specification and not an implementation, the slash bin slash sh is a symlink or a hard link to an actual implementation on most of the POSIX systems. Now, the bash started as a shell compatible implementation, but as time passed, it has acquired many extensions. 
Now many of these extensions may change the behavior of valid POSIX shell scripts. So by itself bash is not a POSIX shell. Rather it is a dialect of the POSIX shell. So summarizing about this I would say that shell is actually a specification of which bash is an implementation. For a long time the shebang line of the shell script used to point to the bash on most Linux systems. As a result, it has become more safe to ignore the difference between the two. But both of them are pretty much different things. With that, let's look at shell versus bash versus a few other Linux shells. First of all, the C shell. Now, if you are a network or systems administrator in a Linux or Unix environment, you will most certainly run into the C shell. So it is good to at least have some familiarity with it. Now casual users and even most developers will probably suggest other shells, but if you are comfortable with C programming language, then the C shell is a great shell to begin with. Now the con shell is the one that you can use interactively to execute commands from the command line or programmatically to create scripts that can automate many computer maintenance and system administration tasks. Now bash is far too big a subject to be covered fully in a single line, but it is one of the most commonly used scripting languages that you will find today. People are comfortable with bash scripting and most of the content that you will find around shell scripting will be in bash, but you should probably learn it for its versatility and ease of use more than anything. Most colleges and universities teach their students to script in bash because it's a great place to begin as well. So now I'm going to run the same script in three different shells which are derivatives of the three most basic shells which are your bond shell, your C shell and your con shell to see how different or similar they are. So for that I have opened up my terminal. This is CentOS 7, the Fedora version. So what I'm going to try to do is take a single argument which is going to be a directory name and my script is supposed to search recursively for all executable files in that directory along with the number of files that are found. I'm going to reuse the script design in each of the examples to illustrate the differences. So first let's see what directories do we have. Okay, so what I'm interested in is this Eclipse directory. So what I'm going to do is. Okay, this is one file Java oxygen. Let's see if it's executable or not. Okay, as we see the Java oxygen file is executable. So when I pass Eclipse as an argument, this directory as an argument to any of my scripts, I am supposed to get an answer that this Java oxygen file is executable and the number of executable files found in that particular directory is equal to one. So first I'm going to run the 10x shell and see. So I'm going to go and open up this 10x shell. So basically what I did is open up my 10x script. It's divided into three basic sections. First note that I use the shebang symbol to declare this file as interpretable by the defined shell. This allows me to execute the file as a regular executable rather than proceed it with an interpreter binary. All right. It maintains a count of the executable files found. So I initialize this count with zero here. So the first section this section right here tests the arguments passed by the user. This argv variable represents the number of arguments that are passed excluding the command name itself. Now you can access these arguments by specifying their index. For example, if I say this hash one, it refers to the first argument. The script is expecting one argument. If it doesn't find it, it emits an error image. So using this, dollar zero I'm going to indicate the command name that was typed. Now let's come to the second section. This basically ensures that the argument passed in was a directory. The D operator here the hyphen D operator here returns true if the argument is a directory but note that I specify a not directory sign here this exclamatory symbol which means negate. 
Now this way the expression says that if an argument is not a directory you emit an error message which is this one and for the final section it iterates the files in the directory to test whether they are executable. I use the convenient for each iterator which loops through each entry in the parentheses in this case which is the directory and then tests each as a part of the loop. Now this step here uses the hyphen X operator to test whether the file is an executable. If it is the file is emitted and the count is increased. I end the script by emitting the count of executables here. Okay, so now that we have understood what the script is, let's go ahead and run this. And then I'm going to try Eclipse. And as we had predicted, it says that Java Oxygen is your executable file and one executable files found. Now let me clear this out for you. Next, let's try doing the same thing with our corn shell. Now this is the code. Now as you can see our shebang line immediately it's different. Now this corn shell is a derivative of the bond shell and it looks so much more similar to it than the C shell. So let's look at our example again. Now the first thing you'll notice here is its similarity to the first code that I had put up. Let me open it side by side for you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I am going to open another new terminal. Let me just open another tab right here, another new window. So I can basically show you the similarity between both of these. So I'm going to go ahead and. Okay, now we have these two on both sides. So the first thing you'll notice on your corn shell script is its similarity to the 10x shell script. Structurally, the script is almost identical. The first, second and third parts of the script, you have your test arguments, then you have your ensure argument, which is a directory, and then you iterate the directory to emit the executable files. But the key differences are evident in the way conditionals, expressions, and the iteration is performed. For example, instead of operating C like test operators, the KSH adopts the typical bond style operators. So here you can see this not equal to versus here this not equal to. Now the corn shell also has some differences related to the iteration. Now in the corn shell, the for in structure is used with the command substitution to represent the list of files created from the standard output of the command ls representing the contents of the name subdirectory. In addition to the other features defined here, the con supports the alias feature to replace a word with the user defined string. Now the con has many other features that are disabled by default such as file name completion, but you can enable it if you want to. So let me close this. So let's try running this file and let's put in Eclipse again. And as you see, the answer is the same. Okay, finally, we are going to try the same thing using the bash or the born again shell. Now the bash has continued to evolve with new features, support for regular expressions and associative arrays. Now, although some of these features may not be present in other scripting languages, it's possible to write scripts that are compatible with other languages. To this point, this script that you see here is identical to the corn shell script, except for the shebang difference. Let me open the corn shell real quick and give you a side by side comparison on this. Okay, so as you can see, it's pretty much the same except for your shebang line, which obviously has to be different because of where they are pointing. One key difference among these shells is the licenses under which they are released. Now the bash as you would expect having been developed by the GNU project is released under GPL, but the C shell 10 X C shell Z shell and so on are released under BSD in BSD like license. The corn shell is available under the common public license. But apart from that, as you can see, the way you write the script in bash and corn is the same except for their shebang line. 
so let me just run this and show it to you and as you can see the answer is the same now my point being why i chose these three specific shells is that it will give you an idea of how all the other derivative shells work more or less it's going to be similar to these three basic shells else your logic will always remain the same with that let me move back to my presentation now apart from these you can go ahead and pick the shell you like many of the ideas and much of the interfaces of the shells remain the same almost 35 years later a tremendous testament to the original authors of the early shells now in an industry that continuously reinvents itself the shell has been improved upon but not substantially changed although there have been attempts to create specialized shells customized shells the born shell derivatives continue to be the primary shells in use let's look at our hardware requirements you should have a system with at least 2 gigahertz dual core processor or better a system memory of 4 gb or more and a recommended free disk space of at least 25 gb now let's look at the software requirements we are going to be doing this on our system with windows 10 installed also we are going to use a tool called virtualbox alternatives to this also exist like vmware but we will be using virtualbox here also it is important that you enable virtualization in your bios settings for the pc otherwise virtualbox won't run so let's move on to the demo part setting up the linux vm on our system has two major steps the first thing for you to do is download the virtualbox utility and second is to download linux we will be using ubuntu here which is a very popular linux distribution so let's first go ahead and download virtualbox open the link and go to your download section as i am having windows here i'll click on this and then my setup should start now i'll just cancel this setup because i have already downloaded the file before as you can see i have my file here and the other thing for you to do is to download the linux distribution so to do that type in ubuntu download here you can download the latest ubuntu and as you can see it has the recommended systems requirement over here which we talked about before to download the ubuntu you click on this download button and soon enough the download should begin now the download process starts but i have already downloaded this as well on my system so i have my virtual box over here with my linux distribution here so let's install virtual box first to do this open the setup and follow these steps now we can start installing the oracle virtual box so click next and go with the normal location and continue clicking next and this shows warning here but don't be worried about it this won't have any issues so click on yes and then install now that the installation has finished let's start our virtual box so now that the virtual box is now open we need to create a new vm so to do this we click on this button new and we provide it a name and i provide it up to 4 gb of ram now i'll create my hard disk and this will be dynamically allocated now that you have this setup what you need to do is that you need to copy this iso image and load it into our vm so to do that you need to click on settings here and select this now provide it with your file so i select my ubuntu here this is my ubuntu image and i'll open it now hit okay 
and start the VM. Now, let's maximize this. And here, I'll select the first option. So, because this is your first time doing this, it might take up to like 2 hours at max for you to set up this environment. Now, click on install Ubuntu and follow along the instructions. Now restart your system. Now you should have a working Ubuntu system on your virtual box. And with that the demo is concluded. In this way you can set up a number of virtual machines on your system and continue your DevOps journey. The first thing we talk about is the Linux directory commands. So what we'll do here is we'll take a look at each command and what they work like in Linux. So the first command is the pwd command, right? So the pwd command is basically used to display the location of your current working directory. Now directory is basically a file. You have to realize that everything in Linux is a file. So directory is a file which contains other files as well. Right, so the pwd file is used to display the location of the current working file directory that you have. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, pwd is the syntax for it and it basically shows you whichever directory you have. So let's take a look at it. Right then, so let's say you want to check out the directory for one of your files. So let's say you go to files and you open up terminal. And then you type in pwd. So this is basically your directory. It is in home and kb is the user, right? So this is basically what pwd does. Moving on to the next command. So next up, we have the second command, which is the mkdir, which is basically make directory. Now make directory is used to make different new directories under any directory that's already there. So let's say for example we've already seen that we are in the directory home and if you want to make a new directory under any existing directories that are present in Linux you use the mkdir command and for syntax of the command you'll have mkdir and then your directory name right so let's say for example if you want to name your new directory then you just have to write mkdir and new directory so let's take a look at it right so you're already here in the terminal and you're inside the directory right with pwd so what we do here is you make a new directory say mkdir and let's say new dir so now if you basically ls into it we'll come to ls later but if you ls into it you can see there's a new directory that has been formed here so this is the mkdir command so moving on to the next one so the next one is basically another command called rmdir. Just like you make a directory, you can also remove a directory. So remove directory is basically used to delete a directory that you've already created. And to basically make that happen, you'll have to type in rmdir and your directory name. So let's take a look at how it works, right? So as you can see here, you've made a new directory called new dir. So to delete it, all you have to do is rm dir and directory and it has been removed. Now if you cross check it, you'll see that your directory has been removed, right? So this is how remove directory command works rm dir. Moving on to the next command. Next up, we basically have the ls command. Like in previous examples, we used ls, right? So ls command is used to display a list of the content that is present in a directory. So let's say 
you have a directory which is the home directory and you want to see what's present inside that directory so if you just type in ls it'll show you all of the files present in the present directory there and for the syntax you just need to type in ls and you'll get all the files that's there so let's just check it out so suppose you want to check out the system files inside your directory so if you go to your computer directory you'll just type in ls in the terminal and these are all the files that are present in this directory which is the my computer for linux since there is no my computer for linux you'll have all these files the system files that you have so this is basically what ls does so ls basically just displays the contents of the directory that's there right now if you want to see which directory i'm talking about i'm talking about this directory which is computer right all of these files that you see bin boot dev etc all you got to do is just type in ls and you can see them so this is the ls command so moving on to the next command so the next command we see is basically the cd command now the cd command is used to change the directory that you're currently in right so if you go to the computer directory with all the system files that's there just type in ls and you can basically see all the files that's there right so you want to go into one of those files and check the contents of those files right you want to change the directory now these are sub directories that are already present in the computer directory right so you just change directory to let's say bin or library or dev so you just need to type cd change directory and the name of the directory right and you will basically get into that directory so let's just check it out so basically guys if you can go to terminal you see right right now you're in the root directory the root directory is always shown as a slash it's a forward slash right so if you want to change directories let's say let's check out the directories that are there we'll check out the contents of your root directory you will just have to type ls and you can see these are directories so to change the directory what you have to do is simply type in cd and choose any of these directories that you have let's say you want to get it to bin and that's it you go into bin now your directory has changed from the root directory to the bin directory now the bin directory is a part of the root directory so we have slash and then bin but now you've changed your directory to bin so this is the cd command so moving on first we saw the linux directory commands now we move on to the linux file commands so there are various linux file commands the first one we talk about is the touch command so basically the touch command is used to create empty files and you can create multiple files by executing the touch command only once for example if you see here you can create an empty file called file.txt and you can also create two files in the same command so you now as you can see if you type in touch file 2 or file 3 or whatever the name of your file might be you can create n number of files at one go so this is basically what touch is used for and for the syntax touch basically you have to write touch and then the file name and if you want to make two or more files together you can write touch and then add the file names one after the other so let's check it out so guys i'll basically make a file in this folder called linux that i have right so all i need to do is just as you can see there are other files as well so let's see how we can create a new file and all you have to do is open in terminal so guys as you can see i have basically just seeded into this and it's in the linux folder like we saw before and we'll create a new file just to do that you'll have to type touch and edureka2 for example and after that you'll just have to check it out so edureka2 is basically a file that you've just created now yeah. if you want to create another file for example two files together let's check that out as well let's first clear this out so to clear your terminal you'll just have to type in clear and that's it right so let's create more than one file together with one command you'll have to type in touch and name of your file let's say my name is Korak. I'll type Korak11.txt and Korak12.txt. 
so these have been created let's check them out so as you can see there are two files that have been created and you can see that there's only one single touch command that i have used so this is what touch is used for so basically the next command is the cat command now the cat command is one of the most frequently used linux commands right so the cat command is short for concatenate now what this helps us to do is it helps us to create a single or multiple files so if you have created an empty file called touch you can basically add content to it if you type in cat so it allows us to create single or multiple files view contents of the file concatenate files and redirect output in the terminal of files so what it does is you can copy the content of a file and put it in another and it'll show that as well so let's see an example of how cat works and the syntax for cat is if you want to create files you know files with content in it you'll basically have the cat command followed with the greater than sign and the file name and if you want to concatenate basically copy the content of one file to another you'll have to write cat and file name so let's check it out so basically the cat command can be used like this let's say we want to insert something into the new file you've just created we created code of one one so basically what you can do now is add content to it so let's say hi and to basically get out of it you have to do control d right and that is you adding content to your file now if you basically check this and just write for see this is basically showing you the content of the file that's already there and this command is basically letting you add content to the empty file that you created using touch so up next we have the next command which is the rm command rm is basically short for remove and it is a command which is used to remove a file and the syntax for that is rm followed by file name so let's check it out so if you want to remove a file you'll have to first go to the directory where the file is present and then once you enter the directory you'll just have to type in rm and post that you'll have to type in the name of the file for example since i've already created a file called codec11.txt if you put rm that and it's removed so just to cross check codec11 file has now been deleted now let's try this file as well right so if you just type in codec11 so since 11 is not there anymore you'll have codec12.txt and you do this and now check it you'll see that codec12 has also been removed right so this is what rm does so up next you'll have the cp command now the cp command is used to copy a file or a directory now all you need to do to use a cp command is type in cp and type in the name of the files that you want to copy right so let's say you want to copy a text file called digitaka into another text file called demo.txt so all you need to do is type in cp and the name of the two files that you want copied into right the first name is the file you want to copy the contents of and the second name of the file is the file you want to basically copy it to so let's check it out if you basically go into the linux directory that you have that's basically a folder that i've created and these are the files that are present in there so you want to copy the contents of one file into another all you need to do is type in cp and the name of the first file that is already existing breaker one txt and new.txt right and all you need to know here is you can go check the contents of the file after this right so if you go and check out new.txt it's basically empty why is that that's because edureka1 is also empty right so if you basically add some contents let's say hi and save this and just shut it down back again go back to terminal and now let's check this out as it just copy so you can just do this and check it out again right so if you go back to your file now and open up new.txt this is the same content as your edureka1 file so this is what copy command does 
So moving on to the next command, the next command is the MV command or the move command. So the move command is basically used to move a file or directory from one location to another. So all you need to do to use the move command is basically type in MV, then the name of the file that you want to move and finally the name of the directory you want to move it to. So let's check it out. So you're basically in the directory where you have your files now you want to move your file to another directory so you have to just type in mp the name of the file that you want to move let's say you want to move new.txt right so new.txt and where you want to move it to let's say documents or let's say now if you basically now check it with ls your new.txt file has gone off to the documents folder Next up, we have another command which is the last of the file commands that you have. This is the rename command. Now, the rename command, as you can see, is used to rename files. It is useful for renaming a large group of files. And the basic syntax for that is rename and then apostrophe s with the name of the old folder and then the name of the new folder. And after that, you'll basically have to show which type of file you want it to be. So this is how you basically do renaming. So let's check it out. So you basically just type in rename command with the old text file and basically you want to convert it to new text file, which is basically you want to convert it from a text file to a PDF file. So this is the command you give in and then press enter, right? So you've now changed rename all the text files into PDF. So let's say if you ls into that now, you can see it's demo3.pdf, eduica1.pdf. All of these text files have been changed into PDF because of the rename command. So this is how rename works. Moving on to the next command. We've all checked out the Linux file commands. Now we move on to the Linux file content commands. So when it comes to file content, the first thing we can see is the head command. Now the head command is used to display the content of a file. Now the content of a file can be displayed with other commands as well but the head command how it's different from the other commands is that it displays the first 10 lines of the file and basically the syntax for that is you just have to write head and the name of the file you want to show 10 lines in so let's check it out so now if you check out the head command let's say for example you type in head and basically the first 10 lines of a file that you want to check let's check it out Right, so as you can see, the first 10 lines have been displayed. Now, if you want to check the contents of that file, I'm going to show it to you. Yeah, as you can see, the first 10 lines are from 10 to 100, and the rest of the lines have not been printed. If you can cross check back here again, so it's 10 to 100 with no other content that's here. So, head is basically something that is used to show the first 10 lines of your file, right? So moving on to the next command. So next up, just like head, we have the tail command. Now the tail command is used to display the last 10 lines of the file content. Just like head is used to display the first 10 lines of the file content, tail is used to display the last 10 of it. Now it is useful for reading error messages, right? So tail is basically something which is used and after tail you just have to specify the file name. So let's check it out with the same file that we saw before. Right then, so just like head, let's just try using tail, right? And so the last 10 lines are these. In, as you can see, as in head, if you can see here, I'll just show it to you. Edureka. So if you put head, you can basically see it's from 10 to 100. That's the first 10 lines of the file. But in Edureka 2, which has tail, it'll show you the last 10 lines of the file right this has no 10 to 60 here it starts from 70 now this is the difference between head and tail right so move on to the next command so up next we have a very important command which is the tag command right so the tag command is the reverse of the cat command that we have used before so it displays the file content in reverse order so let's check it out and basically the syntax for it is just tag and then file name so let's check it out so if you want to see the content of your file, just type in tag and the name of the file that you want to see. 
as you can see tag has basically displayed the content of this file in reverse order if you want to check it out you can again check this so this has 10 to 150 and if you check here tag edureka 2 has made it 150 to 10 right so this is what tag does now moving on to the next command so up next we have the more command the more command is basically a similar command to the cat command and it is used to display content the same way cat does so the only difference between more or cat is that the in case of larger file sizes the screen full output is displayed so for this i'll have to show you an example since we do not have many large content file we can just check some of the files that we have check them out and the syntax for more command is basically more and then file name so let's check out the more command shall we so let's basically check out the more command right so if you type in more and let's say right so when you have more you basically type in more and then the name of the file so this will basically display the content that you have in the file and it's just like cat now the difference between cat and more is basically more is generally used for larger files right files with larger time amount of content larger sizes so this is basically all about more it will help you show the content that is there in the file it's just like cat so the next command is the less command so the less command is similar to the more command but has some added features to it right so along with the fact that similar to the more command the less command will show you content on your file it automatically also adjusts the size of the terminal window that you're using right so the basic command for less is less and then you'll have to basically have the file name so let's check it out so let's just check out what the less command does and the file name so this will basically give you the content that you have the contents of the file that you have and automatically reshuffle or adjust the length and breadth of the terminal that you have right so this is what less does moving on to the next command so after that we have the different linux user commands right so when it comes to user commands the most important is the su and the sudo commands so the su command provides administrative access to another user right so in other words it allows access to the linux shell to another user so let's check it out and syntax for it that's very basic so you'll just have to write su and specify the username right of your linux system so let's check it out so all you need to do here is go to terminal and type it su and then the username my username is kb as you can see so now you have to specify the password so this is something which allows access to somebody else right if you type in su so you can basically use their linux system right you have been allowed access into kb's linux system if you have the password and if you know the username as well so this is what su does so next up we have the id command now the id command is used to display the user id and the group id that you have so you have a user id for your linux system you have a group id for your linux system and the command for that is id right so let's check it out all you have to do here is type in the word id and you'll basically get your user id and your group id as well along with the username so this is what id does so next up we have the sudo command now sudo command let's just show you sudo is something which is used extensively in linux to give you access to files which need permission right user permission administrator permission to access them right you need administrator permission to access certain files so how do you do that let's say for example if you go into the terminal for your computer you go into this computer and you go into terminal and let's check it out you do ls and then you cd into one of the directories and all you have to do now is see the files that are there right so these are all the files that are there now if you want to access one of these files these files are actually administrator protected so you need to have sudo to basically ask for permission which has to be granted by the administrator so just type in sudo then let's say sudo zip 
and you'll have your password so you these are restricted and basically as you can see these are restricted because this is basically machine understandable language and you can already see that this is basically what is there in the file which is the zip file so this is what sudo does so this was a very important command that you needed to know so moving on to the next command so next up we have the user add command so the user add command is used to add or remove the user from the linux server right so if you had or removed a user you'll have to have special permission for which you'll have to use the sudo command as well right so you just type sudo and then user add and then you add the new user sudo has to be because you'll have to have special permission from the administrator to do this and the syntax for user add is user add and then you basically add the username so let's check it out so you basically want to use user add right this will basically add user what you need to do is add sudo and then the user add command and the name of your user let's say i want it to be kb right it'll ask for your password your new user has now been created and let's move on to the next command so the next command is the pass wd command which is the password command so the pass wd command is used to create and change the password for a user so let's say for example you have to use sudo here as well you have a user already present and if you want to change password just sudo into that user type the new password type the retype the new password and then basically it'll show you the password has been successfully updated and the syntax for this is pass wd and then username so let's check it out once so just type in pass wd then kb that is basically your user right now so we'll basically change the password for kb since it's already an existing user which has a password right so current password is already there what your new password to be is and you to retype it right so the password has now been updated successfully and this is how you basically use the pass wt command so next up we have the group add command so the group add command is basically used to create a user group right so when you create user groups you'll also have to use the sudo command because you want to access restricted files right so the syntax for group add is group add and then group name so let's check out the group add command so first of all you have to type in sudo and then group add and then group name let's say we name our group edureka 2022 and then password for kb which we've just created now so now this group has been added into this user so that was basically how you use the group add command so finally you come to the linux filter commands now there are various filter commands that linux has the first thing you can see is the cat command now the cat command is also used as a filter right now filtering here means to filter a file it is used for inside pipes now you basically filter out the content that is there now if you want to filter using cat you'll have to write cat and then the file name with cat or tag and then cat or tag again right so you'll have pipes in between and you'll basically have the cat and tag cat and tag commands back inside pipes so let's just check it out so if you want to use the cat command as a filter let's check it out type in cat home and then we'll basically have this which is the pipe and then the command tag then cat finally we we'll have tag so this is basically what the cat command does as a filter next up is the cut command now the cut command is used to select a specific column of a file so the d option is basically the delimiter option and the f option is basically the column so the d option is used as delimiter and it can be a space or a slash or a hyphen or anything else whereas f is the column number and the syntax for this is cut and then you put the delimiter you put the column number and then you put the file name in the end so let's check it out as well so with the cut command you'll just have you type in cut then you'll have the delimiter after which you will have the f and the file name in the end right so this is basically what the cut command 
does. It cuts out from a specific column and the specific column number. Since there's only one column here and we specified F2, there is no cutting out. So if we do the same thing again and change F2 to F1, let's see how it's different, right? So this is basically what F1, F2 does. It shows you the column name and it'll show you basically a specific part of the file that you want. You'll cut out a part of that file and it'll show it to you. But since we have only column one, It'll show you just the column one here, right? So this is what cut does. Moving on to the next command. So the next command is the grep command. So the grep command in Linux is the most powerful command and it is used to filter the Linux system, right? grep stands for global regular expression print, right? So it is basically very useful for searching content from a file, right? So for example, you need the syntax as basically command and then grep and then you search the word, right? So let's see how grep works. So let's check it out. So to basically check out how grep works, let's check this out. Let's say cat and iterate and do. Then you'll basically have this with grep3. So this is basically every content in the file which is iterator2 which has the value 3 in it. So these are the two values which has 3 in it and that is what grep is showing. So this is how grep works. So moving on to the next command is the com command. Now the com command is used to compare two files or streams, right? So by default, it for displays three columns. The first displays the non-matching columns of the first file, the second for the second file, and third displays the non-matching columns for the third file. So the syntax for this is fairly easy. It's just com and then you specify the file names that you want, right? So let's just check this out. So if you want to check out how the com command works, let's see this com and basically add the two folders you want and the contents of it which you want. So these are all the files content that is there in both the files, right? Input is not in sorted order, but the file number one is not in sorted order. And so this is basically showing the content of all of the files that I've given, which is Eureka 2 and home and the content which it has, right? It displays it in three different columns. So this is what com does. So checking out the next command. So the next command is the sed command, right? So the sed command is short for stream editor. Now sed is used to edit files using regular expression. It does not permanently edit files. Instead, what it does is the edited contains remains only on display and it doesn't really affect the actual file so the syntax for sed is basically the command and then sed with apostrophe s and the old word with the new word right so if you want to check it out let's see so basically for having sed you'll basically have to show the stream editor so this is the command for it you have to put sed echo and echo is basically used in linux and you basically have this Thing printed called Edureka 7, right? So, as we can see, SED is used to edit files using a regular expression, right? So, it doesn't really permanently edit those files, but it's only for view. You can't really change what's there in the content. So, as I showed before, if you write class echo 7 with SED and change it in class, so this is just for view. Edureka 7, what you see is for view, it hasn't really changed the content of it, right? So next up, we go to the next command, which is the T command, right? So the TWE command, which is the T command, is similar to the cat command. The only difference between both filters is that it puts standard input or standard output and can also write them into a file. So let's check it out. Also, the syntax for T command is the cat and then file name, then followed with T and then with new file. And then you have cat attack. So let's check it out. So as you can see here, the TEE is basically putting in standard input, standard output, and writing the same thing as you can see in Eureka 2 into the new 98 file as well. So this is what T does, the T command. So moving forward, we have the TR command. Now the TR command is used to translate the file content like from lowercase to uppercase, right? So if you have some sort of content in a file which is in lowercase, you can change it to uppercase. 
and the syntax for that is basically command follow tr and the old word to the new word right so let's check it out so guys when you're talking about the cat command you'll basically have to write cat and the name of the file followed with tr which is translate and then just replace the file with the old file then replace the word from the old word to the new word so let's say we have hello as the old word i want it to be uppercase on hello right so it'll show me hello world right we go back to the file now it shows you hello world right so hello world is like this and i wanted to basically make it uppercase so this is what i have to do to make it uppercase use the tr command so next up we have the unique command so the unique command is used to form a sorted list in which every word will occur only once right so the syntax for this is the command followed by the file name and slash unique so every command has to be there only once there is absolute redundancy so let's check it out so all you have to do for the unique command is basically type in sort followed by the name of the file you have and put in unique after that and if you do this this is basically showing you everything in the content only once so there is redundancy that's there everything is unique so this is about this unique command moving on to the next command we have here our final command which is the wc command right so the wc command is used to count the words lines and characters in a file so let's say if you want to count the number of characters you have in your file just type in wc followed by the file name so let's check it out so finally we come to wc so what you have to do here is type in wc and the name of the file you want let's say you want home right so this is basically showing you the number of characters that the home file has home file has certain content in it and that content has around 48 characters in it so that is all about the wc command first we will have a look at the linux commands that are very basic like even if you are not working in devops if you are someone who's using the linux based operating system you must be knowing these commands these are the frequently used commands like while you're working in devops okay i'm just showing you the list then we will practically see how to use these commands on the command prompt so these are the few commands i've tried to cover maximum number of commands so that you're comfortable working with devops so now let us try to execute these commands in a Linux based system. So in my system, I have installed Ubuntu operating system. So let us start with the basic commands in Linux. So the first command that you must know is the man command. Man stands for manual. Like if you want to know about any command in Linux, you can just type man space the name of the command. Say, for example, you have to know about ls. Say, for example, just type man space ls. So ls is a command. We'll talk about it later. So just press enter. Okay. So here it shows the name of the command, its syntax, and the description. Like if you want to know what it is and what it does, so you can use man command for it. So the next command that you should know is the clear command. If you want to clear your terminal, just type clear and press enter. So this clears your terminal. So the next command that you must know is uh, say for example if you want to know where is your current working directory for that there is a command called pwd that is present working directory simply type pwd and press enter okay so here it says home edureka so this is my current working directory and if you want to change your directory for that there's a command called cd that is change directory suppose from home edureka you have to switch your working directory to home so simply type home okay so if I now type PWD, it says home. So this was another basic command. So the next command is echo command. Say if you want to type anything, like if you want to print anything on the terminal, so you can use echo command for that. Say for example, echo hello world. So I have to print these two words on the terminal. For that, I'll use the echo command. Okay, so it says hello world. Pretty simple. So the next command is su command. Let's see first who is the current user. For that, there's one more command called who am I? Okay, so 
here it says edureka so edureka is the current user of this system the linux system so if you want to switch to the root user who has all the permissions as of now the edureka is not a super user he doesn't have any permissions related to file operations or any other operations so root is a user the basic user he has all the permissions on this linux os so if you want to switch to the root user so simply type su press enter it will ask for a password type the password so here it says authentication failure so there's one more command bash sudo bash okay so before it was edureka here and now it is root here so if i type who am i so here it says root okay so in case if this doesn't work su doesn't work for any reason so you can use this command called sudo bash so it switches to the root user and if you want to switch back to edureka simply type su and the username okay so you're back to the edureka user okay these are very basic commands guys but you must be knowing this so the next command is the sudo command so sudo command is for user who doesn't have a proper permissions or privileges for executing some commands or operations so in that case you have to use a sudo command so say for example adding a user deleting a user adding a group and many other commands that we will see in the upcoming commands so i'll just give you a few examples here of sudo for example you have to add a user so adding a user deleting a user that is mostly done by the root user so he has all the permissions to add a user and all so say for example if you have to add a user so the command for that is sudo user add and the name of the user say for example arvind oh it says arvind already exists so type arvind11 so it has created a user and uh, say for example if you have to add a password to this user so the command for that is sudo P A S S W D and the username. So it lasts for a password that you need to set. You can type whatever you want. Retype it. So it has created a user and it has also added a password for that user. So say for example you have to delete this user. So the command for that is sudo user delete user D E L and the username. Arvin one one okay so the user has been deleted say for example you have to add a group a group can have multiple users okay so you have to add a group to the system so the command for that is sudo group add and the group name so you can say the group name as techies okay so the group has been added similarly if you want to remove this group sudo group del and the group name okay pretty simple so let me just clear my terminal so the next command that we are going to talk about is the touch command so the touch command is used to create any file on your system say for example i have to create a file a text file you can give whatever name abc cba.txt oh it says permission denied okay so here we are going to use the command sudo so it has created a file called cba.txt and how can we see that simply type ls can you see here the file that we have just created the cba.txt so this is the use of the touch command to create a file so the next command that we are going to talk about is the text editor command say for example vi nano vim gedit and so on so the vi editor is the most popular and a classic text editor in the linux family so to use it uh, say for example you have to write something into that file so for that purpose you will use sudo vi and the name of the file cba.txt okay so press enter the file has been opened now and press i to insert anything into this say for example hi this is edureka so to save this file simply press escape colon w4 write and q to quit so our file has been saved so there's one more command called cat command so this command can read modify or concatenate text files 
so this command is also used to display the contents of the file so say for example i've written something into this file called cba.txt now i have to display the contents of this file so what i'll do is cat and file name cba.txt so here this was the line that i had written in this file cba.txt so the cat command can be used for that so there are also other flags that can be used with this command say for example hyphen b so the command would be cat hyphen b and the file name so this is used to add line numbers to the non-blank lines so the next flag is hyphen n that is cat hyphen n so this command is used to add line numbers to all the lines that are present in the file cat hyphen s is used to squeeze blank lines into one lines and cat hyphen capital e it shows the dollar sign at the end of the line so these were a few flags that you can use with cat command so let me just clear the terminal so the next command that we are going to talk about is the copy command this command is used to copy files and directories a copy of the file directory still remains in the working directory so let me just show you how do you use this command so it is very simple copy so say for example cba.txt i have to copy this file to the location say for example home edureka right now we are at the home location i have to copy this file to this location home edureka okay so the command is very simple cp file name and the destination name so press enter so let us now see whether the file has been copied there so for that we'll have to switch to that location cd edureka so let us use the ls command okay so here you can see the cba.txt file has been copied so this was a very simple command and there are a few flags that you can use along with this command so there's a flag called hyphen n that is cp hyphen n and the file name so this does not overwrite the file the next flag is the hyphen u that is cp hyphen u so this command updates the destination file only when the source file is different from the destination file there's one more flag called hyphen capital r that is cp hyphen capital r so this command is a recursive copy for copying directories and this command even copies the hidden files so these were a few flags that you can use with the copy command so the next command is the move command or the mv command so this command moves the files and the directories from one directory to the another the file or the directory once moved is deleted from the working directory so this was not the case with the copy command so i hope you get the difference between copy and move so let us see what is the syntax for this so the syntax is mb um, the flag name like if there are any flags here the file name and the destination name okay the path to the destination so let us just say first we will have a look at the files that are present here okay so demo.txt can you see this file here so we'll try to move this file to the home folder so the command is very simple mb the file name demo.txt it says permission denied so just simply use sudo okay the file has been moved let us now verify this cd okay so we are here at the home folder simply use ls command so as you can see here demo.txt has been moved so this was a very simple command and easy to use command there are three flags that are associated with this command mv i so this command enters into an interactive mode and the command line asks before overwriting the files so the command mv u updates the destination file only when the source file is different from the destination file and the third flag is the mv b so this command enters the verbose mode and this command prints the source and the destination file so for those who are not aware of what verbose mode is so verbose mode provides additional details as to what drivers and softwares it is loading during the startup so this was all about the uh, move command so the next command that we are going to talk about is the rm command so this command removes files from a directory by default the rm command does not remove directories once removed the contents of the file cannot be recovered 
so the syntax for this is very simple rm the flag flag name and the file name it's a very simple command and easy to use command so i'll just show you how to use this say for example i have to remove this file demo.txt so simply i'll type rm in the file name demo.txt oh it says permission denied so the file has been removed and let us just verify this okay so we cannot see anywhere the demo.txt file so it has been removed so this was a very simple command rm so there are two flags that can be used along with this command the first flag is the rm hyphen r so this command removes even the non empty directories and the other flag is rm hyphen rp so this command removes the non empty directories including the parents and the subdirectories so this was the rm command so the next command that we are going to talk about is the mkdir command so if you want to create a new directory then this command can be used it's a very simple command and the syntax is even more simple so if you have to create a directory simply type mkdir and the directory name so say for example in home i have to create a directory called techies it says permission denied no issues so the directory has been created let us just verify this so as you can see here this directory has been created here at this location the home folder so the flag that can be used with this command is hyphen p that is mkdir hyphen p so this command creates both a parent directory and a sub directory and if you want to create multiple files into a directory you can use the command mkdir hyphen p and the file names so this command will create multiple sub directories inside the new parent directory so let me just clear the terminal the next command is the rmdir command or the remove directory command so this command is used to remove a specified directory although by default it can remove only an empty directory there are flags which can be deployed to delete the non empty directories as well and the syntax for this command is very simple simply type rmdir the flag name and the directory name okay so very simple let us just see how do you remove a directory rmdir so let us just remove the directory that we created in the previous command rmdir and the name was techies sudo rmdir techies okay so the directory has been removed let us just verify this so there's no directory called techies here as it has been removed by the rmdir command so there are a couple of flags that you can use with this command the first flag is hyphen p that is rmdir hyphen p so this command removes both the parent and the child directory there's one more flag called hyphen pv so the command is rmdir hyphen pv so this command removes all the parent and the sub directories along with the verbose so i hope you're clear with this command rmdir so the next command that we are going to discuss is the grep command so this command is used to search for a particular string or a word in a text file so this command is similar to control f but this is executed via a command line so let me just show you how do you use this command so let us say for example let me have a text file here so the syntax for using this command is very simple so say for example we have a file here called grep test as you can see here this one so let me just see the contents of this file using cat command test dot txt so this file has these words dog apple ball cat cat mouse so say for example i have to search the word cat in this file so for that i'll use the command grep the word cat and the file name grep test dot txt okay so as you can see here the word cat has been highlighted just because it is present in this file so say for example we want to search for a word that is not present here so say for example cat1 or any other word so say for example mad okay so it is not showing anything that means that this word is not present in this file so this was a very simple command grep and there are a few flags that you can use with this command so say for example grep hyphen i and obviously the file name 
So this command will return the results for case insensitive strings. So there's one more flag called a hyphen n that is grep hyphen n. So this command returns the matching strings along with their line numbers. The next flag is the grep hyphen v. So this command returns the results of lines not matching the search string. Next flag is grep hyphen c. So this command returns the number of lines in which the results match the search string. So the next command that we are going to talk about is the sort command. So this command sorts the results of a search either alphabetically or numerically files file contents and directories can be sorted using this command. The syntax for this command is very simple. Uh, let me just see the files that are present here. So there's a file called sort test. So let me just see the contents of this file sort test dot txt okay these are the words that are present in this file so i have to just sort these words okay so the command for that is sort the file name sort test dot txt so as you can see here these words have been sorted alphabetically b d f m s and t so this is the use of sort command and there are a few flags that you can use with this command like the first flag is sort hyphen r and the file name obviously so this command returns the results in reverse order so there's one more flag called hyphen f so this command does the case insensitive sorting so whether you have uppercase words or alphabets or whatever in your file so irrespective of the case this command will sort the file and there's one more flag called sort hyphen n so this command returns the results as per the numerical order so say for example you have numbers in this file and if you want to sort them numerically like ascending order that can be done using the command hyphen n so this was pretty much about the sort command so let me just clear the terminal so the next command that we are going to talk about is the ch own command so different users in the OS have ownerships and the permissions to ensure that the files are secure and put restrictions on who can modify the contents of the file. In Linux, there are different users who can use the system. So each user has some properties associated with them, such as the user ID and a home directory. We can add users into a group to make the process of managing the users easier. A group can have zero or more users. A specified user can be associated with a default group. It can also be a member of other groups on the systems as well. So if you talk about the ownerships and the permissions, so to protect and secure the files and directories in Linux, we use permissions to control what a user can do with a file or a directory. So in Linux, there are three types of permission, the read permission, the write permission and the execute permission. So the read permission allows the user to read files and directories. It lets the user read directories and subdirectories stored in it. The write permission allows the user to modify and delete a file. Also, it allows a user to modify its contents for the directories. So unless the execute permission is not given to directories, changes do not affect them. The third permission is the execute permission. So the write permission on a file allows it to get executed. For example, if we have a file named php.sh, so unless we don't give it an execute permission, it won't be run. So these were the permissions. Types of file permissions in Linux, there are three types. The first one is the user. So these type of file permission affect the owner of the file. The second one is the group. This type of file permission affects the group which owns the file. So instead of the group permissions, the user permissions will apply if the owner user is in this group. The third permission is the other permission. So these type of file permission affect all the users on the systems. So to view these permissions, so let us just say we use a command ls hyphen L. So this command will list down all the files and the directories that are present here along with their permissions. So as you can see here, these are the permissions. These are the users, the groups and the timestamp. And these are the names of the file. To use this command so say for example there's this file called abc.txt whose user is edureka okay so you have to use this command chown so the syntax for that is pretty simple chown the owner name 
the owner that you want to change so say for example root and the file name so file name is abc.txt operation not permitted sudo let me just try sudo okay so this works when you use sudo so let us now just run the command ls hyphen n to see the permissions of this file so as you can see here it was first edureka now let us see the changed owner okay so previously it was edureka and now it is root okay so this is how you use the ch own command so just to summarize the ch own command is used to change the owner and the group of the file So the next command that we are going to talk about is the chmod command. So this command is used to change the access permissions of files and directories. So the syntax for this command is pretty much simple. So say for example, if you want to change the permissions and the privileges of a file. So for that, uh, let us just see the list of files that is present here and the permissions. So say for example, this file bac.txt, it has these permissions. So we want to give all the permissions to all the users and the groups that want to use this file. So for that, let me type the command ch mod triple seven. Okay, and the file name bac dot txt. Okay. So let us again have a look at the permissions of this file. Okay. So as you can see here, previously these were the permissions: read, write, read, and read. And now it has changed to read write execute for the user the group and the others. Okay So there are a few numbers that are associated with the permissions like zero means no permission at all One means the execute permission two means the write permission and four means the read permission So here we have used the command chmod triple seven. So seven here means read write execute all the three four two and one so read write execute for the user the second seven is for the group and the third seven is for any other users or the groups. So this was the chmod command and I hope you have understood this command. So let me just clear the terminal. So the next command that we are going to talk about is the lsof command. So while working in Linux or Unix based system, there might be several files and folders which are being used. Some of them are visible and some of them are not visible. So lsof stands for list of open files. So this command provides a list of files that are open. Basically, it gives the information to find out the files which are opened by which process. So with one go, this command lists out all the open files in the output console. So the syntax for this command is pretty much simple. Let us just type lsof. So as you can see here, this is the list of open files these many files okay if you scroll so here you observe there are details of which files are open the process id the user associated with the process fd stands for file descriptor size of the file altogether gives detailed information about the file open by the command the process id its user and so on so cwd here stands for current working directory okay txt stands for the text file obviously so say for example if you want to know the list of all files opened by a particular user so there are several users of a system and each user can have different requirements and accordingly they use files and devices so to find a list of files that are opened by a specific user you can use the command say for example lsof hyphen u and the username say for example edureka So these are the lists of files that are opened by the user edureka. Let me just clear the terminal. So then next command that we are going to talk about is the id command. So the id command in Linux is used to find out user and the group names and numeric IDs of the current user or any other user in the server. So this command is used to find out a few important things such as the username and the real user ID. Find out the specific users UID show the uid and the groups associated with a user list out all the groups a user belongs to and display the security context of the current user the syntax for this command is pretty much simple id the flag 
and the username okay so there are a few flags that you can use with this command the first flag is the hyphen g so the command would be id hyphen g and the username so this command prints only the effective group ids whereas id hyphen capital g prints all the group ids id hyphen n prints the names instead of numbers and id hyphen r prints real ids instead of numbers id hyphen u prints only the effective user id id hyphen help displays the help messages id hyphen version displays the version information so without any option it prints every set of identified information that is the numeric ids so what you need to do here is simply type id and press enter so as you can see here it displays the uid for this user edureka the group id and the group that he belongs to and the respective group ids as well so say for example if you want to know the user id for this user called edureka id hyphen u edureka so 1000 as you can see here user id is 1000 and group id is also 1000 let me just verify this the command for that is id hyphen g okay 1000 as you can see here so to find out all the uids and the groups associated with the user so say for example there's another user called arvin so id arvin so as you can see here the outputs user id group id and the groups that he belongs to so this was about the id command so the next command that we are going to talk about is the tar command so the tar command is used to zip and unzip files of the dot tar format so let me just show you the syntax for this file so say for example if you want to zip a folder so for that the command is tar hyphen cvf space file name and the folder name source folder name so this was a very easy syntax for the tar command and say for example if you want to unzip a file so in devops while installing something you might be getting a file in the dot tar format while unzipping that file you can use this command tar hyphen x v f and the tar file name so you can use this command to unzip a file so this was about the tar command the next command that we are going to talk about is the cut command so cut command is used for extracting a portion of a file using columns and delimiters so say for example if you want to list everything in a selected column then in this case you need to use the hyphen c flag with the cut command so say for example let me just see here so there's this file called So let me just show you how do you use this command so let us first see what are the files present here so say for example this file demo one dot txt okay okay so this file has these lines a11 b22 and c33 so say for example if you want to display only two columns like a1 b2 and c3 from this file so using cut command we can do it so the syntax for doing that is very simple cut hyphen c1 hyphen 2 space the file name so the file name is demo 1.txt so hyphen c here stands for the column and which columns one and two column okay so just press enter okay as you can see here it will display these two columns so say for example you want only one column and not the two columns so just remove this two hyphen c1 press enter so you, you can see here a b c only the first column is displayed okay so this was about the cut command so the next command that we are going to talk about is the sed that is said command so said is a text editor which can perform editing operations in a non-interactive way so said command gets its input from a standard input or a file to perform the editing operations on a file so said is a very powerful utility and you can do a lot of file manipulations using said so say for example if you want to replace a text in a file by searching it in a file you can use the said command with the substitute s flag small s 
to search for the specific pattern and change it so say for example let me just show you an example here there's this file called demo so said test okay so cat let me just see the content this file set test dot txt okay so here it says how are you bubban so say for example i have to replace this bubban by any other name so i can use the sed command here sed space single quote s that is the flag that you can use with this command so the word that you want to replace and the new word chagan okay and the name of the file obviously sed test dot txt so as you can see here first it was how are you baban and now it is how are you chagan so this was the command sed i hope you have understood this command we just clear the terminal okay so the next command that we are going to talk about is the unique command so unique command is used for filtering out the duplicate lines in a files so the syntax for this command is pretty much simple so say for example you have to remove all the duplicate lines from a file so you can use this command unique and the file name so this was a very easy command the next command that you are going to talk about is the watch command so watch command in linux is used to execute a program periodically showing output in full screen this command will run a specified command in the argument repeatedly by showing its outputs and errors by default the specified command will run every 2 seconds and watch will run until interrupted so the syntax for this command is very simple you just have to type watch the flag and the command let me just show you an example using this so there's this flag called hyphen d that you can use with watch so this parameter hyphen d highlights the differences between the successive updates the options will read the optional arguments which changes the highlight to be permanent and this allows the user to see what has changed at least once since the first iteration so let me just type hyphen d watch hyphen d free hyphen m free command we have used we'll see what free command is in the later part of this session so the next command that we are going to talk about is the eval command so eval is a built in linux command which is used to execute arguments as a shell command so it combines arguments into a single string and uses it as an input to the shell and execute commands so the syntax for this command is very simple eval and the arguments so let me just show you an example of eval command here so say for example you have to type eval hyphen hyphen help eval hyphen hyphen help this command shows the description of the eval command itself so as you can see here so let me just clear the terminal so the next command that we are going to talk about is the history command history command is used to view the previously executed commands this feature was not available in the bourne shell bash and corn shell support this feature in which every command is executed and is treated as the event and is associated with an event number using which they can be recalled and changed if there's a requirement to do so so these commands are saved in a history file so in bash shell history command shows the whole list of commands so say for example just type history here press enter so this is the list of commands i've used till now 400 500 plus commands i guess yeah 584 commands i've used so say for example if you want to see only last five commands that i've used history space 5 press enter so these are the last five commands that you have used you can can see here let me just clear the terminal okay so the next command that we are going to talk about is the dd command so dd is a command line utility for unix and unix like os whose primary purpose is to convert and copy files the command line syntax of dd differs from many other unix programs in that it uses the syntax option equal to value so this syntax option equal to value is used for its command line operations so i'll show you just a practical example of this command so say for example 
you have to back up the entire hard disk so to back up an entire copy of a hard disk to another hard disk connected to the same system so this command dd can be used in this command the unix device name of the source hard disk is say for example the source hard disk name is dev hda and the target hard disk name is dev hdb so how do you use this command dd dd space if if stands for input file space the name of the source hard disk so it is dev space hda and i just forgot to place equal to sign here as discussed earlier it has a syntax of option equal to value so input file is this the source file and the output file of is dev dev slash hdb so as of now we are not copying anything so but i'm just showing you how to use this command so input file and output file should be mentioned very carefully just in case you mention source device in the target and the vice versa you might lose all the data i hope you have understood this command okay so there's one more command that we talked about like the free command okay so the free command displays the total amount of free space available along with the amount of memory used and swap memory in the system and also the buffers used by the kernel the syntax for this command is very simple free space or options you can see so let me just type free command here and press enter so as you can see here total installed memory that is present on the system so used means the used memory and free means the unused memory shared displays the memory used by the temp folders buffer displays the memory used by the kernel buffers and cached displays the memory used by the page cache and the slabs and buffers slash cache displays the sum of the buffers and the cache and there are a few flags or options that you can use with this command that is hyphen b the command is free hyphen b so it displays the memory in bytes if you use hyphen k this displays the amount of memory in kilobytes which is by default hyphen m displays the amount of memory in megabytes and hyphen g small g displays the amount of memory in gigabytes i hope you have understood this command free so let me just clear the terminal okay so the next command that we are going to talk about is the ssh command so while working in devops you might frequently use this command the ssh command so ssh means that secure shell okay so this command refers to a cryptographic network protocol for operating network services securely over an unsecured network typical use cases include remote command line execution but any network service can be secured with the command ssh so say for example if you have a master node and the slave node so if you are running this command the command that i'm going to type now on the slave node this will give you access to the master node so the command for that is very simple ssh and the master's ip address so if you run this command on the slave machine it, you can get access to the master machine and vice versa if you execute this command on the master machine along with the slave ip you can get access to the slave machine so there's one more command called ssh keygen so this command is used to generate a public private authentication key pair so authentication keys allows a user to connect to a remote system without supplying the password so keys must be generated for each user separately so if you generate key pairs as the root user only the root user can use those keys so the syntax for creating pair of keys is very simple so you need to type ssh hyphen keys and space hyphen t and rsa press enter here you can press enter it says it already exists so i want it to overwrite press enter enter passphrase empty for no passphrase enter passphrase press enter press enter okay so the key has been generated as you can see here hyphen t option here is used to specify the type of key that you have to create so you have the option of specifying a passphrase to encrypt the private part of the key so if you encrypt your personal key you must supply the passphrase each time you use this key so in this case we have just pressed enter we haven't pressed anything in the passphrase 
So this prevents an attacker who has clear the terminal. So the next command that we are going to talk about is the IP command. So the IP command in Linux is present in the net tools, which is used for performing several network administration tasks. IP simply stands for Internet Protocol. So this command is used to show manipulative routing devices and tunnels. It is similar to the IF config command. OK, the next command that we are going to discuss is the IF config command. So IF config that is interface configuration command is used to configure the kernel resident network interfaces. It is used at the boot time to set up interfaces as necessary. After that, it is usually used when needed during debugging or when you need a system tuning. Also, this command is used to assign IP addresses and net mask to an interface or to enable or disable a given interface. So the syntax for this command is very simple. I have config space options or and space the interface. So there are two options that you can use with this command. That is I have config hyphen a. So this option is used to display all the interfaces available even if they are down. So if you use this command, I have config hyphen a. OK, so you can see all the interfaces that are available. OK. Yeah, and there's one more command called hyphen s. So if you type I have config. Hyphen s. So this displays a short list instead of all the details. So this was about the I have config command. So let me just clear the terminal. Also, if you want to know the IP address of your machine, you simply need to type IF config press enter. OK. As you can see here, this is the IP address of your machine. So to know the IP address of your machine, you just need to use this command IF config. So let me just clear the terminal. The next command that we are going to talk about is the IP command. So IP command in Linux is present in the net tools, which is used for performing several network administration tasks. So IP stands for Internet Protocol. This command is used to show or manipulate routing devices and tunnels. It is similar to the IF config command, but it is much more powerful and more functions and facilities attached to it. IF config is one of the deprecated commands in the net tools of Linux that has not been maintained for many years. IP command is used to perform several tasks like assigning an address to a network interface or configuring network interface parameters and so on. So it can perform several other tasks like configuring and modifying the default and static routing, setting up a tunnel over an IP, listing IP addresses and property information, modifying the status of the interface, assigning, deleting and setting up IP addresses and routes. So let me just show you a practical example of IP. Space. Address. OK. So this command is used to show all the IP addresses associated on all network devices. So you, as you can see here, these are the various network devices and their IP addresses. Yeah, so there's one more command called. IP space link. So this command is used to display link layer information. It will fetch characteristics of the link layer devices currently available. Any networking device which has a driver loaded can be classified as an available device. So IP hyphen link press enter. OK, so this is the output. These are the available devices and the link layer information as you can see here. So let me just clear the terminal. So the next command that we're going to talk about is the net stat command. So net stat command displays various network related information such as network connections, routing tables, interface statistics, multicast memberships and so on. So the syntax for this is very simple. For example, net stat. Net stat. And hyphen a. So as you can see here, if you use this command net stat hyphen a. So it is used to show both the listening and the non listening ports that are available. So this command is used to show both the listening as well as the non listening sockets. And there's one more command called net stat. Hyphen a T. So this command will list all the TCP ports that are available. So as you can see here, these are the TCP ports. 
so this was about the net stack commands so the next command is the ns lookup command so ns lookup stands for name server lookup this is a useful command for getting information from the dns server it is a network administration tool for querying the domain name system to obtain domain name or ip addresses mapping or any other specific dns record it is also used to troubleshoot dns related problems so the syntax for this is very simple simply type ns lookup and the option let me just type ns lookup say for example google.com so it is giving you the details of this domain google.com the server the address so if we type this command like ns and the domain name so this will display a record that is ip address of the domain as you can see here so this command queries the domain name servers to get all these details so this was about the ns lookup command let me just clear the terminal so the next command that we are going to talk about is the curl or curl command as you can see so curl is a command line tool to transfer data to or from a server using any of the supported protocols such as http ftp scp smtp and so on so curl is powered by a lib curl so this tool is preferred for automation since it is designed to work without any user interaction so curl can be used to transform multiple files at once so the syntax for this command is very simple curl hyphen space i repeat curl space options and the url so there's one parameter or the option that you can use with this is hyphen o so this parameter saves the downloaded file on the local machine with the name provided in the parameters so this was about the curl or the curl command so the next command that we are going to talk about is the awk command so awk is a scripting language used for manipulating data and generating reports the awk command programming language requires no compiling and allows the user to use variables numeric functions string functions and logical operators so awk is abbreviated from the names of the developers that is aho wenberger and the kernigan so the syntax is pretty much simple i'll show you how do you use it so say for example let me see the list of files that we have okay so cat abc.txt so let us just see the contents of this file a b c dot txt uh let's just see another file demo dot demo one dot txt okay demo one dot txt okay so i'll just show you how do you use this command so say for example you want to print every line from a specified file so we can use this command awk single quote curly braces okay and the name of the file so say for example awk test dot txt okay so this was the file this has only two lines okay so if you want to print every line from a file so you can use this command awk so say for example i'm looking for a specific pattern in a file so say for example awk i'm looking for the word okay so let's consider this file itself in single quotes i'm looking for ram and i want to print it and the file name awk test dot txt so it will print any of the lines that has this word ram 
press enter okay so these two lines have this word ram so it has printed both these lines so this was another use of awk so the next command that we are going to talk about is the tr command so tr stands for translate so this command in unix is a command line utility for translating and deleting characters it supports a range of transformations including uppercase to lowercase squeezing repeating characters deleting specific characters and basic find and replace it can be used with unix pipes to support more complex translations okay so i'll just show you an example of the tr command so say for example this file called awk test okay so let us just see the contents of this file now we'll try some other file cba.txt okay so let us just say we want to convert this into uppercase everything into uppercase here we want to display this hi this is edureka in uppercase so for that we will use the command cat the file name cba.txt and the pipe symbol tr space double quotes a to z space and the capital a to z okay so this is the syntax for doing this press enter as you can see here everything has been converted to uppercase so this is one of the usage of the tr command so let me just clear the terminal the next command that we are going to talk about is the env command env command is used to print environment variables it is also used to run a utility or a command in a custom environment in practice env command has another common use it is often used by shell scripts to launch a correct interpreter in this usage the environment is typically not changed so say for example i have to see a list of all the environment variables that are present on my system so i'll simply type env and press enter okay so these are the list of environment variables that are present say for example if you want to run a command with an empty environment so for that the syntax is env hyphen i and the command okay and uh, say for example if you want to remove a variable from the environment so for that the syntax is env hyphen u and the variable name okay so i hope you have understood this command env let me just clear the terminal so the next command that we are going to talk about is the ip tables command ip tables is a command line interface used to set up and maintain tables for the net filter firewall for the ip v4 including the linux kernel the firewall matches packets with rules defined in these tables and then takes the specified action on a possible match so i'm going to tell you the usage of the ip tables commands so say for example while working in devops for some reason you need to disable the firewalls so for that this command ip tables can be used say for example service service ip tables stop so this command can be used to disable the firewalls okay so this was uh, one use of the command called ip tables okay so as of now we are not running this command on our system so the next command that we are going to talk about is the apt-get command so apt-get is a command line tool which helps in handling packages in linux its main task is to retrieve the information and packages from the authenticated sources for installation upgrade and removal of packages along with their dependencies so apt stands for advanced packaging tool so if you are using ubuntu based systems so here the command apt-get can be used while if you are someone who is using the red hat based system such as the centos so in that case you need to use the command yum okay so the syntax for this command is very simple like apt-get the options or the flags and the command okay so say for example i have to install something on my machine 
so i'll use the command sudo app get install say for example i want to install this image editor called pinda okay so i'll just type pinda sudo apt get install and pinda okay so this was about the apt get command the next command is the df command and the disk usage command the df or the disk free command reports the amount of available disk space being used by the file systems the du or the disk usage command reports the size of directory trees inclusive of all their contents and the size of individual files the aim is to make sure you are not overshooting the 80 percent threshold if you exceed the threshold it is time to scale or clean up the mess because you are running out of the resources so the syntax to use this command like uh, if you want to see the disk free space in a human readable format you can use the command df sudo df hyphen h okay so this is the disk free command that we are using and we can see here the output size available size used available memory percentages and the mounted location so but in most cases you want to check which part of your system is consuming lots of disk space for so the command for doing that is sudo du hyphen h hyphen d one and the var so as you can see here this location it is consuming a lot of disk space so this was about the df and the du command so now let us talk a bit about shell scripting so first and foremost question what is a shell so an operating system is made up of many components out of which two are very prime components and these components are the kernel and the shell so a kernel is at the nucleus of a computer it makes the communication between the hardware and the software possible while the kernel is the innermost part of an operating system a shell is the outermost one a shell in a linux os takes input from you in the form of commands processes it and then gives an output it is the interface through which a user works on the programs commands and scripts a shell is accessed by a terminal which runs it so whenever you run the terminal the shell issues a command prompt where you can type your input which is then executed when you hit the enter key so the output or the result is thereafter displayed on the terminal the shell wraps around the delicate interior of an operating system thereby protecting it from accidental damage hence it is named as shell so there are two types of shell basically the bond shell and the c shell so the prompt for the bond shell is shown by the dollar symbol and its derivatives are posix con and bash posix shell is also known as sh con shell is also known as sh and the born again shell is now known as bash and the bash is the most popular shell the second type of shell is the c shell and the prompt for this shell is shown by the percentage sign and there are two subcategories for this that is the c shell which is also known as csh and the top c shell which is also known as tcsh so now the question is what is shell scripting so shell scripting is writing a series of commands for the shell to execute it can combine lengthy and repetitive sequences of commands into a single and a simple script which can be stored and executed anytime so this reduces the effort required by the end user so let us understand the various steps in creating a shell script so what you do is first you create a file using the vi editor or any other editor and you name the script with an extension dot sh so we will also have a look at it like we will execute a shell script but i'll just tell you a few steps of how to do it then we have to start the script with the symbol such as hash exclamation mark and the slash bin slash sh so hash exclamation is an operator called the shebang which directs the script to the interpreter location so if we use the command hash exclamation mark slash bin slash sh the script gets directed to the bond shell then once we open this file we have to write some code we have to save it and for executing we have to just type the command bash and the file name dot sh i'll just show you how do you do it here i have the git terminal or the git bash opened here 
so we have to type say for example abc dot sh we have to write something here so what we'll do is i have a simple program which calculates the sum of the digits of a number it accepts a number from a user and it calculates the sum of its digits and it displays the result so this is a very simple program i'll just write it here i'll just save it wq okay so it is saved and now we have to just run this script using the command bash let me just check whether i've inserted okay so we are missing out on a very important thing here we have to type shebang operator okay so hash exclamation slash bin slash sh we have written whatever we wanted okay so we have saved it and now bash a b c dot sh so it says enter a number 88 so the sum of digits of 88 is 16 so this is how you write a shell script and you run a shell script so this was a very simple program but you can write any program that you want and you can run it using the bash so we have come to the final part of this session that is the git commands and uh, before knowing the git commands we'll quickly brush up a few things about git what is git so git is a free open source distributed version control system tool designed to handle everything from small to very large projects with speed and efficiency so git has the functionality performance security and flexibility that most teams and individual developers need it also serves as an important distributed version control tool that is used in devops tools like git enable the communication between the development and the operations team so whenever you're developing a large project with a huge number of collaborators it is very important to have communication between the collaborators while making changes in the project commit messages in git play a very important role in communicating among the team the bits and pieces that we all deploy lies in the version control system like git so to succeed in devops you need to have all the communication in the version control and hence git plays a very vital role in succeeding at devops so this was the definition of git and uh, this is the diagram that you must remember like the working directory the staging area the local repository and the remote repository you just need to remember these things so if you remember these things then you will get a clear understanding of what command is used to do what things so now we will have a look at few of the git commands like as you can see here we will cover a few commands git config git init and so on and few of these commands as well now let us go to the git bash so the first command that we will see here is git config command okay so this command sets the author name and the email address respectively to be used with your commits so how do you do it the syntax is pretty simple like git git config hyphen global user dot name and the name say for example edureka in my case let's just say arvind okay this is the syntax that is used hyphen hyphen global previously i just typed a single hyphen there are two hyphens here you have registered the username and now you have to register the email so that is get config hyphen hyphen global user dot email and the email address that is arvind at eureka.co okay so this works fine so the next command is the git init command so this command is used to start a new repository so this is a very simple command simply type git init like you can type the name of the repository if you want else it will initialize an empty repository without any name okay so here as you can see here on desktop it has created a repository dot get repository has been created on the desktop with our command so the next command is the git clone command so this command is used to obtain a repository from an existing url see for example uh, let me just show you i'll clone a repository from my github account okay so say for example this is the repository game of life which is available on my github account to clone that url i'll have to first go to this tab clone or download click here and then you will get link okay 
copy that link clone with https okay copy that link and paste it here kit clone and the repository paste press enter okay so the repository is being cloned here and uh, it is still working and it is done okay so as you can see here the game of life repository has been cloned so this was a very easy command we just clear the terminal so the next command is the git add command so this command adds a file to the staging area and the command for that is very simple git add and the file name so this is the syntax for the add command and suppose if you have more than one file to add to the staging area you can simply use the star option okay so it will add everything like more than one file or multiple files so this was about the git add command the next command is the git commit command so this command records or snapshots the file permanently in the version history so the syntax for this command is git commit hyphen m and any of the messages that you want to type okay so with each commit you can type a message to notify so this is the syntax for this command let's just say there's one more command called git commit hyphen a so there's one more flag with this command hyphen a so this command commits any files you have added with the git add command and also commits any files you have changed since then so this is the syntax for this command git commit hyphen a similarly there's one more command like as you have seen earlier in the linux command the rm command git rm the file name okay so this command deletes the file from your working directory and stages the deletion this was very easy command git rm similarly there's one command called git show and here you have to specify the commit id okay so this command shows the metadata and the content changes of the specified commit so this was about the get show the next command is the get remote command so this command is used to connect your local repository to the remote server so for that the syntax is very simple say for example get remote add the variable name and the remote server link this is the syntax to use the git remote if you want to delete a branch on your remote repository so how will you do it so there's one command called git push origin the remote server and the branch name say for example b2 is the branch name so the next command is the git pull command so this command fetches and merges changes on the remote server to your working directory so the syntax is pretty simple get pull and the repository link so this is a very simple command the next command that we are going to talk about is the get branch command this command lists all the local branches in your current repository and its syntax is very simple just get and branch this is a very simple command and if you want to create a new branch so for that the command is get branch say for example the new branch that you want to create so get branch and branch name and if you want to delete the feature branch so for that the command is get branch hyphen d and the branch name say for example b1 so this was the usage of the get branch command the next command is the get checkout so this command is used to switch from one branch to another branch and the syntax also is very simple get check out and the branch name where you want to switch okay say for example b1 or b2 or even master so this is one use of checkout so if you want to create a new branch and you want to switch to that branch so for that the syntax is get checkout hyphen b and the branch name b4 so this command creates a branch and also switches to that branch there's one more command called git merge so what this command does is this command merges the specified branch history into the current branch and the syntax for that is git merge and the branch name 
branch underscore name so this is a very simple command like get merge and the branch name there's one last command that we will have a look at that is get rebase so what this command does is this command will move all your work from your current branch to the master branch they look like as if they are developed sequentially but they are developed parallelly so the syntax for rebase is get rebase and the branch name so this was the syntax for get rebase what a linux file system is now when we talk about linux file system the first thing we need to know is what it is right so linux file system is a set of processes that controls how where when data that is stored and retrieved from a storage device how do you store it where do you store it when do you store it all of those are basically taken care of by the file system right so a good file system is extremely essential for everyday system processes, right? A Linux file system is basically a structured collection of different files on a disk drive, right? Or a partition. So what you can see is that the file system helps in basically making all the files present in the Linux system into much more structured, collected set of files. And as you know, in Linux, everything is a file, be it your devices, be it your applications, everything in Linux is a file right so file systems on linux basically control how and where the data is stored along with the fact that every partition consists of file system of their own just like in windows you have c drive d drive and all of that based on namespaces right in python there is no c d drive although you can have partitions but these partitions will basically have their own set of file systems right and the main thing is that file systems helps us store data systematically so this is what a linux file system is next up we talk about the different types of linux file system now when we talk about the different file types of linux file systems there are there are approximately six types the first is the ext so ext is basically ext ext234 which basically stands for extended file system now exe2 was the first linux file system that allows managing 2 tb of data but at the current moment ext4 is the fastest file system that you can have on linux next up we have the jfs jfs basically stands for the general file system general file system is basically developed by ibm along with unix right so jfs is an alternative to the ext file system ext is pretty useful but jfs comes handy when you have a cpu whose power is very limited the third kind of file system that you have is the razor fs file system so earlier razor fs was used as a default file system for linux sus but now they shifted to ext3 but what razor fs does is that it dynamically supports the file extension but has certain performance drawbacks which is why now people have again moved back to exe3 from razor fs so next up we have the xfs so when it comes to xfs you can see that xfs was considered a high speed jfs which is the general file system in high speed which is developed for parallel io processing now one example where xfs is used is basically by nasa the next one is the btrfs now btrfs basically stands for b3 file system it is basically a file system which is used for fault tolerance repairs of the system etc next up we have the swap file system which is the last kind of file system so when it comes to swap file system swap file systems are used for memory paging in linux os right so memory paging only comes into play when there is a system hibernation going on so a system that never goes into hibernate is required to have swap space equal to ram space right so swap space is always equal to ram space for systems that never go into hibernation up next we have the file system architecture now when we talk about architecture there are a lot of things we need to know let's let's get going the first thing you need to know about the file system architecture is that it is a hierarchical file structure and it can manage and provide for non volatile storage data along with the fact that the namespace describes logical structure of the file now i'll tell you all about what all of these means and finally we see that advanced information about the partitions is always stored so let's say for example this is your architecture where you have the kernel you have the virtual file system 
and you would also have the different file systems that you want right along with the hardware in the end so let's go through what i just explained to you so when i talk about hierarchical structure what i mean is that this system basically has a root directory and that root directory has certain subdirectories right so all other subdirectories can be accessed from the root directory so this is what hierarchical structure means right so when i talk about uh, the fact that it can provide for non volatile storage data when i talk about non volatile storage data i talk about ram i talk about rom right so basically this file system is uh, designed in such a way that it can manage and provide space for non volatile data right all systems require a namespace so namespace is something that defines the naming process the length of the file name or a subset of characters that you have so this namespace is also used for logically defining the structure of the file that you have right and finally we see that the data structure needs to support a hierarchical directory structure right so the structure is used to describe the available and used disk space right for a particular block so finally we see that the advanced data that the structure stores or represents contains information about the file system stored on the drive right so this information that is contained about the partitions is completely distinct and independent from other file system metadata now let's look at this architecture we have so the file system requires an api to access the function calls or to interact with file systems right so api facilitates tasks such as creating deleting and copying the files when i talk about api i mean application programming interface so the first two parts of the given system file system together make up the linux virtual file system and it provides a single set of commands that you have so next up we talk about the different file system directories that are there so let's get going as you can see the topmost file directory that you have is the root directory and you can basically access any of these other directories that are there from the root directory itself you can see there's bin dev etc usr home lib as bin tempware all of these files have certain functions right all of these directories have certain functions they store some sort of information about the system right so let's take a look at some of the file directories that are there so starting off we talk about bin now when we talk about bin the bin directory contains mostly binaries now when i talk about binaries binaries is basically some of the applications and programs that you can run so the ls command which is basically the list of the files that you have so the ls command that you have on linux and other basic tools are also present in this directory which is the bin directory right then we talk about the dev directory now when we talk about dev directory we see that the dev directory contains device files right so many of these are generated at boot time or even on the fly right so you don't really have existing device files already present so some of them are generated on the fly or when you boot the system right next up we have the etc now this is fairly important because unlike the fact that etc stands for etc here etc stands for everything to configure so everything to configure because it contains most if not all the system wide configuration calls right so all of the users the passwords the machines that are there on your network the user the password all of these are present in the etc directory uh, then we have the home directory so when we talk about home directory you can see that you find your users personal directories here for example if let's say home slash core contains my directories home slash guest will contain another guests directory on the same system then we come to lib now lib is basically short for libraries all the libraries are found in this directory libraries are basically files containing code that your application may or may not need during runtime right so the library under root it contains all the important kernel modules as you can see there are two different lib directories one is under root and one is again under var right now before we get to that we can see another directory which is the media directory now as you can understand media directory is the directory where external storage will automatically be mounted when you try and plug it in or try to access it right so media directory is the directory where if you connect storage device or an sdd it will automatically get mounted in your system right 
So these are the basic directories that are there. Let's move on to features of Linux file system. Now, when I talk about features, the basic three features that I can think about is the fact that Linux is case sensitive. Now, case sensitivity is because of the fact that it distinguishes between lowercase and uppercase characters, right? So there can be a file which is named TEST text with T capital and there can be another file which has got the same name but none of the capital letters so these are two different files in linux right you don't need to rename them you can have case sensitive files. next up we can see that linux has various hidden files that are there now linux distinguishes between standard files and hidden files most configuration files are hidden in linux os right so usually we don't need to access or read these hidden files. The hidden files are represented by a dot before their file name, right? So I'll show you how you basically access the hidden files or you can basically check out where the hidden files are. Next up, we see the different partitions, directories and drives that are present in Linux, right? So Linux does not use drive letters to organize the drive as Windows does, right? Like local disk C, local disk D. Linux does not have that. In Linux, we cannot tell whether we are addressing a partition, a network, or an ordinary directory because all of the files, all of the directories that are there, every application, every uh, device, all of everything that you have is a file, right? Even the file which has different commands is a different file. Even a command like ls is a different file which is present in bin. And we'll check that out in a in a while, right? So next up, let's come to the demo for linux file system so basically when you go into linux this is your interface that you have so where can you find your files you go to files you can also check out your directories from the terminal and that is basically what we're going to do now here, here you can see that there are no such partitions as such right you don't have a c drive you don't have a d drive so where do you find your system files like in c so you can just go to other locations, go to computer. And as soon as you go to computer, you can see that these are the files that are there, the bin file, dev file, etc, home, lib, and you can basically go into these files. So basically some of these files have restricted access. So let's just go and see how you can access them through the terminal. So you basically go to your terminal and let's just check out, check out a few Linux commands now. So to basically see the files that you have in your system just type in ls right and if you move want to move into the directory you have to put cd right choose directory and let's say desktop right and then let's say ls again so this is basically how you cd into the desktop directory now if you want to move into another directory all you need to do is the cd space dot dot and you move back here and if you see ls now you are back to square one where you can choose anything else right so if you want to clear this you can just type clear and you will basically have your terminal goods new right so basically you want to know what is the user that you are in called right so all you need to do is type in right so this is the name of the user that i have created and it's called kb and all you need to do to find out which user system you are currently on is just type in who am i right the moment you do that your system user will be shown to you so let's go back and check out something else so now you basically see if you type ls this is all the directories that you have in your system like we talked about bin with your bin files with your library files the dev file the etc home all of these are there now what we can do is check out some of these directories that we have right so let's get going so let's check out what is there in the bin file that we have right so let's do let's choose directory bin and choose it we can do cd bin now we are inside bin let's check out the files that are there so as you can see these are the various files that are present in the bin right if you can check properly you will also see that the ls command that we have is also a file that is present in the bin file I repeat in the bin directory so a command itself is also a file now this basically shows us that everything in uh, linux is basically a file 
right? Now, apart from ls, I can show you some other files which we talked about, which are directories as well. Like pound itself is another file which is present in bit and is a directory in itself as well. So as you can see, ls is a file. So let's go back to our item, right? So let's now check out, let's go clear this out, right? So let's check out this command called cat, right? So cat stands for concatenate. Now what concatenate does is basically takes any file and it shows you the binary and whatever is there. So this is basically the binary encoded file for your ls file which is present in the bin directory, right? So even for a command like this, you will basically have a binary encoded file which is there, right? So this is what cat does. It takes a file and shows you the contents of it. So the machine understandable language that is this right now is shown to you, right? So let's go back and clear this out. Right? So let's now check out another command, which is a CP command. Let's say you want to repeat. Let's say you want to copy the contents of a file into another file that you make right so let's check out what do you do for that and you need the copy command which is written by cp so first you write sudo so sudo is basically a command which gives you permission to access administrator files files that you do not get access to generally right so sudo cp and ls is the file i want to copy into my new file which is korak and that's it it's been copied now basically since I copied the contents of ls into this new file which is called korak, let's see what happens when you sudo into korak instead, right? So as you can see, different files in ls are basically now here copied into the file which is called korak, right? So this is how you copy files. Let's go back. So next up, let's just talk about another command that we have called rm right so let's say sudo rm ls right now let's go let's say ls so as you can see we've just removed the file ls right first what we did is we copied the contents of ls into korak and now you can see we've removed file ls and this is basically not there in the directory anymore now basically as you can see there's no ls so let's check out Korak because that's the file we copied it into. As you can see, Korak has all the files that were present in the ls file, right? So to change that back to ls, all you need to do is sudo cp korak and ls, right? And clear it out. And let's just check ls now. Now, if you go check ls, now the copy of contents of Korak are now in ls, and that is how you can basically copy paste any of the contents in your folder into any other folder, right? So let's check out something else now. So let's just try something out. So since we know that every single thing in Linux is basically a file, so the command, just like ls, the command cat is also a file. So can you really concatenate? A cat folder you can write cat cat let's see what happens right so this is exactly what happens you go on and on and on and this is basically your cat folder and it keeps on going until you do this so we'll just clear this out so you can basically concatenate the concatenate file with the same command right so this is pretty interesting so let's not go check out some other directories that are there right so cd slash dot dot you go back Go to ls. Let's check out, let's say, your library, right? Or the s bin that you have. So these are the s bin files that you have. So let's check them out. Let's see if we can really do something. Yeah. Right. So there is this command called add user, which is also a file which is present in the s bin directory, right? So let's see what happens when you have add user. So let's basically say we want to create a new user. That is basically the command for adding a new user. So let's do sudo because you need administrator permissions, sudo and then add user. And let's say new user's name, Rekha. 
right so this is going to be right so basically what you need is full name let's say you can just right so now you basically have created a new user called Edureka which has a full name of course B and you can basically skip these you want to add all of the room number work phone and home number if you want to you can do that but the entire point of this is to show you how you create a new user from an existing user right so basically let's go back and check something else out right then let's go back into the directory and do ls let's check out some other directories now let's cd into let's say user directory right so as you can see here there is a separate bin that is there here inside the usr directory as well so if we cd into the bin directory that it has see what's there so as you can see the bin directory is kind of similar to your root bin directory that is there now if you can check there are most of the files that you see here are already there in the root bin directory right so what is basically different and which directory are you using when you basically store files where is the file getting stored right so to do that you will basically have to type in this command let's say which ls are you using so you use the ls command which is stored in the user directory right same let's go for which cat right which concatenate same here in the user directory which cp so all of these are there present inside the user directory right and not in the root bin directory that you have although the files in the root bin directory and your user bin directory are kind of similar except there are certain more files that are present in the user directory right so let's now go check out some of the other directories that are there so let's just cd back cd back here right so let's check out some of the other directories that you have so the boot directory will consist of files that you have to boot right that you need to boot now the temp directory is the directory which has temporary files that are present there right the media directory is basically the directory which lets you connect or mount any external store device uh, automatically so if you cd into media and check out what's in there there is no other external storage device that is in there right now so there's nothing in the media file also so let's check out some other directories that are there right so let's check out the home directory so home as we talked about is the directory which contains the user's personal directories right so if you ls into this you will see that there is another new user that's been created which is edureka right along with the kb user that was there now this has only been created because we've used the add user command right so this is basically showing you all the users that are present now if you want to let's say ls into them cd kb and ls into this you can see that your personal directory and files are here right so next up let's just check out some other folders let's do cd right right so let's check out dev which is the devices right if you check out the devices so if you go into devices what you can see is sda and sda1 so these these four that you see here are the various virtual drives that you have virtual disks that you have on linux right so these are the various devices you have so if you go back let's say let's clear it out right so and finally let's go check out what proc is right so this is basically a file which is not really there right now proc is basically something which is created every time your system starts up it's not there when your system shut down every time it starts up it 
as a file called proc. Now this proc file will basically have information related to all the ongoing processes that you have. The memory management, hardware management, hardware configurations. So every Linux system has a proc file, no matter which version it is, right? Whenever you start up a Linux system, you will have a proc file. So let's go back. Let's check out our network directory now. So for network directory, we have to cd into etc, right? If you will listen to this, you can see that networks right here. Now you can cd into networks, right? So this is basically what you have. This is your network. Now, what you need to find from here is the different files that you have. So these are the different files. Let's say you turn out into this, right? And you enter into this. You can have these files, right? And you can just check the VPN connection using, let's say, CD open. right so finally what we'll do is check out where the hidden files are there so you can just so as you can see this is basically the computer where you have all your directories and you have all of these are visible and you have hidden files because linux allows you to have hidden files so to check out the hidden files that you have all you have to do is control h right all these are basically Right, so as you can see, these are all authenticated files. And so, if you just go into this and do control H, you can see the number of files that are there have increased. Right, these are other files that are there. Right, so just to see the files which are hidden in Linux, all you need to do is control H. Now let's talk about RPM. So the full form of the RPM is Red Hat Package Manager. The files used by this program have an extension of .RPM. RPM was originally created in 1997. It is free and released under GPL license. It is default packaging for distribution which comes under RHEL, CentOS, Fedora, etc. So to maintain packages, by maintaining I mean adding, updating, deleting packages in RHEL, CentOS or Fedora, we use RPM. So if you want to install any package in CentOS, there are commands like RPM-IVH, then the name of the RPM. For example, if you have got MySQL RPM with version 5.7, so let us suppose the name of the MySQL RPM is mysql.5.7.rpm. So this is just the pseudonym which I'm creating right now. So what you have to do is RPM minus IVH and then the name of the RPM file. MySQL.5.7.rpm. dot five two seven dot RPM. It will install your package. So let's check out the features first. First feature is crypto. The packages in RPM can be verified cryptographically by MD5 checksum and GPG key. So to check the integrity of any file, we have got MD5 sum. So to verify that package has not been changed from the source to a machine, we use MD5. And then to authenticate that whether it is from correct source and there is no one behind the source and IP spoofing it and getting into your system, you need GPG key. So you take a GPG key from that machine, then install it. Authentication. Source archives is also available, which helps in authentication. So RPM helps in patches also. Patches can be applied which helps in updating the process faster and easier. So if you have patches, you don't have to reinstall your system. You just have to change particular some few files and just to rebuild it, restart it. It's not that you are again going to compile your whole program and then going to restart. It is automated and installation time verification. It is done for the dependencies like if I have got a package and it is dependent on 15 or 20 different other packages. 
so it asks you to download them to carry on with the installation of your current package so the basic tasks for rpm so it is the basic task for any package manager installation updation uninstallation query and authentication so we need to check how to install a particular package how to update an existing package how to remove the currently installed package get information about the package or what is the version which it is using things which it depends on and then authentication to verify the package for the security reasons that the package is from authenticated source red hat developed rpm packages can be found at red hat enterprise linux cd rooms red hat network or red hat errata page having list of packages so if we go to any of this link on internet i'm just going over there and with i'm going to search mysql so it gives me all the versions of the mysql so it suggests that it has found 95 rpms very old ones 5.0 since 2009 so we can see there are the packages mysql client programs and shared libraries for 64 bit machines this one is for 32 bit machine i386 or i686 x86 64 is for 64 bit architectured machines so there are different rpms for different machines now how to install so to install minus i is the option but we probably go for v also because it is the verbose mode and it suggests that okay something is going on because if you just install any rpm package with rpm minus i it will be installing it but there will be no status bar in it that okay 100 percent this is now 10 percent 20 percent 50 percent 100 percent so to get that feel that okay your software is being updated or software is being installed use verbose also and then print hash marks of the package archive as just as, as it is unpacked we use minus h usually we use rpm minus ivh now check the rpm signature to check the signature we have this command minus minus check sig so it checks the pgp signature before installing any package if its integrity and origin is okay because at the background it checks for your md5 sum as well as your gpg key so if integrity and origin is okay then one can go ahead and install that package if you have any query on that package minus q is the option so it is pretty straightforward till now if you want to have a query on package it's minus q if you want to install that's a little bit different when you want to uninstall a package it is like eradicate minus v so we will come up to that it checks the dependencies of the package if package is dependent on some other packages to ignore these dependencies use minus minus no depths so rpm minus q minus minus no depths and the package name one can check if a particular package is already installed or not to do that just add minus l so minus l is for list all the installed packages so if it is installed rpm minus ql now to install all the packages which are there to view all the installed packages use minus mod so rpm minus qa so one can list all the recently installed rpm packages one can shorten the list to check for recently installed by adding minus minus last which will return the last package installed on the machine upgrade a package you need to do it minus u rpm minus uvh v is again for verbose and h for hash so rpm minus uvh and then your package will be upgraded now to remove a package as we have discussed it is minus e rather than minus r or minus uninstall so it is like eradicate to remove a package use minus e option in case you don't want to remove the dependent packages you just want to remove your package then apply minus minus no depths in it to find the package to which particular file belongs to use minus f in your query so f will give you file name to find the details about a particular installed package again rpm minus 2i and then package name to verify an rpm package use minus capital v p option because small p v is for verbose so use minus hyphen capital v option rpm hyphen capital v p and package name will give you the verification of the package so to verify all the packages use a rather than p just remove p because p is for specific package name if you go for a it will verify all the packages in the system so this rpm demo can be done on centos or fedora machine right now in our setup you are using ubuntu so let's check it out how it is being done so if i'm going to install rpm minus ivh 
you can see those hashtags coming so if you're not using minus vh in there or h is in there these will not be coming to verify whether a package is there in the files or not just use rpm minus minus verify to query on a particular package that what are the things which are there in the package rpm minus ql httpd so we know that httpd is there for hosting web servers so this is if you go to etc folder this is how it looks when it is being stored so it gives you all the files which is packaged in the rpm folder and inside any rpm now let's talk about yum so rpm was the package manager yum is again the another which is being used in the free versions of the centos so if you don't have that dot rpm files and you want to install from the source repository which you are not because in rpm files you need to have that dot rpm downloaded if you don't want to download dot rpm you don't want to take that headache of downloading dot rpm from internet what you can use is you can use yum so yum was created in 2003 and is primary choice for rpm based distros so wherever we are using rpm based distros like centos fedora yum is the repository for it we tend to do in yum is we just write the package name which we understand so i don't know the version of mysql i just go for yum install mysql it will search whether mysql is there in the repository it will come up with a specific version number it will suggest okay it is there install it via this command when you do that you don't know where that rpm package is kept or whether even rpm package is kept or not it automatically downloads that package and installs it so installing and updating the packages are simpler software dependencies are taken care of and installed along with it because if we are using rpm package we have to install all those dependencies by ourselves but in yum it is just like app get it will install all those dependencies so we have two things rpm and yum the same thing which rpm and yum is is almost synonym to dpkg and app get so if you want any package to be installed manually in ubuntu or any debian linux debian distro what we tend to do is we use dpkg command to install it and the extension of the file is dot dev similar to what we have in send to us where we use the same mechanism we use rpm minus ivh and the extension of the file is dot rpm and in the same way the yum has replaced rpm to some extent app git has replaced dpkg to some extent so let's talk about yum first the software dependencies are taken care of and installed along with it yum is primarily in command line interface but gui based wrappers also exist but it is pretty simple in command line interface it's easy to use in command line interface it is the official package manager of red hat and centos so rpm is there but this is the official package manager this is the package manager so rpm and yum rpm is the package manager which installs the package while yum is the repository management tool which will fetch the package so to get mysql installed you need to find it on internet where you can get dot rpm files but if you want to install it via yum you don't need file go yourself take the pain by yourself and search it on the internet where the dot rpm file is download it and then install it so you don't need to do that in yum in yum you just need to list the files okay whether it is listed or not if it is there in the source repository you can install it and you don't need to know what was the source of it where it has installed that headache is of yum repository yum fetches appropriate package as required by our our linux which is compatible with our linux in rpm it can be that i have a like in centos 7 the default python version is 2.7 but by mistake i go and i don't use yum i install it via rpm and install python version 2.4 which is a very old version so it is not compatible so to not to take care which is not to take headache of what is the compatible version of the software with this linux distro it is advisable to use the repository manager rpm can alert you to dependencies but is unable to source additional packages so in rpm it will check these are the dependencies which need to be taken care of it will invoke a alert to you 
that you need to install these packages first, but it will not give you the source directory or source from where to get these services or these packages. But yum finds out all the dependencies and also the additional packages and installs them. If you're installing any package via yum, yum by default has multiple repository location in its configuration file and it fetches packages for installation. So how to install using yum? Use command install to install a package using yum. So if I need to install anything, just do yum install python. I don't need to give the version of it. If I'm going to use 2.4, 2.6, like by default in CentOS 5, 2.4 was there. By default, 2.6 was there in CentOS 6. Now in CentOS 7, it is 2.7. But if you want to go for 3.5, 3.6, or 3.7 of version of Python, you need RPM for that. But via yum repository, or you need to tweak yum repository a bit. You need to go to the yum source repository.d and then tweak over there. So the first syntax is yum install Python. It will ask you if you are interested to install this package or not. Just question on it. If you don't want, if you are writing a cell script, and you want it to be installed by itself, just insert minus y command. The same thing happens with apt-get2, same thing happens with yum2. yum minus y install package name python, it will be installed and it will suppress the confirmation question and it will take the input as yes, that okay, yes has been already been provided, installed it automatically. To remove yum remove package name and again to provide confirmation, and suppress the confirmation and automatically do is it yum minus y then list package names so if you want to check whether a specific package is there in the source repository or not yum list any specific package name so it is checking for open SSH server which is my SSH server which listens on port 22 and if you want to connect from one machine to another there is a service called user bin SSH daemon so that enables you to SSH from one machine to another machine which we just had example of SSH username at the rate of machine IP. So that's the package we are searching for yum list open SSH. So to list all the available packages installed, use install keyword yum list installed. And if you want to check all the packages which are there in yum repository, just write down yum list. Use command. If you want to search any package, use command search to find all available packages to match the name of package specified. If I don't know the exact version of it or exact name of it, yum search ssh or open ssh, anything. So it provides the exact package name which needs to be installed. To find which package provides a particular file because if you are seeing some file in a system which you haven't created and it is there by some package, you can search the originator package for the file name using command yum provides file name again for updating any specific package for right now i have using python 2.6 i want to update to python 2.7 yum update package name if that update is available there it will update it automatically and to check update for which packages are available you can write command yum check update if you want to update the whole system just like ubuntu update update and update upgrade was there yum update is there and sent to us to list all the enabled repository in yum, we use command repo list. So to check what are the repositories which are there in my yum, yum source directory, yum repo list. To view both enabled and disabled one because few repositories are commented. So to check all those yum list all. To install a specific repository, yum minus minus enable repo, the repository name which was disabled. So enable that repo and that package name. So to view all those commands, the other few commands in yum are yum history. Check what are the things which you have executed in yum previously. Yum clean all, so it removes all the cassette packages and header created to resolve the dependencies. Yum group list, which lists yum groups, group info, group install, and then group remove. Demo about the yum commands, which we have just gone through. So we have searched, we have checked that to list a package, it was the command yum list. So we are just listing the package with yum list open SSH. Now it is going for all the packages, all the repository it has. Probably it is going to FTP server of IIT Madras. So ftp.iatm.ac.n. And from there, it is checking for the open SSH. Update a package. 
so again yum update open ssh was there so if there are any update available as per the source repository it will update it install a package this is a pretty cool package in linux wine it enables you to run all those executables of c of windows machine so if you are fifa fan or nfs fan so you won't be able to get those things on linux distributions because fifa or nfs doesn't support linux distributions so if you want to run linux distribution too you just need to install wine the wine application enables you to run exes also so actually these windows files are executable formats exe format so why enables you to run your exe files so what it has done is yum install wine and then it will be installed so right now yum history tells you about what are the things which have been done in last two time so it says that yum history has got 34 commands in it last one was install libx11 development package and before that it was update so accents is also defined date and time is also defined now how to search for a package so it is yum search open ssh which it has been done it is now searching for the package what are the packages available with the name open ssh you can see there are many different packages which are available for open ssh choose any one of them open ssh server open ssh client ldap gsi based perl based anything which you want if you just want to open ssh server on your machine install using open ssh server x3664 now let's get back to dpkg debian packages dpkg is the main package management system in debian and similar oss it is used to install build remove and manage packages package for it has an extension of deb at the end dpkg is low level tool apt is commonly used as high level tool as it can deal with complex tasks involved in package management. The dpkg database is located under var lib dpkg. So dpkg is almost similar to what rpm is there in CentOS. And yum is similar to what is apt-get is there in Ubuntu. So how to install? Again, just like rpm, we used to install via rpm minus i. So similarly, dpkg minus i package name. So if I have that Debian package with me, like if i need to do any installation by rpm i need to have that rpm package so similarly i need to have the debian package to be installed by dpkg so i'm installing python 2.7 debian so dpkg minus i python 2.7 deb so to check whether your dpkg debian package has been installed or not you can use command dpkg minus s python it will check if the package is installed and if it is installed it will return again to list package dpkg minus l package name if you want to list all the packages don't add the package name if you just want the content which is being used in python 2.7 debian file like the last time which we saw for httpd we list all the file names of httpd similarly over here we did that with rpm minus qf now in this scenario we can do it with dpkg minus c to remove a package just like in rpm we did by rpm minus e we have got dpkg minus r the package name and now it is not required to give the debian extension of it now installing the packages from the directory itself so if we need to install all the packages which are there in the directory minus r because it will install all the packages recursively so use command minus r and then minus minus install in the directory name so it will install all the packages which are there in the directory so if you've got 15 packages which you need to install you can do this you can put all those 15 packages in the directory and then install recursively using directory you don't need to give name of each and every package at the time of the installation now to update a package like if we have to update python you need to do dpkg minus u a specific package name now let's check the demo so dpkg minus s python now let's check dpkg minus s python so it suggests python is not installed and has got no information on it because this file has not been installed using debian package if i ask apt to install python for me it will check and install the python version 2.2.7 now i have installed python 2.7 it is unpacking and linking all those libraries and processing things up for me now let's do python dpkg the thing which i have done is dpkg minus s python now it suggests package name is python status 
installed ok installed priority is optional it gives all the information about the package i have done ticket because i don't have the tpn package right now with me so now dpkg minus l python let's run this command and check what does it give so it gives me the python version of 2.7.15 now let's get to apt because you would be using app package manager very frequently rather than using dpkg apt is the command line interface to handle package using apt library just like the yum library it we used to have sent to us we have got apt library in debian based distros linux distros it is the default package management system for debian like distros like ubuntu it is an efficient way of handling packages in your system rather than using dpkg it is advisable to use app because dependencies are managed automatically upgrades and removal are handled carefully to maintain the stability of the system and it has an external ui support with tools like synaptic aptitude but right now we are not using any tool like synaptic or aptitude we are going via command line interface now let's understand few commands first apt cache app cache is a command line interface to search for app software packages this tool is used to search software packages and get information about them one can search for a package without having exact name of the package if you even have some pattern of it you can get it from the app cache the data is fetched from different sources listed in sources.list file so as we saw in yum yum repo list was there similarly we have app get source list over here so it has got a number of links from where it searches for its packages and installs it. Where cache app archives contains already downloaded packages to avoid downloading them again if one needs to reinstall a package after removing it. So now uses of some of the app cache command. How to list in such a package using app cache. Use command package names to list packages and starting with particular string. So example. If you just want to search all the packages which are starting with open, might it be open SSL, might it be open SSH, anything. What you need to do is apt cache package names and open, open SSL or Python, anything. So that will fetch all the package names. You search for a package with a particular name. Apt cache search Python. Use command show to get details about a package. If I want to get all the details about a specific package, I would use apt cache show Python. Check the dependency of a package. Like if I install Python, what are the other packages which will be installed, which are required in support of Python to enable Python to run what are the other packages which are required to run. We can get that via app cache show package Python. Now to update a package, use app get update specific package name. So if you are to update Python, we would be using app get update Python. If we have to update the whole system, app get update simple. And then if we want to install a package but prevent from upgrading, if already installed, use minus minus no upgrade options. Now to install a package, app get install package name. It was for updation. Now let's go how to install a package. Rather than using update, just use app get install package name. If you want to install multiple packages, app get install multiple packages, Python, MySQL, OpenSSH, anything. And again, you might need to provide minus Y with it. In some of the previous version, like in 16.04, it used to ask for the confirmation. To install multiple packages having a particular string, use wildcard. So all the packages in the source dot list, which is having star name as a regular expression in it, it will install all those packages. Now apt get upgrade. If you want to upgrade the system, you can use command apt get upgrade. It may remove or update some of your installed packages. If you want to upgrade only some specific package of your system, you can use app get install python minus minus will only upgrade python it will not upgrade its dependent packages now if you want to remove app get remove specific package name if you want to remove all the configuration files associated with it what app does is app stores the configuration file because in future if you reinstall the package you don't have to take care of the configuration again but if you want to remove configuration file along with package app get remove minus minus package so removing a package doesn't remove its configuration file to remove configuration file along with it append with purge option use command download to download a package without installing it so if you are download the package just get app get download python so if you want to get into the source code of any package because we are using linux distribution everything is open source over here 
we can view source code packages of any package so in that scenario we can use applicate source python so it will unpack the source code of the python so to check for the dependencies we can use command applicate check so if we have to check the dependencies of python packages applicate check python to install build dependencies use build up options so it is there that whenever you are building your product or any software where there are many built dependencies of it to get that app get build up python so let's get into the demo of apt so the first thing is app cache show package ssh so let's run it our own system app cache show package let us go for open ssh so it says there is no open ssh now we have installed python now it is showing all the packages of the python a long list so what are the packages which has it has installed it has installed any json that might be used for the json conversion from dictionary to json in python mod python mod wizgy mod wizgy is usually utilized for web servers if you are hosting your python packages online mod wizgy mod python are being used so it lists all the packages which are installed along with the python package so rather than showing show package it is showing package names and these are default commands if i'm writing package and using tab it will be giving package names by default so these are the package names which are installed along with python so python rpm is there crypto doc is there http library is there feed parser is there so there are many packages like that we have already seen how to install package now check how to app get remove minus minus purge python so it is asking me for yes or no let's do no and now what i will do is i am just appending minus y now it will not ask me for yes or no by default it has taken that okay i have given a confirmation for deletion of this package as i have supplied minus y command if you can see the last line it says purging configuration files so all the configuration files have been deleted now let's try the previous command app cache package names so you can see even if i have not installed these packages these are getting from the cache it says that if you install python these are the packages which will be installed along with it so you don't need to install any package to check what are the dependencies and what are the files which will be installed if i install python i'm going to install app git install python 3 so you can see that i already have python 3.6.5 in my machine so it is not installing python 3 and it also suggests that few of the packages are no more required this python 2.7 and if i run command app auto remove it will clean my desk space it is suggesting that these packages are no more required python 2 python 2.7 minimal python minimal lib python standard library because i already have python 3.6.5 with 18.04 2.7 is the older version of it so i don't need these packages now i'm cleaning this off let's try app get update so you can see it has gone to security.ubuntu.com archive.ubuntu.com these are the source list repositories which it has and it is installing packages from there now it is updating itself it is checking if any new version is there it will be updating itself now it is reading the package list everything is done similarly if i want to upgrade it suggests me these many packages will be upgraded if i run this command so you can see how linux community is working There's a lot, huge community, and it's working all day. And there are many updates coming every day. Now it has started upgrading it. So there are commands like app get check, app get install Python with minus minus no upgrade. What is DNS? Well, DNS stands for Domain Name System, and its main responsibility is to translate internet domain. and the host names to ip addresses and vice versa well most of you might know that every physical machine connected to the internet is identified by an ip address but most of you might not know that these ips are unique only inside that same domain right and uh, another fact that you might not be aware of is that when you type in a url in your web browser then it uh, you know automatically gets converted to the equivalent ip address of that server which you are trying to access supposing you're trying to access uh, google.com then when you type in google.com in your browser then it would be automatically converted to google's ip address right and only based on the ip address is the system able to fetch google's server and display uh, you know give you the results on your screen well uh, 
can anybody tell me why that happens why do we do that why does there why is there an internal conversion into an ip address that happens can anybody guess why that happens well uh, that is because uh, the url or the fully qualified domain names like uh, google.com facebook.com yahoo.com all these uh, dot coms right these are the addresses of any server or machine on the internet okay and uh, they are however only easy to remember by the humans only for us for computers however it's easier to remember for them it's easier to remember in the form of ip addresses so whatever we have google.com has an equivalent ip address facebook.com has another equivalent ip address so every single uh, site and every single url has an equivalent ip address right they would be hosted on a server and to access that server you have to access uh, th that server's ip address so that's how things work in the background and uh, yeah so this task of uh, translating between the ip addresses and the domain names is what is done by this uh, by this tool called dns okay so the domain name system does that and uh, well it's a big benefit and uh, people nowadays might not realize the thing okay any newcomers might not know because without the invention of uh, dns our lives would have been very difficult because back in the 80s 90s at that time when we didn't have uh, the dns then if we had to uh, access each and every uh, website with the help of just by giving the uh, host name so for example if i wanted to access google.com back in the 80s or 90s right instead of uh, giving the ip address I ha if i had to give the google, uh, google say google.com then i have to specify this in the hosts file okay i have to map the ip address and the host name in the in the host file and uh, doing that today seems a very tedious task because we have so many uh, websites and we have so many uh, ip addresses which we have to manually feed and uh, this is a manual task right so to uh, to eliminate this overhead we came up with dns and uh, boy now it's a uh, very big uh, help and a lot of our uh, effort is saved so that's the thing and talking of how dns works it works on a concept which is very similar to a client or a server or network communication architecture okay so here our systems will be the uh, dns client okay now supposing i'm accessing internet then i would be a dns client first of all and then i'll be sending these requests to the server okay i'll be sending the request to the dns server by specifying the host name uh, if i type in google.com in my url in my uh, in my web browser then that you uh, then that host name would go to dns server it would the dns server would resolve google.com to a particular ip address similarly if i type any other uh, website like facebook.com or yahoo.com dns server would do the task of converting that that host name into its equivalent ip address and then give back that ip address to us okay and uh, the very act of uh, sending a request is called a lookup request okay and uh, what you get back from the dns server in the form of an ip address that's called a lookup response so these are the two things that uh, are involved and uh, wherever you you configure the dns server in whichever environment or whichever machine that's uh, generally called a dns server okay it can even it can even be a running environment and similarly every uh, system that tries to access that particular server that uh, they are called uh, dns clients so we don't have much of a configuration to do from the dns client side but of course dns server side we have a lot of configuration to do <coughs> excuse me guys yeah so that's about uh, this example and another thing that i want to show you is that uh, this concept of dns lookup request okay now if you see this image over here you can see that uh, over here i've uh, specified lookup request and lookup response okay but over here this dns client is making a request in the form of an ip address right and then the server is uh, giving back the dns response in the form of a fully qualified domain name so in my case dns.vardhan.com is a fully qualified domain name that i have set for my demonstration on this system of mine okay on this uh, virtual machine now now you might ask the question why am i specifying ip address now that's because uh, the fact that of course you people know right you can uh, either enter the ip address or the host name so to represent that i've entered this and when you enter the host name into your uh, web browser and when you and when the server gets back to you with the ip address then that's called a forward lookup okay so it resolves the host name or the domain name to the ip address uh, whereas the reverse lookup this one resolves resolves the ip address to the host name so in this case when i send an ip address supposing i know the ip address of a machine but i don't know the uh, host name or the domain name then in that case what i get back the lookup response i get back from the server that would be a reverse lookup 
right? So there are there can be two kinds of uh, ways in which you can access and look up. So th these are the two things with respect to DNS. Now the uh, question that can arise in your mind is that uh, where does the DNS server get the IP addresses of the host name, right? You can ask that from where, how, if there are so many websites, if there are uh, so many domain names, if there are so many IP addresses for those uh, systems inside a particular domain, how would our uh, DNS server access that particular uh, IP address or that particular server? You can ask me that question. And to explain that question is what I'm going to explain in this uh, next slide, right? So here, first of all, we have a local system. Now let's assume it's uh, me. Okay. I'm trying to access a new uh, website. Okay. Which has not been, which is a very new website. So, or let's ignore the fact that it's a new website. The uh, let's just consider that we are going to try to access google.com. Okay. So when we try to access google.com, then that request would first of all, go to a resolver. Okay. Now the resolver is nothing but your ISP server and it's basically built into your network operating system. And the IP address of google.com would be built inside resolver. Okay. It would be present as a cache memory. And uh, since the IP address would be present, the host name would be resolved and the response would be, it would come back to you. But in case if there's a new website, which has uh, been newly, newly published. And if that uh, website, if that IP address is not in your resolver, what happens? Google.com is famous, right? But google.com is, uh, you know, you, there's no guarantee that the website that you're talking about is, has been accessed by someone in your ISP and it's on there in your DNS cache. What would happen at that time? So at that time, the entire, uh, we have the, we have a different root hierarchy of DNS, right? So those would be accessed. Now that's where the whole concept of uh, DNS comes into the picture. And that's where we have, first of all, something called as the root server. Okay. Now the root server sits at the top of the DNS hierarchy. Okay. And uh, there are about 13 sets of uh, these root servers placed strategically around the world and uh, about 12 organizations access these, uh, you know, they control these root servers. And the thing with these root servers is that they will not tell you which uh, exactly which IP address your host name is uh, resolved to. Okay. If you specify uh, button.com, it's not going to re return back with the IP address of uh, that particular domain. What the root server will do is it will point you to another server. Okay. And that is called the top level domain servers also called TLD servers. Okay. Now when they point back to the TLD servers, the TLD servers will have further information. So they can point you to a direction where you will get the IP address. So the root server will point you back to the TLD server in which your domain may be hosted. Okay. The domain that you're trying to access that may be hosted in one of the domains over here. And uh, these, one of these domains are what, make up these 13 set of root servers. So from the 13, you shortlist one of them and uh, those come to the resolver. It tries to access the top level domain servers and uh, these top level domain servers, they store information of these uh, top level domains such as uh, .com or the .net or the .org domains, all these domains, right? So whether it's facebook.com or google.com, those kinds of, those kind of information or details will be present in the top level domain servers. Now, even now you cannot uh, totally resolve to a particular domain's IP address. Supposing I want to access a particular IP address inside a domain that I cannot get it here. I just, by this time, the top level domain only, uh, it only knows this particular uh, domain is hosted under these, uh, servers. Okay. So what the TLD will do is it would again return back the particular domain or uh, let's say, let's call it authoritative name server. Okay. The TLD would return this name server back to the resolver. So based on that information, the resolver would again query the authoritative name server. Okay. Now the name servers is what knows everything about the domain, including the IP address. So the root server would uh, return back the top level domain servers, such as the .com or the .net or the .org and these top level domain servers, they will return back the domains where your IP address is part of, right? And uh, that is through the authoritative name servers. And uh, yeah, that's how uh, things happen. And then the re resolver would finally get uh, short, uh, you know, get to the IP address inside your authoritative name server. And uh, finally it would, sh it would store the IP address in its uh, cache locally for uh, later use. So the next time somebody else is trying to access this website in your, uh, you know, through your ISP, then they can uh, instead straight away access that website with the IP address since it would already be present in the uh, cache. And yeah, finally, once it's uh, present in the resolver, the resolver would uh, send the response back to the local system. 
so this is how a dns server works okay now uh, if you guys have understood this part then you're all set you can understand exactly how how to set up your uh, dns server which uh, which which server to use right so speaking of which server we have a lot of uh, dns servers available in the market and uh, we what i'm going to use in my session is that of a bind dns server so bind is one of the most popular and one of the uh, earliest dns servers which was in use and it's basically a name server and it can also be configured for mail servers and uh, i'm going to use bind however you can uh, try out unbound or you can try out uh, power uh, dns we have a number of uh, names so, uh, dns servers so moving on to uh, how to configure a bind dns server i can show you that in 10 simple steps okay now let's see how uh, we do that now that's the next topic and uh, the 10 the 10 steps that are involved are uh, mentioned here right and first of all the most obvious of the uh, steps is this one you have to install bind because uh, bind is a dns service and we'll have to install bind with the help of uh, yum command in centos machines uh, if you're however doing this on a ubuntu machine it would uh, be apt get install bind right so this is the uh, first step the second step would be to add a static ip address uh, now can anybody uh, guess why we add a static ip address to your uh, uh, machine to the to the system where you're configuring the dns server anybody well uh, see the reason for that is uh, because when we reboot our uh, machine so sometimes if your server crashes and then it uh, reboots then at that time you don't want your ip address to change right so for that purpose you say boot protocol is static okay so initially by uh, default when you're trying to configure it for the first time you would find dhcp over here that's uh, stands for dynamic host control protocol which would assign a dynamic ip address every time you reboot your uh, server but uh, when you change it to static then what ip address you set here this is going to be constant it's uh, not going to change okay so that's the uh, uh, need to assign a static IP address and that makes up the uh, second step. And along with these, you need, you need to also add these two lines of net mask and say which uh, subnet it belongs to, okay? And the gateway. So uh, in my case, my IP address is uh, 192.168.56.2 and this is what I've entered in my uh, edge zero file, which is present under uh, this directory, etc sysconfig network scripts, right? and you also add the gateway okay and you add these three lines and the rest remains the same and you of course change the at zero file and uh, moving on the next step is to assign a fully qualified domain name for your server well what's the point in uh, hosting a domain if you don't want to give a, a, a domain name right so that's the whole point of assigning it and uh, you can simply assign a domain name a fully qualified domain name by entering this file the etsy sysconfig network file and uh, you'll have two lines, you'll have networking is equal to yes, this will be a line which would be initially there. And even the host name is equal to uh, followed by the current machine name. That would be the uh, entry initially in your system. Okay, so when you configure it, you can change it with the domain name that you want to give. So in my case, I'm giving dns1.varadhan.com. Okay, so you can uh, change it appropriate, uh, accordingly. You can do that. Uh, so once you've uh, set the uh, fully qualified domain name, the next step is to go to the uh, etsy hosts file and add the entry okay this entry you've uh, in your uh, in this file right in your networks file you've added the domain name you've said uh, this is your host name now you're uh, defining an ip address for that host name over here in the hosts file right that's the step here these two lines would uh, be there by default you don't need to worry about that and the fifth step would be to go to your resolve.conf file okay this would again be present under the, under the uh, etsy directory and uh, you need to add these two lines so you need to say search and your domain name uh, you can ignore the dns one part but you got to uh, put your domain name over here uh, in your case it can be anything but in my case it's vardhan.com otherwise it can be google.com or yahoo.com excuse me it can be anything like that and of course you should say name server and point the ip address which you want to act as the uh, dns server okay and uh, this is one important step which has to be configured even in the clients, uh, even in your DNS uh, client. Okay, so supposing uh, if I want to check later, what is the, uh, uh, what, if my domain name is working, right? That time I will have to go to the uh, resolve.conf file in my client and add this particular line. 
I will show you that later, right? I will show you that in my demonstration. So just remember that it's a very important uh, step which you need to do even in your clients. In fact, this is the only step that you have to do in your clients, in your DNS client side, right? So the, then the uh, next step would be to go and edit the namedy.conf file. So from here onwards is where the uh, actual configuration of bind starts. So till here you are just configuring your own network, the first five steps from the sixth step onwards till the uh, eighth and in fact even the ninth, uh, till the eighth step, it's all about bind DNS, okay? So this named.conf file is a file that comes when you install uh, bind, okay? And uh, what you have to do is you have to enter the namedy.conf file and you'll have a number of lines there, which of course I can't, uh, I, I couldn't print all the lines in my slide. So I have just the three lines, which we have to uh, change. So we have to edit these three lines. And uh, the thing is, initially, when you open this file, you will have this uh, line, okay, where uh, in curly brackets, you would have localhost, like it says here. What you have to do is you have to replace this localhost with your IP address. So in my case, I would be doing it with dot uh, 52. Uh, sorry, dot two fifty six dot two. That's my IP address, right? And uh, you'll have one more line for pointing to the IP v six port number. And this you need to comment this. You don't need this line anymore, okay? And uh, the third line which you have to edit is that of allow query. And you will have none initially. You should uh, replace this with any. So that is the uh, sixth step which you have to uh, uh, configure. When you're done with this, you can uh, then go to the other file in the Etsy, which again, uh, the file name is rfc.1912.zones. And this of course comes from, uh, comes when you install bind and uh, here is where you define your zones. Okay. Now there are uh, two concepts of forward lookup and reverse lookup, right? So I told you that when you enter the uh, host name and then uh, you hit enter in your browser, then that's called a forward lookup. But however, if you enter the IP address, that's a reverse lookup. So if you want people to query your server, either uh, in the forward or the reverse fashion using one of these uh, uh, lookup fashions. So at that time, for that purpose, you have to set up two different zones. So your first zone would have the rules and settings for what should uh, be returned to them when they access you uh, from the forward lookup and when they access your server through the lookup uh, through the reverse lookup, then the settings for those would be present under this uh, zone. Okay. So I've just defined that it's uh, the, uh, I've, I've just defined the forward lookup as uh, my domain name here. As you can see, it's in the form of version.com, which is uh, like a domain name. And for the reverse lookup, of course, it would be from the IP address. So for this reverse lookup, I've uh, said it would be in the form of an IP address and I've named it as reverse.zone. Okay. And similarly, file would be forward.zone. Okay. Now uh, this file, RFC file, this is going to be again a very long uh, file and you will have a lot of lines there and uh, these would be uh, this would be placed in there. So you would understand this better when I open the demonstration. So stick around till then till you understand this completely because it's a little tricky at uh, this step. Okay. And uh, then moving on to the next uh, point, uh, the next step is the configuring of the forward and the reverse zone. So whatever we have configured over here in step seven, we have created the forward zones here. We've uh, created a new file forward.zone and created a new file reverse.zone. We have to add the, uh, we have to add the rules over here. So that's what you're doing here. You create one and then you open them and you will have a basic template and you will have to edit that template and replace that template with your host name and your IP address. In the forward.zone, you would replace the uh, template, uh, the template with your uh, domain name and in the reverse.zone, you would replace your template with your, uh, IP address. So these are the two things that you have to do. And when you do this, your uh, DNS server is uh, well and good. Okay. But however, you might also want to change your group ownership of uh, those two files. Okay. This is a minor step that's needed. You're just setting it uh, root access, full permissions. And uh, yeah, that is the final step. When you do that, you can just restart your uh, NAMD service and uh, your service would be up and running. Right. So these are the uh, 10 different steps which are uh, needed. So I can uh, now get started with my hands on, right? So let's see how to configure this uh, bind DNS server in 10 simple steps through my demonstration. And for uh, my demonstration, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my virtual machine. Okay. So uh, this is my virtual machine. As you can see, I've already set my domain name here. It says uh, dns1.version.com. This is my machine name. So let me just open this up. 
So uh, first and foremost, let me just check what's my IP address. That's uh, 192.168.56.2. The IP address did not change because I followed my step and I have assigned a static IP address for this, right? So okay, guys. So I hope you can see the uh, VM clearly now. Right now, uh, the first thing, of course, that you would have to do is to install bind, right? So the command for that is uh, sudo yum. Well, what I'll do is I would uh, enter as a sudo user. Okay. Yeah. The first command is to do a yum install bind. And uh, I'm going to give asterisk because there are multiple packages that come with bind. So I would want to install all those uh, utilities, especially the one that's a ch root and utils package. So when you give asterisk, all the associated uh, packages would be there. And uh, since I have already the latest one installed, I have nothing to do. So the next step would be, let's go back to uh, step number two, would be to assign a static IP address. So I've done that and let me just uh, verify that and show it to you once. Okay, so let me open this and show it to you. So I'm gonna do a cat command here or let's uh, do a VM itself. Let's see, sys, sysconfig, network scripts, and I want to edit my at zero file. Okay. Okay, so one minute. Oh yeah. at zero file, all right? So here we go, these are the settings that uh, I had told you that I had already done. I've assigned my IP address here, I've um, mentioned it's gonna be static, okay? I've also added these two lines, a net mask and gateway along with my IP address. So this is something that you also have to do. So let me just uh, close this. Now, going to the step two is all about assigning of, of uh, you know, Assigning a FQ DN, a DN for my server, right? Fully qualified domain name. So that we can do by going to my Okay, so as you can see, my uh, host name, of course, uh, it's dns1.varden.com. Uh, you can again change the domain name as per your wish, right? So this is the important thing. And uh, the next step would be to configure the etsy slash hosts file. Okay, you have to add your, uh, uh, whatever domain name that you've created, you have to add the IP address uh, along with that. Okay, so let me just, uh, Go to my hosts file and show you that I've done the same thing here. I have my IP address and I've also specified my domain name for this particular IP address. Okay, that's done with step number four. Now going to step number five, we have to then go to our resolve.conf file. Okay, so our uh, resolve.conf file is again present over here. And as you can see, uh, I've said search vardhan.com. Okay, now uh, I've mentioned my I mentioned my uh, domain name, but however, there's one problem over here. The uh, name server is wrong. So it's pointing to 1.1. .1. So let me just change this to my IP address, which uh, I want to set for my uh, name server. And uh, let me also, okay, so I can also comment these two lines. I don't really need these two lines. Okay. So I'm going to comment them out. I'm going to just uh, save and quit. All right, so going back to my uh, step number six, now is where the uh, whole bind task starts. So bind, like I told you, it's one of the most popular uh, DNS servers, right? So let's edit the namedconf file, which is uh, given by bind. So here we go. 
and uh, this is the file here and uh, this was the line that I was talking about okay you would have uh, local host specified over here and you'll have to change this with the IP address of the server on which you are uh, of change it with the IP address of the machine that you want to make your server okay DNS server in my case it's my IP address and uh, you have to comment this line of yours and then you will have the allow query right so here you have to specify any so these are the three uh, settings that you have to do in your namedconf file okay when you've done this you can just uh, quit and then you can go to the next step that is configuring the rfc.1912.zones okay you define the zones over here now okay so this is the uh, file the rfc file and as you can see this is my uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, thing which is pointing to my forward zone okay i've uh, said uh, vardhan.com is my domain and uh, i've said type master it's going to be the master it's not going to be the slave it's going to be the master over here and i've said the file name is forward.zone okay uh, when when we uh, say file forward.zone it basically means the settings for uh, the rules that you need to follow that you need to return would be present in the file called forward.zone and uh, this forward.zone would be present in the directory that is uh, var slash namedy okay uh, that is a directory that you can set in your namedy.conf so the file that i opened previously in that we have to set the path so let me just uh, quickly open back that uh, file and show you what i'm talking about so over here along with uh, specifying these three lines i have something called as directory right so whatever uh, uh, files that my dns is bind is going to create so that it would it would place it in the slash where slash named so even the forward zone and the uh, reverse zones which i'm going to uh, configure in my rfc those would be present inside inside this directory okay so that's why we have written forward dot zone which would be the name of my file and uh, similarly explaining the other lines uh, dump file again over here is where your uh, uh, cache and your logs would be dumped okay and then you have a statistics file where you'll have other uh, details well, these are not uh, we don't need to really worry about uh, these details for now okay we just need to verify that it includes the rfc 1912 dot zones because you are defining your forward and the reverse zones inside this location okay now now going back to the rfc 1912 dot zones i explained uh, this part okay now what you have to do is one minute guys Yeah, sorry for the delay guys one minute okay yeah so what i was uh, what i was talking about is uh, setting the forward zone we've done that here now we need to go down and you would see the reverse zone right here okay uh, as you can see when someone queries me with the ip address of my system that time uh, we are specifying the rules for that in uh, this file called reverse dot zone okay and this again would be present in the same directory and one thing which you would find strange is we have uh, we have the subnet in the reverse order okay now that's because uh, that's how rules are defined so you don't uh, this is the only thing that's going to be different instead of giving 192.168.56 you would have to give it the other way you have to first specify the class c then comes class b and then class a okay the subnetting order is a little different over here when you specify the reverse dot zone uh, the reason for that is in the reverse dot zone you specify the number of your IP address. So in my case, it's two. So I've uh, specified the two and I've uh, followed that up with the uh, rules. So for that purpose, we specified in this order. Okay, you would understand this better later. Okay, so right now you might get a little confused. So just uh, hang around. So let me just uh, quit and exit this. Now going back to my slides, the next step is to actually create the forward zones and the reverse zones okay and then open them and uh, use the template to basically create a rough a forward and reverse zones and then edit them so now those would be present okay let me first clear the screen guys okay so let me do uh, slash vr slash name d and uh, I can do an ls first okay so as you can see 
right now we have something called as namedy.localhost okay now this is the uh, file that provides the default template okay now the forward dot zone and the reverse dot zone is what i created based uh, out of this so using this i created uh, these two files and uh, let me now show you what i have uh, made changes in these two files okay so this is my forward dot zone which i am uh, first editing and as you can see uh, we have in the first line it says ttl so ttl stands for uh, time to live and uh, we say that as one day okay and uh, when we say add the rate it basically means uh, rules for all okay and uh, in specify uh, stands for internet and uh, soa stands for state of authority now these are a couple of terms which you might not understand when you get started with dns right away okay so the state of authority we are giving complete when we say add the rate in SOA, we are giving complete authority to this particular domain. Okay, that's what's happening. And uh, right after uh, specifying SOA with the tab space, I have uh, said dns1.vardhan.com. This is my fully qualified domain name to which I'm giving complete uh, authority. Okay, along with that, I'm uh, giving root dot the fully qualified domain name. Now, the one rule which you have to notice after I give the fully qualified domain name, I finish it with uh, append that with a dot. The, the same thing goes over here and over here. Okay. Uh, this is basically to indicate that your uh, domain is ending. Okay. This is a syntax. So you cannot play around over here. So just make sure that you have a dot. And if there's any time, if there's an error, make sure that you check this because most of the time errors would be because of uh, giving of failing to give a dot somewhere here. Okay. And these are again, set of rules, which you don't need to really worry about. These are the rules when something goes down, it, it's, it's about the backup. Okay. So what you need to, uh, just edit is these two lines in your, uh, forward dot zone. When I've said again, which stands for internet, I've uh, said that the forward dot zone over here would act as a name server. Okay. So I'm setting up my bind as a name server, which would basically resolve IP addresses and host names. Okay. So NS stands for name server. If you want to configure a mail service over here, then you can replace NS with MX and uh, similarly other options okay with bind of course you have these two options and i've uh, added name servers name server and i've said my server is uh, dns1.vardhan.com okay and the domain the dns1 i've uh, given the ip address of 192.160.56.2 okay so whenever this domain is uh, queried then the address for that query over here is the server okay the server address would be 192.160.56.2. So that's what the forward zone does. Now, let me just uh, quickly exit this and open my reverse zone. And here, the only difference that you would see is the last line over here. Okay. So we, the other rules are the same. You're uh, saying complete state of authority to your, uh, uh, to your domain name here. And then these rules are the same. And uh, you're also defining the name server for dns1.version.com, which is my domain name. But in, instead of A, we have PTR. So A over there stands for address, right? Uh, that's pointing to your address. But when you say PTR, it's basically pointing to your IP address. So because it's a reverse lookup, right? So from your IP address, it's looking up to your domain name. So that's why we replace this with PTR. This all this is the syntax. So you uh, say PTR and then you give the, uh, if it's uh, 56.2 in my case, so I've given two over here. Okay. Now some of you might have had a doubt why I gave that in reverse, uh, 192.168.56. So that's because the rules start from here. So it's 2.56.168.192. So, uh, it would look up in that fashion, right? So now I hope, uh, now you would have understood why I did that. And, uh, yeah, that it's pretty much it. And this is all that's needed to set up your DNS server. Okay. So let me just uh, quit this again and uh, I want to clear the screen. So the ninth step that uh, that needs to be done is that of changing the group ownership of these two files. Okay. You give them complete uh, root access. Uh, this is something that I've already done. So I don't need to uh, brush up on this. And uh, finally, the 10th step is to restart your uh, named service. Okay. Now let me just supply the command for that. Okay. So 
service, namely restart. This is a command to restart my service. And it says uh, it's stopping my service. Okay, and it started my name service. Great. Now, uh, to check if our uh, connection is up and running, we can do a dig command, which basically uh, digs for our name service. And as you can see, it says that uh, the status, there's no error and it's uh, giving you all these uh, details. But to understand better, you need to just look at this particular server. If this is coming perfectly, right? So the server that you set your DNS service for is uh, this one, 192.168.56.2. So that is coming up here. It's uh, perfect. And it also says it's, it's under port 53, uh, as we suggested. Now, you can uh, verify this in, an, in another way by supplying this command, ns lookup command and specify the domain name. Uh, in my case, it's dns one dot vardhan.com so when i hit enter you can see that uh, it says the server is my ip address uh, the address where it's hosted is uh, port number 53 inside the same ip address and the domain name is uh, this and my ip address now similarly when i do a reverse lookup i can do a 192.168.56.2 when i do this it returns me my domain name again, right? So this is the server. This is the port number where it's running and the uh, lookup done in reverse fashion, right? And uh, it's pointing to my correct domain name. So this is what uh, a DNS server does. So this is how you set up a DNS server guys. Now, some of you might, uh, you know, have a doubt as to, okay, we've done, we are doing the lookup from the server. That's why we are uh, getting to see the details, uh, the correct details here. Now, right? So you're not, uh, you know, having a verification. You don't have a verification as to if you can actually see this domain name from other systems also. Now, to answer that question, I can show it to you from a different VM. So this is one VM. I can go to my second VM here. Right? And uh, let me open up my terminal first of all. Uh, Okay, I'm going to do a if config and yeah, this is my IP address of this VM. Okay, now let's see if this uh, from this VM, if I do a reverse uh, lookup, uh, sorry, if I do a lookup to my uh, domain name, let's see if it's pointing to the correct address, right? You guys notice that this has a different IP address, right? Now, let me supply the same command NS lookup and say my uh, IP, uh, my, my domain name here, vardhan.com. Okay, and when I hit enter, uh, okay, so it's giving an invalid address. Now that's because we have not set the name server, right? So there was one uh, point number six, which I told you that we had to do even on your client side. Now it is this point, this one, right? Where you, you will configure the dissolve.conf file. You have to set the name server, which you want your system to look up to. So that is what you have to do over here. So at every client, if you want to resolve the domain name, you have to do that. And uh, the command for that is uh, resolve.conf, okay? And there goes the password. As you can see, we have uh, the default ones over here. Now let me replace, let me first comment these two lines and change the IP address over here and point it to my name server. So my name server, my DNS name server is a 56.2. Save and exit. Now, if I supply the same command, NS lookup command, now you can see that it's pointing to my uh, IP address and it says the port number where it's hosted is uh, 53 and it's resolving my domain name and this is the address. From here, let's uh, check even the reverse lookup, okay? And when you do that, the reverse lookup also works exactly the way we want it. Correct? So it's pointing to my domain name and uh, yeah, that's how this works guys. So that's how you set up a DNS uh, server and this is a simple 10 step uh, process. Now let's move on to our command line essentials. For that, I'm going to take you to the terminal. Now, because this is a scripting video, we're going to spend a lot of time on the command line interface. 
Now, this is important because it saves you a ton of time. You can't just keep switching from CLI to GUI in any real life given scenario. So I am using CentOS 7, the Fedora version, and I'm running it on a virtual machine. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the size of the text a little bit. I think this should be fine. And then let's start with making a list of all the commands that we shall be acquainting ourselves with. For that, I'm going to open the nano editor and I'm going to name this CLI Essentials. All right. Now, nano editor is basically a text editor like any other. I could have used Wim instead of it, but I like the nano editor because it gives you a bunch of options in the bottom and it's just easier to use. So let's start with our list. So we have our basics, which are CD, which means change directory, PWD, which will show you the directory. Then we have LS or list. Then we have the next segment, which is the copy, the move and the remove. They pretty much do what the name suggests. They copy, move and remove respectively. Then you have echo, which is like Linux's version of print. You have cat or concatenate, then you have less, which by definition, both of them should sound pretty similar, but in a bit, I'll tell you why they are different. Then we have grep, we have mkdir, which basically helps you make a directory, and then we have touch, which basically helps you make files pretty quickly. Then we have change mode, which is also pretty significant. I'll tell you in a bit why. And then finally, we have man plus help, which is basically like a manual. Then if I had to save this, I just have to write out. So control O, then it'll ask you whether this is the name you want to save this with and hit enter. And then it tells us that we've written 14 lines. Now, all I want to do is exit this. So control X and here we are back on our basic terminal. So let's start change directory right now as you can see we are at edureka our current working directory so cd slash home it's as simple as that now we are at home then we can do a cd and back to edureka there you go then we have pwd which will show you your current working directory as you can see it shows home slash edureka it's the path of our current working directory then we have ls it shows all these files that are there in our current working directory not just that you can also write ls and specify a path name so then it will give you the list of objects that is there in that particular file so at home you have these two files called edureka and vagrant now what else can we do with ls we can go ahead and look at the flags that are available for that. All you have to do is hyphen hyphen help. Now that works universally through all distributions of Linux. Now this may look like a lot of text now, but if you go up, you will realize that there are flags and their descriptions given on the left and right respectively. You have your hyphen A, which means do not ignore entries starting with your dot. Then you have capital A, which means almost all. And then it has its description right here. What I'm more interested in comes all the way down here, which is your L flag or the long listing format. Let's use that and see. Now, I had done ls before. Now, if I go on and do ls hyphen L, it's basically going to show me all my objects the same as ls, but it is going to give me more information about these objects like the date and time at which this object was created, who is the user, the user group. And on the extreme left, if you see, it basically shows you the permissions, which I'm going to talk a little more about later in this segment. Right now, all I want to tell you is R here stands for read, W for write, and X for execute. So when you see RWX written on the left, it means your user can read, write, and execute that particular file. Okay, with that, let's clear this. All right, let's move on to our next set of command line essential commands. So what else did we have? We had copy. So for copying, all you have to do is type CP, type the name of your file, and then put in a destination path. 
In this case, I've put in pictures, which is there in the Edureka directory. And with that, it is copied. Now, let's see if it is actually present in pictures. So again, let me just use the list command. And you can see CLI Essentials is right here. Now, let's see how to use the move command. For this, I am going to be moving to this pictures directory. Oh, first up, let's just see what other file can we make the move to. All right, we have downloads, we have project public. All right, so first, let's move into pictures. So now I'm at pictures. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move CLI essentials to let's say I'm going to move it to public. Okay. Now, once the move is done, if we see public, let's list out public. You see, there is just one file which is CLI essentials. But then if I go back and check pictures, there is no CLI essentials file. Which basically means what moving did was it removed the file from the pictures directory and put it in public. Now let's remove that file from public with which we can also cover the rm command. So let's move into public. Now, as you can see, we are at public. Let me clear this. I'll keep clearing the screen for which you can just type clear or use control L. And let me remove CLI essentials. Now, if I do an ls, you see there is nothing there in the public directory. So, with that, let me move back to Edureka, the original working directory I was in. Let's see what are the commands that we were using. Okay, we've done cd, pwd, ls, cp, mv, and rm. Next, we have echo. Now, as I had mentioned, echo is like the print command in here. So, if I'm going to say echo, hello world, like we haven't used this phrase a million times already, but I'm going to stick to the cliche and I'm going to still type that. It prints out hello world. Surprise, surprise. And as you might have seen, what I previously did, which was using the cat command, I'm going to do it again. Basically, what the cat command does is it concatenates your text file to this terminal of yours. So what is there in that particular text file, CLI Essentials, I can see it printed right here. Now, how is that different from the less command? Now, if I did the same thing with less, it will also show you the contents of your text file, but it will open it on a brand new separate window and just override the previous window you were working on. Now, this is a much neater way and it helps you from not cluttering the window that you're currently working on. So that was all about cat and less. For grep, let's move back into our original window. For that, all you can do is press Q and then you're back here. So the next command we're going to do is grep. Basically, what it's going to do is it's going to grab the data from a certain file or a command that you are trying to pursue. So you guys might remember I just used the MV or the move command. So what I'm going to do is MV and go to help because if you remember your hyphen hyphen help would basically bring out this entire manual of the flags that are there for MV. Then we're going to pipe and we're going to do this thing called grep and we're going to type out verbose. So basically what I'm trying to find out is, is the verbose flag available for your move command or not? So as you can see, your hyphen V or the verbose flag, basically what it does is it explains what is being done while you move it. So if you use the hyphen V flag with your move command, it's going to show you basically where you're moving your file. And if suppose you're using a big file, suppose a 12 or a 20 GB file, it's going to show you when it starts and when it is finished. With that, let's move on and let's see what else. So we finished cat less grep. Next, we have touch and MKDIR. Now, touch will be easy to show. It is basically going to help you create a few files quickly in the current working directory that you're working on. So file1.txt, then we have file2.txt, and let's take file3.txt. 
not very original but just have to show you how it works and if i do an ls you can see you have file1.txt file2.txt and file3.txt right here next we have mkdir which basically helps you make a directory in your current working directory if i just type files and then i'll do this ls again you see we have created a directory which it'll show you in blue and we have created files then we have chmod or change mode now this basically helps you play with or alter the permissions that are associated with a file now let me give you an example by running a script so what i'm going to do is i'll open script so basically what i'm going to do is that i'm going to write a little script now this is a no means me rushing into the next segment that one is separate this is just for me so i can demonstrate how you use chmod so i'm going to go with the shebang line and i'm going to just go with hello world or hello learner because we have used hello world a lot so i'm going to write out of this control o and then we're going to move out of here now let me clear this out and let's try to run that particular script so this is how you run it you go dot slash and then test dot sh and as you see it basically shows you permission denied now one thing you should remember is any script that you've just written isn't executable from the get go mostly you only have permissions to read it now to change that condition we have something called chmod so when you go ahead and type chmod and then your plus r or plus w or plus x it means you're basically adding to whatever permission that there is a permission to execute that particular file so with that plus x now let's try running this and as you can see hello learner so what i could have done instead of the plus x is i could have done this 777 and then test which would have meant the same thing but there is a difference from just adding a permission to the user and using the ch mod this way for that let me open another nano editor called permissions so i can explain it to you further now remember how i had said when we were using long lists or the extension hyphen l to ls that on the left most column what you could see were the permissions associated with a certain file now chmod basically helps you alter that now if you might have noticed the permissions were displayed in the following fashion suppose abc and then abc and then one more abc and then the file name and then the date and then whatever basically there are three aspects to it the first one being the user or you second one being the user group and finally there's a thing for everybody else so when you basically type chmod and followed by three numbers you're basically specifying the user the group and others and then the file name which is the basic syntax of chmod now how does this work now these numbers can be anything from 0 to 7 and all those numbers mean something now let's start with 0 we have 0 which is equal to 0 which basically means nobody gets any permission then we have 1 which basically means only execute then we have 2 which means you can only write then you have 3 which is basically the sum of 2 plus 1 which means you can write and execute then we have 4 which is read then we have 5 which is essentially 4 plus 1 which as you all might have guessed means read and execute then we have 6 which is read and write and finally you have 7 which is 4 plus 2 plus 1 which means all three permissions read write and execute not going to be saving this so when you type something such as chmod 777 and a certain file name your first seven basically means your user has the permission to read write and execute 
Your second seven means your user group also has the permission to read, write, and execute the file, and so does everybody else, which you can see through the third seven. With that, I am closing this. So Control X, and then I'm not saving it. And then finally, I have man plus help, which is basically your general commands manual. You can see the names of all your general commands. You can see your bash bulletin commands. It's basically like your guidebook before scripting. You can press H and it'll open to a summary of commands. And then you can press Q when you are done. Again, Q. Now let me head back to my presentation for a little more on CLI. Now basically, before closing this segment, I'm going to talk a little bit about CLI and how it compares to GUI. So firstly, the first point must be pretty clear. CLI actually stands for Command Line Interface. So it basically means it's a text-based interface. Now the GUI or the Graphical User Interface is a visual-based interface, pretty clearly. It features the use of graphic images, including windows, icons, and menus. Even if it does that, it does require a mouse, which is the most common way to navigate through a GUI. Which brings me to my next point, icons are easy to use. Because of the visual representation, most people can learn and use GUI much faster and much easier. But once you get used to the command line, I don't personally think it is that tough as well. But for a beginner, yes, GUI can prove to be pretty optimal. But there is also a downside. A GUI's OS is slower because everything you remove does not get permanently removed from the system. It is going to stay there as a copy of the file and going to clutter your space and reduce the speed of your whole system, which is where CLI wins as it has a faster OS. Which also brings me to my final point. Command line interface gives you way more control than your GUI. With a CLI, users have all the control over a file system and their operating systems, and the tasks become really simple. You can create a script that contains a few lines of command and it will do the work for you. Although your graphical user interface can create shortcuts, they do not readily support scripting or automation. So for common tasks, a user must repeat each action within the GUI manually. Now, nothing is better than the other. It's a personal choice for everybody. But for scripting, obviously, a command line interface is most optimum. It helps you do things at scale. It helps you when you need to script or automate something. You need greater control over systems or functions. And it helps you with less memory usage. With that, let's move on to the shell script basics. So the most logical question, obviously, is what is a shell? As I had mentioned earlier, users communicate with the kernel through a program known as a shell. A shell is basically a command line interpreter. And basically what it does is that it processes your requests. When you type in a command at your terminal, the shell interprets the command and calls the program that you want. The shell uses standard syntax for all commands. So basically what it does is that it translates commands entered by the user and converts them into a language that is understood by the kernel. From the shell, the direct derivative is the shell script. Now, the basic concept of the shell script is that there will be a list of commands which are listed in the order of execution. A good shell script will have comments preceded by the hash sign. Now, it is not important for you to have hash signed certain comments for your script to be executed. It is only a good practice to have your steps hashed out so somebody else reading your script can understand what you want to do with it. Now, there are several different types of shells which can be broadly classified into two types. First, you have the classic shell, which is the bond shell. A derivative which came later was the C shell. Now, each of these types have their own subtypes. A few examples of the bond shell are the basic bond shell, the con shell, the bond again shell, or the bash, and the POSIX shell. In C shell, Certain examples are your basic C shell, your 10x C shell, and the Z shell, which has been picking up popularity in the past few years. Now, to understand how this works, let me move on to our terminal. Now, what I'll be doing is I'll be dividing the screen into two parts. On my left, I'll have my nano editor, and on my right, I shall be having your basic terminal where you can see your commands being executed. 
so kindly be patient okay so let's start with some basic shell scripting now shell scripts have several required constructs that tell the shell environment what to do and when to do it of course most shell scripts are more complex than the one i'm going to show you the shell is after all a real programming language complete with variables control structures so on and so forth no matter how complicated a script gets it still is just a list of commands executed sequentially so here i'm going to open up my nano editor and i'm going to put up let's say example 1 and sh now notice the extension sh this is my extension because i'm using the basic bond shell or the shell so i'll start with the shebang line and it is nothing but the absolute path to the interpreter of your shell so it has this hash and this bang or the exclamatory followed by the full path to your interpreter now all scripts under linux execute using the interpreter specified on this first line so this could be sh or bond shell bash or your ksh your zsh so on and so forth now like we had given the advice of hashing out comments let me just put on a few comments make this look good okay and then i'm going to put up try and print this very simple print such as what is your name and then i am going to read whatever you enter and then i am going to print that out you're going to allocate whatever we read into this variable called person and then we are going to call that variable using the dollar sign so hello whatever person as i had mentioned before your control o for write out and then we're going to exit this now this is to remind you one more time that every file which has just been made is not executable so if i try to execute it now it would tell me that permission is denied this is just a recap of what i had done say 2 minutes ago so we are going to change the mode and i'm going to do this when i'm executing any script at all i'm going to try and execute it now it's going to ask me what is your name edureka employee and then it's going to greet me saying hello edureka employee and that is the most basic of the shell scripting that you can do as we move further i'm going to keep bringing you back here i'm a firm believer in practicing what we're learning in theory with that let's go on and see what we have next in this module so the next segment is about using variables so what is a variable most people might be aware of this term but for those who are not i'm going to explain it down to the scratch for all of you now variable is nothing more than a pointer to the actual data it's nothing more nothing less the shell enables you to create assign and delete variables so basically what it is is that a variable is a character string to which we assign a value the value assigned could be a number text file name device or any other type of data the shell enables you to create assign and delete variables which may contain numbers texts file names devices or any other kind of data now variables are of three kinds in the shell you have your local variables which as the name suggests is the variable that is present within the current instance of the shell it is not available to programs that are started by the shell and they are set at the command prompt then you have your environmental variable an environmental variable is available to any child process of the shell now some programs need the environmental variables in order to function correctly usually a shell script defines only those environmental variables that are needed by the programs that it runs and finally we have the shell variables which can be compared to the global variable if you're into any other kind of programming a shell variable is a special variable that is set by the shell and is required by the shell in order to function correctly now some of these variables are environment variables while others are local variables it can be any of these now to see how we can implement these variables we are going to move on to the shell but before that let's see specifically what we are going to look at so first of all we are going to learn how to define variables how to access the values then we're going to see a little bit on read only variables and unsetting variables 
Then we have special variables. We're going to see how you can work with them. We have command line arguments. We have special parameters and the exit status. Now to see how all of these things work, let's move on to our terminal. So again, I'm going to create another nano file called variable.sh. Now defining variables. Now any variable that you are going to define should be along the lines of this. You have your variable name and then you have your equal sign and your variable value. Now, if you have done any sort of coding or programming before, you would know this is basically how you allot a value to a variable throughout all different platforms. Now, the thing you have to notice is that in shell scripting, it's very particular about the syntax. So no spaces on either side of your equal to sign. In that case, it is not going to execute and it's going to throw an error at you. So let's take something simple. So your name equals this. Now this example defines the variable name and assigns the value at Eureka employed to it. Variables of this type are called scalar variables. Now a scalar variable basically means that it can only hold one value at a time. So let's turn this into a shell script first. So I'm going to go up and put in my shebang line. And then I have my name and then we're just going to call that particular variable. Pretty simple and we've done it before. So then control O here. Again, we have to give it permissions. And then when we execute it, it prints out what we had asked for it to print out. Okay, let's see what happens when I use the read only command. And then I try to change the value of the variable. Suppose I put in my own name into it. I'm going to go control O and OK. Basically, it's going to throw an error at me saying that the variable name is a read only variable. So I cannot change the value of the variable once I put read only in front of it. Now that was all about read only variables. Now let's move on to see what else can we do with this. Now there is also something called unsetting variables. Now unsetting or deleting a variable directs the shell to remove the variable from the list of variable that it tracks. You'll see in a moment what I mean. So I did this and then instead of read only, I'm going to put unset. And then I'm going to call my variable same old, same old. And now we are going to try and call this. As you can see, nothing. So basically what it did was it took the variable out of the list of other variables. That is what unset does. Now let's clean this out and we can look at special variables. Okay, so now let's discuss a little bit about special variables. So in the previous segment, you understood how to define a variable how to read only and unset a variable. Now these variables are reserved for specific functions and hence they are called special variables. Now they're usually preceded by a dollar sign and these are the special variables that we are going to see. You have your dollar zero, which is the file name of the script. Then you have your dollar any number one to nine. Now these variables correspond to the arguments with which a script was invoked. Here you can pick any n number which will be a positive decimal number corresponding to the position of the argument. You shall understand when I demonstrate this further in the segment. Then you have your dollar hash sign. Now this will basically return the number of arguments supplied to a script. Then you have your dollar and asterisk. So this will return you all the arguments that are double quoted, which again you shall see when I demonstrate this. Now this will give you all the arguments that are individually double quoted. That is the only difference between the dollar asterisk and the dollar at the rate sign. Then you have this, which is the exit status of the last command that you have executed. And finally, you have the dollar dollar which will give you the process number of the current shell for the shell script. 
Now, this is also the process ID under which it is being executed. Now, let me try to script something with which I can depict not all, but at least most of these special variables. So let's just put on echo. Pick dollar zero. Let me go ahead, select it, and then copy it a bunch of times. Okay, so let's go ahead and execute this. So now that we have learned about all of these special variables, let's implement them using command line arguments. Now, command line arguments, as you can see on your left, are these dollar one, two, three to nine. They're actually positional parameters with dollar zero pointing to the actual command, following which your dollar one and your dollar two are the arguments to that particular command. If you see the script on your left, this is how it will run. So first we are going to change the mode. Then we are going to run it and pass a parameter here. So if I pass Edureka employee or I've typed that too many times. So Edureka learner and enter. It shows you the file name dollar zero, your parameter number one, which is Edureka, your second parameter, the quoted values, and the number of parameters, all of which are returned to us by our special variables. Now, as you might have noticed, your dollar at the root sign and your dollar star sign returned pretty much the same thing. These are the special parameters that allow accessing all the command line and arguments at once, which in our case is Edureka Learner, both of these arguments. So both of them actually act pretty much the same unless they are enclosed in double quotes. Now let me show you how. If I run the same thing, but I put them in double quotes, you can see both of them again give the same value. But if I put them in individual quotes, it will treat them as two separate parameters and will give you two separate values. Whereas in the first one, it will quote your number of parameters as one. It will consider it one single string. Now let me try and demonstrate it using another shell script. How is it different? This does not make a lot of sense to most of you right now. So let's just hope the next thing makes it better. So I'll run a little for loop here, which again we are going to touch up on later. But for now, let me just do this to demonstrate how this works. Now let me put this in perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this entire sentence. Edureka wishes you happy learning. And you see what just happened, right? What your special parameter did here is that it took this entire list and separated it into separate arguments. And that is what these two special parameters do. Now, once you're done with it, you can always use the exit status. So what I'm going to do now finally is I am going to go and implement the exit status and it is going to return a value of zero. Now, this is basically the exit status of the previous command. It would have given you a one if your previous command was unsuccessful. Since your command was successful, it gave you a zero. So the exit status is basically a numerical value returned by every command upon its completion. As a rule, most commands return an exit status of zero if successful and one if unsuccessful. Now, some commands also return additional exit statuses for particular reasons. For example, a few commands will differentiate between kinds of errors and will return various exit statuses depending on the specific type of failure. With that, we've come to the end of this segment. Let me go back to my presentation. Next, let's take a look at our basic operators. Now, there are various operators supported by each shell. I'm not going to take a lot of time with this segment. We will discuss about the default shell in this segment and we are going to discuss the following operators. We have the arithmetic operators, relational operators, Boolean, string, and file test operators. So this is the first table, and these are your arithmetic operators. You have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulus, assignment, equality, and not equality. 
it's very important to understand that all these conditional expressions should be inside of squared braces with spaces around them. Now, all the arithmetic calculations are done using long integers. Next, we have relational operators. Now, the bond shell supports these relational operators that are specific to the numeric values. Now, these operators do not work for string values unless their value is numeric. We have again the equal operand not equal to greater than less than greater than equal to or less than equal to then we have the boolean operators which are just three there is the logical negotiation logical or and logical and and finally we have the string operators which are equals not equals check if operand is zero not zero and check if string is empty and finally we have the file test operators now we have a few operators that can be used to test various properties associated to a unix file now assume a variable file holds an existing name of the size 100 bytes and has to read write and execute permission on so you have your hyphen b which checks if the file is a block special file then you have hyphen c which checks if a file is a character special file if the file is a directory which is hyphen d hyphen f is if a file is an ordinary file as opposed to a directory or a special file then you have hyphen g which checks if the file has its set group id hyphen k which has its sticky bit set hyphen p which is a named pipe hyphen t which checks if it's associated with the terminal hyphen u has its set user id r is readable w is writable and x is executable which we had discussed before then you have s with a size greater than zero and e if the file exists now these are specific to the bond shell there are other operators that are available in the c shell types but you shall find a lot of content surrounding that it's not really crucial to discuss that in this module so let's move on next we have shell loops in this segment, we are going to discuss shell loops in Linux. A loop is basically a very powerful programming tool that enables you to execute a set of commands repeatedly. Here we shall discuss the while loop, the for loop, until loop, the nested loops, and loop control, which will include the infinite loop and how to get out of it with break and continue commands. For that again, as most of you might have correctly guessed, let me head back to the terminal. So first let's discuss the for loop so the for loop operates on lists of items it repeats a set of commands for every item in the list so let me open the nano editor let's see let's call it edit all right so basically this is how the syntax of your for loop goes for your certain variable in say your word one word two so on and so forth till your word n then you have a do statement whatever you want your for loop to do and then done and this is basically how your for loop works so here i'll give you a simple example of how the for loop works it's basically going to span through a given set of numbers set 0 to 9 and upon execution it should print all those numbers it's basically printing out this variable for all the variables that are there in the set. It's pretty simple. So again, chmod and then, and there we go. Now, what if you had to do the same thing using another way? We have for you the while loop. Let's get out of here. Let's open this and see how the while loop is different from the for loop. Now the while loop, what it does is that it enables you to execute a set of commands repeatedly until some condition occurs. So it is usually used when you need to manipulate the value of a variable repeatedly. The syntax of a while command looks something like this. So you have a while and then you have a command, a condition, if you will. Then you do and then there's this statement, what you want to be done and then done. I'm going to demonstrate the same example using the while loop. Now, this is basically going to do what we did with the for loop, but using the while loop. 
we start with assigning a value to a which is our variable now we say while a is less than 10 it's going to print a and then increase the value of a to a plus 1 that's all that is there inside the loop now let's try executing this again i'm going to change the permissions and it prints the same exact thing here the shell command is evaluated if the resulting value is true so as long as a is less than 10 it will keep printing a and adding 1 to it once it reaches 10 your while loop breaks and you come out of the loop each time the loop executes the variable a is checked let's try doing this one more time using the until loop let me clear this out now the while loop is perfect for a situation where you need to execute a set of commands while some condition is true sometimes you need to execute a set of commands until a condition is true and that is where you use the until command i'm going to go back here and you'll notice that the structure of until command is pretty similar to that of your while again you have your until statement then the command or the condition then you have your loop beginning whatever you want to happen in the loop and then done here once the shell command is evaluated if the resulting value is false the given statement is then executed if the command is true then no statement will be executed and the program jumps to the next line after the done statement so again because i'm lazy i am going to do the exact same thing as i did twice before but this time using the until command same thing here instead of while it's until so until your a is not less than zero it's going to keep printing a and then incrementing the value of a so even if what gets printed is the same you know for a fact that how the procedure was gone about was different when you use the while command your statement is executed while your condition is true but when you use the until command your statement keeps executing until your condition is true with that let me clean this out and then we shall move to nested loops let me get out of here okay now next let's talk a little bit about the nesting of loops now all the loops support nesting concept in linux which means you can basically put one loop inside another similar or different loop this nesting can go on up to unlimited number of times based on what you require now let me give you an example of nesting using the while loop so remember the simple while loop that you ran which went from 0 to 9 what we're going to do is basically we're just going to add another while inside the previous one so nano okay remember till here it's pretty much the same as the previous one that is your first loop inside we are going to assign the value of a to b and while your b remains greater than zero it's now going to go to a new line which is this n flag print b and then increment b once it comes out of the loop it's going to increment a and so on and so forth let me show you what this looks like now the result here is not very important but what you need to understand is how the basic structure of the loop is and how it works so again like you can see a starts with zero now while a is less than 10 zero being less than 10 a is assigned to b now while b is greater than equal to zero which now b is it is zero it's going to go to a new line and print b it printed zero then it's going to increment the value of b and turn it into one and now once b is incremented it gets out of that loop followed by the increment of a which now a becomes a plus one that is one and it keeps going on and on and on and on till finally your a is no longer less than 10. so with that let's move on to our next topic which is of loop control here we are going to discuss some very important concepts 
But before I introduce the concept of loop control, first we need to understand what infinite loop is. So let me create an infinite loop. So let's start with a equals suppose 10 and let's go saying as long as a is greater than 0 start your loop and you're going to print a and then we are going to increment the value of a and then done control o And now what this is going to do is it's just going to go on and on and on and on and on because it will go on until a is greater than zero and it's always going to be greater than zero. So let me just put a stop to it. This by using control C, I can put a force stop to it. Now you can also do that using something known as the break statement. Now the break statement is used to terminate the execution of an entire loop after completing the execution of all the lines of code up to the break statement. Now let's see how that works. So I am going to exit this and now this is a simple example which shows that the loop will terminate as soon as a becomes equal to 5. So let's go ahead And you go and one two three four five now another statement associated to it is the continue statement which is similar to the break statement except that it causes the current iteration of the loop to exit rather than the entire loop so this statement is useful when an error has occurred but you want to try to execute the next iteration of the loop let's look at one of those So basically what you see in the script is that this loop makes use of the continue statement to return from this particular statement to the next one, which is the found odd number statement. So if we try to run it, you will receive this result found an odd number even odd even odd even odd it's basically very similar to the break command except for the fact that your break command will exit the entire loop while the continue statement will only exit the current iteration on your left you see this little script where we are trying to see this numbers that we have put in 1 to 7, which of them are even and which of them are odd. Now what you'll see here is that the script uses the continue command to exit from this particular statement to this particular statement. So if I tried to run this, it keeps exiting this to produce this even number statement. With that, we come to the end of shell loops. Let's go back to the presentation to see what we have next. So in this segment, we will discuss in detail about functions in the shell. Now, basically what functions enable you to do is to break down the overall functionality of a script into smaller, more logical subsections, which can be then called upon to perform their individual tasks whenever needed. So in this segment, we are going to talk about creating functions, passing parameters, returning values, nested functions, and calling from prompt. So here we are at our terminal. Let's again open our nano editor. So to declare a function is very simple. What you will have to do is type your function name and then go ahead with your list of commands and then close the bracket. This is all that you have to do. Now let's start with this very basic function. Start with the shebang again, not to be confused with the shebang 
in the pop culture that we use. So what we're going to do first is that we're going to define function. So again, this is my function name. It's going to be hello. And then I am going to just print hello learner. Nothing very complicated. And then all I have to do is just invoke my function or call my function, whatever it is. So hello. Then I'm going to save it. And here, it basically calls that function. And that's how simple that is. Now, using functions to perform repetitive tasks is an excellent way to create code reuse. This is an important part of modern object oriented programming principles. Now, shell functions are similar to subroutines, procedures, and functions that are present in your other software and hardware coding languages. The idea here is to break down a big program into smaller, more logical subsections, which can then be called whenever they need it. Now, you can define a function that will accept parameters while calling the function. Now, these parameters can be represented by $1 and $2 as we had passed parameters early on, if you remember. Now, here, if I make some minor changes to my function, I think I can make it accept parameters. So hello, and I can put two different parameters. And then what I can do is I can put those parameters right here. Let's say I'll put two names. Let's say I'll put Priyanka Chopra. Because, you know, pretty international. Let's just keep it that way. And that is what it called. Basically, these two parameters were captured and printed in this function. What you can also do is return values from functions. If you execute the exit command from inside a function, its effect is not only to terminate execution of the function, but also the shell program that called the function. If you instead want to just terminate the execution of the function, there is a way to come out of the defined function. Now, based on the situation, you can return any value of the function using the return command. So, again, what we can do is make some changes here. Let me return this. Another thing I'm going to do is capture this 10 value that has been returned from my previous command. All right. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print this out by echo. And then return value is. So I'm going to put this here. So here, as you can see, the parameters that we had passed and the value that has been returned. Now, one of the more interesting features of functions is that they can call themselves and also other functions. A function that calls itself is known as the recursive function, as most of you might know. Now, I'll also give you an example demonstrating the nesting of two functions. So let me just clear this out. I could open a new nano editor, but let's just say I am very lazy. So. Okay, now let's execute this. Basically, we have a function number two inside the function. Number one function is saying alpha online over and then calling number two. And number two here is printing beta online. And then we are calling the function number one, which is our superset, if you may, in the function. So if we execute this, we get the first one, alpha online over and beta online. I clearly watch a lot of movies as well. And now you can put on definitions for more commonly used functions inside your profile. And these functions will be available whenever you log in and you can use them at the command prompt. Alternatively, you can also group the definitions in a file and then execute the file in the current shell. 
with that i come to the end of the segment as well now we are going to move on to some used cases on a small scale of course to see how shell scripting is used on a broader scale on a day to day basis so i am going to clear this and i am going to clear this as well so let's run a few simple scripts to scan and monitor network using the combination of your shell script and your ping command obviously these scripts are no match to a full monitoring dedicated software like nagios but they could be useful for a small home brand networks where implementing sophisticated monitoring systems can become an overhead let's look at something simple first okay let's look at a scan so your dot slash okay so let me just show you the code for this so right now we are going to run a few simple scripts to scan and monitor the network using a combination of bash and ping now this is a disclaimer here these scripts are no match for a full monitoring dedicated software something like your nagios but they could be very useful for small home brand networks where implementing sophisticated monitoring systems can become an overhead so let's start with something simple like scanning a network so this is the code in this script what we are going to do is we are going to scan the network for hosts that are attached to an ip address and the script will print the message nodes with ip so if your ip address is up then your ping command was successful feel free to modify the script to scan your host's range whenever you try it so as you can see it starts with your basic shebang line then we are using our ping and we are basically checking for the exit status for being zero now if your exit status is equal to zero then it will print that your ip address is up pretty simple if we go deeper into it now we are going to run this loop for ip addresses from 1 to 255 in the subnet 192.168.2 basically what's going to do is it's going to ping these many systems and check if they are up and then disown them all right let's try running the script now as you can see these many systems are up in this particular subnet we have a bunch of different ones one of them should be mine this one seems like it's mine and so on and so forth all right let's move on to our next script basically what i did just now is i four stop this script all right okay now what we are going to do is we will try to send an email to my email address when the ping cannot reach its destination which probably means the host is down so system admins can execute this in a script regularly with the use of a cron scheduler Now this script uses ping command to ping the host or IP that is supplied to an argument and in case that destination is unreachable a mail command will be used to notify the system administration about this event so let's look at this so cat all right now this is what the script looks like also a pretty small code again it starts with the shebang line and it runs a for loop now here you can see there is a special variable used which is your dollar at which basically means that all the arguments are individually double quoted so inside this for loop basically we are trying to ping all the parameters that are passed and if the set parameter is not equal to 0 then we are going to get a mail to this particular email address that the host is down all right so previously we had checked for an entire subnet that is why we didn't have to pass on any arguments but here since we are not running it for an entire subnet we are going to try it on on some trusty websites so before i call in this code i would like to show you that this is what my gmail tab looks like there's nothing in my inbox currently so what i'm expecting is that when i pass on an argument which is not supposed to be up i'm supposed to be getting a mail in my gmail right so let's run this let's put in google.com because we know it's always running 
let's put yahoo.com let's put in an imaginary ip which i'm sure let's hope this does not exist let's put on one more for safety okay now we've put in four we know for a fact that google.com is always up so has yahoo.com now we'll have to check which of these two ip addresses is not up now let me open my gmail and check and as you can see i have two new messages and if you open the mail you can see the message that we had put in as input all right now that we've done these two things let us try an extended version of the same thing now i four stopped this particular script from running because it will go on and on and on and on now what we're going to do is that we're going to create a monitoring log so the last example i'm going to show you here is a modified version of the previous two examples now this example that i'm going to show you is a modified version of what i just showed you when the mail is not configured on the system the script will create a log file now the core of the script is wrapped into this endless while loop which is set to execute ping and check every minute feel free to modify the script according to your own needs and you can also go ahead and remove the endless while loop when you intend to use the script with the cron scheduler all right so let's see what our script looks like so this is our script let me break it down for you a little bit so first of all i have created this log file which is going to save if your host is up or down in a temporary log file it basically is a directory then i have created another variable called seconds so this script is going to run every 60 seconds to check which host is up the email is my email which i had shown you previously then the for loop begins now this is very similar to the previous code that we had just run this is the same part and here we have an infinite loop which is basically what we are going to run to check if a host is up so we are going to ping the various arguments that we are going to pass and if the said argument is not equal to 0 then the status gets logged into our monitor log and if the status is down then again like our previous code we get a mail that our host is down else if the host is up you just ping okay the host is up and there is no mail now the reason why i'm not sending a mail when the host is up if suppose somebody uses this code to check a subnet of a lot of systems you do not want to spam yourself with a bunch of different mail saying the host is up that is not important we want to know when a host is down and then this if condition closes with an fi and your argument being up is also sent to the log and then we have sleep for the seconds variable which we have put up as 60 seconds so as i had mentioned the script is going to run every 60 seconds so let's run this i'm going to check for google.com and this imaginary ip address which as we had previously seen is not up and then let's put in yahoo.com and yahoo123.com which i'm hoping is not an actual website let's put in this 2.2.2 now let's run the script this might take some time so kindly be patient let the script run So while it runs let me explain this to you as you can see the core of the script is wrapped into an endless loop which is set to execute ping check every 60 seconds whenever you try the script feel free to modify it according to your needs and if you intend to use the script with a cron scheduler feel free to remove this endless loop because that's what a cron scheduler will do on its own okay so i think that's enough time let me just stop this and as you can see i have already gotten the new messages here again as you can see this does not exist this does not exist the hosts are down so our ping has failed and so we've gotten these mails now what else can we do with it let's try to understand a script to create a network backup sort of a file so let's see what that code looks like so for this code i'll have to go back to root 
let's check if our file is here and it is so let me show you the code for creating a backup of a file in your network to your local system all right now this is what your code should look like so first of all you're going to mount the shared directory which basically means you're not creating a copy of the directory but if you make any changes in your local file it will be reflected in your shared file and vice versa so cifs is basically used for sharing your window file this is the path of your shared file and this is the path to the local directory where you're going to create your backup we've had a username at eureka and we've set the password at eureka that is what hyphen o does so again we've mentioned what are we going to back up this is the file that we're going to back up and this is our destination now basically we're going to create a backup and save it in the name of the day so for example today is thursday so if i create this backup today then it's going to be saved in a folder called thursday our host name is localhost and so our archive file is going to be localhost hyphen the name of the day which is thursday dot tgz is basically your tarball file extension and then we've put in a print of the start status message which is basically supposed to inform us that we have started creating the backup what ccf does here is it basically creates a zip file because we are obviously going to import files into the local system and in the end it is going to show us a message called backup finished and finally we are going to unmount our shared directory so first let me show you the file that i am trying to backup over here so now that we know what the code looks like let's give it a run so dot slash so as of now it's creating a backup and remember i had told you this is how it's going to name it localhost underscore thursday dot tgc localhost being our host name and thursday being today's day and it's also showing us that these are the folders that are present in our backup directory so how are we going to see it let's first head on home change directory to edureka So let me clear the screen and let me head on home. So here I'm home at Edureka and this is the list of everything that is there. So as you can see there is a file created here called backup and now we're going to extract the files and see if the code that we've run has actually worked or not. So let me go to that file. And so now I'm going to unzip the file and see if actually now let's go in here and check if we actually have our files in or not. Let's go and unzip this file. And here are all the files that are present in that particular folder. We have a bunch of PNG images, as you can see. Now, if the same thing I had to show you in GUI, so I'll go to home, and this is my backup file. This is
and these are the PNG images that have been imported into this folder. Let's straight up move ahead to the questions. So first of all, the most basic, what is a shell? Now the shell is a command line interpreter. Basically what it does is it translates the commands entered by the user and then converts them into a language that is understood by the kernel. The typical operations that it performs include file manipulation, program execution and printing texts. So basically the shell is the utility that processes your requests. When you type in a command at your terminal, the shell interprets that command and calls the program that you want. The shell uses standard syntax for all the commands. So obviously the next logical question is what is a shell script and can you name some of its advantages? So shell script is basically a computer program designed to be run by a Linux or a Unix shell, which is in the form of a command containing text file which has one or more commands that are written in an order of execution. It has two main advantages. One is it facilitates you to develop your own OS with relevant features best suited for you. And secondly, you can design software applications according to your desired platform. Next, what are the different types of variables that are used in the shell script? Now there are basically two types of variables. There are system variables and user defined variables. So the system variables are defined or created by the operating system or Linux itself, whereas the user defined variables are created or defined by the system users. Now the system defined variables are generally defined in capital letters and can be viewed by the set command, whereas the user defined variables can be viewed using the command echo. Question number four. What are the different kinds of commonly used shells on a typical Linux systems? Now firstly, there are two main kinds of shells. You have your born shell and your C shell. Some common derivatives of born shell that we use, some very popular ones are the born shell or the regular shell. You have the corn shell, you have the born again shell or bash and the POSIX shell. Some common C shell types are the C shell, the 10x C shell and the Z shell. Next, how do you create a shortcut in Linux? Now you can create a shortcut in Linux with the help of links. There are two kinds of links. You have the soft link and you have the hard link. So before you understand what a soft link is and what a hard link is, I'd also like to explain what an inode is. Now there's something called an inode for every file of the file system which has information along with all the file attributes except for its name. Now, a soft link is an actual link to the original file. These links will have different inodes with different values. The soft link points to the original file. So if the original file is deleted, then the soft link fails. If you delete the soft link, nothing will happen to the file. The reason for this is that the actual file or directory's inode is different from the soft link created with the file's inodes. A hard link acts like a mirror copy of the original file. These links share the same inodes. Changes made to the original or the hard linked file will reflect on another. That is why when you delete a hard link, nothing will happen to the other file. Hard links cannot cross file systems, whereas soft links can. Hence, deleting the original file does not affect the hard linked one. Whereas deleting the original file makes the soft link inactive. Next. Okay, now this is a question which is very common. Can you tell me something about the super block in shell scripting? Now, the super block is basically a program that contains all the information regarding a specific file system. It contains information such as the size of the file, the block size used by its number of free data blocks and the list of free inodes and data blocks. Question 7. What is GUI scripting? Now when we talk about Linux, mostly what we talk about is the CLI or command line interface scripting. But there's also something known as graphical user interface, which is used for controlling a computer and its applications. Now the GUI scripting supports different applications, which mostly depend on the OS. Next, what are the various stages of a Linux process? 
that it passes through. Now basically there are four stages, namely they're waiting, running, stopped and the zombie mode. Now waiting is basically when the Linux process waits for a resource, then it starts running, which means the process is being executed. Then after a successful execution, the Linux process is said to have stopped. Now the fourth one is an interesting one, which is called a zombie stage. Now it is known as a zombie because the process has already stopped, but in the process table, it is still active. Question nine, what is the difference between the break and the continue statements? Now a lot of the times when you do basic scripting, you might use break and continue statements for pretty much similar things, but they are actually a little different. The break command is a way to escape out of the entire loop in progress, whereas the continue command causes you to escape only the current iteration. You do not skip the whole entire loop. So when you want to test whether each iteration of your loop is executable, you use the continue statement, in which case it just jumps out of every iteration that has an error and goes on executing those which don't. Next question, what is the significance of the shebang line in shell scripting? Now you might have seen the shebang line at the top of each script. Basically what it does is that it determines the location of the engine which is to be used to execute the script. It simply provides information regarding the location where the engine is placed. It is also neglected by some of the users if they want the same. Now with that, let's move on to some questions which we can execute in our terminal. So how do you pass an argument to a script? For this, let me just go ahead, increase the size of this so you can see better. I think this is okay. So basically, this is how you pass an argument to a script. You use the cat command and the dollar one sign, which basically is used to take an argument. Just going to exit from here. We are going to change its permissions and then we are going to execute it. So basically, this is how you take in an argument. This simple script is basically used to show the file name. This dollar one is a special variable which displays the file name. The file name here is question 11 or q11.sh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change permissions and then dot slash. So here I have a simple script which basically what it does is it will show the file name. So here I have a concatenate dollar one. Dollar one means it's going to take in your first argument and that is basically what the question is. So I'm just going to exit this and I'm going to make sure that it is executable. So basically what I'm going to do is run that file and then pass a file name as an argument. So I've already created something known as a test file and that is how it works. Okay, with that, let's go on to our next question. So question 12, how to use arguments in a script? So basically what I'm going to do is copy the file argument one to the destination, which is my argument it's basically I'm going to take in two different arguments and copy the first one. The first one is going to be a file to the second one, which is going to be a path. All right, pretty simple. Same thing I'm going to do again, which is make sure it's executable. So I'm going to give a file name. Let's do the test file that I had created earlier and then copy it to public and if I put in the same path, you can see that our test file is right here. All right, pretty simple. Now let's clean this next. These are going to be pretty simple scripts as this is just the first part of the interview questions. 
these are for beginners so next is how to calculate the number of past arguments so again you can just go ahead and do a dollar hash but if you want to do it properly like in a script form we have the script for you this is just a fancy way of doing what I just did some time ago all right so number of parameters passed it's going to print and then it's going to take in the number of parameters that you have passed dollar hash all right so I'm going to pass two parameters here I'm going to write Edureka learner how's that and as you see I've gotten okay next is how to get the script name inside a script now again there's a very simple way to do it all you have to do is dollar zero which will basically print out the script name but since we're doing it in a script we're just going to print it out same thing dollar zero and it prints out the name of the script which is q14 all right next how do you check if a previous command has been run successfully now you might have noticed that I haven't really cleared my screen out this is so that you can see my previous command has been run successfully right so to check if it has been run successfully what I can do is simply go dollar and question mark oh and put in print which is the echo and if the answer is zero basically your script has run successfully if it is one it has not now there may be other numbers shown to you depending on the kind of error that is there in your script now such a thing can also be done in a script form so if you want to do it in a more organized manner you can do this so basically what I've done is I've created a variable and assigned the exit status which is what this dollar and question mark special variable is it basically gives you the exit status of your previous script now if that variable is zero which as we saw which means your script has been run successfully then you're supposed to print this message and if it's not you're supposed to be printing this message all right so let me exit this and because our previous script was run successfully it prints this message I can see my spelling mistake here but this is a scripting tutorial and not an English tutorial so we can just let that slide so let me clear that out next we have question number 16 how to get the last line from a file so basically it's a very simple way to get the last line from a file all you have to do is tail and hyphen one and then you put in your file name and it gives you the last line of that particular file this is basically what's there in the file let me concatenate and show it to you yeah so this is basically a test file it has three lines all having test one test one test one now you can also go ahead and change the number and it will print that many lines from the bottom so there you go next question how to get the first line from a file now this is pretty much like the previous question so instead of tail and a hyphen a certain positive integer what you can do is you can go ahead and type head and hyphen one and then put in your file name and it'll give you the first line from that particular file called test file one it's pretty self-explanatory it's a pretty simple question next question how to get the third element from each line from a file so this goes along the same lines of the previous two so basically what I'm doing here is that I'm using the AWK to print out the third column or the third element from any given file that I am taking in as argument nothing too complicated so let's just exit this 
All right, so dot slash. Okay, so it only makes more sense if I show you the file that I am using. This is the text file. It's basically a test file three. And as you can see, my third entire row is test, 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 test. This is basically what it's supposed to be printing a row full of tests, right? So if I run this and I put in test file three as my argument, it prints out my third element from each given row. All right. Next question number 19. So how to write a function in shell script? So this is a very simple example of a function. It's basically function example is the name of the function and it has a basic print statement called echo hello learner. There are parentheses which begin at the end of your naming the function and they close at the end of your function. It's nothing too difficult as the function keeps on complicating. This might get complex, but the basic structure of this script will not change. Okay. And finally, question 20. This is the last question of this particular segment. Write down the syntax for all the loops in shell scripting. Okay, let me open and edit for this. So first of all, let's start with the for loop. How the syntax goes is you go for and then you have a variable say IJK and then you put in your condition for I equal to anything and then this is the beginning of your loop says done. Then you have your statement that you're going to execute and then you're going to go ahead and go done, which is the end of your loop. So this is how your for loop works. All right. Now let me go ahead and quickly put in a for loop. A simple script that I can run and show you. And upon execution, you will get this result. It was a very simple for loop printing out all the variables from one to nine. Now next comes uh, the while command. So again, you have your while statement and then whatever condition it is that you want to imply. And then as the loop begins, you have your do and then you have your statement that you want to execute and then done. All right, this is how your while command should look like. This is the basic structure of how it should work. Again, I'll try to run the same command that I did for for, except for this time I'll be using the while command. And when we try, so this is basically the while command that I've written, I've taken a variable a and here the while command states that if your value of a is less than 10, then you're going to print a and then add one to that particular a. And then this goes on and on and on till your a is no longer less than 10. All right. So again, it prints from zero to nine, same as the for loop. Then you have the until loop, which is kind of like the while loop, but it is slightly different. So I am going to clean this out. So same as while you have your until and then your condition. And then do and your statement to be executed. And then done. With that, you close the loop. All right. This is basically what your until condition should look like. Go ahead and clean this out. Again, I'm going to do the same thing with the until command. So here, instead of while, I'm going to go and do while. So until your e remains less than 10 and what stayed inside the loop remains the same. You're going to print a 
as you can see as I had done while before a is starting from zero that is the value that has been allotted and then again we are adding one to a we are incrementing a by one and then we are closing the loop with a done so when we run it so when we run it we get the same exact thing now that was three different loops for the same exact result but see how differently those things are executed here i have put them in for achieving the same thing but there are different loops for different utilities in shell scripting with that we come to the end of the first segment of our shell scripting interview questions now let's move ahead to slightly tougher ones which are for the intermediate level of professionals our shell scripting interview questions now let's move ahead to slightly tougher ones which are for the intermediate level of professionals so the first question in this segment where exactly can you store the cell programs in the system the answer is pretty simple they're stored in a file which is tagged as sh or the bond shell as you might have noticed there is the shebang line that you put right in the beginning that basically points to the file where your program is going to be stored what makes c shell a more preferable option than the bond shell well there are three points which speak more in favor of the c shell than in the bond shell firstly all the commands in the c shell can be aliased whereas in the bond shell all of them cannot be aliased secondly c shell is great for reusing your script lengthy commands can be used again and again in the c shell whereas in the bond shell it does not allow the same access and the third and final thing is the access to command history which is there again in the case of c shell and not there for the bond shell okay so the next question is what is the difference between these two special variables one of them is a dollar and asterisk sign and the other one is a dollar followed by the adderit sign now the meaning of these two are pretty identical when not quoted or used as a parameter assignment value or as a file name however when you use it as a command argument what the dollar and at sign does is that it treats each quoted argument as a separate argument but when it is the dollar sign followed by an asterisk it will consider the entire set of parameters as one single string so if you're passing a sentence as a number of parameters to a script what the dollar and at sign will do is that it will print each word on a different line because it treats them as different parameters but the asterisk which follows the dollar sign will not do the same it will take the entire sentence as one single string and print them on one line so now let's move on to the next question how would you compare the strings in a shell script now basically you use this command known as the test command which is used to compare the test strings now how this works is that this command will compare text strings by comparing each character in each string so suppose i have two strings both the same called word first the test command is going to check the first character of each which is w once that matches it's going to go to o and so on and so forth once all of these match it declares them to be the same string next how do you redirect both standard outputs and the standard error to the same location now there are two methods to redirect standard outputs and error to the same location and they are what you see on your screens right now these are the two commands which will redirect your standard output and standard error to the same location next is a differentiation between single and double quotes which i shall demonstrate further in this segment so your single quote you use it when you do not want to evaluate the variables into values so if you say echo and put in a single quote where you are calling a variable it is going to print that variable as is whereas in a double quote you use it when all the variables that are inside the quotes need to be evaluated so in a double quote where there is a variable that is being called it is going to replace that particular variable with the value stored in it 
This I am going to demonstrate in a little while in this very segment. So the question is when should shell programming or shell scripting not be used? So when the task is very complex like writing an entire payroll processing system or there's a high degree of productivity required and it involves various different software tools, it is not the most ideal to use shell scripting. Next question is what is the lifespan of a variable inside a shell script? So the lifespan of a variable inside a shell script only lasts until it is executed. That is until the end of execution and that is it. Any further than that, the variable inside the shell script is not of any use. So what is a file system? Now basically it is a collection of files which contain information that is related to the files. In computing, a file system controls how the data is stored and retrieved. Without a file system, information placed in a storage medium would be one last body of data with no way to tell whether one piece of information stops and where the next one begins. Question 30. What are the default permissions of a file when it is created? So the default permissions of a file is 666, which is the user is allowed to read and write the file. The user group is allowed to read and write the file and so is everybody else. As you can see, there is a table on your screen which has numbers 0 to 7. Now each of these numbers have a default permission which is associated with it. So when we type in 0, it means there are no permissions. 1 is execute, 2 is write and 4 is read. The remaining you can split as a sum of integers and find out what is the permission associated with it. 6 as you can see is 2 plus 4 so it means read and write. And finally when you type in 7 it is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 4 which means you can have all permissions to execute read and write. When we type the same thing thrice the first one will stand for the user permission. The second is the group permission and the third one is permissions for everybody else. And that was all about the default permissions. Let's move on to the next question. So what does it mean by the shebang line SH or the bash at the beginning of every script? I'm here at the terminal and I am going to open up a simple script to demonstrate. Now as you can see there is this shebang line shebang slash bin slash sh which is there which you will find in the beginning of every shell script. Now what this line does is it's nothing but the absolute path to the shell interpreter. It consists of the shebang which is the hash and bang followed by the full path of the interpreter such as bin slash sh or bin slash bash. All the scripts under Linux using this particular interpreter are specified on the first line. The shebang must be the first line because it is interpreted by the kernel which looks at the two bytes at the start of the executable file. Since the kernel will only look at the first two characters and has no notion of further lines you must place the hash and bang in the first line. So the program loader mechanism parses the rest of the file's initial line as an interpreter directive. That was all about the significance of the shebang line. Let's go back to the presentation and look at the next question. Now this is determine the output of the following command kind of a question. So obviously we are going to go to our terminal. So in bash or the bond shell or any similar shell, this is basically a shorthand way of writing an if statement. So basically if this is true, if this non-zero bracket is true, then echo zero, else echo one. For a simple test like this, if you do not want to waste a lot of time or waste five lines of valuable screen editor, vertical space, then you can take advantage of the logical and which are these two ambicents and the logical or which is these two pipes and how they work in a shell. So echo zero is executed if this statement is true and echo one is executed if this statement is true and this one is false. So basically it returns a non-zero exit code and this is why it should not be used if there is any chance of that occurring. This will give you a result of zero 
and that is why it should not be used if there is any chance of the latter statement to come true which is the output of one even though this condition is true in other words it's almost equivalent to these five lines of code which i'm going to put it right here it's basically equivalent to these five lines of code and you get the same answer now this full form does not have the same flaw that the shorthand form does this construct is correct and always works while the shorthand is a quick hack and it is useful in only limited circumstances this particular z flag is only a test of whether a string is empty or not and it will always display a zero next question is again determine the output sort of a question so this is your command and you have to determine the output of this command now this is the same command in the terminal it's a very simple command it's basically assigning the value john to a variable called name and here in the string it is calling that name in single quotes pay attention uh, this is a single quote and we had discussed this earlier in this segment the difference between single quotes and double quotes later i'm going to do the same using double quotes and you will see the difference for yourself here as you can see because it is inside single quotes it does not call the value of name if i try to do the same thing using double quotes it has called the variable which is john and that is the difference between single quotes and double quotes question number 34 again is a determine the output question okay so let's go to our terminal so basically what is happening is the variable is being assigned using this particular notation or some people even use this to expand their own variable now the answer to this is simple the answer is going to be just variable so the value variable is being assigned to the variable new but why are people doing this why is the variable being assigned like this now this technique has its own advantages it allows for a variable to be assigned to a value if another variable is either empty or undefined okay moving on so question number 35 how to get a part of a string variable with an echo command only so for that we have a script here all right so basically we start with taking in a parameter so a variable x and y where x is your start position of from where you want to pick from the string and your y being length for the part of the string that you're trying to pick out from this particular sentence so this is the string that is allotted to the variable variable and finally we are printing out seven characters from position 11 which is this position we are picking out seven characters from position 11 and it should basically print out my name all right and it prints out seven characters from the 11th position which is basically upasna that's my name so question number 36 so rewrite the command that is given so here it is i like and whatever variable we are calling so rewrite the command to print the sentence and convert the variable to plural so let's see how we can rewrite and convert this okay so this is what's been given to us i like the certain variable so firstly i am going to allot something to that particular variable so i'm going to go ahead and so basically i allotted a string value called plain to variable and here i'm putting variable in curly braces and adding an s so it will take whatever is there in the curly braces and switch it with the value of the variable and that's it it changed to i like planes and it's as simple as that question 37 how to print all the arguments provided to the script the answer is pretty simple actually 
you can just go ahead and do a dollar star or you could do a dollar at if you want to see how it is executed you can just do echo dollar star and then happy learning and it prints happy learning it's as simple as that next question is how to print the PID of a current shell it's simple you just go ahead and use two dollar signs so if I do echo and two dollar signs you get six zero two three which is the PID or process ID of this particular shell okay next how to print the first array element So this is a simple script with an array which is hi my name is Apasna and basically what you're doing is printing out the zeroth element. It's really not that tough. You might have done the same while using any programming language that is. And it printed high, which was the first element. And this is the final question of the segment how to print all the array elements and their respective indexes. So, again, it's the same array that I've taken. Here I'm printing out all the arrays. I'm using the at sign, which is used for all the arrays. And here, if I just use the bang before your variable, I can print the indexes. And by bang, I mean the exclamatory sign here. In Linux, it is called the bang. And there you go. Hi, my name is Apasna, and the index number is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. With that, we've come to the end of the intermediate section. Next, we have some questions for the experienced people with three to five years of experience in shell scripting, Linux, or Unix. This section will also have some scenario based questions, obviously, in the practical form. So, the last few questions are for professionals with three to five years of experience, at least. Here we have a few scenario based questions, which may help you build on that resume that you have created with so much care. So, let's go ahead. So if you're experienced, you might know there is something known as cron. So the first question is, what is the cron tab? Now the cron tab is a list of commands that you want to run on a regular schedule. And also the name of the command that is used to manage that list. So the schedule is called the cron tab, which stands for a cron table, because it uses the job scheduler cron to execute tasks. This is also the name of the program that is used to edit that schedule. The software utility is a time based job scheduler. Now, people who set up and maintain software environments use cron to schedule these jobs to run periodically at fixed times, dates, or intervals. So, the next logical question obviously is that what does each field do in a cron tab file? Now, the cron tab file has six fields, the first five of which tell the cron when to execute the command. They specify the minute, hour, day, month, and day of the week. And the sixth field contains information on which command is to be executed. I'm sure a lot of you might be finding a lot of these questions pretty simple, but this is mostly because you must be working on Linux on a day to day schedule. Even if all these questions are pretty small, they are mostly knowledge based, and there's a high possibility that people who are in touch with shell scripting and Linux because of their daily jobs or because of their university courses will do better in interviews because of practice with that let's move on to question number 43 what are the two files of the cron tab command now the two files of the cron tab command are cron allow which decides which users need to be permitted from using the cron tab command and next is the cron dot deny it decides whatever users need to be prevented from using the cron tab command in red hat based systems such as centos these cron tab files are stored in the var spool cron directory, 
while on Debian and Ubuntu files, they are stored in the cron slash cron tabs directory. If you look for it, you may just find it in your particular OS. Next question, which command do you need to use to take backup? Now to take backup, you need the tar, which basically stands for tape archive. Now you can go ahead and add the extension of CVF to zip the files and XVF to unzip the file. Now tarball files are also used when you download a number of files from the internet or your emails. So tar is basically your most efficient command which you need to take a backup. Question 44. What are the different commands available to check the disk usage? Now there are three different commands which you can check the disk usage with. You have df, du and df space. Now the df command which is short for the disk file system is used to show the disk utilization for a Linux system. You can display information of the device name, total blocks, total disk space, used disk space and available disk space and mount points on a file system through this command. You can also get the information in a human readable format or at a particular partition. Then there is the du command which is short for disk usage. Now this is a useful command because you can find disk usage for files and directories. The du command when used with various options provides the results in various formats. For example, you can find out the summary of disk usage for a directory with all its subdirectories using this. The output of the command shows all the files and directories in slash home with block size. And finally, you have the df space which is the command used to check the free disk space same as df but in terms of MB. So that's all about checking disk usage. Let's move on to the next question. What are the different communication commands available in shell? So there are four different communication commands in the shell. You have mail, news, wall and MOTD. Now whenever a mail is sent initially, the mail command calls the standard sent mail binary which is located in the user file. It allows you to read or send a mail. The news command writes system news items to standard output. This command keeps you informed of news concerning the system. Each news item is contained in a separate file in the news directory. Then you have the wall command. The wall or the Linux wall is an abbreviation of write to all. So basically this is a utility that displays the content of a computer file or the standard input to all the logged in users. It is typically used by root to send out shutting down message to all users just before power off. And finally you have MOTD. So MOTD basically stands for message of the day and it is used to send a common message to all the users in a more efficient manner than sending them all an email message. Other systems might also have an MOTD feature such as the info segment on Multix. This feature is a file on all Unix like systems and can be changed at upgrade or during installation time. Next, how would you find out the total disk space used by a specific user? Suppose the username is Edureka. So the given command here is used to find out the total disk space as we had discussed earlier. There is the du command with the path which is home slash edureka with the s flag which will show how much disk space is used by each subdirectory. Next, how to debug the problems encountered in each script or program. So there are two ways to do it. One is by inserting debug statements in the shell script to output or display the information which helps identify the problem. And second, by using set hyphen X, we can enable debugging in the script. Next, the difference between single equal sign and the double equal sign. Now, the first one is for assigning value to a variable, and the second one is used for string comparison. The comparison operator or the double equal to sign behaves differently within a double brackets test as the single equal to sign is an arithmetic operator and the double equal to sign is a string operator as well as an arithmetic operator which is meant not for assigning but for comparison. Next, how to open a read only file in a shell. Now if you work continuously with Linux and shell scripting, you might know the answer to this. 
basically you use the vi command with the r flag and the file name that you want to read to open a read only file in the shell and this is the last theory question of the module how can the context of a file inside jar be read without extracting in a shell script again this is a command called tar which we had discussed earlier the tar which stands for tape archive and its flag tvf which can basically be expanded to t meaning the table of contents v means verbose and f means file followed by the file name and the tar extension next question 51 where can you specify two methods of passing parameters to your script okay let's see two methods is it so the first way is going to be how we've done it many times earlier and you might have seen it many times here in this video you basically write your script name and then you pass your parameters one way is this and next is you can use your read with the p flag and you can pass your parameter inside with your destination host name so those are the two ways in which one can read parameters next write a shell script to get the current date time username and current working directory so here i have written all right so here is our script it's pretty simple to follow actually here hello whatever your log name is then there is date which is going to include time and this is the user and this particular statement is going to print out your current directory which is the pwd command so we are going to change the permissions associated to it and then we're going to run this so here i have my log name which is edureka the date command printed out the date and time this is the username and the current directory slash home slash edureka which you can see even here it's pretty simple each command is very self-explanatory let's move on to our next question how do you find all the files modified in less than three days and print the record count of each let's go ahead okay so basically you're going to use the find command and the m time flag then here is the number of days and we're going to execute it and then whatever it is that we are finding out from our list that we are going to put into a text file called the last three days all right so it's going to take some time and it's done now we go ahead and do an ls you can see the last three days text file is created and if we open the last three days text file you see all the files that have been modified in the last three days all right next question write a shell script that adds two numbers if provided as the command line argument and if the two numbers are not entered it throws an error message this seems like an interesting one let's go ahead and all right so let me explain to you a little bit about what's happening in the shell script so firstly we are starting out with an if statement which is like a preventive step that if two inputs are not received from the standard output then you are going to execute the below statement and then you're going to explain to whoever the user is that you have to put in two integers for which i will print the sum and that is what is written here and then you have your exit statement and then you exit the if statement and at the end of it if they do put in two positive integers the statement basically prints the sum of those integers it's pretty simple so let me exit this so first i'm going to run the script without entering two numbers as command line argument so let's see what happens if i do that here prints out this statement it asks you for two numbers x and y where 
x and y are two numbers for which the script is going to print the sum. Next again, let's try to enter x and y. When the numbers are entered as we are instructed, it says sum of 5 and 3 is 8. And that's how simple it is. Hence, the script fulfills the condition as suggested in the question. Next, it asks print a given number in reverse order using a shell script such that the input is provided using the command line argument only. So let me open. All right. Basically, this is what the algorithm is. Let your input number be n, which is going to be taken in by the command line. And then we are setting the variable reverse as zero. And SD or single digits is set up to zero as well. Then your single digit is going to be achieved by taking n modulo 10. This will find and give the single leftmost digit. Then you're going to reverse the number that is generated as your reverse into 10 plus your single digit and then decrease the input number by 1. Now then, if your n is greater than 0, then you go back to step number 3 and then print reverse. And hence, finally, your reverse number is printed. So now I'm going to run the script and I'm going to pass in a number, say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now here I haven't put in a number. So again, like the previous question, it is going to instruct me on how to make use of this. For example, this. So let me go ahead and give them what they want. I'll put in a space and go for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And it gives me back the reverse number, which is 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Next question. Calculate a real number calculation directly from the terminal and without a shell script. Now I know that this is a shell script tutorial, but there are a few things which are related to the shell script, but you have to run them directly from your terminal. So this is important. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll need to use the BC command in a special way for this answer. So what we're going to do is we're going to print it out and then we're going to put it. We're going to put two real numbers. Let's say 4.432 just and then pipe in and it gives us the answer. So basically what you're going to do is you need to use the pipe space BC command where the answer of these two real numbers is going to be piped into the BC command. For that, obviously, you need your BC math package installed. With that, let's move on to our next question. How can you get the value of pi till a hundred decimal places? So basically, what we're going to do is we are going to use the BC math package again. Here, I'm going to directly print this out. I'm scaling this up to 100. I'm putting a scale as 100 and here I am putting in the pi. And here you have it. This is the value of pi till 100 places. Now again, I'd like to remind you that for this to work, you need to have installed your BC math package. Since my system has CentOS running, I use yum install for other Red Hat Enterprise Limited OSs. You can use apt-get and for Debian-based systems, you can use DNF. Next question, how to check if a directory exists? This is a pretty simple script. Here you are taking in as a parameter or an argument your name of the directory, which I'm allotting into my DIR. And this is your directory flag. So basically, if the answer to this is non-zero, then it's going to print your directory exists and then you close your if statement with an fi all right let's go ahead and try and run this
put in the name of a directory say public and then it says directory exists so if I go ahead and type this is your question 58 and says let's see public and you know the directory exists because if I open my list of directories here you can see in blue you have public okay so let's clear this out so question number 59 can you write a script to portray how set hyphen X works now as we had discussed earlier this is a way of debugging a script so let's go and see how it works so here I have written a script which obviously is going to throw an error at me so if I hash out comment out this set hyphen X line let's see the answer that we get it basically shows this as I said it is a script that is supposed to throw an error at me now let me go back and uncomment this particular line and there you have it now in addition to displaying the intended output in the loop iteration lines it enables debugging with the set hyphen X and also shows each line of execution preceded by a plus sign although this can become impractical when it comes to larger shell scripts it should be obvious how useful this can be when debugging a shell script to identify the root cause of the problem let me clear this out and finally this is your last question how will you find the total disk space used by a specific user so as I had mentioned before we are going to be using the du command and then go with my user the current user that is edureka and here you have each directory each file how much space they have taken this seems like a pretty long list to me let's move on to Linux versus Windows this might be the reason most of you are still hooked on to this session so let's start up with users now there are three types of users in Linux you have regular administrative and service now a regular user account is created for you when you install Ubuntu on the system all your files folders are stored in slash home slash which is your home directory and as a regular user you do not have access to directories of other users next you have the root user or the administrative user other than your regular account another user account is called root and it is created at the time of installation the root account is a super user account who can access restricted files install software and have administrative privileges hence the name administrative user whenever you want to install software make changes to the system files or perform any administrative task on Linux you need to log in as a root user otherwise for general tasks like playing music and browsing the internet you can use your regular account and the third and final account is the service user Linux is a widely used as a server operating system and services such as Apache squid email etc have their own individual service accounts having a service account increases the security of your computer now Linux can allow or deny access to various resources depending on the service now in Windows there are four types of user accounts you have your administrative standard child and guest account next let's go ahead and look at usage now according to the market research data of the September of 2007 92% of the world's PCs had Windows running while only about a percent of PC users use Linux the home users multimedia enthusiasts mainly used Windows whereas for serious use server application corporation servers were running on Linux irrespective of the GUI many users found it difficult to use Linux as compared to Windows obviously due to the command line interface and so the appeal of Linux was very limited to common people also for licensing agreement with Microsoft various PC vendors are entitled to bundle Windows OS with their PC and for this Windows gained the initial market popularity over Linux though these days many PC vendors such as Dell and HP started to give Linux as a pre-installed OS to cut the cost of their PC system according to the latest IDC report Windows Server market is gaining popularity over Linux based server 
The annual rate at which Linux is growing in the x86 server space has fallen from around 53% to 45% globally. The main reason is that while Linux servers are looking for high performance computing and web serving, Windows is apparently adopted on a much broader basis. Next, let's move ahead and look at what the kernels are like. Now, Linux uses a monolithic kernel which consumes more running space, whereas Windows uses the microkernel as of the latest versions, which take less space, but the system running efficiency is lower than Linux. Next, let's look at file systems. In the Microsoft Windows, files are stored in folders on different data drives like CDE. But in Linux, files are ordered in a tree-like structure starting with a root directory. Now, this root directory can be considered as the start of a file system, and it further branches out various subdirectories. Now, the root is denoted with a forward slash, and a general tree-like system on your Unix may look like something like this on your screen. In Linux and Unix, everything is a file. Directories are files, files are files, and devices like printer, mouse, keyboards are also files, which is not the case in your Microsoft Windows. At number five, we have security. Every Windows user has faced security and stability issues. Since Windows is the most widely consumed OS, hackers, spammers all target Windows very frequently. Consumer versions of Windows were originally designed for ease of use of a single user PC without a network connection and did not have the security features built in. Now, Microsoft releases security patches through its Windows update service approximately once a month, although critical updates are made available at shorter intervals when necessary. Many a times, users of Windows OS face the blue screen of death caused by the failure of the system to respond and eventually the user has to manually restart the PC. This is super frustrating and it also may cause you to lose valuable data. On the other hand, Linux is a very stable OS and is more secure than Windows. As Linux is community driven, developed through people collaboration and monitored constantly by the developers from every corner of the world, any new problem raised can be solved within just a few hours and the necessary patch will be ready at the same time. Also, Linux is based on Unix architecture, which is a multi-user OS. So, it is much more stable than a single user OS such as Windows. Next, let's look at compatibility of the two. Here, Windows shoots and scores. Here is where the Redmond offering wipes the floor with Linux. Despite recent improvements in software being ported or developed to Linux, Windows is still the king. Users of Windows can be certain that most softwares will work and even obscure outdated software will continue to work even when it is abandoned by developers. Windows has good legacy support, plain and simple. I know of commercial software that still relies on technologies like Silverlight, ActiveX and Internet Explorer 11. Linux, on the other hand, can struggle with the basics that Windows users take for granted. Adobe Flash Player is something else that is missing on Linux for a really long time. And even when it did appear with repositories, it was not as actively developed as Windows versions. With regard to file systems, Linux can also read and write to NTFS and FAT formatted devices and USB sticks, whereas Windows will have no idea what extension 4 is. At number 7, we have ease of use. Now, this is a tough one to call. Linux over the recent years has made huge leaps in usability. Distributions like Linux Mint have made installation and setup pretty simple. Even non-technical users can install and use software and do normal day-to-day -day activities like web browsing, answering emails, playing music, and watching videos. Windows, due to high market proliferation, is the default OS of many devices. Now think of it, people like you and me, we grew up on Windows, right? Buy a new laptop or a PC, there is a very high chance that it comes with Windows installed. Users are used to clicking the toolbar, opening their favorite programs, which makes it good for power and non-power users. Next, we have privacy. Linux users have a private operating system that does not spy on them and does not phone home with any degree of seriousness period. Choosing Linux 
means the system is yours and yours alone. Add to the mix that most Linux systems come with an option of a built in military grade encryption, and users can be sure that the device theft poses no real problem to their own data. As a contrast, increasingly over the last few years, Windows has gotten more advert driven. Users are given the choice to opt out, and there are some clever registry hacks that can help. But advertising is now a part of Redmond's plan. Windows can also watch what users do, offering syncing to Microsoft OneDrive service, or to learn behavior to make Cortana, the Microsoft personal assistant, better. Personally, I do not favor these kind of intrusive tools. But some users do like these features. Like, who wouldn't want a personal assistant in your laptop? You already have your Google Assistant and your series, right? Next, you have source code. Now, this all of you might know Linux is open source, whereas Windows is commercial. So, users have access to the source code of Linux and can alter the code as per user need, whereas Windows users do not have any access to their source code. Now, this has its own advantages in Linux, like bugs in OS will fix at a rapid pace, and disadvantages, like developers may take advantage of any weakness in the OS if they are found. In Windows, every user would not have access to the source code. Only members of a selected and qualified group will have access to it. Next, you have license. Now, the Linux kernel and the GNU utilities and libraries which accompany it in most distributions. Are entirely free and open source. You can download and install GNU Linux without any purchase. Some companies offer paid support for their Linux distributions, but the underlying software is still free to download and install. A funny folklore here is that Linus Torvalds actually was an introvert and did not want companies to communicate with him through email. He did not want to be spammed by all these big companies running the industry to buy the source code to his kernel. So basically, what he did was he made it open source for everybody to access. Funny, isn't it? Now, on the other hand, you have Microsoft Windows, which usually costs between 99 to 199 US dollars for each licensed copy. Now, Windows 10 was originally being offered as a free upgrade to current owners of Windows 7 or 8.1 if they upgraded before the 29th of July 2016. But that offer is no longer available. Then you have reliability. Now, Windows as we know it becomes sluggish day after day. You will want to reinstall Windows after a while when you encounter crashes or slowdowns on your system. If you're using Linux, you will not have to worry about reinstalling it. Just to experience a faster, smoother system. Linux helps your system run smooth for a longer period of time. In fact, much, much longer in my experience. Also, with Windows, you will have to adapt to a habit where you keep on rebooting the system for just about everything. If you just install software, reboot. If you recently uninstalled software, reboot. If you just installed a Windows update, reboot. And if the system seems to slow down, you guessed it, reboot. However, in the case of Linux, you will not have to reboot for the situations previously mentioned. You can comfortably continue with your work and Linux will not bother you. Another fact that proves Linux to be a reliable source are the web servers. You could observe that most of the internet giants like Google and Facebook run on Linux. Even most of all the supercomputers run on Linux. So why isn't Windows preferred over Linux? It is because Linux is far more reliable than Windows. Period, no arguments. Finally, we have support. Now, Windows has a support which is easily accessible online forums or websites, and it has paid support as well. In a Linux system, you need not hire an expert to solve a problem. You just need to search for a familiar thread on the web for a solution or post a thread to let others know of the problem. Within minutes of posting the thread, on any Linux forum, you may expect a reply along with a detailed solution which would finally help resolve your problem at no cost. It's like Linux has its own Stack Overflow community, doesn't it? Now, there are a lot of active Linux users who are always ready to respond to a relevant thread that might have created. The number of community users active on such forums 
is more than the number of active members on any windows focused forum any day however the community response might be depending on the linux distribution being used with that i come to the end of my linux versus windows segment the last category is distributions now before we begin i need to address one of the more confusing aspects to the linux platform while windows has maintained a fairly standard version structure with updates and versions split into tiers linux is far more complex originally designed by the finnish student line starvels the linux kernel today underpins all linux oss however as it remains open source the system can be tweaked and modified by anyone for their own purposes what we have as a result are hundreds of bespoke linux based operating systems known as distributions or distros this makes it incredibly difficult to choose between them far more complicated than simply picking windows 7 windows 8 or windows 10 given the nature of open source software these distros can vary widely in functionality and sophistication and many are constantly evolving the choice can seem overwhelming and particularly the differences between them aren't always immediately obvious on the other hand this also has its own benefits the variety of different linux distros is so great that you can all find something that suits your particular taste do you prefer a mac os style interface you're in luck elementary os is a linux distro built to mirror the look and feel of an apple interface similarly if you yearn for the days of windows xp you can bring that back with a q4 os which darkens back to the microsoft's fan favorite now there are more specialized linux flavors such as distros designed to give ancient low powered computers a new lease of life or super secure distros that can be booted from a usb drive to keep you safe when using an unfamiliar pc naturally there are also numerous linux versions for running servers and enterprise grade applications for those who are new to linux i'd like to recommend ubuntu as a great starting point it is very user friendly even compared to windows while still being versatile and feature rich enough to satisfy experienced techies is the closest thing linux has to a default distro although we would urge everyone to come and explore various distribution options available and find out what is your favorite next let's look at which os is most suitable for you now this one depends on what you need to do both linux and windows are rich in multimedia applications though setting up sound and video options in the older versions of linux can be difficult for some users the main advantage of linux is that most of the multimedia applications are freely available while in the case of windows users might have to pay a hefty amount to get the software although many open source free versions are often available moreover if anybody buys a copy of windows on a cd rom they do not get any application software with it other than the bundled microsoft software but if the same person buys a copy of a linux it typically comes with a lot of free application software such as open office a complete free office suite including spreadsheets presentation so on and so forth a new computer with windows pre installed may have additional application software but that is totally up to the pc vendor but each linux distro comes with multiple flavors the more expensive versions come up with more application software if you're a gamer and need 100% compatibility with a particular software or want a user friendly system hands down windows wins steam amongst other clients and options provides a huge number of games for both aaa publishers and small indie developers while steam for linux now allows you to install windows games it is still in beta phase and not all windows games will work it can be a little frustrating for linux users like myself and no doubt the situation will change in the future but as of now in 2019 many linux users miss out on the top games with their choice of os the graphics card vendors also tend to support windows platforms rather than linux they provide timely updates and new features that don't always filter to other oss if you are an advocate of open source software or if your device simply is too old or lower spec to run windows or just plain tired of all the forced updates and reboots in windows then linux is a great option linux supports almost all major programming languages 
Python, C, C++, Java, Perl, Ruby, etc. It offers a vast range of applications useful for programming purposes too. Now the Linux terminal is superior to use over Windows command line for developers. You would find many libraries developed natively for Linux also. A lot of programmers point out that the package manager on Linux helps them get things done easily. Interestingly, the ability of bash scripting is one of the most compelling reasons why programmers prefer Linux OS. Linux also brings in native support for secure shell, which would help you manage your servers quickly. You could include things like apt get commands, which further makes Linux one of the most popular choices for programmers. Let's move on to the differences between both of these OS's. So let's look at our first basis of difference, the use. Now, Unix is mostly used in internet servers, workstations, and PCs, while Linux is used by everyone from home users to developers and computer enthusiasts alike. Because Linux OS can be installed on various types of devices like mobile phones, tablets, and computers. Development and distribution. Now Unix systems have different versions and these versions are primarily developed by the AT&T as well as other commercial vendors. While Linux, as most of us know, is open source and thousands of programmers collaborate online and contribute to its development. It features through forums, etc., and is distributed by various vendors. Now, talking about the architecture, Unix is available on PA, RISC, and Itanium machines. Solaris is also available for x86 or x64 based systems. Now, Linux originally was developed for Intel's 86 hardware. So the ports available are for over two dozen CPU types, including the ARM. Now, let's talk a little bit about the processors of the two. Now, Unix supports your x86, x64, Spark, Power Itanium, PARISC, Power PC, and many others. Whereas the Linux has a wider variety of processors that it supports, which include dozens of different kinds of processors. File system support or the supported file type. Now Unix supports ZFS, HFX, GPS, XFS, and VXFS systems. Whereas the Linux is supported by file types XFS, NFS, CRAM, FSM, from 1 to 4, UFS, Dev PTS and NTFS, which again is a wider variety of file types. Next, let's talk a little bit about something both of these are very known for, that is their shell interface. Now, the Unix was originally made to work in Bond shell or the basic shell that we all know of. However, it is now compatible with many other softwares, whereas in Linux, Bash is the default shell. It offers supports for multiple command interpreters. Now that we've spoken about the shell interface, the next logical question is obviously about the graphical user interface. Now the Unix has a common desktop environment and also has Genome, whereas Linux provides two GUIs, which are the KDE and Genome, though there are many alternatives such as Mate, XFSC, etc., which are just a few of the millions of alternatives that it has. Next, let's talk a little bit about the portability of each of these. Now, Unix is not portable, period, that's it. But Linux is portable and is booted from a USB stick, which is a big plus in the side of Linux. Now, of course, this is the next question, security, which is one of the most important features when we move to a certain OS. Now, till date, there are between 80 to 120 viruses that have been reported in Unix, whereas Linux has had about 60 to 100 viruses listed to date, which are currently not spreading. So the next most logical question is the threat detection and solution procedures. While Unix users require longer wait time to get the proper bug fixing patch, threat detection and solution is very fast in Linux because Linux is mainly community driven. So if Linux users post any kind of threat, a team of qualified developers start working to resolve this threat. Now next, let's talk a little bit about the source code. Now this must be an obvious to all of you, 
As we all know, the source code of Unix is not available to anyone, whereas Linux being an open source OS, the source is available to the general public. And finally, the license. This is something most of you must be waiting for. Now, in Unix, different flavors have different pricing depending upon the type of vendor, whereas Linux is freely distributed, downloaded through magazines, books, websites, etc. There are priced versions for Linux as well, but they are normally cheaper than that of Windows. Now, let's discuss a few limitations of each of these OSs, starting with Unix. Shall we? Now, the limitations of Unix. Firstly, it has an unfriendly, terse, and inconsistent and non mnemonic user interface. Apart from that, the Unix OS is designed for a slow computer system, so you can't really expect a fast performance. Versions on various machines are slightly different in Unix, so it lacks consistency. And finally, Unix does not provide any assured hardware interrupt response time, so it does not really support real-time response time systems. Apart from this, the shell interface can be treacherous because a single typing mistake can destroy a lot of files. With that, let's move on to a few limitations that Linux possesses. So here are a few limitations in Linux. First of all, there is no standard edition of Linux. Secondly, Linux has a patchy support for drivers, which basically may result in the misfunctioning of the whole entire system. Many of the programs we are using for Windows will only run on Linux with the help of complicated emulators, for example, the Microsoft Office. And finally, Linux is really suitable for only corporate users. It is way harder to introduce in a home setting. Linux for new users at least is not as easy to use as Windows. So let's get with the interview questions here. The first question, the basic question would be, what is Linux? Okay. So as a layman, as an interviewer, if I ask this question, what is Linux? The first answer would be, it is an operating system. So before I get into Linux, first of all, let me explain you like what is an operating system. Every time you switch on your computer, you see a screen where you can perform different activities like read and write or browse the internet or watch a video. What is it that makes the computer hardware work like that? How does the processor on your computer knows that you're asking it to run a MP3 file? Well, it is the operating system or the kernel which does this work. A kernel is the program at the heart of the operating system that takes care of fundamental stuff like letting hardware communicate with software. So to work on your computer, you need an operating system. In fact, you're using one as you read this on your computer. Now, you may have used popular OSs like Windows, Apple OS X, but here we will learn what Linux is and what benefits it offers over other OS choices. So Linux is an operating system or a kernel which germinated as an idea in the mind of young and bright Linus Torvalds when he was a computer science student. Linus Torvalds is considered as father of Linux operating system. So when he was a, as a computer science student, he took a Linux kernel and he developed it from the scratch. He used to work on Unix operating system, which in those days called as a proprietary software and thought that it needed improvements. However, when his suggestions were rejected by the designers of Unix, he thought of launching an operating system which will be receptive to changes, modifications suggested by its users. The benefits of using Linux operating system. What are the main benefits and why it gained more popularity compared to other operating systems? The main benefits are it offers a free operating system. You do not have to shell hundreds of dollars to get the OS like Windows. Being open source in modify its source code. The Linux operating system now offers millions of programs, applications to choose from. Most of them are free. Now, once you have Linux installed, you no longer needed an antivirus because Linux is highly secure system. More so, there is a global development community 
constantly looking at ways to enhance its security. With each upgrade, the OS becomes more secure and robust. Linux is the OS of choice for server environments due to its stability and reliability. Mega companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google use Linux for their servers. A Linux-based server could run non-stop without a reboot for years on end. Okay, this is all about Linux. So Linux is just an operating system or a kernel, okay, which has been developed from Unix operating system. So this is what we have discussed. And uh, coming to the next question, how different is Linux when compared to Unix operating system? You might face different types of questions when you attend this type of interviews in Linux operating system. Like, what is the comparison? What is the differences did you find between like Linux and Unix operating system? As I said earlier, Linux is a Unix clone. But if you consider it according to the POSIX standards, a POSIX is nothing but a portable operating system interface. According to the standards, Linux can be considered as Unix. Exactly. To quote from official Linux kernel readme file, Linux is a Linux clone written from the scratch by Linux Torvalds with assistance of hackers across the net. So I'll just take some strategies here in terms of cost, in terms of development and distribution, in terms of manufacturer, like what are the differences between Linux and Unix? In terms of cost, Linux can be freely distributed, downloaded freely, distributed through magazines, books, etc. There are priced versions of Linux also, but they are normally cheaper than Windows operating system. When you compare with Unix, in Unix we have different flavors of Unix, have different cost structures according to the vendors. In terms of development and distribution, Linux is developed by open source development, that is through sharing and collaboration of code and features through forums and it is distributed by various vendors. When coming to Unix, Unix systems are divided into various other flavors, mostly developed by AT&T, as well as various commercial vendors and nonprofit organizations. In terms of manufacturer, Linux kernel is developed by the community by Linus Torvalds. Linus Torvalds will oversee the things. And when you talk about Unix, three biggest distributions are Solaris, which is now acquired by Oracle, AIX by IBM vendor, HPUX, it's by Hewlett Packard, and Apple makes OSX, which is also a Unix based operating system. Okay, so I've just taken three aspects here like cost, development, and distribution, and manufacturer. Like this, we have many such differences between Linux and Unix operating system. Okay, so this is what we have discussed. Okay, coming to the next question like what is the importance of GNU project? GNU project was launched in September 1983 by Richard M. Stallman to create a complete operating system which is free software. The main intention of GNU project is to create an operating system which is completely open source, which is completely freely available for all public users. The main licenses of the GNU project are the GNU GPL, which is nothing but the general public licenses. The name of the GNU project is derived from the recursive acronym, which is nothing but GNUs, not Unix. Okay, the full form of GNU, it's a recursive term, GNUs, not Unix. Unix was a very popular operating system in the mid 80s. So Richard Stallman designed GNU to be mostly compatible with Unix operating system so that it would be convenient for people to migrate to GNU. So the GNU project was intended to create a Unix-like operating system, but it should be freely available for all the public users and it should be a open source operating system. So this led to the birth of Linux operating system, okay, with the help of Linux kernel and the GNU utilities. The importance of the GNU project, the free software movement started by Richard M. Stallman. Okay, you see the full form of GNU, GNU is not Unix, it's a recursive term. Okay, and coming to the next question, the question is like, what is Linux kernel? Okay, so this is an important question would be asked in different types of interviews and most of the people will, will get confused in answering this question. 
what is Linux kernel? Let me explain you in a simpler way. With over 13 million lines of code, the Linux kernel is one of the largest open source projects in the world. But what is a kernel and what it is used for? A kernel is the lowest level of easily replaceable software that interfaces with the hardware in your computer. It is responsible for interfacing all of your applications that are running in user mode down to the physical hardware and allowing the processes which are known as the services to get information from each other using inter-process communication. Technically speaking, a kernel is nothing but the core of any operating system and it is responsible for translating the user commands into equivalent language understood by the computer hardware. Okay, so kernel, it is nothing but the heart of any operating system. It's a core of any operating system which is responsible for translating the user commands into equivalent language understood by the computer hardware. Okay, so if you can see this a pictorial representation on the left pane, okay, you see applications on top of kernel you see applications and bottom of the kernel you see the hardware devices the hardware devices like cpu memory and the devices which are attached to the computer okay so in order to interact with the kernel okay applications you see on top of operating system you have applications so in order to interact with an operating system applications you need to have some kind of language right so kernel would be acting as a mediator mediator between applications and hardware devices it just translates the user's language to the machine language and machine's language to the user's language it's a core kernel is nothing but the core the heart of any operating system okay and coming to the next question, what is a shell? And in shell, what is exactly called as a bash shell? Okay, first let me explain you what is exactly a shell. A shell is a user program or its environment provided for user interaction. A shell is a command language interpreter that executes commands read from the standard input device, which is called as a keyboard or from a file. Shell is not part of system kernel, but use the system kernel to execute programs like creating files, creating directories, etc. Okay, so please remember shell is exactly called as a user interface. In order to interact with operating system, we need one kind of interface, right? That interface is called as a shell. Okay, shell is a command language interpreter. Most of the people often confuse between interpreter and a compiler. Okay. Please remember interpreter is type of a mechanism that executes commands which are read from the standard input device or from a file. Okay, so when you talk about shell, in shell we have different types in Linux and Unix operating system. We have bash shell, we have single shell, we have corn shell, we have C shell, we have public domain corn shell, we have different types of shells used in Linux and Unix operating system. But bash is the default shell bash has been adopted as the default shell for most linux systems okay bash is a shell or a command language interpreter for the gnu operating systems once again i'm using the term gnu okay gnu operating systems like linux in most distributions of linux operating system bash is incorporated as the default shell okay the name is an acronym for the born again shell bash stands for born again shell okay it is named after a person called stephen born okay he's the author for born again shell now why bash has been incorporated as the default shell because in bash we have many such features features like command aliasing command completion by using the tap keys and the command history also okay like in order to execute the commands like no need to remember all the commands in Linux operating system okay with a lot of ease you can execute all these commands by the features of bash shell okay command aliasing command completion or file completion by using the tap keys and the command history okay in order to execute like previous commands no need to type the commands again and again you can recall those commands by using the up and down arrow keys Using that, you can recall all those commands. 
okay if i show you practically one particular example we have one command called clear in linux see this is the terminal i'm using the command line interface the terminal where we can gain access to linux operating system i'm just giving one particular example like why bash has been incorporated as a default shell okay let's see what is exactly a command aliasing i'm executing a command called clear the command clear which is used to clear the screen so every time you want to clear the screen you run the command clear once you press enter the screen will be cleared now instead for this lengthy program and what i'll do here i'll just make an alias c is equal to clear now once you press enter for that particular command clear i've been aliased to c now instead of running command clear i can run the alias command called c once you press enter the screen would be cleared like this for any such programs or applications if you want to do aliasing this is possible with bash shell now these kind of features you cannot see in other shells okay in other shells other shells like c shell corn shell public domain corn shell you don't see all this types of features in other shells in unix operating system the default shell was shell okay and what this person has done stephen born has incorporated some new features okay some features has been incorporated in single shell and this has been renamed as the bash shell okay bash is nothing but the born again shell it is named after an inventor called stephen born okay in linux if you want to see the types of shells which are supported you can check this configuration file the configuration file called slash etc slash shells okay this is a configuration file where you can see the number of shells supported by linux or unix operating system if you want to see what is the default shell you can just recall the environment variable called shell this will tell you what is the default shell used in the operating system you see slash bin slash bash okay so that is the importance of bash shell and you must have got an idea like what is shell and what is the importance of bash shell okay and coming to the next question what are demons so this would be a tricky question asked in interviews like what are demons if i put it in simpler format a uh, demon according to my readings demons are services that provide several functions that may not be available under the base operating system its main task is to listen for service request and at the same time to act on these request after the service is done it is then disconnected and waits for further request a daemon process has no controlling terminal it cannot open the terminal for example slash /dev/ slash /tty if you do ps hyphen ef and look at the pp tty field all daemons will have question mark for the tty terminal okay i'll give one practical example here if i run a command ps hyphen ef you see for most of the demons usually in linux and unix operating system a demon would end with d okay you see for example let's take this particular demon here k thread d okay at the end you see the character here d which is nothing but a demon okay as i told you a demon process has no controlling terminal if you check tty wife field here for this particular demon you see a question mark okay a demon process is essentially a program that runs in the background and is usually started when the operating system starts up okay if you want me to take one more example a typical demon process in a mail demon that runs in the background checking to see if you have received a new mail when you do it notifies you okay so most demons tend to last a long time be owned by root or do something useful but this is a very tricky question okay what is the difference between a demon and a process okay so please don't get confused between this a demon is a service that provides several functions that may not be available under the base operating system okay the main advantage the main task is to listen for service request and at the same time it will be act on this request so that is about the demons okay one good example you can always run ps hyphen ef and 
you check all the demands in the TTY field, you see the question mark. That means we have not initiated this system. The operating system has initiated all these demands. Okay. And coming to the next question, what is a Lilo? A Lilo is a Linux loader. It's a bootloader for Linux operating system. It is used to load Linux into the memory and start the operating system. Uh, Lilo can be configured to boot other operating systems as well. Lilo is customizable, which means that if the default configuration is not correct, it can be changed. The main configuration file for Lilo would be slash etc slash lilo.conf. Okay. As I said, Lilo stands for Linux loader, which is just a bootstrap program. Lilo is the code snippet which loads PC BIOS into the main memory at the time of starting the computer system. Okay. And uh, the main task it handles is locating Linux kernel, identifying other supporting programs and loading them into the memory and starting the kernel. Okay. So Lilo is not used nowadays. The default bootloader for Linux operating system is now is Grub, which is called a Grad Unified Bootloader. Okay. When you talk about the latest version of Linux operating system, it has been replaced with Grub 2. Okay. Some more features has been added in Grub and they have released the new version that is called Grub 2. Okay. So this is all about Lilo. It is just a Linux loader. It is called as a bootstrap program. It's a bootloader which loads Linux operating system into the main memory. Coming to the next question. What are the advantages of Linux being open source? Okay. So we have been discussed in the earlier questions also the advantages of open source operating system. Linux was one of the first open source technologies, but many programmers have contributed and added software that's completely open source for any user. This means that you can download the source code and change it in any way you like. Some developers have restrictions on how you can distribute the code. For instance, some developers allow you to change the code, but you cannot distribute it for money. One main advantage of open source technologies such as Linux is a wide range of options available to users and the increased security. With Linux being open source, several distributions are available to the end user. For example, distributions such as Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu and Mint are just a few of the distributions available to end users. And these distributions are completely free to download. Security is the other main advantage. Several white hat hackers have contributed to the overall security of Linux and by making the source available to anyone security experts can help identify any main security flaws in the operating system. Coming to the next question like what are the basic components of Linux operating system? Okay, this is a general question which would be asked in the interviews. Linux operating system has primarily three components. What we have discussed already is kernel. A kernel is the core part of Linux, which is responsible for all major activities of this operating system. It consists of various modules and it interacts directly with the underlying hardware. Kernel provides a required abstraction to hide low level hardware details to system or application programs. Okay, we have already discussed what is kernel. Next comes the second part is system library and system utility. Okay. System libraries are special functions or programs using which application programs or system utilities accesses kernel features. These libraries implement most of the functionalities of the operating system and do not require kernel modules code access rights. Like when you compare with Windows, in Windows we have .dll which is nothing but dynamic link libraries. In Linux we have something, all the libraries which are there to read the file, write the file, all this coding part, okay, implementation of the most of the functionalities will be there in the slash usr slash lib directory or slash lib directory. Okay, and coming to the next question, how to check memory stats and CPU stats as a Linux admin? Okay, so in interviews, as I said earlier, the questions would be always in tricky format, like you can expect questions in theoretical or you can expect questions in practical also. So you should be well advanced, you should be well prepared for the interview in the practical part also. 
So according to this question, being the Linux administrator, how you can check the memory stats and the CPU stats. So there are various commands in Linux here. One such command would be free. If you want to check memory statistics, you can run the command called free hyphen M if you want to see the size in megabytes or free hyphen G if you want to see the size in megabytes. And if you want to see the virtual memory statistics, you have a command called vmstat. Uh, Linux vmstat command used to display statistics of a virtual memory. You can also see the kernel threads, the disks, system processes, IO blocks, interrupts, CPU activity, and much more. Okay, let me explain you this practically here. As I said, if you want to see the memory statistics, you can run the command called free hyphen M. According to my system, I just got approximately some 10 GB of RAM because by default I'm seeing in megabytes here 9838 MB out of which 651 is used 8714 is free or if you want to see that in gigabytes you can run the command free hyphen G if you want to see that in gigabytes and when you talk about virtual memory statistics you have a command called vmstat hyphen A okay so in this example, there are six columns here. The significant of the columns are explained, okay, in details here. As you can see, the first is the processes, the memory, swap, I.O., system, and CPU, okay? You can just find out with the vmstat hyphen A command. You can also check the dynamic activity of your system. Like for example, you see I'm running the command here, vmstat, Two space six. With this command, vmstat execute every two seconds and stops automatically after executing six intervals. See this practically. See the interval here. Okay, interval is every two seconds and it will stop automatically after six intervals here. You can monitor like this virtual memory statistics. Okay, if you want to see along with the time format here, you run the command vmstat hyphen t. Okay. 1,5 for example once you press enter you can see along with the time format okay so like this we have many such options in vmstat the based on the requirement the based on the performance and monitoring you can execute those and coming to the cpu you have a command called sar the system activity report okay with sar hyphen u you can display the cpu usage see exactly you can see the cpu usage okay sar hyphen u displays the cpu usage for the current day that was collected until that point okay if you want to see the real time cpu usage it's the same like vmstat sar hyphen u one space three okay every one second but three intervals here you can see okay sar is very 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 important command it is used by uh, every administrator to monitor the day-to-day -day activity okay in SAR also we have many such arguments here if you want me to discuss more SAR hyphen R to see the memory free and used I'll give 1 comma 3 you can also see with the SAR you see the KB memory free KB memory used and memory used in percentage you can see all that with the SAR command also okay this is all about the system monitoring and the performance so coming to the slide so these are some programs we have just given in the slide here we have discussed about the free vm stat to see the virtual memory statistics and uh, when you talk about cpu statistics you can always use the program sar which is nothing but system activity report okay so i just gave you some basic examples but if you dig more into these commands you have many such options okay and the frequently asked questions in interviews would be how to reduce or shrink the size of an LVM partition okay this is a frequently asked question in interview see the main advantage if you just compare between a partition and a logical volume okay the storage management can be created like whenever you want to create a partition partitions can be created by using a tool called fdisk but if you create a partition using fdisk it is the fixed partition size later it is not possible for us to modify or resize or shrink the partition size that flexibility is not available using fdisk partitioning tools 
Now using advanced partitioning tool like LVM, which is called as a logical volume manager, we have a flexibility of either resizing a logical volume or reducing or shrinking the size of a logical volume. So let's see practically how you can do that in Linux operating system. I'm talking about advanced partitioning tool called LVM, which is nothing but the logical volume manager. Okay, so I've already created a logical volume manager here as you can see with the command DF H capital T you can see for example, there is a logical volume here. The logical volume is zoom Linux and the type of the file system is ext4 the size is 4.8 GB and currently this logical volume is mounted on the mount point called slash LVM. So now I got a requirement of reducing this logical volume size. Okay in other file systems I'm running out of space. I would like to reduce this logical volume and I want to increase the logical volume for other file systems. So let's see how exactly we can do that. Okay, so let me take one example here. There is a logical volume which is of 5 GB currently. I would like to reduce to 3 GB now. Okay, so that that 2 GB I can accommodate to other file systems. The first thing is online shrinking is not possible. So first you need to unmount a logical volume. The command is U mount and specify either the device name or the mount point. And then you can check whether you have any problem with this particular file system. You run the command E2FSCK hyphen F and specify the device name. Okay, so this is must and should. Before you reduce the logical volume, you just need to scan your file system. Okay, E2FSCK is the command to check the particular file system whether you have any problems or not. Now once you press enter, so exactly you should find this. Okay, so we have no problems with this particular file system. Now we can reduce by using the command resize to fs specify the logical volume name. I would like to reduce from 5 GB to 3 GB. The current size is 5 GB. I would like to reduce to 3 GB and the remaining 2 GB. I would like to accommodate to other file systems. Enter. Now you see the logical volume size has been reduced. Okay, so now we can run the command LV reduce hyphen capital L 3 GB and specify your logical volume name. Now once you press enter it will be reduced to 3 GB now from 5 GB to 3 GB as you can see some information here and then you can mount your logical volume to the mount point called LVM. Now you can see the logical volume size. Now it has been reduced from 5 GB to 3 GB. Okay, this is half you can reduce or you can shrink the size of a logical volume. Okay, so this flexibility is not available in fixed disk partitions. Once you create partition, that's it. Now you don't have a flexibility of modifying the partition size or shrinking the partition size. So this is possible only by using advanced partitioning tool called LVM, which is nothing but the logical volume manager. So let's get back to the slides here. So we were discussing about like how to reduce or shrink the size of a LVM partition or a logical volume. It's a five step process. First you have to unmount run FSCK run the resize to FS to 3 GB or whatever required size you want. And then you run the command LV reduce to reduce the logical volume. Then you can mount that particular file system. Okay. The next question being explain the functionality of a root user. Okay. So in computing world, the super user is a special user account used for system administration. Depending on the operating system, the actual name of this account might be root or if you talk about Windows, we call as an administrator or admin or supervisor. In Unix like computer operating system root is the conventional name of the user who has all the rights or permissions to all the files and programs in all modes. Okay, the root user can do many things which an ordinary user cannot such as changing the ownerships of files binding to network ports numbered below 1024. So root is the default account every time Linux is installed. Okay, so there comes your question again. Uh, what is CLI and what is GUI? Okay, 
CLI is nothing but the command line interface is a console or text based representation in which the user types the commands to operate the software or devices. The main advantage of CLI is multiple steps can be executed by specifying a single command which is not possible in graphical mode. Okay, so a GUI which is nothing but the graphical user interface is a graphical representation in which the users can interact with software or devices through graphical icons. Okay, simple definition. What is CLI and what is GUI? So how can you find out how much memory used in Linux operating system? It's again a uh, same question here. So how exactly you can find out? There are many such programs here. The command would be free. Okay. The free command is the most simple and easy to use command to check memory usage on Linux operating system. So here is an example free hyphen N or free hyphen G or you can also cap the contents of slash proc slash mem info. This will also give you the complete information about your memory. You can see here the total memory. Okay. Memory in free and memory available and you see the used and everything here. Okay. You can use this command also. You can just cap the contents of slash proc slash mem info. Okay. Or better, the simple command would be free hyphen G. Okay. What is swap space? And what is the typical size for a swap partition under Linux operating system? So this is also one of the most frequently asked questions in interviews. So what is a swap space? Swap space in Linux is used when the amount of physical RAM physical memory which is also called as a RAM okay is full if the system needs more memory resources and the RAM is full inactive pages in memory are moved to the swap space while swap space can help machines with a small amount of RAM it should not be considered as a replacement for more RAM okay so people often get confused between main memory and swap memory okay so if the CPU doesn't find free space in the physical RAM, so what CPU does is it just moves all inactive processes, all inactive pages from the main memory to the swap space, the swap space which is created onto the disk, okay, to ensure it improves your system performance, okay. So the preferred size for swap partition is twice the amount of physical memory. Okay, amount of physical memory available on the system. If this is not possible, then the minimum size should be the same as the amount of memory installed. Okay, swap is used in normally desktops and laptops. Okay, not in service because in service we have equipped with more RAM. We have 32 GB, 64 GB, 128 GB. On those systems, there is no need to create a swap space. Okay. Swap space only for low end machines where we don't have enough RAM available. Okay, so swap is just to improve the performance of the computer, nothing more. Okay, and uh, how do you access partitions under Linux? What is the naming convention for devices in Linux operating system? Okay, as you can see here, I'm running the program fdisk L, and you see the first device. I got two drives connected to my Linux system. The first drive is slash dev slash SDA and the second drive is slash dev slash SDB. See the naming conventions here. The conventions used for SCSI drives. In case you have IDE hard drives, the first convention would be slash dev slash HDA, HDB, something like that. If you got SCSI drives or SAS drives, the naming conventions would be SDA and SDB. And under this first hard drive here, if you see, you have the partition starting from SDA1 to SDA13. The first partition slash dev slash SDA1 and the second partition SDA2 like that. Okay, so these are the naming conventions used for your storage devices. And this is how exactly you can access partitions under Linux operating system. Okay, you see here ID hard drive starts with H. In case you got SAS and SCSI starts with S. SDA, SDB, go on. How are hard drives and floppy drives referred in Linux? Just now I told you, right? SDA, SDB, and for floppy drives, it would be FD0, FD1. Nowadays, nobody accessing floppy drives, but it would be a question in interviews. 
how floppy drives would be referred in Linux. Slash dev slash FD0 slash dev slash FD1 based on the number of connections you have in your system. In case of hard drives, HDA, HDB. In case of IDE, if we have SCSI or SAS drives, SDA, SDB, something like that. Okay. These are the naming conventions used for floppy drives and hard drives. Similarly, in Linux, how are names assigned to different serial ports? What we also called as communication ports. The communication ports are identified as slash dev slash TT5S0 to TT5S1. You see practically here LS hyphen L slash dev slash TT5S star. You see here the communication ports. Okay. TT5S0, TT5S1. Okay. What we normally called as communication ports in Windows. Communication 1, communication 2 like that. Okay. Coming to the next question asking about printer ports. How exactly you can identify the printer ports in Linux. Same thing slash dev slash LP star LP0 LP1 LP2. These are the names to use for printer ports. Okay. And the very basic question asked in interviews is what are the kind of permissions available in Linux. Okay. What are the basic file permissions or the directory permissions available in Linux. So there are basically three levels of file and directory permissions in Linux. One is read read like users only read the files or list the directory contents and the second permission would be write as the name suggests users can write information to the file or create files inside the directories of a subdirectory and the third permission would be execute. The users can run the file or look up a specific file within a directory. Okay, so besides these you can have a combination of all these three levels of permissions and two of them or one of them some combinations read write execute or read write or read execute the based on the requirement as an administrator. I can change permissions. Okay, basically there are three permissions the three permissions what we see here that is read write and execute. Okay, coming to the next question like how do you change permissions under Linux? So there is a command called chmod. chmod is a command to change permissions for files and directories and the permissions can be changed in two formats. One is symbolic mode another one would be absolute mode. Symbolic mode is nothing but using numbers and absolute mode is nothing but like using characters. Okay, like R W X or 755 or 644 with the help of ch mod you can change permissions. Okay, in order to change ownerships you have a command like ch own and ch grp in order to change ownerships for files and directories. Okay, see here the command ch mod is to change permissions and if you would like to change the ownerships you can use the command ch own and ch grp. Okay, on the left pane you can see some representation here user groups others and the permissions are read write and execute. Okay, plus is to add permission minus is to revoke permission and is equal to to overwrite the existing permissions. Okay, the permissions can be changed in two different modes symbolic mode and absolute mode symbolic using like characters or WX absolute is using numbers. Okay, combination of numbers. The read value is 4, write value is 2, execute value is 1. You can either use characters or you can use numbers. Okay. Symbolic mode or absolute mode. Yes. CH mode 700. What is 7? Read, write, execute. Applicable for owner. 0 means none permissions. Applicable for group. 0 again none. And this is applicable for others. Okay. And coming to the next question. What are symbolic links? Very interesting question. Okay. Symbolic links. So in Linux, basically we have two types of links. One is symbolic link, which is also called as the soft link. So symbolic link, you can always compare. If you take an example, like in Windows, we have shortcuts. Okay. We always create a desktop shortcuts. Now, instead of going to the lengthy part, or navigating into directories into directories and directories we can better create a shortcut on the desktop okay for easy accessing and easy way of interacting with the operating system 
Similarly, in Linux, it is called as a symbolic links or soft links. So this is one special kind of file that points to another file. Like I've compared with Windows, right? We have shortcuts. But please remember, symbolic link does not contain the data. Okay, symbolic link will not have the data. All the data we have in the target file, but not in the shortcut. Okay, and what are the benefits of using symbolic link? It just allows instant access easy of access of application or a program okay without having to navigate to multiple directories here let me show you one practical example here for example i just want to see the configuration file of my lan card network interface card the command would be cat slash etc slash sysconfig network hyphen scripts and the configuration file would be starting like this this is my configuration file for my lan card enp 0 s3 see the path here etc sysconfig network hyphen scripts under this directory we have a file called ifcfg hyphen enp0 s3 now instead what i'll do here i'll create a symbolic link see ln hyphen s is the command ln stands for link now what type of link i'm creating here i'm creating a symbolic link the path would be etc sysconfig network hyphen scripts ifcfg hyphen enp0 s3 for this particular file, I am creating a shortcut under my root directory with the name called ifcfg. Enter. The link has been established. Now, instead of viewing the LAN information, instead of going to this lengthy path, better I can read from the shortcut. Now, which one is easy to access? Either this one or the, from the shortcut. I know it is from the shortcut. See the properties here ls l slash ifcfg because this is exactly pointing to the original file, the target file. This is a link file, the symbolic link file, which is pointing to the target file. Now, instead of using this lengthy part here, I can better use my shortcut, okay? So these are called symbolic links. Please remember, symbolic link does not contain the data. All the data we have in the target file, we don't have anything over here, okay? What are the qualities of symbolic link? Now, both the files will have different inode numbers. We'll discuss about inodes. Both files, the source file and the target file will have different inode numbers, will have different permissions and the different size also, okay? Soft link will always have different name. Same content, both will be having same content, but the different name, okay? And remember, soft links can be created only for files and directories. When you compare with hard link, hard link can be created only for files, but not for directories. But soft links can be created for files and directories. And soft link can cross the file systems also. You can establish a link between file systems. Whereas hard link, you cannot span across file systems. Okay, I hope you got me about symbolic links here. See the qualities of soft links, what we have discussed. Okay, both files will have different inode numbers different permissions different size but the same content but with a different name okay what are hard links now in computing a hard link is a directory entry that associates a name with a file on a file system all directory based file systems must have at least one hard link giving the original file for each directory okay the hard link is usually only used in the file system that allows more than one hard link for the same file okay hard links can be created only for files but not for directories and hard link you cannot span across partitions it should be created within the file system okay so these are some of the differences between the symbolic links and hard links here okay and coming to the next question like what is the maximum length of a file name under linux this is also one of the important question which is frequently asked in linux interviews Linux has the maximum file length of 255 characters, okay? For most file systems like ext3, ext4, in those file systems, you can have a file up to length of 255 characters, okay? And a maximum path of 4096 characters, okay? What we have discussed here, the maximum path, you can have up to 4096 characters. And one particular file name, you can have up to 255 characters okay coming to the next question which type of files are prefixed with a dot so generally in Linux and Unix operating system if any objects 
starts with dot or prefixed with dot those are called hidden files I'm under super user home directory if I want to see all the files here you can run a command ls hyphen a including all the files you see one particular file prefixed with dot so this is exactly a hidden file this is a regular file which is not starting with dot and this is a file which is prefixed with dot this is the hidden file okay and you see a directory also which is prefixed with dot and you see the regular directory public is a regular directory dot cache is the hidden directory so these files can be sometimes called as the configuration files also which holds some important data if you see one example here cat bash rc some aliases has been mentioned here for that particular environment right so mostly in linux and unix operating system if any objects begins with dot those are called hidden files and hidden directories coming to the next question like what is a virtual desktop virtual desktop like whenever a user's desktop environment when you talk about user's desktop environment like icons wallpapers windows like folders toolbars okay is stored in a remote server rather than on a local pc then it's exactly called as a virtual desktop okay the desktop virtualization software separates the physical machine from the software and presents an isolated operating system for users desktop virtualization tools include like microsoft virtual pc vmware workstation and parallel desktop for mac operating system the main benefits of desktop virtualization it just includes like cost savings because resources can be shared and allocated as a needed basis and more efficient use of resources and energy improved data integrity because backup is centralized and centralized administration okay this is about the virtual desktop what we have discussed the benefits of virtual desktops okay and uh, what does a nameless empty directory represents empty directory as you know empty directory name serves as a nameless base for the linux file system this serves as a attachment for other directories files drives and devices okay empty directory how can you create folders and files using the terminal so in linux operating system if you want to create a directory you can use the command mkdir and to create files we have many such programs for example like vi cat command or you can use graphical base editors like gedit nedit pico nano you have many such programs to create files okay you even have line editors screen based editors graphical base editors to create files in linux and unix operating system okay but if you want to create a directory you want to create a folder use the command mkdir okay and uh, next question would be what are the different ways to view the contents of a file okay to view the contents of a file once again we have many such programs here we have many such inbuilt linux programs you can either use graphical based editors or text based editors something like cat vi vim gedit you have pico nano you have many such programs okay what are environment variables one important and interesting question what are environment variables environment variables are global settings that control the behavior of a shell okay software packages installed in linux and other processes the path where the various softwares are installed will be stored as a environment variables environment variables are used to pass information into processes that are spawned from the shell shell variables and variables that are contained exclusively within the shell in which they were set or defined while interacting with your server through a shell session there are many pieces of information that your shell compiles to determine its behavior and access to resources some examples if you want to see in environment variables also we have different types we have system variables and we have user defined variables in the case if we want to see the system variables you can run the command env env is the command to display all the environment variables which are set by default with the operating system okay one good example of an environment variable would be path okay this is a system variable which has the information about the path of all your binaries all your executables okay 
If you take one more example, you see the environment variable called home. What is the super user home directory, which is slash root. Okay. These are some examples here. Environment variables. Okay. System variables and user defined variables. What is the functionality of a tab key in CLI? We were discussing about the features of bash shell, right? I was talking about command aliasing, command completion by using tab keys and command history. Let me show you practically here. In the current working directory called slash root, I have a file called anaconda case.cfg. Let's take one example here. There is a file called anaconda case.cfg. If I want to see the contents of this file, I can run a program called less or more or cat. You can do anything here, but I have to type the complete file name case.cfg. Rather, what I will do here, I'll simply type few letters. I'll use the tab key here automatically the file name would be completed. See cat anaconda case.cfg. I'm not typing the complete file name. I'm just using a few letters and then I'm using the tab keys. Enter to see the contents of this particular file. Similarly, there are many programs in Linux starts with the character C. I'll type C here. I'll use the tab key. I can see with the C letter. I have 162 possibilities. That means I have 162 programs here. You see one such program called cat. If you want to see CA use the tab key here with the CA. We have this many possibilities here. One good example is cat. One good example would be calendar. Okay, so these are the features of the bash shell. Okay, to complete a command or to complete a file name or the directory name. Okay, what is redirection in Linux? Is this is also one of the frequently asked questions in Linux here? Okay, so what is exactly a redirection? So in Linux, redirection is used to pass the output of one operation as input to another operation in the same command. If you see one example here as an administrator, I would like to find out like the users who logged in with my operating system who currently using my operating system. I can run the command called W with the W. I can have all this information. Okay, since when my PC is up and running. Okay, for how long my PC is up and running. How many users are connected and what is the load average of my computer and you see the remaining information here the users the terminal they logged in from which system they logged in you see the login time you see the idle the jcpu pcpu and what exactly they're doing what commands they're executing okay i just want to send this report to one of my lead manager so that you can have this information here w and i would like to save this particular information in one particular file so this is exactly called as a redirection okay so redirection is nothing but which is used to pass the output of w command okay output of one operation will be the input for another operation okay w will display all this information and this will pass to this particular file see cat log all this information has been passed here. This is exactly called as a redirector, the greater than symbol. Okay. It is called as the redirector, the redirector symbol, the greater than symbol. Okay. They give one more examples here. The cat files, file one, file two, the contents of file one, file two will be in file three. Okay. If file three already exists, the file three would be overwritten. And if you don't want to overwritten, if you want to append, you use double redirecting to. Okay. And uh, what is grep? So this command is used for searching for a particular string, or you can also call it as a word, searching for a particular word in a text file. Okay. It also supports pattern based searching. The pattern based searching is done by including options and parameters in the command. Okay. One such example is. The command is grep. I have one file here, the file called testing. In this particular file, I have some words and characters and numbers here. I would like to grep this word. The command is grep the word you want to search for from the file called testing. See, grep the string or the word you want to search for from the file called testing here. Okay. If you want to see with the line numbers, you can pass an argument called hyphen n. At line number 17, I have the word called SD. If we want to see the count of the word, 
you can use an argument called hyphen C. I just have only one word called SD in the file called testing. The count like this, we have many such arguments in grep. Okay, the pattern based searching is also possible in grep command. Okay, and coming to the next question, like how to terminate on ongoing process in Linux here. So in Linux, every process in Linux operating system is identified by a Unix process which is called as a PID number. Okay, PID is nothing but the process ID. To terminate any process, we can use the command kill. You can either use the process name or you can use the process ID. Okay, you see the command kill. And if you want to terminate all process at once, you can use the command kill zero. Okay, it shouldn't be executed on production environments. Kill zero, not recommended command, but only for information sake. And how to insert comments in command prompt. So this is a very basic question. Comments are inserted by using the hash symbol before the comment text. You see any such configuration file, for example, if you take slash etc slash grub.conf or slash etc slash profile, for example, okay, you see the comments here. The comments can be provided by using the hash symbols. So these are the commented lines and these are called uncommented lines. Okay, so can you insert several commands in a single command line entry? If so, then how? It's a very good question. So this is also called as a command chaining. Like you can execute multiple commands one by one. Okay, by using a semicolon. Okay, if I give you one practical example here, the first thing is I would like to create a directory called directory one. And then I want to go to this directory. Then under this directory, I would like to create all these files. So this is called command chaining. One after the other, the commands would be executed. The first command is to create a directory and the second command to execute a directory. Under this directory, I'm creating all these files with the names called J, K and L. Okay, this is exactly called the series of commands in a single entry. You go to this directory. See the files has been created here. Okay, write a command that will display all the txt files along with its permissions. Okay, write a command that will display all the txt files means we have to use the regular expressions and the common extension we have to use is dot txt. So I'll use the command ls hyphen al start dot txt. Okay, so in this particular directory, I don't have anything here with start dot txt, but this would be the command. The command is ls hyphen al star dot txt. It would display all the files, including hidden files, with the properties. Okay, see here. I got gita dot txt, report dot txt, along with the properties here. Okay. And the next question: Would you write a command that will look for files with dot txt extension and has the occurrence of the string edureka in it? Okay. So we have to use combination of commands here. And that combination would be I'll give an example here of find forward slash search from the complete directory here. I would like to search the txt files here from the txt files. I would like to search for a word pattern called edureka. Okay, the combination of commands here first it would find all the files which has the extension txt and then using the advanced command called x arguments. I'm running a command called grep i I'm searching for the word pattern called edureka. Okay, find will list all the files with extension txt and grep is used to search for the string edureka. This is how you can do it. Same thing. How to find the status of a process? If you want to find the status of a process in Linux operating system, you can run the command called ps aux. Okay. So you see the status here, the status of a process. If it is S, it is interruptible sleep state. That means it is waiting for an event to complete. Okay. If you find D somewhere here, D, that is uninterruptible sleep state. Usually it is waiting for IO operation to complete. If it is R, that is a running state. If it is Z, that is nothing but the defunct process, which is also called as a zombie process okay 
the process which is terminated but not reaped by its parent. If it is T, all of you, that is, it is a stopped state, either by a job control signal or anything it can be. Okay. You can also see some code meaning here. You have the greater than symbol and you have N, you have L there. A greater than symbol is nothing but the process which is of high priority. You see here. Okay. Interruptible sleep state which is of high priority. If it is N here, somewhere you see N here, N is nothing but the low priority. If it is L means the process where the pages has been logged into memory. Okay. Like this you can find out the process states by using the command ps hyphen aux the status of a process you should look into this column the status of a process okay and uh, what is the command to calculate the size of a folder this is also one of the important question and you can find out with the command du which is nothing but the directory usage and with the arguments hyphen sh of the directory boot you see for the directory boot it is occupied 135 mb okay the command du is to find out the directory usage of a particular directory okay how to check the memory status of the system the command is free hyphen m or free hyphen g okay same thing and uh, how to log in as root in linux from the terminal i've already logged in as a root here let's say for example I have a user called Edureka. This is a user logged in. With the user Edureka, I want to gain access to super user. Okay, I want to log in as root. Simple, I can run the command sudo su hyphen, and uh, I think I don't have sudo's configured here. I'll simple run the command su hyphen, and then I need to provide a super user password. Then I can log in as a root. See here, the prompt has been changed from the dollar sign to the hash prompt. Dollar sign is the prompt provided for all users, and the hash prompt is the prompt only provided for super user. Okay, the command su, su stands for substitute user. With the user edureka, I gained access to the operating system as root user. Okay, like this you can do. The command su. And the next question is how can you run a Linux program in the background simultaneously when you start your Linux server? This is a very, very important question and this is frequently asked in interviews. And the command would be no hub. Okay. The command is no hub. By using the no hub command, the process will run in the background. Okay. Any process which receives the no hub signal. Okay. Will be terminated when you log out the program. Okay. Until then, the process would be running in the background all the time okay please remember the command would be no hub okay by default it just plays the process in the background which demon tracks events on your computer events on a linux system okay we have the demons like syslog d we have demons like r syslog we have so many tracking events in linux and unix operating system okay the answer should be syslog d or r syslog okay so what is partial backup? So partial backup is nothing but a type of backup where the complete operating system is not taken as a backup. Okay, only certain files, certain folders have been backed up, but not the complete file system. That is exactly called as a partial backup. Okay, so when you select only some portion of a directory, okay, in a single partition, that is exactly called as a partial backup. Partial backup is not the complete backup, only certain files and folders have been backed up. Okay, so in Linux, we have many such backup programs like tar, cpio, dump, restore. Okay, using this, you can take a backup, either complete file system backup or the selected files and folders based on the requirement. And next question would be inode, very, very important one. Inode is nothing but uh, the contents of any file will be stored in data blocks, whereas information about that file will be stored in inode. So when we talk about data, data has two parts, the contents. The contents will be stored in the data blocks and information about the file, what we called as metadata, that metadata will be there in the inode. Okay, so information, uh, what type of information is stored in inode, like the file size, the permissions, the user ownership, the group ownership, the link count, when exactly the file was last accessed, or last modified okay 
all that you can see in inode so an inode number points to an inode table which is a data structure that stores all that information the size of the file the device id the user id group id the file mode permissions everything okay so which command is used to set a processor intensive job to execute less cpu time very very important question and the answer would be the command nice and renice okay these are the programs which are used to set a priority okay you can change the process priority using nice and renice programs so nice command will launch a process with an user defined scheduling priority renice command will modify the scheduling priority of a running process okay so the process scheduling priority ranges from minus 20 to 19 keep this in mind this is very important okay the process scheduling priority range from minus 20 to 19 we also call this as a nice value okay a nice value of minus 20 represents the highest priority and the nice value of 19 represents the least priority of a process okay if i show you one practical example here let me just create one particular file cat redirecting file one i'm creating a file okay so in the back end one process would be invoked because i'm creating a file here let me open another session here let me show you by just running the command ps-fl and the process name called cat okay see this particular process by default you see the nice value the nice value is zero whenever you submit a process by default every process will have a nice value zero okay see here similarly if i submit a program with the less priority for example minus 10 okay minus 10 cat redirecting file one here now you see the nice value let me open the other uh, other this one let me recall the same command now you see the nice value for cat command the nice value is 10 okay the nice value ranges from minus 20 to 19 minus 20 being the highest priority and 19 being the least priority see i launched a program with the nice value with the least value called 10 okay if you want to launch a program with the highest priority i'll give minus 10 okay do not get confused here it is not hyphen hyphen it is minus 10 now you see now it is minus 10 okay that means this command requires more cpu time okay similarly unlike nice if there is already a running process that can be changed by using the command called renice okay the command is renice hyphen n the priority you want okay and you can give the process name or the process id you can do with the renice renice can be used if the program is already in used okay very important programs see here the priority ranges from minus 20 to 19 minus 20 being the highest and 19 being the lowest priority and the last question is like what are shadow passwords and how they are enabled so shadow passwords are given for better system security every user's passwords will be stored in slash etc slash password file and by implementing shadow passwords all passwords will be stored in encrypted format in a new file called slash etc slash shadow okay the passwords in the original file will then be replaced with x in multi-user environments it is very important to use a shadow passwords okay if i give one small example like in linux we have two such database files here one database file will have information about users and other database file will have information about users passwords slash etc slash shadow okay we have two such database files here which keeps information about users and users passwords okay so this is to improve the security in earlier days in earlier versions of linux and unix operating system there used to be only one particular file which has everything user and the users file see an example here example called password convert cat slash etc slash password used to have everything like this in one particular file you have users the users passwords and everything but the problem is this particular file is readable by everyone see here slash etc slash password is owned by root 
he got full permissions here even others got read permissions okay which does not impose security on this particular file okay so that is the reason there are two database files maintained one is etc password and etc shadow files now you see the shadow file is only has read permissions for root for others you see we have none permissions okay so this is of we have two database files here etc password which has information about users and etc shadow which has information about users passwords okay not only passwords you also have information about the password age also for how long we can use this password when password would be expired all this information can be used in etc shadow file okay so this is all about linux interview i hope the session is useful for everyone i hope you have enjoyed listening to this video please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to edureka channel to learn more happy learning